On March 15, 2011, Martin Sims was wandering down the streets of Carson, California. His clothes were ragged, he was filthy, and gibbering like a madman with a full beard and long, unkempt hair. His body was covered in scars, but he showed no signs of malnutrition. What made Martin's sudden appearance so remarkable? He'd been missing for three years. When he was interviewed by police, they asked him where he'd been all this time. They couldn't believe his answer. He'd been trapped in an IKEA since 2008, but this was no ordinary IKEA. This was a dangerous anomaly that would come to be known as SCP-3008. Martin's strange answers in his interview were laughed off by his interviewing officers, who assumed he was either crazy or under the influence of something, but they caught the attention of an SCP Foundation field agent embedded in the precinct. The report was passed up the chain to a local site director who approved a detachment of Foundation field operatives to look into Martin's case. While he was reluctant to lead the Foundation agents back to the offending IKEA, the Foundation can be extremely persuasive. His screams of, please, I'm begging you, don't take me back, don't make me go back, were noted but ultimately disregarded. When the SCP Foundation had triangulated the position of SCP-3008, which was indeed an active IKEA, the entire retail zone was closed and barricaded under the pretense of a severe black mold infestation. Armed Foundation personnel also arrived on the site shortly after, based on Martin's vague statements that there were creatures of some kind inside. Due to his deteriorating mental health, Martin was unable to provide a great deal of lucid information on the specific traits of SCP-3008, but one phrase he kept repeating was, bigger on the inside. Once researchers were satisfied that Martin had delivered all the pertinent information he was able to, he was administered foundation amnestics to erase his memory of the last three years and return to his family. A cover story was formulated. Martin had been kidnapped and abused for three years by a mentally unbalanced stalker in downtown Carson. He'd been able to escape as said stalker took his own life out of guilt, a suicide that the Foundation expertly fabricated to make their cover story airtight. With the loose end of Martin Sims taken care of, the true observation of SCP-3008 could begin. A base set around the perimeter of the mysterious IKEA kept a 24-hour watch on the building, covering all potential entrances and exits. No exploratory missions had yet been approved by the Foundation Ethics Committee, so they first wanted to perform a week of external observation to see if any of the store's anomalous properties extended beyond the confines of the building. After a week of nothing, it appeared they did not. A local site director approved of the use of 20 disposable Class D personnel to explore the interior of SCP-3008. The D-Class operatives would be split into four squads of five men, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta Squad. Each would be assigned a different quadrant of the store and would deliver information back to the control team on site via a live audio and video link. Three of the four teams upon entering the store reported nothing out of the ordinary. Neither the audio or video they were sending back indicated anything different from a standard IKEA store, from the flat pack wardrobes to the Swedish meatballs. Team Delta, however, suddenly began experiencing a scrambled audio and video connection. Shortly after, communication with Team Delta dropped off entirely. They disappeared somewhere inside the store and haven't been seen since, with one notable exception. After the disappearance and the extraction of teams, Foundation researchers classified SCP-3008 as Euclid because its anomalous properties were at least confined to the interior of the store, and even then seemingly not the entire interior. The anomalous area within SCP-3008 became known as SCP-3008-1, and containment appeared to be 100% secure. There was no telling how many people had already gone missing in the store over the years, but the disappearances must be stopped. The Foundation maintained constant surveillance around the perimeter of SCP-3008, but it appeared they could prevent any further incidents by simply preventing other civilians from accessing the IKEA store. Martin's ravings about monsters were assumed to just be the product of delirium, until a surviving member of Delta Team suddenly reappeared. The date was November 3, 2011. It was a cold night, a few hours after what would have been closing time if the store were still active and seven months after the extraction teams had disappeared somewhere in the confines of SCP-3008. There had been no anomalous activity outside the store since the perimeter was first secured, and the Foundation researchers hadn't expected that to change, until the last surviving member of Delta Team came barging out of the store's entrance. Startled field operatives were amazed to see him again, but they were even more amazed to see what was following him out of the store, repeating the same phrase, the store is now closed, please exit the building. Despite the fact that the entity chasing the Delta Team survivor was wearing the yellow shirt and blue pants of an IKEA store employee, the being definitely was not human. 
It was around 7 feet tall with no visible face. The entity had grossly extended limbs, with each arm being around 5 or 6 feet long and ending in a huge oversized hand. The whole process was so sudden that the field agents present at the perimeter weren't able to save the Delta Team survivor as the entity reached forward with his freakishly long arms, grabbed him and twisted his head off like a child with a doll. The field operatives present drew their weapons and peppered the entity with bullets. It would later be classified as SCP-3008-2. The being appeared to collapse and die from the physical trauma, at which point it and the body of the former Delta Team survivor were taken for an autopsy by Foundation researchers. There were no biological abnormalities of the body of the Delta the team survivor, so it did not appear that the anomalous properties of SCP-3008-1 had any effect on the physiology of its occupants. He was not malnourished despite being missing for months, and the contents of his stomach looked to be half-digested food consistent with the menu of a typical IKEA store restaurant. SCP-3008-2, on the other hand, raised a number of perplexing biological questions. The autopsy revealed that the creature's clothes were actually part of its body, like an additional layer of skin. The creature lacked blood or any kind of vascular system. Even stranger, the entity didn't appear to have bones or internal organs, not even a brain or nervous system. It was a being made entirely of skin all the way to its core. How it was able to move, or even live for that matter, remains a mystery. Though when you work for the SCP Foundation, you learn to accept that some things will always remain unexplained. One thing was certain though, Martin Sims was right about his monsters. After the incident with the Delta Team, the Foundation deemed that sending manned explorations into the heart of SCP-3008 was too much of a liability and planned a series of drone-based reconnaissance missions into the anomaly. The first of these drones experienced connection issues and failed when attempting to venture into the IKEA's anomalous zone. However, However, after a lengthy period of trial and error, the Foundation was able to establish a more secure connection with its drones, even when deep into the SCP-3008-1 anomalous zone. It was only then that some of the most extraordinary discoveries were made. SCP-3008-1 seemed to break the laws of spatial reality, as the area of the IKEA's interior was at least an order of magnitude larger than its exterior. Just as Martin Sims had said, it was bigger on the inside, but just how much bigger? The Foundation has yet to find evidence of any physical term within the store that might indicate SCP-3008-1 has an end point, while an area of at least 10 kilometers squared has been uncovered in SCP-3008-1. It could, in theory, be infinite. Laser rangefinder tests, which are normally very reliable, have only given inconclusive results. Interestingly, the anomalous area doesn't have any clear visual differences from the rest of the IKEA store, except that it extends forever. An individual trapped within the confines of SCP-3008-1 wouldn't even realize they've entered an anomalous zone until they tried to locate an exit and leave, at which point they'd find they were already hopelessly lost. The geography of SCP-3008-1 does at least appear to be consistent, so people trapped within are theoretically able to retrace their steps and escape if they haven't already ventured to too deep. According to data collected during the drone reconnaissance missions, SCP-3008-2, of which there appear to be a vast population, would wander the stores aimlessly during the day. They are unresponsive to the drone's presence and did not appear to be aggressive. While the physical descriptions of these creatures could vary slightly, they all follow the same overall trend. Clothes, consistent with an IKEA uniform, no face, either seemingly too tall or too short, and limbs that are grossly out of proportion with their bodies. As the Foundation began sending drones deeper and SCP-3008-1, they found another incredible discovery. There was an unknown population of humans trapped inside IKEA's anomalous zone, and these people had used the IKEA furniture around them to create entire settlements and towns within the store. There were several of these towns, all of which seemed to cohabitate peacefully. Even Foundation personnel found this development in their research to be truly extraordinary. Since SCP-3008 was first identified, there have been only 14 civilian escapes. Some had been trapped inside for months, others had been in there for years, some far longer than Martin's three-year stint. While every one of these escapees has eventually been released back to their home, after a liberal application of amnestics and a proper cover story has been devised, the Foundation interviewed each of them extensively first. According to each of these escapees, the people trapped inside the IKEA have built an entirely new society across the various settlements. Contrary to the Lord of the Flies' expectations of a group of people isolated and afraid, there is immense cooperation between the trapped civilians. The food in the several IKEA restaurants in SCP-3008-1 
mysteriously replenishes while nobody's there, so there's no threat of starving, and the automatic turning on and off of the lights forms as a rudimentary kind of day and night cycle. Nighttime, however, is when things get dangerous, as the SCP-3008-2 entities, which are known to the people inside as the staff, become extremely hostile after dark. Aggressive hordes of the staff swarm the settlements at night, repeating, this door is now closed, please exit the building. The civilians inside are usually able to repel these attacks with minimal casualties, but the constant war of attrition slowly wears down those inside. The bodies of the creatures also need to be removed from the area after each attack, as the presence of corpses or even parts of corpses has been known to heighten the ferocity of the next night's attack. During the day, the staff return to a docile and unresponsive state, though they'll still defend themselves violently if anyone dares to attack. Over the course of the interviews with the 14 escapees, Foundation researchers were able to answer another of their key questions. How had so many people gone missing in the store for so long without being noticed? But the answer they received only raised many more unsettling queries. According to the escapees, there were people inside the settlements that, despite being otherwise of entirely sound mind and standard intelligence, seemed to lack very common knowledge that even a child should know. For example, some of them weren't aware of the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, or stranger still, the existence of the Statue of Liberty. This led the researchers to a frightening conclusion. SCP-3008-1 may not only be a nexus point of multiple IKEA stores in our dimension, it could be connected to IKEAs in every dimension where IKEAs exist. While it only abducts a handful of people from each store over an extended period of time, it suddenly becomes clear how this SCP was able to trap so many people without detection over such a long period of time, which in turn led to an even more terrifying revelation. The SCP Foundation may not have SCP-3008-1 as contained as they thought. It might even be tucked away in an IKEA store somewhere near you, just waiting for you to visit. After all, there's always room for one more. When an anomaly is first detected by an SCP Foundation field agent, it's up to the Foundation's mobile task forces to tag and bag the impossible entities before they can do any more harm. Sometimes these retrievals are uneventful, other times, not so much. Especially when they're dealing with brutal forces of nature, like SCP-096. Also known as the Shy Guy, a creature that, from the very first interaction with the Foundation, had a reputation for being dangerous and needed to be feared. A series of vague sightings and mysterious disappearances up in the frosty mountains of the Yukon first sparked the Foundation's interest. When they were certain that they had an anomaly on their hands, two retrieval teams, Zulu-9A and Zulu-9B, were dispatched to secure and contain the entity. Zulu-9A took the lead in a heavy-duty chopper, equipped with 50 caliber GAU-19 heavy machine guns and carrying an AT-4 anti-tank launcher. They were prepared for anything, or so they thought, as they established a visual on SCP-096 while two clicks away from the target. They couldn't get a clear line of sight on the creature, but it appeared to be stationary, docile, and was making no attempt to flee. Piece of cake, right? Little did they know that SCP-096 was just looking away from them. If it was facing towards them, it'd be a whole different horror story as Zulu-9A were about to find out. The team landed their helicopter next to the creature and were shocked to see that it was completely naked, in spite of the sub-zero temperatures all around them. The creature was unnaturally thin, as though it had been starved for weeks, with bone-white skin and unnaturally long limbs. The team guessed that the creature's arms must have been at least 1.5 meters long, but its docile nature and insubstantial body mass gave the impression that it wouldn't prove too difficult to contain. That is, until they saw its face. Zulu-9A's captain was the lone survivor of the incident, as he was lucky enough to be looking away when the creature turned towards his team. The rest of the squad ended up staring eye to eye with SCP-096, and from that moment on, wasn't docile anymore. The creature began to whimper, then cry, then sob uncontrollably in a way that sounded eerily human. This sudden change in temperament startled the rest of Zulu-9A, and they opened fire on the creature. Under the hail of gunfire, SCP-096 entered a murderous frenzy and began tearing into the hapless squad of soldiers. While its flesh and organs did seem to take damage as a result of the barrage of 50 caliber rounds from the helicopter-mounted machine guns, its skeletal structure remained intact and it continued its onslaught, tearing the team limb from limb even after they'd blown practically all the flesh from the creature. The AT-4 anti-tank launcher proved equally ineffective at stopping SCP-096 while it was in attack mode. 
and it was only after slaughtering the entire team that it returned to its docile state. Nobody knows exactly what the creature did to Zulu 9A after the gunfire started, but no trace of the team was left behind. Zulu 9B touched down soon after, and with a grave warning from the captain not to look at the creature's face, they were finally able to subdue it. A bag was placed over SCP-096's face, which seemed to soothe it enough to move it to a nearby Foundation facility. Little did they know, they just obtained one of the deadliest SCPs of all time. And while it may have been under lock and key for now, it seemed inevitable that it would get out and cause more violence and chaos. Research and containment procedures for the SCP-096 were put under the command of Dr. Dan, a senior researcher at the site. It was his job to find out exactly what this being was capable of, and the more he tested, the more he realized that they were dealing with something truly terrifying. Disposable D-Class personnel were used to figure out exactly what it was that caused the creature to enter its attack mode. Just as it had during the initial retrieval mission, SCP-096 went berserk when any of the attending personnel saw its face. In this stage, it would enter a period of considerable and unstoppable distress for one to two minutes, covering its face and wailing loudly. When the period of distress ended, the creature would mercilessly slaughter every D-Class that had seen its face, and just like with Zulu 9A, no trace of their bodies would be left behind. Dr. Den was horrified and intrigued by this phenomenon. The creature killed anyone that saw its face directly, but could the same be said for indirect depictions of the creature's face, such as images and videos? Dr. Dan was desperate to find out. More D-Class personnel were brought in to test this, to frightening results. Dr. Dan found that the creature did indeed still enter attack mode when people saw pictures and videos of SCP-096's face. The creature seemed to have an innate sense of when people were viewing these representations, even when it should have had no conceivable way of knowing. It didn't matter how far away or how many barriers were in place between the viewer and the creature, the attack mode would still activate. And once it did, it seemed as though nothing could stop the creature from hunting down the one who saw its face. With all of this new data, special containment procedures were devised to keep the creature safely under lock and key. Its cell was a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter airtight steel cube, fitted with advanced pressure sensors and laser detectors to ensure that SCP-096 remained in its cell without risking anyone having visual contact with the creature's face. All cameras and video equipment were strictly forbidden, and weekly checks for any cracks or holes in the containment cell were mandatory. Of course, none of this would stop the creature if anyone somehow saw its face. In order to solve that little problem, Dr. Dan would need to continue his research. To find a method of subverting the creature's deadly glance, they needed to know exactly what they were dealing with. But how could they, when even a glance at a photo or video of the being meant certain death? A potential solution was proposed, creating an artistic oh. representation of the creature's face, something that hadn't yet been attempted. But how would they achieve such a feat? Simple. They'd procure a D-Class prisoner with some artistic talent, and they found one who had been a tattoo artist before becoming a Foundation guinea pig. Dr. Dan formulated an ingenious plan for keeping this D-Class alive for long enough to accurately draw an image of SCP-096's face. He would be placed in a bathysphere diving bell several kilometers underwater and tens of kilometers away from the containment cell where the SCP was being held. The D-Class was made to look at a photograph of the creature's face and then replicate that image in a pencil sketch. Dr. Dan first confirmed that the creature's attack mode is only activated by the creature's face by having the D-Class look at a series of photos of the SCP's body parts, one by one, finally finishing with its face. The D-Class began drawing and even remarked on how creepy the SCP's facial features were, despite not knowing the deadly context. Meanwhile, back in its containment cell, SCP-096 sensed someone viewing its face and entered its inconsolable crying state followed by its attack mode. It broke out of containment easily and began making a beeline for the D-Class, traversing the miles between it and its prey. The D-Class didn't know it as he locked the finished drawing into a separate, autonomous submersible, but he was already dead. As the drawing made its way up to a researcher on the surface, SCP-096 dived into the water and started swimming down towards the artist. Minutes later, the bathysphere was breached and the D-Class was torn to shreds. SCP-096 was recaptured without issue by Surface Recovery Team Foxtrot 303A, 
and further testing on the drawing showed that artistic representations of SCP-096's face were in fact harmless. From this experience, we now know that the creature has a gaunt face with totally white eyes, possibly indicating blindness and a grossly extended jaw. Nevertheless, Dr. Dan was adamant that SCP-096 was too dangerous to be left alive, and requested permission from the upper echelons of the Foundation to terminate the creature by any means necessary. However, the doctor's request would fall on deaf ears, until it all started with a seemingly innocent image. While it's now been redacted for your safety, the black speck inside the yellow circle was once a minuscule image of SCP-096, taken unknowingly in the 1990s by a semi-professional mountaineer. One day they were looking at old photographs when his eyes passed over the tiny speck without even noticing that he had seen anything. But SCP-096 noticed and began entering its attack mode. It tore through its steel containment unit like tissue paper, causing the release of a nerve agent that killed a number of attending Foundation staff. The monster then fled the base and began pursuing its prey, with Mobile Task Force Tau-1 in hot pursuit. Dr. Oleksy, who was helping to manage the site where the SCP was contained, was in dismay over the situation. Dr. Dan was out of the country at the time, trying to discover more about the creature's origins. However, he did leave the Mobile Task Force with a new secret weapon against the rampaging Shy Guy, Project Scramble. Scramble were state-of-the-art goggles featuring a new technology created by Dr. Dan, which, using artistic renditions of 096's facial features, could detect and scramble the features of SCP-096 into an unrecognizable form, preventing the normally deadly effect of gazing upon its face. In theory, this would allow MTF Tau-1 to engage safely with 096 once its prey had been eliminated and bring it back into containment. But disaster struck on two fronts. First, the prey in question was located in a population center, creating the potential for a huge loss of life. And the second bigger problem was that the scramble technology didn't work, as stray pixels of the creature's face would reach the eyes of the task force before the internal microprocessor had time to scramble them. The mission turned into a death sentence, as SCP-096 slaughtered almost the entire task force, as well as a number of civilians in town, including an infant and its entire family. It was a monumental disaster, made even worse by a final revelation. Dr. Dan and Dr. Alexei had themselves facilitated the entire containment breach and allowed the resulting massacre to happen. With Dr. Dan hoping it would be enough motivation for Foundation Command to greenlight his research into destroying the creature. Anything that would give him the opportunity to kill this thing would be worth the bloodshed. His plan worked, and the SCP Foundation saw it his way, approving his request to neutralize SCP-096. However, success comes at a cost for Dr. Dan. Once he figures out a way to finally kill the creature, though done in his line of duty, he himself will be terminated by the Foundation for his crimes against humanity. But considering how much damage SCP-096 is capable of causing if it ever got to a major population center, or even worse, was ever caught on camera and broadcast to a worldwide audience, the doctor himself would likely deem his own death a justifiable cost. To this day, the Foundation is researching ways to kill the creature, and they're still looking for their silver bullet. And the pressure is on. They hadn't known about the seemingly innocent picture that sparked the last containment breach, the one taken decades ago, in which the Shy Guy had only occupied four tiny pixels. Four tiny pixels that resulted in multiple innocent lives lost. So be careful where you look, because who knows how many other photos of the creature are lurking out there. Photos with an innocent dot in the background. Your eyes glance over it, not even noticing the little blip until you hear a distant wailing that seems to be getting closer and closer and closer. And then, it's already too late. SCP-682 must be destroyed as soon as possible. So begins the SCP Foundation file on the dreaded SCP-682, a highly intelligent reptilian monster that has, despite the Foundation's best efforts, proved impossible to kill. It may not be the most dangerous SCP out there, considering that some are capable of eliminating entire realities, but it's one of the most iconic, and you've probably heard tales of the monster that death forgot, and you know exactly why everyone is so afraid of the so-called hard-to-kill reptile. It's been subjected to some of the most deadly weapons and traps the Foundation could devise, and survived attacks from some of its deadliest fellow SCPs. But before we tell you about the Foundation's many failed assassination attempts against the so-called hard-to-kill reptile, 
we need a little more groundwork on what this creature even is. The first thing to know about SCP-682 is that this thing wants you and everything you know dead. Unlike some other creatures like SCP-096 and SCP-173, which are murderous but exhibit no real higher processing skills, SCP-682 possesses cunning, advanced reasoning, and even human-level logical intelligence. SCP-682 can engage you in conversation, but just talking to the creature calmly and cordially will sometimes cause it to enter its rage state, where it becomes even more dangerous and volatile. The beast is perpetually kept in a tank of powerful hydrochloric acid, melting its tissue to prevent it from reaching its full potential and going on a rampage. The creature's most terrifying asset, and the reason it's proven impossible to terminate thus far, is its incredible adaptability to any and all external stimuli. 682 is a reactive being, capable of not only surviving and regenerating from all attacks, but often incorporating those attacks into its own wide arsenal. In other words, if you're hoping to kill this thing, you better kill it on the first hit. Because if you don't, you better believe it's going to hit you back a hundred times harder. This brings us to the main event. Some of the SCP Foundation's most ambitious and frightening attempts to terminate SCP-682, or even understand how it could theoretically be terminated. There are quite literally too many unsuccessful attempts for us to list them all here, so think of this as a highlight reel of the Foundation's most prominent failures. 682 was first cross-tested with SCP-017, a humanoid shadow entity shown to be able to consume matter with its shadows and leave no traces behind. Tests on tissue samples from 682 showed that SCP-017 was able to consume said tissues with no adverse effects. However, when SCP-017 was placed into the containment chamber with the actual creature, 682 let out a horrific roar that was so loud it damaged nearby audio equipment. SCP-017 fled to the corner of the room, and 682, in its rage state, attempted to breach containment. Agents managed to suppress and remove the creature, but no meaningful damage was logged. Attempt failed. SCP-173, the killer statue, was later brought in, hoping that its thus far impeccable track record for killing would hold strong. The second that 173 was introduced into the testing area, 682 retreated to the far wall and began screeching intensely. It was intelligent enough to know what it was dealing with here. While the researchers and guards expected an instantaneous reaction, there was actually a stalemate for over six hours as 682 stared at 173 continuously. Eventually, the tie was broken when agents shot out 682's eyes with high-caliber sniper rifles, breaking the line of sight and causing 173 to attack. Though 682 sustained damage to several parts of its body, while its eyes regenerated, the creature was not killed. It then regenerated a number of eyes all over its body, covered in a clear armored carapace that made them resistant to bullets. The stalemate continued for an additional 12 hours, as 682 maintained perpetual eye contact. 173 was eventually removed from the containment unit, and the mission was aborted. Attempt failed. In their desperation, the SCP Foundation restored to bringing in another dangerous and seemingly unkillable monster to take on 682. SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy. As astute SCP fans will already know, this being kills anything that sees its face, with no known exceptions, and when it enters its attack mode, it's thought to be quite literally unstoppable. Or at least, it was. While SCP-096 was able to destroy 85% of 682's original body mass during their 27-hour battle, it was left mentally broken, <laughs> wounded, and huddled in the corner. To this day, if ever confronted with SCP-682, the Shy Guy reacts in pure terror, turning away and clawing at its own face. Attempt failed. During a deadly containment breach, SCP-682 also went head-to-head -head organically with another iconic SCP Hall of Famer, SCP-106, also known as the Old Man. The old man and a shape-shifting psionic anomaly known as SCP-953 broke into 682's containment cell. The old man pulled both of his fellow anomalous combatants into his pocket dimension to continue the battle on his terms. However, despite losing 67% of his body mass during the ensuing pocket dimension showdown, 682 still prevailed, with the old man eventually fleeing back to his cell and 953 being collected and taken away by agents. Once again, SCP-682 continued to hold the title. But it wasn't just cross-testing experiments, intentional or otherwise. 
The SCP Foundation's quest to kill 682 led them to a number of more yeah. conventional murder methods, all with varying degrees of success. Due to SCP-682's highly adaptive abilities, some methods were discounted from the outset. For example, launching a powerful thermonuclear missile at the creature was soundly rejected by O5 Command, on the premise that if the creature wasn't destroyed and evolved to the point where it could shrug off nukes, humanity would be pretty much done for. Other ideas were abandoned just for being too ridiculous, such as one researcher's suggestion to fly the creature through the air and drop it from a considerable height, hoping to kill it with a high-altitude impact. I'm not sure we even need to tell you why that's a terrible idea, but during the experiments on SCP-682, the studies range from honest to incompetent to straight-up evil. One guest researcher fed two small, innocent children to the creature, just to see what would happen. He was then himself fed to the creature for his sadistic behavior, which was viewed as getting in the way of his professional conduct. After all, the Foundation is meant to be cold, not cruel. It was SCP-682 that had the monopoly on cruelty. Mimetic kill agents were a resounding failure. They attempted to dismember 682 with a powerful laser, only to have the creature develop reflective services that displaced the beam and caused catastrophic damage to the area around it. They attempted to kill the creature by sucking all the air out of its containment facility and create a vacuum, but it expelled a dangerous gaseous compound that reacted violently and exploded when air was once again introduced into the room. The Foundation used high-precision blades to slice SCP-682 into approximately 12,000 pieces, then separated these pieces. Unsurprisingly by this point, this attempt also failed. The 12,000 pieces reformed a short while later into the fully operational killing machine we all know and fear. In one particularly frightening display of intelligence and adaptability, the Foundation attempted to kill 682 with extreme heat, but it shielded itself by developing a second carpace composed of solid helium. When personnel entered the room following the failed attempt on the creature's life, it shattered its helium carapace into deadly shards that fired around the room and shredded all Foundation personnel in attendance. It had set a trap, and that trap had been wildly successful. The creature's ability to adapt to seemingly any offense is unparalleled, to the point where Foundation staff have no idea how to classify this creature, whether it's organic, inorganic, or even alive at all based on any definitions we could understand. At every turn, the creature just raised more questions. What is it? Is it possible to destroy it at all by any means? Who was even trying to kill who here? Because it certainly seemed like SCP-682 had a masterful KD ratio by now. More extreme feats of cross-testing continued in the Foundation's growing desperation to eliminate this monster. SCP-162, which is a hypnotic ball of sharp objects, hooks, and high-tension fishing line, was introduced to 682's containment cell. The hooks latched onto the creature and tore huge portions off, including its entire lower jaw and one of its limbs. However, 682 was still able to breach containment, kill 11 people, and badly wound 86 others. It regenerated its severe injuries in no time. The beast was even taken to the domain of the Gate Guardian, one of the proposals for SCP-001. The Guardian had a flaming sword hotter than the sun, capable of destroying its targets on an atomic level. Naturally, SCP-682 survived and regenerated. Perhaps the most fascinating cross-test of all was between 682 and SCP-053, who manifests as a kind, innocent little girl, with the unfortunate condition of causing homicidal tendencies in all who come into contact with her for more than 10 minutes. The people with these tendencies would then attempt to harm the girl, but would immediately drop dead shortly after, leaving the girl intact. The researchers present anticipated two possible outcomes here. The optimistic outcome, in which 682 enters a rage state, attacks 053, and died for good. And the realistic outcome, in which 682 attacks 053, possibly experiencing some minor injury or nothing at all, and 053 had to be removed from the containment cell. But that didn't happen. What did occur was considerably more shocking than any kind of violence. When 053 entered 682's containment chamber, the monster became uncharacteristically docile. Researchers and staff were baffled and watched with amazement as 053 approached the terrifying, immortal, mass-murdering monster and began to play with it. 682 even allowed 053 to draw on its face with crayons. Researchers thought they must have been dreaming seeing this surreal display play out. 053 even appeared to have affection for this unkillable misanthrope. It was a single act in defiance of everything they thought they knew. 
When Foundation personnel entered the containment cell to separate the two, 682 went ballistic and killed multiple guards. 053 also wept, sad at being separated from her new friend. To this day, despite further testing, the Foundation has no idea how or why this happened. Like many details surrounding SCP-682, it's shrouded in deeply frustrating mystery. Mm. And so the tale of SCP-682 continues, in spite of the Foundation's best efforts. The monster continues to breach containment and slaughter with some regularity, taking out its seemingly limitless hatred for not only human beings, but anything that dares drop breath. Nobody knows where exactly the creature is from, what its true nature is, or why its ability to adapt and regenerate far exceeds any known organism on this planet. Perhaps one day, through enough research and cross-testing, we can someday answer these questions with scientific precision. But until then, we only have one answer. Hatred never dies. The esteemed Dr. Thomas Morstead entered the cell of the anomaly. He'd been warned and even chastised by his colleagues. But who in the Foundation could tell him what to do? He was the best at what he did, maybe the greatest in the whole history of the Foundation. As he entered the room, SCP-049 bid him welcome, cordial as always, so polite in fact that you'd never guess you were talking to a killer. Dr. Morstead knew the truth of what he was dealing with, but he also believed he could get through to 049. Calm him, exercise the devil from him. It was the meeting of two great minds, one of them human, one of them part human, part something that has never been clear. It was to be a battle of wits, and like so many great battles, this one would turn into a massacre. Before we get to that fateful meeting, there are some things you should know about the anomaly known as SCP-049. If you saw him in the street, the first thing you'd think of is playing, because 049 always looked the same, a man dressed in black robes with a plague doctor's mask. But this wasn't a costume that could be taken off. In fact, it wasn't a costume at all. It was. Him. The robes had grown out of him like an exoskeleton. That horrible mask with the pointed nose wasn't covering his face. It was his face. A kind of shell that had seemingly sprouted from bone. The first reports came during World War II. In a picturesque town in the south of France called Montauban, people had begun going missing. Children disappeared from their beds in the middle of the night and weren't seen again. Adults went to the market and never returned. Local authorities searched high and low. They scoured nearby woods and dragged the rivers, but nothing was found. Because what was happening wasn't criminal, there was no clue they could stumble upon or eyewitness who would break the case. No, this was something else, something that the townsfolk could never understand. Word spread, and that's when a search and discovery team was sent from the Foundation. It was a cold, dark night in January of 1941 when the team found what they were looking for. They walked through the open door of a small house located not too far from the Grand Chateau de Richelieu to find a masked man sitting next to an open fire. And he wasn't alone. The floor around him looked like it was moving. Upon closer inspection, the team saw that the floor was covered with writhing, grasping bodies. It's patience, as it called them. Bienvenue chez moi, said the thing. Welcome to my home. Those so-called patients crawled towards the team, intent it seemed to cause harm. The hostiles, now known as SCP-049-2s, were deemed dangerous and had to be eliminated. A sight, it seemed, that didn't bother 049 in the slightest. It just sat there, occasionally looking up from writing notes in a leather-bound book as his patients were gunned down. Once the carnage ended, it simply closed its book, stood up, and allowed itself to be escorted away. And that's the story of how 049 ended up at the facility, becoming a guest of sorts, staying in a standard secure humanoid containment cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19. The few that came into contact with 049 remarked that it was a pleasure for them, with its impeccable manners, vast knowledge of medicine and human anatomy, sharp tongue, and stinging wit. They almost became spellbound listening to it, caught in the throes of its charms until, with the simple touch of its hand, it would drain the life from them. That's why SCP-049 was classified as a Euclid. That's why armed guards were always stationed outside its cell. It's why doctors took great precautions when in its presence, and it's why Dr. Morstead should have known better. Remember, when 049 was discovered in France, it willingly went with the team, like it was happy it had been found. 
as if it had planned its own capture. When it arrived at the facility, it didn't act like it was contained against its will. It was like it was returning home. Initial findings as to the biology of 049 were that it didn't require any sustenance at all, not even water. It seemed content to be left alone with its notebooks. It did not object when it was asked if it could share some of its notes and gladly handed over its journals. But upon examination, it was discovered that they were written in the language that no linguist or cryptologist has so far been able to translate. It's apparent that 049 derives much satisfaction from seeing so-called experts struggle over its text. Unable to read those notes, a long line of doctors visited 049 in its cell, each fascinated by what they beheld. It was learned that it has traveled the globe. It speaks many languages, but prefers to speak what it calls les langues de l'amour, French. It asked for only one thing, warm-blooded animals. The facility agreed to supply 049 with various kinds, including rabbits, cattle, and even an ape on one occasion. Just like with humans, it could kill the animals with a mere touch of its hand, sucking the life right out of them. But that wasn't even the most incredible part. Soon those animals would rise again, as if reanimated by 049. They would become, for all intents and purposes, the living dead. And they were hostile. After several unfortunate incidents, they were taken from the cell the moment they arose and disposed of in the incinerator. This was not to the liking of 049, who would claim it had cured the animals. For it, the world was sick. It saw plague and pestilence everywhere, and the meaning of its existence was to rid the world of disease. Humans, it said, contained a virus and had to be cleansed. In the first days after arriving at the facility, 049 didn't seem to pose a threat to humans. It was quite friendly, in fact. It seemed aware of the fear it caused in staff and would often go out of its way to make them feel comfortable and safe. This was a ruse, of course, or a canard, as 049 liked to say. It had no intention to help humans. Hmm. No, it had come for humans. It wasn't trapped. It had set a trap. One of the first people to truly upset 049 was Dr. Raymond Hamm, a well-respected physician that had twice been a contender for the Nobel Prize for his more mainstream work. What had confused Dr. Hamm the most was not 049's clothes-like exoskeleton, or even his ability to reanimate the dead, but the bag that it used. 049 was somehow able to pull a seemingly endless supply of surgical tools from that bag. Sometimes it would even pull out objects that were somehow larger than the bag itself. It was as if the bag connected to somewhere else. And that's what Dr. Ham wanted to talk about on that fateful day. With 049 on one side of the cell and Dr. Ham on the other, he asked, how is it that you can produce a great quantity of tools from that bag? I've observed you, and it seems to me that you are doing the impossible. Dear doctor, replied 049, the scourge, the great dying, cannot be fought with a handful of toys. My bag is merely the product of my imagination. It gives me what I require. You, dear sir, it seems, are limited by your imagination. It stopped for a second or two and stared at Dr. Ham. I detect you are unwell, it said, in a voice not as amiable as before. It's just a cold, said the doctor. Ah, just a cold. If you had seen what I have seen, you would not utter such insulting words. Dr. Ham pulled out some papers from a briefcase and approached 049, holding them close enough so it could read them. You see, said Dr. Ham, pointing to the results on the paper. Those animals you say you cured, they were not diseased. They were perfectly healthy before they died. And your so-called cure, it turned them into something quite terrible. We found that if they were left alone, they began to eat each other, and then themselves. 049 did not respond, and after a brief pause said only, A good day to you, doctor. Please close the door on your way out. You should get some rest. Ham refused to go and instead turned the conversation to this real interest, the bag, demanding that 049 let him see inside of it. Very well, doctor, 049 said, in private. 049 began to pull a series of long metal poles out of its bag, followed by a rolled up curtain that it hung between them, creating a kind of medical tent around Dr. Ham. It seemed to stare for just a moment into the observation camera outside of itself before whipping the curtain shut. Dr. Ham was discovered three hours later, crawling around the floor of 049's cell, now another mindless undead. When he was retrieved by security, 049 didn't even look up from his notebook. Dr. Ham didn't get the incinerator treatment, but he did receive a fatal dose of drugs, a mercy. A removal team was sent to 049's cell, but it had said there was no need for special extraction techniques. 
It would go willingly wherever they wanted to go. It was not, it said, an enemy of the people. The Hippocratic Oath forbids me to hurt a human being, it said while walking to the interrogation center. My only desire is to offer you my services and expertise. The floors and walls of the interrogation center room were painted a bright white. Even the table was white which contrasted with 049, a mass of black sitting in the middle of the room. During the interrogation, it refused to admit or even accept that it had killed Dr. Ham. I cured him. I removed the pestilence from his body, it said. It was later asked if it regretted its actions, to which it replied, Well, good sir, one always regrets the loss of a colleague for any reason, but I stand by my actions. The pestilence must be abated before it is too late. Every two weeks from that point, 049 was given animals. The scientists at the facility observed it time and again, touching the animals, killing them, before producing a saw or a scalpel and opening them up. Organs would be carefully removed with perfect precision. It was astounding to even train surgeons just how talented 049 was. I require a close relative of yours, said 049 one day to a young doctor, who expressed shock that it was asked for one of the doctor's family members. I mean a great aid said 049, not your dear aunt. There were several instances of 049 displaying a crude sense of humor. Staff would almost forget that the thing that they were talking to wasn't human, almost. And it was Dr. Thomas Morstead that had supplied the great apes, orangutans in fact, that had been rescued from the rainforests of Borneo, only to be taken to 049 South. Then one day something changed. 049 told Dr. Morstead that its work was done, that it accomplished what it had wanted to do, and could someone remove the cured animal from its cell? I think you'd find that it's quite the work of art. A triumph, 049 said through the intercom. When the removal team entered the cell, they found the orangutan, or what was left of it. It was lying in the corner of the cell. The top of its skull had been removed, leaving its brain exposed. On its face was the expression of relaxation, and from its mouth it issued very soft squeaks, like that of an infant. 049 said, Tell Dr. Morstead that its rage mechanism no longer exists. I've removed the amygdala and made some changes to the hypothalamus and limbic system. It is cured and quite harmless. The next day, Dr. Morstead announced that he wanted to visit 049's cell himself, after which he heard a chorus of disapproval from his colleagues, all telling him that 049 was now too dangerous. Dr. Ham was sick replied Morstead, and 049 has assured us that he would never take another human life. He's never lied to us, and we're going to take him at his word. It appeared that 049 had created the perfect specimen, so what was next? Dr. Morstead had to know. Everyone is sick, 049 told Dr. Morstead after the two had talked for a couple of minutes. The great pandemic has started. Fear not, doctor. I have a cure. No longer will you humans spread your disease. I'm afraid you are wrong, replied the doctor. This pandemic you speak of does not exist. We can happily live with our pathogens. We have done so for millennia. Dr. Morstead became angry that he couldn't get through to 049. I'm afraid you are suffering from paranoia. It is you who need to be cured. You have no idea, said 049, standing up. What are you doing? shouted Morstead. You promised you wouldn't hurt a human again. I'm not hurting you. I'm healing you. 049 said and leapt across the room in a flash, placing a hand on the doctor's head. Morstead slumped to the ground. They were being watched in the observation room, and this had gone too far. He had to be moved to the containment cells, permanently. Mobile Task Force Epsilon 11 was right on the scene and burst through the door. No imagination, 049 said to himself. Those humans have no imagination at all. He began walking towards the task force, who opened fire on the anomaly but the bullets bounced off its black coat and mask. SCP-049 calmly touched each of the members of the task force, one by one, draining the life from them. The last one standing stopped firing and attempted to run, but again 049 leapt across the room, black cape billowing out behind him, and gently touched the man causing him to drop to the floor. 049 stepped over the bodies of the fallen team and walked out of the containment cell. The full details of what happened next are available only to the O5 Council, what are sometimes called the Overseers. The redacted report that is available reads, Standard Secure Humanoid Containment Cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19, Subject, SCP-049, Date of Breach, Redacted, 
Euclid class SCP-049 breached cell and subsequently gained access to adjoining rooms and nearby buildings. Breach lasted approximately three days and five hours. Total casualties? Redacted, with redacted number of survivors requiring incineration therapy. Course of action. Department of Science Alchemy Division suggested injecting anti-transmogrify disinfectant into Class D former prisoners who were transported to site and allowed them to come into contact with SCP-049. SCP failed to reanimate injected prisoners and cure them. SCP-049 acknowledged this failure and surrendered to Mobile Task Force Alpha-1. SCP-049 then requested to be contained. Present containment under responsibility of Redacted, Redacted. Present location of SCP-049, Redacted. End of report. We were a team. Despite our differences, in spite of the terrible things they've done, we were still a team. That's not how the higher up saw it, though. No. The guys upstairs with their perfectly pressed shirts. For them, we were judged by our level of expendability, and they knew that our next mission was a death sentence. One by one, that thing took out my team, my friends. Snapping their necks so quickly and with such ease that no sooner did I hear the scream, they were dead. We had been used. I'd been used. Delivered as prey to the Predator. A plot that was sanctioned by the bosses and approved with a blood-red stamp. Why did they do it? I'm still trying to figure that out. Maybe that's something you can tell me after you hear how these so-called scientific men left us in the cell. And in the hands of SCP-173. For me, it had been the best of times before it became the worst of times. The best, because I'd quickly risen through the ranks of the facility. The worst, because, well, I'll get to that. I was never the best student. I finished high school by the skin of my teeth, and my job prospects looked bleak. But I was lucky, I guess. Or at least I thought so at the time. You see, I have an uncle Siegfried who did some work for the government. I never actually knew what he did, just that it was secretive work. I used to imagine he was some sort of super spy, so you can imagine how excited I was when he found out I needed a job and he offered to help me out. I couldn't believe it. I always thought he hated me. I'd overheard him telling my parents that I was a no-good deadbeat, but now he'd had a change of heart and was willing to take me under his wing. What would I get to do? Undercover intelligence gathering? International assassinations? Just you wait, he said. And that's how I found myself walking into a sprawling, futuristic-looking facility where they handed me a level one security clearance card with big, bold letters that read, Janitor. But I was happy. Just the word security clearance made me feel important, and it beat flipping burgers. I pushed mops, turned off lights, fired up generators, clocked in, and clocked out. But all that time, they must have been watching me, grooming me, waiting for the day they could throw me to the wolves. I should have known. I've always been an expendable kind of guy. After a few years, I was called to an office, and there was a man in a plaid shirt and kind of a tweed jacket that professors wear. He asked me, do you have any idea about what we actually do here? And to be honest, I didn't. I knew that there were many parts of the facility I couldn't enter. I imagined that down a maze of corridors were weapons being built, or prisoners being interrogated. But I had no idea about the anomalies. How could I? Before I was told anything, I had to sign a bunch of forms. There were so many I thought I'd get to find out who really killed JFK. And while they didn't come out and say it, what I inferred was that if I ever talk about what happens at the facility to someone outside the facility, well, let's just say it's not the kind of thing they'd spell out on a piece of paper, but it involves padded cells and rusty tools. I wasn't scared though. I was part of something big, something secret, and I loved it. So I signed my life away with no hesitation. Soon after, I was introduced to my first anomaly, the safe class, of course. They took me to an observation room, and from that room I could see into another room, with a sign on the wall that read SCP-067. I just stood there, waiting for something to happen, when in walked another guy in a white lab coat. Welcome to your first anomaly, he said. Is it okay if I hook you up to this heart monitor? We want to gauge your reaction to what you see. All I can see, I told him, is an empty room with a table and what looks like a pen on top of some papers. Correct, he said, half smiling, as if I was some kind of idiot. That's SCP-067. 
I thought about telling him that if I needed years of training before I could see a pen, that I probably should have taken that fast food job. Could have been a shift manager by now. Then they brought a young chimpanzee into the room, small enough to be harmless. One of the guys forced a pen into the scared chimp's hand and something strange happened. It started scribbling. Nonsense at first, but suddenly it was sketching and drawing faster and faster. I could catch glimpses of words and images. By the time they dragged it out, it was flailing around like it was possessed. That pen has power, said the man in the lab coat. A power whose source or origin we don't fully understand. That's why we're here. That's why you are here. One of the guys in the other room held the chimps drawing up to the window. It was a perfect sketch of the Tower of London, intricate and brilliant. Above the sketch was the title, Tower of London, Tudor Period, circa 1541. The year Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury, lost her head on the chopping block. Underneath that, the chimp had written, Pity, she was no traitor. Take it from me, I was there. They didn't need to look at the heart rate monitor to see that I was shocked. That was far from the only anomaly I'd come into contact with, and I must have been doing something right, because in time I went from level 1 to 2 to level 3 security clearance, and that's when they made me a containment specialist. I won't bore you with all the details, but as you can guess, I dealt with the containment of anomalies. A lot of my time was spent looking through small windows and cell doors, making sure that whatever was inside was still inside and still in one piece. Other times I worked with field agents when anomalies were brought in, a transition period that the arrested freaks didn't much like. There was one certain anomaly, though, that I was tasked to oversee on many occasions. I like to think of it as my pet, but in hindsight, I was its pet. This was SCP-173, something that was in what we call the Euclid class, a classification meaning that we don't fully understand it, but know it is very dangerous. We know it's intelligent, we know it's unpredictable, and we know it will kill. And for that reason, there's people tasked with containing it and keeping an eye on it at all times. At first glance, you wouldn't guess just how dangerous 173 is. You wouldn't think it's incredibly intelligent. In fact, you'd think the opposite. That's because it's more or less a walking slab of concrete and rebar with stunted limbs and traces of spray paint that give the impression of a dopey face. We have to enter its cell twice a week for cleaning duties. It leaves a disgusting, foul-smelling liquid on the floor, a reddish-brown substance that I can only describe as a mix of blood and waste products. Where that stuff comes from has remained a mystery since we first contained it in 1993. Going into the cell was always a three-man job, because, and this is maybe the weirdest part about 173, it can't move if human eyes are watching it. That's why you need at least two people watching it at all times. If you were in the room watching 173 by yourself and blinked, you'd be dead before your eyes opened. We don't know how it moves that fast, but in that fraction of a second, your neck is snapped so hard it's almost like being decapitated. I've seen the videos to prove it. All it took was a sneeze. He wasn't even finished getting the rest of the achu out when there was a flash and his partner was left lying on the ground. His head twisted around the wrong direction. So, you can understand why we now require three men for any time we must enter 173's cell. Then, a few months ago, I was told that a long process would begin to train and re-educate some future Class Ds. Class Ds are mostly prisoners with lifelong sentences, or those we've taken from death row and given a new lease on life. We were apparently understaffed, so why not employ these men whose lives had pretty much ended anyway? That was the rationale, or at least that's what they told me. I was told to train them on their new job mopping up 173's mess, so that me and the rest of the containment specialists could focus on more important tasks. They hadn't been through the training I had, seen what I had seen, but after showing them the video of 173 nearly taking off a man's head, they were more than willing to follow the rules. They understood not to blink or turn away or sneeze, and that any lapse in focus could lead to a violent death. So I started to show them the ropes, how we move as a team into the cell and always keep the others informed on what we're doing. 173 was always sitting in the corner of a cell, no expression on that crude face. But when we walked in its cell, I got the feeling it knew something had changed. I felt almost as if it was communicating with me, but I couldn't tell what it was trying to say. And then it happened. It was a Tuesday afternoon, three days from the last time we'd cleaned. As usual, 173 had covered the floor with that horrible liquid. We headed in to clean, my new team alert as always, and some of them cleaned while others kept their eyes focused on the thing in the corner. 
Things were going smoothly when we heard a noise I knew very well. It was the sound of the cell door locking. Someone must have screwed up. Hey guys, we're locked in here. I shot it through the intercom. Nothing. Guys, the damn door is locked. Nothing. I lost it a bit. Open the door, will you? Nothing. My team looked at me. The ones not on eye contact duty, that is. As if I should know what to do. Hoping that this had happened before and that there was some kind of standard plan to deal with it. There wasn't. We were always observed when in the room, and I knew that a technician couldn't accidentally lock the door. It was impossible. There were protocols. Someone had done this on purpose. The four of us sat in the corner of the room as far from 173 as possible. Our eyes locked on it. It didn't move an inch as usual. Just stood, staring at the wall as it always did. We stayed awake through the night, talking a little, holding on to the slim hope that something had gone wrong. But as night turned to day again, we all began to lose hope. We weren't sent here to clean. We were a test. Totally expendable. Lab rats. But I wouldn't go down without a fight. We couldn't just stay up forever. That was a death sentence. I suggested that two of us stand, one sit and rest, and one get some sleep. We'd take shifts. A couple hours on, a couple hours off. Maybe we could show that we wouldn't give up. They'd have time to realize what they were doing was insane, call off the test, and come free us. We made it through a couple of shifts like this, and it seemed like we'd actually be able to make it another day or two when everything went wrong. It was my turn to sit and rest when I heard the worst possible noise. Snoring. The con next to me was sleeping quietly, so it must be one of the standers. I glanced over for just a split second and saw both of them, leaning against the cell wall dozing. At the same time, I saw the flash. Crack, snap, pop. One after another, their necks were snapped. I'm not sure how it happened, but I was standing again, staring at 173, who was now in the corner, dead bodies with their heads twisted around, piled up in front of it. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't stare at this thing forever. I felt myself giving up. I lowered my head to the ground, and then finally broke my gaze, ready to die. And then, nothing happened. I slowly raised my head back up, and there it was, its hideous face inches away from mine. It was then that I understood what we'd been containing, what we'd underestimated. I felt it again, like it was telling me something. It was telling me to close my eyes, to sleep. So I did. But as my eyes closed, I didn't see darkness. I saw 173, or something like it, but not in the cell. I saw it outside, in the world, standing over children sleeping in their beds, watching. I saw them hiding in the shadows, staring out at passers-by. Then I realized they weren't watching, waiting to pounce. No, they were hiding. My eyes popped open as the door opened and in rushed six security personnel. They took me outside, jabbed my leg with a syringe, injecting me with something as the world faded away. Incident report. Time and date redacted. Following the experimental forced interaction with Euclid class anomaly SCP-173, subject has ceased responding to external stimuli and appears to have taken on the traits and behaviors of the anomaly. Subject now spends entire days sitting in corner of cell staring at the wall. Staff are advised to proceed with caution when dealing with subject, as the only behavior they engage in is an attempt to strangle anyone who enters the cell. No treatments have shown any effectiveness, and subject will unfortunately require incarceration, likely forever. Almost all cross-testing to kill or pacify SCP-682 had failed miserably. If you haven't seen it, go watch our video on the legendary hard-to-kill reptile to see just how powerful and terrifying this creature is. It faced the Gate Guardian, an SCP with a flaming sword hotter than the sun, capable of tearing your atoms to shreds, and came out fine. In its face-off with the horrifying SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy, it broke the Shy Guy's mind and reduced it to gibbering despair. Even SCPs with supposedly unlimited powers simply refused to engage the beast in combat. So, when it was proposed that they test 682 with SCP-999, a creature known among Foundation staff as the Tickle Monster, the idea was considered laughable. 682 had been burned, suffocated, cut up, incinerated, and growled in the faces of the gods. 
How could this so-called tickle monster ever hope to survive an encounter, let alone win a fight? Some even believe that this was the last we'd see of SCP-999. But what makes this story truly remarkable is that that isn't how this played out. As you'll soon discover, SCP-999 is an amazing and unique SCP oh. in and of itself. But its secret origins and its interactions with some other prominent figures in the SCP universe are what make this humble, slimy creature beyond extraordinary. Prepare yourself for the heartwarming, yes, you heard that right, the heartwarming story of SCP-999. Several highly trained agents on 682 detail place 999 into the immortal lizard cell. Compared to the giant reptilian sitting across from it, 999 wasn't much to look at. It's a large orange amorphous blob of anomalous slime. Weighing in at around 120 pounds, SCP-999 was nothing compared to the monstrosity it was supposed to face. While its weight has in the past caused minor injuries to some of its human handlers, it has never caused serious or long-lasting damage of any kind to a living thing. Even its diet consists only of candy and sweets, with a particular preference for M&Ms and Necco wafers. It consumes these treats through the cell membrane of its slimy body, much like an amoeba. This extremely stretchy membrane means the creature is highly malleable, including the ability to stretch and flatten itself out to a mere 2 centimeters thick. At rest, the creature takes a dome-like shape around 2 meters wide and 1 meter in height. The closest things the creature has to limbs are prehensile pseudopods. Those are the arm-like projections normally seen on single-celled organisms, of which it has at least three. The more you hear about this utterly harmless creature, the more that matching it up with the pure embodiment of absolute hatred known as SCP-682 feels downright cruel. In absolute contrast to the misanthropic attitudes of the reptile, 999 loves humans. It has a playful dog-like attitude, much like an overexcited puppy when approached, 999 will react with extreme joy and slither towards the nearest person in order to interact. It will leap onto them, using two of its three prehensile pseudopods to hug the person, while the third nuzzles the person's face, emitting high-pitched cooing and gurgling noises throughout. The creature is apparently pleasant in every conceivable fashion, as even its odor has been reported to smell just like the favorite scent of whoever is smelling it. Examples have included chocolate, fresh laundry, bacon, roses, and Play-Doh. It's almost impossible to oversell just how beloved and benevolent this strange creature is. It's one of the rare sapient SCPs to earn the safe class, and it's allowed to roam freely around its facility at all times, apart from a one-hour bedtime period between 8 and 9 p.m. In the rare instances that 999 has caused harm to a worker at the facility, it immediately began to back away and contract its body while whimpering in a kind of dog-like apology. The closest the Foundation has ever come to having a real incident with the creature was the time someone accidentally fed it a can of caffeinated cola, causing it to become hyper for an hour before becoming visibly queasy. You'll be relieved to know that it's since made a full recovery. But what would happen when this whimsical creature is forced to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Foundation's most ill-tempered monster? The employees observing the test watched in suspense as 999 began to enthusiastically slither towards 682. It's no surprise that after being tortured and almost killed hundreds of times during testing, 682 had grown jaded to the cross-tests it was regularly subjected to. When it saw this strange orange blob squelching across the ground towards it, it sighed and groaned, expecting the worst. What is that? The creature asked of its gelatinous guest. SCP-999 began jumping up and down in front of 682 like an excited puppy, creating a high-pitched squealing noise. Just as it regarded all living things, 682 thought the creature bouncing around before it was disgusting and hardly worth the effort to destroy. Was the Foundation even trying anymore? With a single vicious stomp, 682 flattened the friendly creature beneath one of its feet. Observers were prepared to charge in and liberate 999 from under 682's claws. But then something truly unexpected happened. The expression on 682's acid-eaten face began to slowly change. It was beginning to smile. Observers recorded a noise what they thought could have been a chuckle, as the creature growled and said, Hmm, what is this? I feel... good. While the observers looked on, stunned at what was happening, 999 began to slither and crawl up from between 682's toes. It reformed on its scaly leg and slithered up along its side until it reached the neck. There, it began to nuzzle like it had never nuzzled before. The results spoke for themselves. 682 was grinning and chuckling, repeating a phrase that the Foundation never would have imagined coming from 682. 
feel so happy. 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 Just when you thought SCP-999 couldn't possibly be more adorable, you learn about its greatest power, bringing joy. Anyone and anything that comes into contact with the creature, even in passing, will experience a kind of mild euphoria. As one's contact with the creature is prolonged, this overwhelming sense of joy increases and continues long after you've separated from it. Prolonged contact has completely cured depression, anxiety, and PTSD, along with a number of other conditions, including rage and antisocial personality disorders. Serial killers practically become saints after coming into prolonged contact with 999, and in that moment, 682 was no exception. And there truly does not appear to be no exceptions. While causing happiness and joy isn't a dangerous weapon, when it comes to SCP-999, it is an extremely powerful one. And what's more, SCP-999 also appears to have an innate sense for those who need its help most, with a particular affection for the hurt and the unhappy. The creature appears to be a true altruist on a fundamental level, even risking its own safety to help humans during dangerous containment breaches. In one dramatic instance, 999 leaped into the air to block a bullet from making contact with a member of staff. As a result, the creature is pretty much universally loved by all members of Foundation staff. It's the one SCP who has never made trouble for anyone. Back in SCP-682's containment cell, the beast was still smiling and laughing as 999 rubbed against its neck. It was an event so strange, so unprecedented, that the observers in attendance felt like they were hallucinating. For a few minutes, the monster kept dreamily repeating the word, happy. But then, suddenly, the creature began to enter a fit of uncontrollable, booming laughter. It rolled onto its back, slamming its huge tail against the door. It had just fallen victim to one of 999's favorite pastimes, tickle fights. Hence how it earned its Tickle Monster nickname among staff. The tickle fight continued until 682 appeared to tire and fall asleep, with a smile still on its face. After 15 minutes of inactivity, two D-Class personnel were commanded to enter and retrieve SCP-999 from the containment cell. They did so successfully, but as soon as 999 was removed, 682 roused from its slumber and released a powerful psychic attack from its entire body while laughing maniacally. It rendered all personnel within a certain distance incapacitated as they collapsed in fits of laughter, allowing 682 to escape and go on a violent rampage. However, in spite of this, 999 showed no fear and helped save some of the bystanders as security officers subdued and recaptured 682. And even after all of this, 999 showed no hard feelings towards 682 and indicated a desire to play again. It's a creature whose capacity for love is so limitless that it's practically immune to fear. Which is all well and good, because the true enemy that 999 is destined to face is infinitely more powerful and terrifying than 682 could ever hope to be. What is this monster, and why should 999 have to face it someday? The answers to these questions all lie in the true origins of SCP-999, available only to those with level 5 clearance and beyond. It's a perfect example of how something good can come from the darkest places. There would be no SCP-999 without SCP-231-7. SCP-231 was a collection of seven girls, all impregnated by horrific nightmares in a ritual performed by a cult known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these girls, over the years that followed, gave birth to some of the most horrific monsters imaginable. One of which, according to some, was SCP-682. These beings were manifested by the Scarlet King, a powerful interdimensional nightmare god believed to be behind a great deal of the darkness and horror present within our and many other dimensions. Foundation higher-ups have declared the Scarlet King to be the greatest existing threat to the multiverse at large, and SCP-231 was his latest direct interaction with our universe. The only surviving member of SCP-231, SCP-231-7, gave birth in secret. But she didn't give birth to a monster, she gave birth to SCP-999, a being of pure goodness. That's right, the nicest, kindest, cuddliest SCP of all is the direct descendant of a being that's essentially the dark god of all evil. Feel free to take a moment to absorb that. The creature even healed the girl who birthed it, and allowed her to return to normal life with her family once more. From its first moments, SCP-999 was making positive changes to the world around it, 
and according to ancient texts from a Scarlet King aligned culture known as the Deivas, SCP-999 is still very much in its infancy, yet it already has the power to pacify its monstrous siblings like the aforementioned 682. It's believed, according to some prophecies and Foundation theories, that the power of SCP-999 will grow exponentially as it matures. Why does this matter? Well, it's believed by some that one day, 999 will grow powerful enough to overthrow not only its own monstrous siblings, but the thought-to-be unstoppable Scarlet King himself. Not through violence or hate, but through the pure force of happiness and love burning out the darkness and purifying the corrupted. While the humble SCP-999 rarely outshines its frightening competitors, to those truly in the know, 999 is one of the most powerful and valuable SCPs in existence, and may be the greatest asset in the Foundation's arsenal for the war against dangerous anomalous activity. After all, what could strike more fear into their hearts than the knowledge that it might be love rather than firepower that finally dethrones the Scarlet King? and for the knowledge that it may one day save everything we know from a fate so much worse than death, with nothing but affection for everyone and everything, it's worth offering thanks to the little orange blob, or at least an extra pack of M&Ms before bedtime. This is impossible! The SCP site director wasn't normally a calm or cheerful man, but the researcher had rarely seen him as angry as he was right now. His face turned a deep beet red as he scanned the documents on his desk before he asked how months of valuable research on this subject had suddenly gone blank. The data was completely gone. The researcher gulped nervously, hoping a demotion wasn't in his future, and nodded. How could this be possible? This was an experienced researcher who should have been taking all of the necessary precautions. Could the being they were studying somehow have erased all these documents himself? That's just what the researcher had been trying to find out for months, with hours and hours spent trying to learn the extent of its abilities. Well, where are they? The site director asked. I want everything you have! The researcher dropped a printout of their research on the mysterious subject's abilities on the director's desk. Every relevant line read, Data Lost. The director let out a deep sigh. He wanted to hear everything the researcher knew, well, everything he could remember, at least, from the beginning. The researcher sat down and began to relay everything he could about SCP-343, which some of the other researchers had started to refer to by the nickname, God. SCP-343 was first sighted in Prague, just an unassuming older man wandering the streets. He seemed completely normal to everyone who passed him by, until he decided he was tired of staying on the ground. An SCP agent stationed in the area noticed the old man disappear from the streets, as if he was blinking out of existence, only to appear on a rooftop nearby. The local SCP teams were marshaled, and they had soon tracked down what seemed to be a very powerful specimen. But SCP-343 didn't seem concerned. He reacted calmly when detained by the Foundation and went with them willingly. He was detained in a standard holding cell for interrogation and examination, but he seemed completely at ease with his sudden confinement. It would soon become clear that this ordinary old man was anything but. Doctors Beck and Nidlovu was brought in to consult on the SCP's classification, and that's when the first anomalies began. Their assessments matched initially, but when it came time to describe him physically, things took a strange turn. Older male, seemingly nondescript and with no unusual physical features. Caucasian in appearance. Dr. Nidlovu was confused by what Dr. Beck was describing in his report. This man was clearly black. The two doctors quarreled, unable to square their differing perceptions. They decided to bring in a third impartial view to settle it, their fellow researcher Dr. Wan. She didn't take long before coming back with her assessment. Older male, seemingly nondescript and with no unusual physical features, Asian in appearance, possibly Chinese. Whatever SCP-343 was, he seemed to be perceived by each staff member as close in appearance to their own race. But that was only the start of the anomalies surrounding the old man in the holding cell. Dr. Beck started making regular visits to the mysterious man, and in their first interview, he asked the old man who he was and how he came by his abilities. The old man had a simple response. I created the universe. Dr. Beck stifled a laugh and decided to indulge the old man's delusion. It was a fascinating claim, but could he prove it? Without another word, 
SCP-343 got up from his chair, laugh, and turned around and walked through the solid wall in the holding cell and disappeared. Dr. Beck was about to hit the panic button and marshal the facility's security to find him when the strange man reappeared, walking through the solid wall. The only thing that was different? He was holding a hamburger, which he sat down and enjoyed. The facility quickly went on lockdown, and a full investigation was done into how SCP-343 breached containment. But there was no evidence of any security breach, no failures in containment, and no evidence of any other cells failing. SCP-343 hadn't broken through the security, he had just ignored it, as if it wasn't there at all. When questioned about how he had gone on his hamburger run, he simply repeated his belief that he was God, in between bites of his fast food treat. This would be far from the only time strange things happened around SCP-343. SCP containment cells are as secure as they need to be, but even the least strict containment isn't known for its decor. Which is why Dr. Beck was in for a surprise the next time he paid visit to SCP-343. The bare-bones cell now looked like a comfortable home, decorated in old English fashions. The scientists assumed that SCP-343 had been making many more trips out of his cell to get accessories to feel more at home. But that didn't explain all the changes to the cell. No one could explain how he had installed a roaring fireplace in the containment cell, and everyone who entered could swear the cell looked many times bigger than any other cell in the facility. SCP-343 wasn't just breaking containment, he now seemed to be breaking the laws of physics in the facility. The rules of the SCP containment facility didn't seem to be a concern to SCP-343, but there was one thing he didn't seem to want to do, escape. After every sudden exit, he would always return to his personal cell and treat it as his home. When interviewed by staff members, he was polite but vague, and everyone seemed to enjoy talking to him. It was decided to keep him on site, not attempt to increase his security, but restrict access and keep his room guarded at all times to ensure only researchers with level 3 access and above were allowed to meet with him. But God works in mysterious ways. Minimal Security Site 17 was one of the least restrictive SCP containment sites, hosting anomalies that could be safely contained and weren't likely to mount violent escapes. But as in every SCP facility, security was still taken seriously and only those with proper clearance could interact with the subjects. So why did SCP-343 seem impossible to guard? While only level 3 clearance and above were allowed in, the guards assigned to protect the entrance all seemed to fall down on the job. Security Officer James, who was supposed to be keeping people out of SCP-343's cell, had instead let in multiple visitors, in addition to dropping in several times himself. When questioned on why he had gone against orders and done so, he simply replied that 343 seemed lonely and was so happy every time he got company that it just seemed like the right thing to do. The security guard was reassigned and new ones were brought in, but history repeated itself. Guards were given stricter instructions to minimize exposure, but SCP-343's presence always seemed to influence them anyway. His containment cell was a revolving door, with staff members at the facility entering regularly for friendly conversations. Dr. Beck decided it was time to take matters into his own hands. He would meet with SCP-343 one-on-one and express how dangerous these security breaches were. He would try to convince the mysterious being that he needed to stop influencing the minds of the guards watching him, or the facility would have to look into new measures to contain him. Dr. Beck entered the containment cell and had a long conversation with SCP-343, and when he emerged, he had a big smile on his face like he had just finished a reunion with an old friend. He gave the current guard a friendly clap on the back and told him not to worry so much about security. After all, nothing bad was going to happen from letting people at the facility visit SCP-343, right? He wasn't dangerous in any way. He also said that security should bring him anything he requests so he would feel less need to leave his cell. Minimal Security Site-17 soon became a model SCP facility with morale being the highest of any site, with most giving the credit to the presence of SCP-343. Employees generally make daily visits to his chamber, and he seems to have an encyclopedic knowledge of anything they want to talk about, including things he should have no way of knowing. 
Guards no longer quit their posts or break protocol, as their only real duty is to keep track of who meets with SCP-343 so they can be interviewed and debriefed after. Everyone's conversation is different, but they all report being in a better mood after leaving than when they came in. No further information is available on SCP-343's origins, the full extent of his powers, or whether he is telling the truth about being the god who created the universe. The site director rubbed his temples after hearing the researcher's explanation. So what you're telling me is that we have an uncontained, highly powerful SCP that has not only been breaking containment whenever it wants, but has managed to destroy all the files regarding the research on it. The researcher's answer was yes. However, the situation at Site-17 seemed to be stable, and they had come up with a plan that should help to maximize the positive effect SCP-343 has on the facility. They were even hypothesizing that staff from other sites and even certain anomalies could be pacified by 343's presence. The site director wasn't impressed, though. He wanted the researcher to go back to the drawing board and redo the research. After all, if all the files were blank, how could they ever learn how to properly contain it? That's what the C and SCP stood for, after all. Containment. The researcher finally had to stand to the director, though, and told them that it wasn't a good idea that they had already tried everything to contain SCP-343, but that it wasn't that he broke containment. It was as if he didn't even acknowledge that an attempt had been made to contain him. He was omnipotent, aware of things he shouldn't, and able to do things that broke the laws of physics without breaking a sweat. There was no evidence that this was God, the creator of the universe as he claimed to be, but there also wasn't any evidence yet to conclusively prove he wasn't. The researcher's best guess was that this was a powerful reality bender whose abilities knew no limits, and that the only reason he was staying in the facility was because he wanted to, and doing anything to change that might cause him to change his benevolent ways. The director sighed. As much as he hated to admit it, his researcher was making good points. He wanted to meet SCP-343 personally, but did he need to know anything first? Well, sir, the researcher replied, he likes hamburgers, but beyond that, he'll take care of the rest. He's right there where we left him, in his home, waiting for his next guest. Now, for a less friendly old guy in SCP custody, check out SCP-106, The Old Man Escape. And for another ancient and uncontainable being, watch SCP-3000, Anatashisha. The SCP Foundation does their best to live up to their famous namesake. They secure and contain anomalies and monsters from all around the world or sometimes even off-world, and protect the public from the dangers that these strange entities might pose. However, despite their efforts to maintain security and keep their subjects under lock and key, there are sometimes creatures so clever, so devious, and so determined to escape their captivity and wreak havoc on the world, that even the SCP Foundation struggles to keep them from getting free. One example is SCP-035, or the Possessive Mask. SCP-035 is one of the most dangerous test subjects in SCP Foundation custody, and its mere presence at the Foundation has resulted in untold damage, death, and destruction. It seems innocent enough to the untrained eye. The mask, which resembles a classic white porcelain comedy mask, though it occasionally changes its expression to tragedy, has been in existence since at least the 1800s. In the late 19th century, the Foundation discovered the mask in a sealed crypt beneath an abandoned home in Venice. It is unknown how it got there, or how the Foundation knew to look for it. If there was ever an explanation for its discovery, it has long since been removed or redacted from the Foundation's archives. You're probably wondering, how can a simple mask leave multiple seasoned Foundation employees dead? Well, like everything at the SCP Foundation, this mask is not what it seems. There is a reason its classification is Keter, a designation that refers to an entity that's excessively difficult to contain, and it couples this difficulty with a pronounced hostility towards human life, and the ability to cause widespread destruction in the event of a containment breach. These are the qualities that the poor unfortunate souls assigned to guard SCP-035 would come to understand all too well. The possessive mask is a parasitic entity, constantly seeking out a host willing to put it on. Any human being in the mask's proximity experiences a sudden, unexplainable urge to put it on, and once they do, there's no going back. SCP Foundation research has determined that once a host has put on the mask, their brain waves are replaced with an alternative pattern, this one coming from the mask, rendering the host effectively brain dead. 
Once the host's brain function has been eliminated, the mask takes over, piloting their body and even speaking through them. However, the mask can only occupy a host for a small amount of time before the body begins to decay and decompose, eventually rotting away completely, leaving nothing but desiccated flesh and bones where there once was a person. SCP-035 is capable of possessing any humanoid being, whether that's an actual human being or a lifeless humanoid shape. Despite all their research, the SCP Foundation unknowingly gave the mask all the tools and resources it needed to break containment and leave a trail of bodies in its wake. For a time, the mask was given host privileges, meaning that it was purposely allowed to occupy a host in order to speak with the scientists studying it. In order to avoid murky ethical issues, the host was usually something inanimate like a mannequin or a statue. These conditions, however unsettling, allowed the researchers to carry out interviews with the consciousness housed inside the mask, in the hope of beginning to understand it and its motivations. However, SCP-035 lost all access to its host privileges after it almost pulled off an unprecedented, shocking, and nearly catastrophic escape attempt. In its early days at the facility, when it was still allowed host privileges, it was contained in a triple-locked room and monitored by several research wow. personnel. These were experienced researchers who had been with the Foundation for a minimum of five years each, an unusually long tenure in such a dangerous and mentally corrosive line of work. These research staff members were thought to be the most capable of handling interactions with the mask and be able to resist its attempts at manipulation. Unfortunately, these assumptions were naive and seriously underestimated the mask's power. Research on the mask indicates that the mask is incredibly intelligent and a skilled manipulator. It has a photographic memory, intelligence that would rank it in the 99th percentile of humans, and the ability to incite dramatic changes in the behavior and people that it talks to. One particularly infamous interview between the entity and an unnamed doctor at the Foundation suggested that the mask may even possess telepathic abilities. The mask was able to give details about the doctor's life that no one else was privy to, including knowledge of an affair that his wife was having. Following the interview, the doctor suffered a psychotic break and committed suicide just 24 hours later. The mask is able to use its superior intelligence, charismatic personality, and mind-reading abilities to get inside the heads of those it speaks with. It will pull out any and all psychological stops to get what it wants, leaving broken minds and spirits in its wake. It was really only a matter of time before it used this skill set to its advantage and attempted to escape its confinement. The day of the escape attempt was like any other. The research staff, a team of three intelligent, experienced men, checked into the facility, measured the conditions of the mask's containment unit, and began the process of interviewing the mask like normal. Its motions were slow and looked to require great effort, as its current host was beginning to degrade beyond use. The mask was attached to the blank face of a mannequin, and corrosive black liquid could be seen oozing from its eye and mouth holes. This liquid is excreted by the mask at a near constant rate, and it's thought to be at least partially responsible for the accelerated decay of the host bodies. In spite of the entity's unsettling, nightmarish appearance, it was just another day's work for the men assigned to monitor SCP-035. And so they carried on with their daily routine. Everything was going according to plan until one of the men, Dr. Jones, began to behave erratically. He demanded that his fellow scientists leave him alone with the mask for a while and allow him to engage in a private conversation with it. It is unknown what exactly the two spoke about while the other two scientists were absent, as the security footage mm. captured had no sound. However, several minutes into the conversation in the footage, Dr. Jones can be seen dissolving into a fit of tears, laying on the ground and shaking with sobs as the mask dispassionately watches. He then climbs onto his knees, begging the mask for something, before he embraces it. He holds the mannequin in his arms for five straight minutes, weeping again before they separate. After this disturbing emotional display, Dr. Jones brought the other scientists back into the room with him. What happened next is still uncertain, but there are a few things that we know for sure. The other scientists began to speak with the mask. In later interviews, the other scientists were bordering on incoherent babbling about various traumas from their lives. One repeatedly referred to a drunk driving accident where a dear friend was killed and he was at fault. Another simply cried out for his mother again and again. Whatever the mask said to them, it was enough to completely destroy their mental health. After the two scientists had been emotionally devastated by the mask, Dr. Jones escalated the situation further. 
Dr. Jones removed the mask from the decaying mannequin body and shocking everyone who had later reviewed the security footage, placed it onto his own face. Once the mask was in place, the security footage ends. At the command of the mask, which was now speaking through Dr. Jones, the other two men switched off all security camera monitoring SCP-035's containment facility. The mask, piloting the body of Dr. Jones like a horrible fleshy puppet, made its way through the facility, avoiding detection until it reached the exit doors, where it was finally stopped by a team of over a dozen security guards. Knowing the dangers of touching the mask, all Foundation employees involved in the recontainment of SCP-035 refused to remove it from Dr. Jones' face. Instead, he was placed in the lock room with the mask still on, left alone to be observed over the security cameras until his body had decomposed beyond use. His body paced back and forth in the cell for days, flesh rotting and dropping away only until sinew and bone remained. Only when the bones began to turn black and brittle, crumbling apart into dust, did the body finally stop moving. His family was notified, the mask was carefully removed from what was left of his body, and his remains were destroyed. The other two scientists involved in the SCP-035 escape attempt were terminated and their files destroyed. After this incident, a few more failed escape attempts and the acknowledgement of the devastation that could have been caused if the mask had made its way out into the general population, SCP-035 lost its host privileges altogether. Several research staff protested this decision, insisting that there was more to be learned from speaking with the entity, and citing valuable information that it had given about other SCPs. However, the risk was determined to considerably outweigh the potential reward, and the request to reinstate 035's host privileges were denied. Several staff members went so far as to erupt into violent outbursts on 035's behalf, attacking their supervisors who refused to provide the mask with a new host, clawing at them with animalistic rage. Any staff members that submitted a request to reinstate said privileges were considered a security threat and reassigned to a different SCP, or in some cases, terminated. Any staff member who had direct contact with SCP-035 was also terminated, in order to avoid the risk of any more staff-aided escape attempts. The mask is now kept in a hermetically sealed glass case, and there is a psychologist on call to provide assistance to anyone guarding it in case of adverse effects on their mental health from the mask's presence. Personnel that work around the mask, even in its current dormant state, experience frequent violent outbursts and a higher rate of suicide. Even without a host, the mask's corrosive effects have spread across its containment facility. The walls of the room have begun to secrete the same black liquid that emanates from the mask, which tests have revealed to be highly contaminated human blood that damages the structural integrity of the walls following prolonged contact. This blood has begun to form patterns on the walls, spelling out words and phrases in Italian, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, as well as depicting drawings of ritual sacrifice and mutilation. Staff members also report hearing unintelligible whispering and horrifying high-pitched laughter when in proximity to the mask. Further exposure to the mask results in migraines, hemorrhaging around the eyes, mouth, and nose, and an eventual psychotic brain. Between the corrosive substance appearing on the walls and the physical and psychological damage to employees, SCP-035 is becoming increasingly difficult to contain, and there are debates among staff as to whether the entity can, in fact, be contained at all. As soon as possible, SCP-035 will be moved into a new containment uh -huh. facility, and its previous cell will be isolated from the rest of the Foundation's property and destroyed for the safety of all involved. We can only hope that the new containment procedures are more effective than the last ones, and that this mask never makes its way into the world again. If it does, who knows how many lives it will claim. In the meantime, if you ever come across a strange mask and feel a nearly uncontrollable urge to put it on, ignore the whispered pleas to just try it. Ignore the echoing laughter and the sensation of something older and more powerful than you can imagine rummaging through your deepest, darkest secret thoughts. Turn around and run as fast as you can in the other direction. You'll be glad that you did. The SCP Foundation is no stranger to pure evil. Whether it's a reptile that wants to end all life, a sadistic old man with his own tortured dimension, or the personification of death itself lurking beyond a limestone cavern. But what if there was something even worse out there? The embodiment of chaos and cruelty, existing across multiple realities and dimensions. And what if it was coming? 
for us. This is the Scarlet King, believed by many to be the ultimate evil behind much of the trouble the Foundation has faced, and some even speculate that fighting him was the reason the Foundation was created in the first place. But what exactly is the Scarlet King? He's known by many names, almost always including some allusion to the color red, and then a reference to royalty or power. Harak, Kaharak, the Red Shah, the Crimson Khan, PTE-616 Mendez Ex Machina, the Laha Raja, and, of course, SCP-001, to name a few. And like many of the Foundation's mysterious enemies, stories about his true nature and origins abound and are often contradictory. According to the official SCP-001 files of Tufto's proposal, symbology of the Scarlet King has existed in multiple cultures throughout history, with the king often depicted the same way, as a huge, red, demonic figure often wearing a gold crown or other headdress indicating royalty. He shows up looking similarly within different cultures' mythologies. Despite existing at different points in history, or them not having the means to communicate with one another, a number of entities that the SCP Foundation is familiar with are believed to be somehow connected to the Scarlet King, including SCP-2317, a wooden door leading to the realm of a being known as the Devourer, who is expected to escape and cause an apocalyptic event in the next 30 years. But really, there is no way of knowing just how many SCPs are directly connected to the Scarlet King. Strangely, the Foundation's official file on the Scarlet King once designated his containment class as Keter, but that has since been downgraded to safe. According to the file, any attempt to change this designation is likely to lead to horrifying results. It is widely known that the Scarlet King still has considerable influence over a number of groups, individuals, and anomalies in our universe. And if ever he made his way into our universe, it would likely lead to the irreversible damage of reality itself. So then why save? And why are the O5 Council so adamant that it remained that way? Getting to the bottom of this mystery is exactly why we're here today. But to fully grasp the true nature of the Scarlet mm. King, we must first understand the man whose life and fate have always been tied to it, Dr. Robert Montauk. If that name feels oddly familiar to you, it's because of its association with one of the Scarlet King's most recent attempts to enter our reality, SCP-231. This SCP, often referred to as the Brides of the Scarlet King, was formed of seven women. Seven, by the way, being an extremely significant number for the King, all kidnapped by the most recent in a long line of the King's devoted cults known as the Children of the Scarlet King. Each of these seven unfortunate women were impregnated with anomalous horrors, such as the infamous SCP-682, and every time one of these horrors were birthed, a catastrophe occurred and the mother died. At the time, Dr. Montauk was a prominent researcher studying this anomaly, and as six catastrophes had already occurred, pressure was mounting to figure out a way to prevent the final birth. But as he was working on the issue, Dr. Montauk was struck with a personal tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of his 14-year-old brother Jacob. In his fear and anger, Montauk believed that this must have something to do with the Scarlet King and his disciples. Wanting revenge, Montauk proposed an idea so horrifying that the details were never made public, a procedure known as 110 Montauk, to be performed on the final bride at regular intervals. However, this wasn't the end of Dr. Montauk's fraught relationship with the Scarlet King. It was just the beginning. To give you some perspective on just how dangerous the Scarlet King is, the SCP Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition decided to put aside their differences and form a joint effort to stamp out the children of the Scarlet King. They were successful in this mission, and even managed to capture the children's leader, a mysterious man named Depeche Spivak. Dr. Montauk, who became the lead researcher on 231 and 2317, was naturally the first choice for interviewing Depeche about the true nature of the children and of the Scarlet King. Dr. Montauk could never be the impartial interviewer that the SCP Foundation wanted, though. 
The suspicion that the Scarlet King or the children had something to do with the loss of his younger brother still lingered just beneath the surface. Like a lot of cult leaders, Depeche was extremely cryptic in his answers to Dr. Montauk's questioning. He'd already heard of the doctor from the reputation of the horrifying Montauk procedure and was surprised to see him so calm and courteous in person. A few key facts about the king and his cult were revealed in the first few rounds of questioning. The children had once worked with the serpent's hand before being excommunicated for their allegiance to the king and they had stolen sacred texts from the mystical Wanderer's Library to assist in their summoning rituals. Depeche also revealed that the Scarlet King is bound by three laws. The Law of Blood, the Law of Concrete, and the Law of Howling. Dr. Montauk, confused and frustrated by Depeche's secrecy, had to learn more. He found an old memoir from a former member of the Children of the Scarlet King, Jack Hirsch, who had the ability to invade the minds of people from the past and experience what they experienced. He recounted a battle between the Scarlet King and his followers and a group of time-traveling Turkmen warriors from SCP-3838. Hurst saw both sides of the battle. From the perspective of the children of the Scarlet King, their lord ruled over them from an immense fortress embedded in a volcano. From the perspective of the Turkmen, the children were starved and beaten peasants, commanded by the king's voice in the roaring howl of the wind. Montauk also found extensive records of summoning rituals performed by various Scarlet King-aligned cults. Interestingly, some of them incorporated the use of carved SCP Foundation symbols. What could this mean? Montauk returned again to Depeche, who finally gave him the truth about the Law of Blood. This is the Law of the Scarlet King. It's defined by poverty, violence, starvation, hate, and most of all, fear. Like the serfs in the Middle Ages, persecuted by and subjected to violence from the nobles. To the children of the Scarlet King, this sense of holy pain and awe is the only way to live. The alternative is the law of concrete, which means the modern age defined by empty safety and false comfort. Buildings, easy to access food, healthcare, knowledge, technology. This is everything that the Scarlet King despises. But the mystery only deepened as Montauk found files from a former Foundation operative by the name of Agent de Beauvoir. Montauk learned that the Scarlet King didn't seem to appear until after the Foundation was created. And in fact, it seemed that the greater interest the Foundation took in the Scarlet King, the more powerful he became. How could this be? Things were also getting stranger on a personal level for Dr. Montauk. Depeche repeatedly pressed him about his brother's disappearance and the Montauk procedure during the interviews. Little by little, it was beginning to take its toll. The questions still plagued him. What was the law of howling? Who or what really is the Scarlet King? How did he come to be? Montauk's search was causing him to act more like the children of the Scarlet King ranting about the horrors of the modern world, how all of us are living a lie, how the only honest way to live is suffering under the dominion of the Scarlet King. This philosophy is summed up in the words of one cultist named Arya Dene Cartwright, who said, We must learn what it is to die, to be enslaved, truly, brutally enslaved, with no compassion or compunction from our masters. We must learn what it is to be taken towards a single purpose, to know and truly understand our lack of agency. We must be beholden to the words of gods and darkness, the tempest-tossed refuse of a race of fools. We must kill modernity, postmodernity, with all its analysis and sneering observation. There is only one rule, the rule of chaos, for humanity, for life. For the Scarlet King. Basically, any time humanity tries to exert control over the world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. Every time they try to understand or organize or categorize their world, the Scarlet King gets stronger. As colonial and imperial powers conquered and invaded lands like India, Africa, and South America, and subjugated their beliefs under Western ideas, the Scarlet King grew stronger. Montauk was beginning to truly understand the power of his enemy here. And even worse, 
he was starting to understand his part in it. Montauk, slowly being driven mad by the knowledge he was gaining, realized that the Scarlet King's greatest enemy, the SCP Foundation, was also its greatest asset. Every time they tried to understand the monster, to give him some kind of comprehensible form, they only made him more powerful. Just in time with Montauk's new revelation, a red crack appeared in the wall of Depeche Spivak's containment cell, a portal to the realm of the Scarlet King. Foundation staff found they were unable to enter the cell, and Depeche demanded a final interview with Montauk. With no other options, the Foundation relented. In their very last conversation, Depeche congratulated Montauk for finally understanding what he was dealing with. The Scarlet King, Depeche told him, is an idea, a concept. He is a being given power through the conflict between the old and the new. This is the law of the howling. The Scarlet King's endless rage at the direction the world and humanity has taken. The King, according to Depeche, hated the Foundation's belief that science and rationality was the true path to progress. The King saw this as little more than petty arrogance. The reason Montauk's procedure on the final bride of the Scarlet King was so effective was because it wasn't born out of science. It was born out of hate, pain, the desire for revenge, and in the Scarlet King's realm, that would be all there is. Unless our world, and especially the Foundation, changed its course, the Scarlet King's rise to absolute power would be inevitable. Montauk, his mind practically gone, asked one last question. Did the children or the Scarlet King take his brother, Jacob? When Depeche told him the answer, no. And in response, Montauk shot him dead, finally bringing an end to the children of the Scarlet King. In light of his new revelations, Montauk begged the O5 Council to change their ways in order to avoid letting the Scarlet King break into our reality. They refused, saying Montauk's ideas were too radical. But they knew they couldn't just ignore the threat posed by the Scarlet King. They would have to take some steps. And so the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation, the most powerful and secretive group in the entire world, in order to prevent the most dangerous threat that humanity has ever known from breaking into our reality and enslaving all the people of the world, finally did something. They changed the classification of the Scarlet King from Keter to Safe, and made its description on the official Foundation files deliberately vague. The O5 Council thinks this will be enough to stop the Scarlet King's power from continuing to grow, but Montauk knew it wasn't enough. He had seen the truth, and he couldn't unsee it. While the Foundation was going on as normal, Montauk grew to despise them. He knew the Scarlet King was coming, he knew that he couldn't be stopped, and that our whole reality was little more than sitting ducks. Dr. Robert Montauk is no longer a researcher for the SCP Foundation. No, Dr. Robert Montauk chose a different path. He's now a child of the Scarlet King, a devotee of madness, hate, and chaos. You can't beat the Scarlet King after all, and as the old adage goes, if you can't beat him, join him. There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the Foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long-abandoned cemetery. 
The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. On further investigation, the foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown, likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20, 2016 until… At that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny, to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to Mission Command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the mirror dimension where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine, but they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies, nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. 
Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members. With the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer, the team split into two groups of eight and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the Mirror Dimension Site 81 while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once in the Mirror Universe. Once inside Site 81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute, across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime's Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the Mirror Dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 a.m. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared. Death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the Foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers. I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar familiar to the Foundation Command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world. 
and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch, since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all. A month ago, Dr. Robert Maxwell was a senior researcher working at the facility, but a tragic mistake had cost the lives of several of his co-researchers. Now he was being led down a bleak hallway in armed biocontainment area 14, a rifle-wielding guard flanking him on either side. The once rising researcher had a very different title now, D-8724. He had been made a D-class personnel, a death sentence. However, as the guards led him to his possible demise, he wasn't dressed in the typical D-class orange jumpsuit. No, he was dressed in frilly Rococo dining wear more typical of 18th century France. If anything, Dr. Maxwell looked like he was on his way to meet royalty, and in a sense, he was. The former researcher had begged for any other assignment, but the site director insisted on committing Dr. Maxwell to tea time with SCP-082. He'd always been the talkative type, so the two would make a perfect pairing. And if the creature found him sufficiently amusing, then Maxwell might even leave the containment cell alive. He had heard legends of the giant creature they called the cannibal. Maxwell hoped they were just stories. Dr. Maxwell was pushed by the guards into a large, luxuriously appointed room, and the doors were locked behind him. He felt like a child, surrounded by freakishly large furniture and ten-foot-high ceilings. The fog of obnoxious floral perfumes couldn't fully cover up the pervasive smell of death that lingered in the cavernous halls of 082's palace. Thanks to an elaborate ruse conducted by the Foundation, SCP-082 believed he was the King of France and that his containment cell was a palace where he remained for his own safety. The creature's continued good behavior and everyone else's safety relied on visitors keeping up that lie. Maxwell had never worked in this area of the facility, so a lot of the standard procedures were new to him. Still, his superior had given him a clear directive. Talk to the monster, communicate with him, be cordial and friendly. See if you can find out more about his mysterious past. And most importantly, if you want to survive, don't annoy him. The down-on-his-luck scientist gulped inside, trying to steady his nerves in this oversized, fake French palace. He just kept thinking, surely he can't be that big. He almost talked himself into believing that the accounts of the creature were just that, tall tales, until a huge figure began lumbering into the main chamber. It was him. SCP-082, also known as Fernand the Cannibal. SCP-082 was an eight-foot-tall hulking monster built sturdier than the castles it likes to imagine are its true home. Swollen, bloated, and grossly out of proportion, the creature clocks in at over 700 pounds, most of which is pure muscle that's almost impossible to pierce with conventional weaponry. SCP-082 stopped just feet away and stared at Dr. Maxwell with its beady, sunken in eyes like a hungry rat. Just the sight of it struck terror into Dr. Maxwell's heart, but he didn't dare show his fear. Instead, he remembered his brief training, bowing politely and forcing a smile, referring to the creature as Your Highness, and profusely thanking it for granting him an audience. The monster continued staring without saying anything, and then gave a wide, lock-jawed grin showing off its huge teeth. It did everything through gritted teeth, except eat and sing. Dr. Maxwell hoped he wouldn't be a part of either activity. Fernand gave a low, booming chuckle. He thanked Dr. Maxwell for coming to give him some company and invited him to come further inside and take a seat, adding, with a sly wink, that he won't bite. 
The monster complained that he so rarely gets visitors to the palace these days, but he omitted the fact that the main reason for this was his tendency to devour them. Maxwell nodded and followed the giant deeper into its oversized abode. He couldn't help but notice that the monster's arms looked like huge, fleshy punching bags. He knew that if Fernand wanted to, he could easily crush him flat, just like he'd done to so many unfortunate guards during containment breaches. Fernand told Dr. Maxwell that he was thinking of having some decorating work done. The walls of his palace were starting to look awfully drab, and he gestured to one covered with a rusty red streak. Maxwell remembered that D-Class cleaners were sent into the containment cell twice a month to tidy any of Ferdinand's messes, but they often ended up becoming one of the messes themselves. The creature encouraged Maxwell to take a seat at his oversized dining table, while he tended to a pot of what he said was full of delicious onion soup. Maxwell obliged his host's request and took a seat at a huge chair that made him look like a six-year-old sitting at the grown-up's table. Meanwhile, Ferdinand was using a huge machete-like knife to cleave onions in half for his bubbling pot of stew. Even though Ferdinand had shown no signs of outward aggression, as he watched the cannibal hack away at onions with his enormous knife, Maxwell could feel himself beginning to sweat. After all, they didn't call this creature the cannibal for nothing. This was a monster with a truly horrifying body count. During previous containment breaches, it had taken enough tranquilizer to put down two elephants to subdue the creature, but not before multiple agents quite literally lost their heads in the process. Fernand was able to bite them off with one huge chomp like he was eating a drumstick, snapping right through the bone with his incredible tooth and jaw strength. Surprisingly, when he wasn't on a violent rampage, Foundation researchers had found SCP-082 to be unusually polite and forthcoming, offering the researchers plenty of information about himself and his past. The only problem was that almost everything the creature said was a complete lie. From his time as a researcher, Maxwell knew that there were only a few details about the creature that could be ascertained for certain. SCP-082 would reliably answer to the name Fernand, and genetically, Ferdinand was technically human. The means by which Ferdinand became so grotesquely huge, strong, and cannibalistic are still unknown. Foundation personnel are still looking into whether it's due to some kind of anomalous genetic mutation or by more supernatural means. All we know is that he's big, unpredictable, and extremely dangerous. Dr. Robert Maxwell sat terrified at the dining table of SCP-082 listening to Fernand's slightly dull blade chop through the final onion, which he then tossed into the boiling soup. Fernand had switched the topic of conversation to one of his favorite fictional characters, Hannibal Lecter. Of course, Hannibal the Cannibal isn't quite so fictional to Fernand. While he's been shown to be extremely intelligent in terms of puzzle solving and memory, he seems to have no understanding of the distinctions between fiction and reality. He assumes all movies and TV shows are a form of documentary or reality television. And ever since seeing The Silence of the Lambs, Ferdinand has been eager to meet with Dr. Lecter, which he emphasized to Maxwell over and over. Since trying to explain the concept of fiction to Ferdinand had never previously worked, Maxwell simply told him that Dr. Lecter is extremely busy at the moment, but will visit whenever he gets a chance. This seemed to satisfy Ferdinand, who placed two large bowls of steaming soup on the table before sitting down a little too close to Maxwell. He couldn't help but notice that the giant cannibal was now sitting within biting distance, and as a lowly D-class, nobody would be rushing in to save him if things went south. Ferdinand began ranting through his clenched teeth once more, occasionally stopping to consume a hefty spoonful of onion soup. Maxwell was sure to do the same, not wanting to seem anything less than polite. But soon, the tenor of Ferdinand's rant began to shift. Typically, the monster spoke French or heavily accented English. Now, he was affecting the accent of a Victorian gentleman, peppering his speech with tally-ho and the game is afoot. Maxwell was confused at first, but quickly realized the game Ferdinand was playing. It's well known that Ferdinand is a pathological liar who likes to play numerous characters, changing his mannerisms and clothes accordingly. These personas have included a vampire, Big Bird, Andre the Giant, Foundation researcher Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, Dr. Frankenstein, and Frankenstein's monster. And, of course, in this case, 
the iconic fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes. Fearing for his life in this strange situation, Dr. Maxwell did the only thing he could, play along. As Fernand reeled off his Holmesian delusions, Maxwell began to play the role of Dr. John Watson, asking follow-up questions and complimenting Ferdinand's impeccable deductive reasoning, and it seemed to be working. Ferdinand played along too, acting as though the two of them really were Arthur Conan Doyle's crime-fighting duo. Towards the end of their game, Dr. Maxwell was even starting to enjoy it, amazed that his quick thinking was actually keeping him safe. But just then, the cannibal froze, as if in a trance. He locked eyes with Dr. Maxwell, like a mad dog that you can't tell if it's going to bite you or not. He saw the creature's gargantuan teeth separating, its huge jaws stretching open. This could surely only mean one thing. Dr. Maxwell winced and prepared for death, cursing that all of his quick thinking had amounted to nothing. Fernand leaned towards him, his gaping maw with its hot onion-scented breath just inches away from Maxwell. And then, he began to sing. The cannibal broke into a raucous Victorian pub song, happy and jovial. In his moment of terror, Dr. Maxwell had forgotten that this was the other reason SCP-082 opens his nightmarish jaws. Relief washed over him, as he knew he was safe, at least for the moment. Not long after, Foundation guards arrived and escorted him from the cell, leaving the delusional giant to his own devices back in the so-called palace. The former researcher had done it. He had bested Ferdinand the Cannibal, and hopefully it would be the last time he'd ever be face to face with that deranged giant. Unfortunately for Dr. Robert Maxwell, in a performance review later that week, one of his superiors remarked that Ferdinand enjoyed his company and he had done a great job. Such a good job, in fact, that Ferdinand insisted he have Dr. Maxwell for dinner, or any other meal, for that matter. Sometime, very soon. The first thing that tips the Foundation off to SCP-087's presence were the reports of numerous unexplained disappearances on campus. There were plenty of rumors about what might be behind them, but field agents suspected that the true source of the vanishing would be something beyond civilian imagination. All anyone knew for sure was that everyone who had gone missing was last seen in a certain administrative building on the university grounds, and that the disappearances only seemed to happen when the elevator was out. The campus was soon flooded with Foundation agents, creating a barrier around the administrative building and the presumed habitat of SCP-087. Nobody else could get in, and hopefully whatever was inside couldn't get out. One of the Foundation's lead scientists was flown in to consult on the investigation. What could have been behind those students disappearing? The doctor's preliminary interviews with university staff who worked in the building yielded some interesting details. Strange noises, like banging and even a faint shrill crying, would be heard from a door that led to a no longer used stairway in hallway 3B. Staff in the building had no reason to ever take these stairs, especially considering how many of them reported a strange sense of unease when just standing outside the door. The only reason someone might take those stairs is due to elevator malfunctions. In that instant, the doctor had put it all together. The staff they interviewed had their memory wiped with amnestics, special chemicals used by the Foundation with the power to delete human memories. The Foundation only used them for staff or civilians who had confirmed contact with an SCP, and the doctor knew that they had a live one on their hands. The staircase. There was something terribly wrong with that staircase, and it was the SCP Foundation's job to find out what before it made anybody else disappear. This is the story of SCP-087, otherwise known as the Endless Staircase, and the three doomed journeys down into its murky depths. The doctor was more than eager to begin research into the staircase and its frightening, anomalous properties. After all, you don't claw your way up to being one of the Foundation's key researchers without being brave and perhaps just a little bit deranged. As was standard, once a perimeter was secured around the staircase, the good doctor requested a selection of D-Class personnel for testing. For those not in the know, D-Class is the Foundation's polite way of saying cannon fodder. The doctor was sent three D-Class prisoners for use in his investigation of SCP-087. The first, D-8432, was, according to official documentation on the incident, a 43-year-old male of average build and appearance and unremarkable psychological background. 
This man once worked for the Foundation in a more official capacity, but he was given the often deadly demotion to D-Class due to a dangerous mistake handling SCP-682 that led to the deaths of several other agents. Now, it looked like it would be his turn. The doctor explained his mission to him, explore the staircase, gather data, help us find out exactly what we're dealing with here. If you come back alive, there may even be a promotion in it for you. And with that promise, D-8432 was given his loadout, a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power capable of lasting 24 hours, an audio headset, and a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset that would allow him to communicate with Dr. Bright. D-8432 was then pushed through the door in Hallway 3B and out onto the staircase. According to declassified Foundation files describing the staircase, SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38-degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. But in D-8432's mind, unlit really didn't seem like the right word. He would have chosen all-consuming darkness. Despite carrying a powerful 75-watt lamp, D-8432 was only capable of partially lighting the platform he was standing on, and the illumination only stretched down nine of the 13 steps to the next platform. When D-8432 observed how little help his lamp was giving him, he was instructed to shine it out of the doorway into Hallway 3B. When he did so, the light seemed to shine far further than it ever could in SCP-087. Already, the beginning of the anomalous activity was obvious. Everywhere else, darkness is just the absence of light. In SCP-087, darkness eats light. It was like a tangible black mass that only a certain amount of light could survive, while the rest just wouldn't show. D-8432 swallowed hard over a lump in his throat. The door to Hallway 3B was closed behind him, and he was ordered to descend. Surviving to see that promotion was feeling unlikely, but it's not like he had a choice. If he tried to escape SCP-087 before he was permitted, he'd be shot by SCP Foundation field agents on the spot. So he followed the high-ranking doctor's orders and began to descend the steps to the next platform. Nothing about the physical makeup of the staircase itself seemed abnormal. The base and walls were a very plain, dull concrete with a metal handrail. The only thing that seemed unique about it so far was the strange light-bending properties. At once, until he reached the second platform down, and he heard it, a soft, echoing cry. A child's cry. It was shrieks of panic, or maybe even pain, echoing up from below. He was asked why he had stopped, and he explained the crying sound he'd been hearing. It sounded like it was coming from far down the stairs, maybe 200 meters below him. He could just make out the words, please, help and down here, coming from the darkness. But the team outside the stairwell couldn't hear anything, so they asked him to descend further. Another platform down, and they could hear it too, the unmistakable cries of a terrified child. Please, help, and down here. D-8432 was ordered to keep going, and only stop if he noticed changes to the visual environment or in the sounds he was hearing. D-8432, knowing his life was on the line, had to keep going and descended another 20 flights of stairs before stopping to remark that the sounds of the child hadn't gotten any closer. They still sounded just as far away as when he'd first heard them. He was told his observations were noted and pressured to continue. Within half an hour, D-8432 had descended a full 50 floors with no sign of a bottom in sight. Somehow, the volume of the child's crying had remained consistent throughout, as if it was moving away from D-8432 at the same rate he was descending. At this point, D-8432 reported that he was feeling uneasy. The doctor said that this was understandable, given the circumstances. He'd been watching what little there was to see over a live video feed the entire time, and something about the truly bottomless nature of the staircase and the ever-elusive crying was undeniably eerie. But things were about to really take a turn for the worst. As D-8432 stepped forward towards the next set of stairs, he froze. There was something on the platform below him, barely illuminated by the light of his 75-watt bulb. It was a face, vaguely human in size and shape, but with a few terrifying differences. It had grayish skin and no mouth, 
nostrils or pupils. And yet, D8432 could feel that this thing was making eye contact with him. He couldn't move, trapped in the thing's piercing gaze. In an instant, the face jerked forwards, suddenly only about a foot away from D432's face, eyes staring into its own. D8432 screamed and ran, scaling all 50 flights in an astonishing 18 minutes before charging out into Hallway 3B. There, he collapsed from the exhaustion and the fear of what he'd just seen. Upon reviewing the footage, the strange face was designated SCP-087-1. Fascinating. It was time for a second experiment. The doctor just had to know more. The second test subject was D9035, a 28-year-old male with a history of aggravated assaults against women. He was given the same loadout as his predecessors, except this time with an even more powerful 100-watt bulb. He was also given 100 small LED lights that had adhesive backs and a battery life of approximately three weeks with which they intended to permanently illuminate SCP-087. However, despite the extra wattage of his bulb, he still couldn't illuminate beyond the ninth step. SCP-087 wouldn't allow it. Having no ideas of the horrors that lurked below him, he descended on the doctor's orders and began fixing the LEDs to the walls of each platform he passed. The LED always illuminated the landing, but the light couldn't pass the first step on either side. The flights of stairs themselves would remain in perpetual darkness. After the second flight, D9035 noticed the same crying D8432 had heard and became uneasy. Just like before, as D9035 descended, the volume of the crying didn't seem to increase, as if for every step he descended, the source of the crying descended one, two, keeping them at a constant 200 meters apart. Still, he was ordered to continue his descent and the placing of LEDs even as his paranoia grew. When he reached the 51st floor, he observed damage to the wall and steps. Sections appeared to have been smashed to rubble by an extreme force. As he descended past the broken step, he only felt his fear, anxiety, and paranoia grow. The doctor made note of the fact that SCP-087 seemed to cause instances of anxiety and terror in its occupants, even before they encountered SCP-087-1. As D9035 reached Platform 89, a full 350 meters under the initial platform, he stopped dead in his tracks and saw something staring up at him from the platform below. That same terrible gray face with those dead, white eyes. He was encouraged to stay calm and try to get better footage of the face, but it charged for him, and D9035 ran for his life. He ascended the staircase at a staggering pace, even passing out from exhaustion and remaining motionless for 14 minutes halfway. When D9035 finally gathered the strength to get up, he scrambled back to Hallway 3B and fell into a state of catatonia. He remains unresponsive to all external stimuli to this day, just staring off into the distance with a haunted expression, almost like he's still there in the hallway. The doctor wanted to conduct one more test before he ordered SCP-087 shut off from the world forever and it was the most terrifying of all. The final subject was D9884, a 23-year-old woman with a history of depression and use of excessive force. The doctor had hoped that D9884 would travel the deepest yet, and so he gave her the additional supplies of a backpack containing 3.75 liters of water, 15 nutrient bars, and one thermal blanket. As far as the foundation was concerned, she was in this for the long haul but none of them had any idea quite how right they were. When D9884 entered SCP-087, all the lights from the previous expedition had disappeared. Still, she was ordered to go deeper. She heard the crying of the mysterious child, if it was even a child at all, and again she was ordered to go deeper. At the 496th landing, even as D9884 seemed to slip into a state of mortal terror, once again she was ordered to go even deeper. Every moment, he was hoping to get a better look at the face of SCP-087-1, and when D-9884 finally broke and fled back upstairs, he did. The face appeared, but this time, it was mere inches behind her, staring directly into the camera with its blank eyes, startling even this veteran of the supernatural. The face appearing caused D-9884 to panic and flee, but instead of going back up the stairs to safety, she went deeper down the staircase in an attempt to escape it, deeper and deeper and deeper, until her video feed cut out. D-9884 
was never seen again. In the aftermath of the tests, the SCP was classified as Euclid. It may have been dangerous, but at least it was easy to contain. The door to Hallway 3B was replaced with one made out of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the rest of the building. The lock won't release unless a classified number of electrical volts are applied, while the key is turned counterclockwise. And after a few inches of foam insulation were applied to the inner side of the door, staff at the building never again reported hearing strange noises. As for the fates of those lost within the endless turning flights and platforms of SCP-087, we may never know, but one can only assume it isn't pleasant. A tangled mass of yarn and ribbon sounds more like what you'd find in the back room of a craft store or a forgotten closet than a mysterious creature worthy of investigation. And yet that's exactly what SCP-066 appeared to be, or at least it did at first glance. But the SCP Foundation doesn't contain and study just anything, and there was, and still is, something incredibly strange just below the surface of SCP-066, also known as Eric's Toy. At first, Eric's Toy seemed to be completely harmless and even helpful, a knot of string that produced strange but harmless items and effects. But the Foundation soon discovered a dark side to SCP-066. While it may be referred to as a toy, this is no mere plaything. SCP-066 weighs only about one kilogram and appears to be a braided bunch of yarn and ribbon. Though there is no apparent musical capability within the strands of yarn and ribbon themselves, music can be produced by moving individual strands one at a time. When it was first being studied, this SCP was composed of multicolored strings and ribbons, but it has since undergone a transformation and now presents an appearance somewhat different from its initial description. The strands of yarn and ribbon can be used to play the notes of a diatonic scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, though the research has not been able to determine just how SCP-066 produces music or any sound at all. SCP-066 was thought to be completely benign at first and was classified as safe, but following an incident known as Incident 066-2, its classification was adjusted to a subcategory of Euclid, Euclid Impetus. Euclid is a classification given to SCPs that are more difficult to contain than those classified as safe. Impetus in Latin means attack, and specifies that SCP-066 is not only Euclid class, but on the more aggressive side. While 066 is not always aggressive towards humans, the events of Incident 066-2 prove that it is highly unpredictable and should not be provoked. Like many SCPs, it proved that underestimating its capabilities can be a dangerous mistake. Before the incident, SCP-066 displayed only charming, if unusual, behavior. Various researchers spent their time playing random assortment of notes using its strings, curious about what would happen, and determined to record anything this unusual ball of string had to offer. They did not yet know that the creature was capable of any hostility, and went about their work with a light-hearted, carefree spirit. After playing an improvised six-note melody with the strands, a researcher was thrilled to find that SCP-066 was capable of shape-shifting. Its appearance changed to resemble a small calico kitten for 17 minutes. The kitten was incredibly friendly, rubbing its head against the researcher's glove hand and purring loudly. Ironically enough, the kitten also spent time playing with a piece of string. After the 17 minutes were up, the kitten transformed back into SCP-066's original form. A few days later, another researcher played a different melody on the strands and was surprised to find that, when they stopped, the music continued on its own. The sound of an acoustic guitar kicked in, accompanied by vocals with no visible source for either sound. The SCP then played a four-minute song with lyrics warning against the use of sharp objects without the supervision of a parent, especially scissors. After the song ended, the SCP was silent for the rest of the day. The following week, a research assistant used the strands of SCP-066 to play the opening notes of Happy Birthday, and a chocolate cupcake with a lit birthday candle appeared from within the braided strings. Against the warning of his peers, the assistant ate the cupcake. In response, the SCP played the rest of Happy Birthday, and the assistant suffered no adverse effects from the cupcake. All of this fun was brought to a swift end when one scientist suggested that a portion of SCP-066's yarn body be cut off and removed so that the specimen could be tested. On April 18, 2008, the event that would become known as Incident 066-2 took place. A young man known only as D-066-4437, or D, was assigned to the task. 
Naturally, he was a member of the highly disposable D-class personnel, but D was grateful for the opportunity, as most experiments of a similar nature involved quite a bit more obvious risk. It was a simple enough job. Take a pair of scissors, snip off some yarn, and bring it back to the lab for further study. It was hardly on the level of supervising 173, or being 682's latest chew toy. He entered the containment room, where SCP-066 was lying dormant and still, and approached it with scissors. He grabbed a small handful of string and started to cut. As soon as the scissors began to cut through the fabric, the SCP rolled out of his grasp. It came to a stop one meter away, where it started to make a high-pitched squeaking sound resembling the cry of a frightened rabbit. Unsure what to do and unprepared for this scenario, D approached the entity again. He snagged another fistful of yarn and cut, only for 066 to curl into a ball and roll away from him again, even faster this time. Once it was safely on the other side of the room and away from the scissors, it stopped moving. Only this time, it didn't squeak. Instead, for the very first time since its containment, it spoke in a deep, uncannily human voice and asked, Are you Eric? After recovering from his initial shock at hearing a voice come out of a massive string, D responded, No, I'm not. This answer said something off in SCP-066, and its form began to shift and change. The string wriggled around on the floor, unbraiding and wrapping around itself into a mound. The colors, previously a rainbow of shades, shifted until every strand was a blood red. Much to Dee's horror, the transformation was not yet complete. Small bumps began to emerge from the spaces between the strands of yarn, popping out all over the bright red mass. If that wasn't terrifying enough, suddenly, all together as one, they blinked open, revealing themselves to be over a dozen small eyes. Every single eye was focused at D, studying him, staring him down. SCP-066 then began to produce loud, abrupt, dissonant notes like someone banging on the keys of a piano. D had seen enough. He abandoned his task and fled the containment room. After this failed attempt to extract a sample, SCP-066's behavior and its treatment of personnel who interacted with it began to change dramatically. Before the incident, the SCP was largely dormant, only becoming active if a melody was played using its strands. Following the incident and its change of form, 066 began to move on its own. Long strands of its yarn body would move like tentacles, writhing and wriggling around at high speed. It no longer needed human interaction in order to produce sound or to produce any other effects. At the sight of any human, regardless of the human's behavior, the SCP would begin to react with sound and effect within six seconds. The first of these effects was noted by a research assistant who entered the SCP's containment facility a week after the incident with D. As she approached 066 to take notes about its current state and its new ability to move, a bee appeared out of nowhere. It stung the assistant and flew away before it could be captured. Weeks later, a team of 11 personnel were monitoring the SCP when it suddenly burst into a rendition of Beethoven's Second Symphony. It produced this music at a volume of over 140 decibels, permanently deafening three of the personnel and causing permanent hearing damage in the other eight. It was theorized that the SCP did this as an act of retribution for its perceived mistreatment. These personnel refused to work with SCP-066 again. When a new team was assigned to monitor the entity, everything seemed to be going well at first. It was moving around, flailing its tentacles of yarn at nothing in particular, and staring at the personnel with its many eyes, but otherwise was on its best behavior. Then, suddenly, every light in the room went dark and there was a complete loss of visibility. The lights were unable to be turned on for five hours, and any attempt at an alternate light source, such as a flashlight, was unsuccessful. It was as if the darkness in the room swallowed any and all light right up. It was similar to the oppressive darkness within SCP-087, or the unlimited black of SCP-3001's shadow dimension. The personnel in the room later reported hearing the sound of loud, labored breathing just behind their shoulders, though when they searched for a source of the sound, they could find nothing. There had been no recent anomalies reported or any additional hostile behavior. Instead, whenever it sees a new human, SCP-066 repeats the name Eric again and again in the same deep voice. Who is Eric? No one at the facility knows, or if they do, they have not reported it to any official channels. It is possible that the SCP was once owned by someone named Eric, and perhaps, given the circumstances under which SCP-066 first said the name, Eric attempted to cut the threads of the entity while it was in his care. Unfortunately, there are no official records of how SCP-066 was discovered, or why it was brought to the Foundation in the first place. 
Its origins remain murky and as mysterious as everything else about it. All that is known is that, whoever Eric is, SCP-066 is determined to find him. Once the SCP's class was changed from safe to Euclid, its containment procedures had to be adjusted. While it was previously kept in a simple room, it is now contained in a tungsten carbide box at its site's high-value item storage facility. Once a month, the box is inspected for damage to its interior. Due to the SCP's tendency to use its appendages to wear down the walls of the box over time, if there is any damage, SCP-066 is to be moved to a new box using a robotic arm that performs this transfer in less than three seconds. The Foundation has attempted to place recording devices in the box with the entity in order to monitor its behavior when there are no humans present, but the SCP destroys every recording device placed inside of its containment box, and any attempts to record its behavior when it is not being observed by humans have been unsuccessful. Whatever it's doing when there is no one around, it wants to keep a secret. On the surface, SCP-066 is one of the less frightening finds contained within the walls of the SCP Foundation. It does not have claws or teeth or the ability to cause mass deaths, but it has incredible, unpredictable capabilities and seems very capable of holding a grudge. There is so much that is unknown about it, from its origins, to its form, to its ability to manifest matter from nothing, and there is something deeply unsettling about this SCP's unpredictable behavior and increased hostility towards being observed. We do not know what it has done, and we do not know what it will do next. All we can do is wonder. As we ponder the nature of SCP-066, it does nothing but sit, staring with unblinking eyes, waiting for Eric to come back. An SCP Foundation researcher sits at a table inside of a standard containment cell. These are often dangerous places to be, especially when the SCP you're supposed to be studying is one that you can't see. The researcher is taking notes, unsure of exactly what is going to happen next. He can hear the sounds of knives scraping behind, of flesh sizzling and searing from high heat. He braces himself as a burst of heat hits the back of his head, as if a fireball has erupted. An object floats through the air and settles in front of him on the table. It's a plate of food, and it looks delicious. It may surprise you to learn that there is no rule that the SCP Foundation must deal exclusively with violent and vicious creatures. Not every SCP held in containment shares the same malevolence and contempt for humanity as SCP-682, or the world-ending threat posed by the likes of SCP-2317. Some, perhaps not many, but some are benign and might even seem outwardly friendly, but you'd still be taking a huge risk to assume that anything contained by the SCP Foundation is completely harmless. Such is the case with SCP-5031. As per the Foundation's containment procedures, this quasi-humanoid, meaning it appears to have some vaguely human features, is held in an airtight cell that is regularly checked by Foundation personnel on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-5031 has no need for regular nutrition or regular interactions from staff. The trick with SCP-5031 is not being eaten by it, since though it doesn't need food, it does still hunt and consume anything it encounters, human or otherwise. Avoiding being eaten is hard enough with creatures that can actually be seen, but like so many other creatures the Foundation keeps contained, SCP-5031 has developed an almost perfect defense mechanism, which is when observed, it will literally cease to exist. Some might choose to refer to this as a quantum lock, however it is worth noting that traces left by SCP-5031 still remain observable when the creature has temporarily disappeared. For example, trails of blood and scratch marks left behind by SCP-5031 still exist when the SCP itself does not. Naturally, this makes both avoiding the creature and capturing it using cameras difficult. However, when SCP-5031's existence ceases, it still casts a shadow. From this, researchers have been able to determine several of the creature's physical traits. Based on its silhouette, it has been deduced that SCP-5031 levitates about half a meter above ground level, sports an abnormally small necklace head atop an elongated torso, approximately 1.9 meters long, with three sets of spindly lower arms that branch outwards. Using these arms and its loosely hanging body, SCP-5031 will lower itself to hunt any human or animal that draws near to it. 
and uses the blade-like tail to cut up food. Perhaps the most interesting facet of SCP-5031 beyond its defensive capabilities and apparent physical attributes are the series of nine tests conducted by senior researcher Stanley Huxtable. Appalled by the conditions that the creature was being kept in, Huxtable took over the role of HCL supervisor for SCP-5031. Having grown increasingly frustrated and empathetic towards the creature, listening to its screams from inside its iron containment unit, Huxtable devised a series of tests to introduce SCP-5031 to various different stimuli as a way to better understand the creature and hopefully keep it contained in a way that didn't seem to cause so much suffering. It's worth remembering that the SCP Foundation makes its mission to be cold, not cruel, in performing their duties to protect normality and many of the researchers and staff are just as capable of having empathy for creatures as you might for a stray animal at a shelter. The first of Huxtable's tests involved installing speakers in SCP-5031 cell, through which a variety of different ambient and popular pieces of music were played to see if they had any effect on reducing the creature's stress. By judging SCP-5031 stress levels based on how much it screamed when compared to normal, Huxtable was able to determine how to best use music to calm the creature. SCP-5031 seemed to convey higher levels of stress when listening to Morning Forest, Deep Grotto, and Seaside Paradise ambience, as well as the best of late 60s British rock band Jethro Tull. However, the best of Mozart, Enya, Kiss, and Ben Folds produced dramatically different results, decreasing SCP-5031's apparent stress. Following this test, senior researcher Huxtable compiled a playlist featuring SCP-5031's favorite music. Over time, the stress-reducing effects of music on SCP-5031 seemed to decrease, but keeping the playlist on shuffle seemed to keep the creature consistently calmer than it had been previously. The next test involved introducing inanimate objects into SCP-5031's enclosure to monitor its reactions and how its stress levels were affected. When a softball was thrown into the enclosure, SCP-5031 immediately sliced the ball in two with its tail in one swift motion. A similar result occurred when researchers threw the creature a basketball, which was quickly punctured and sliced open by SCP-5031's tail. Its stress levels first seemed to diminish when the creature was offered a bowling ball, which it rolled around the enclosure and then later knocked it against a second bowling ball. However, when one of the balls chipped, rendering it unable to roll properly, SCP-5031 stress increased dramatically until a replacement was offered. Researcher Huxtable noted that SCP-5031 seemed to possess a similar level of motor skills to an average human toddler, with similarly explosive emotional reactions to match. <laughs> Next, when given the choice between two food sources at opposite ends of its enclosure, SCP-5031 seemed to gravitate towards higher quality food, most notably favored cooked rotisserie chickens over animal carcasses. It even chose this option over a live chicken, using its tail to cut its food into more manageable bite-sized portions, rather than ripping its meat with its hands or teeth like many of its fellow SCPs. Researcher Huxtable recorded these findings and highlighted that, even though SCP-5031 didn't need to eat in order to survive, providing the creature with food of a better quality marginally reduced its stress. Senior researcher Huxtable next attempted to test SCP-5031's coexistence with other living subjects, each time making sure that the creature had been adequately fed to avoid any unseemly incidents. First, a live chicken was introduced. SCP-5031 rolled its bowling ball at high speed towards the chicken, increasing both its and the chicken's stress levels and inadvertently killing the chicken in the process. When a second chicken was introduced, SCP-5031 gently rolled a basketball towards it, but ceased any further engagement after the chicken squawked from being hit by the ball. Next to be introduced into the enclosure was a blindfolded D-Class staff member, who was instructed to sit down and roll the basketball towards SCP-5031. After doing so for several minutes, the creature began to approach the D-Class subject, who was instructed to remove their blindfold to cease the creature's existence and prevent any potentially deadly incidents. Finally, researcher Huxtable had another Class D engage in a game of catch with SCP-5031 while facing away from the creature. This test proceeded successfully, and senior researcher Huxtable remarked how SCP-5031's motor skills were improving, albeit gradually and with some gentle encouragement. Through Huxtable's tests, the creature was learning. 
The next test, focused on teaching SCP-5031 linguistic symbols, utilized LCD displays and buttons connected to a food dispenser. One display showed an image of a rock, and the other an image of a rotisserie chicken. After some brief probing, SCP-5031 was quickly able to understand that pressing the button under the correct display would dispense a rotisserie chicken for it to eat. The creature was later able to adapt when, the following day, the screen displays and materials dispensed were swapped, and then later set to swap at random intervals. When additional rock dispensing stations were introduced, this time displaying the word rock as opposed to an image, SCP-5031 was able to determine which station dispensed chicken through a process of elimination. Whenever the functions and displays were swapped, SCP-5031 would find whichever displayed the word chicken to receive its food. The final phase of this test presented SCP-5031 with a single station, displaying the word chicken, but with a button that would remain inactive unless the creature spelled out the same word with a collection of lettered blocks it was provided with. After some initial confusion and frustrations as to why the button would not dispense food when pressed, SCP-5031 was able to assemble the word correctly, not only activating the button and dispensing food, but proving to researcher Huxtable that the creature was capable of learning language. Huxtable continued to test the creature, encouraging it to spell words using lettered blocks as a method of communicating. By increasing SCP-5031's vocabulary and the amount of human interaction it received, senior researcher Huxtable observed that SCP-5031 was gradually learning to sing, albeit non-verbally, as well as to juggle with its six hands and was even communicating its food preferences and dish pairings. Later, another Class D, D-52125, was introduced to SCP-5031's enclosure to aid in further testing. Through D-52125's instructions, the creature quickly learned to draw using crayons and created artworks depicting itself. Its newfound friend D-52125, researcher Huxtable, a cat, and a rotisserie chicken. SCP-5031's new creative side didn't stop there, though as the creature quickly learned to play chopsticks in only two days once a piano was introduced into the enclosure. SCP-5031 even managed to start creating its own original, admittedly crude, compositions. Next, a spice rack was placed inside the creature's cell, and D-52125 demonstrated how to season meat. This proved to be SCP-5031's new favorite hobby, as it spent the next three days experimenting with different combinations of foods and spices using its letter blocks to request more, more, more garlic powder. Interestingly, the creature only created artwork or music when D-52125 was present, but seemed to thoroughly enjoy its experimentation with food when left alone. Following this development, senior researcher Huxtable devised a new test for SCP-5031, providing the creature with cooking utensils and using D-52125 to demonstrate. 5031 was shown how to prepare a variety of different dishes, from hamburgers and tacos to Mongolian beef, steak, clam chowder, and profiteroles. In addition to a small peanut allergy, this eighth test revealed SCP-5031 to be a phenomenal chef, possessing culinary skills far beyond the average person. The creature quickly and enthusiastically embraced its newfound talents, concocting its very own brand new recipes, with D-52125 even volunteering to be the first to taste test 5031's dishes. It was shortly after this test that SCP-5031 spoke its very first word. And it should come as no surprise that the word was salt. Naturally, senior researcher Huxtable was very proud of the progress the creature had made with its development. The final test almost seemed to be what the creature was born for. Over the course of two months, SCP-5031 was tasked with creating a full three-course meal, which would then be served to Foundation staff for Thanksgiving. SCP-5031 not only rose to the task, but exceeded all of researcher Huxtable's expectations, creating a meal that even Gordon Ramsay would be hard-pressed to find fault with. The creature created a first course consisting of sweet potato miso soup seasoned with turmeric. Next came a beautiful duck confit, glazed luxuriously with apple cider, and topped generously with sweet cranberry compote, paired with a side of butternut squash gnocchi and served on a bed of kale seasoned with truffle salt. The grand finale of the exquisite meal was a spiced cassava pie for dessert, complemented with the finest French vanilla ice cream and a maple hazelnut syrup. And SCP-5031 didn't stop there. 
The creature also debuted one of its original musical compositions to complement the decadent meal it had created. As the staff enjoyed the food, SCP-5031 performed live from its enclosure the deeply moving Piano Concerto for Six Hands, to an overwhelmingly positive response from not only senior researcher Huxtable, but the entire Foundation staff. As a fitting end to the creature's tale, Huxtable reported that, during the Thanksgiving banquet it had created, SCP-5031's stress levels reduced entirely. New, kinder containment measures that would keep 5031 safer but also far more contented were submitted for approval. Perhaps some of you may find it refreshing to learn that SCP-5031 isn't simply just another malicious, malevolent monster that the Foundation has to keep under lock and key for the safety of the world. Instead, SCP-5031 is a gentle, if a little frightening at first, creature that just requires careful and considered guidance instead of a cold iron cage and around-the-clock armed guards. Through testing, senior researcher Stanley Huxtable and his fellow Foundation staff were not only able to help the creature develop, but also found what makes it tick, and not just for the purposes of containing it. Instead, it is hoped that SCP-5031's creativity and flair for culinary and musical masterpieces can continue to thrive and grow under the proud watch of researcher Huxtable. Over 50 men and women, clad in red robes, kneel before an unholy altar. They chant and mutter indecipherable words, words of cruelty and madness, of obsession and sacrilege. Not long ago, these were regular people. Computer technicians, teachers, plumbers, construction workers, accountants. This was before they fell under the ungodly influence of a new ruler. The center of this makeshift place of worship was once a normal school gymnasium, but it's now the home of a huge statue. A humanoid being, wreathed in tentacles. Its head is more like a squid or cuttlefish than anything resembling an actual human face. While he's known to the cultists as the Tentacled God, the beast they worship is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2662, and he sits in the belly of one of their expansive containment facilities, locked away from the world. But not for long, if his devoted followers have anything to say about it. This is their god, all-powerful and unchanging, and when it comes to springing him from containment, no tactic is too vile or underhanded to get the job done. Their mortal leader and high priest, a man in a purple robe calling himself Brother Marsh, walks among their crouched forms. He whispers instructions for the great day of liberation that's soon to come, providing everyone plays their part. It's a plan months in the making, and one that, if it goes off without a hitch, could free their monstrous god into the world. They would strike at the very heart of their enemy, the SCP Foundation, when they least expect it. And nothing shall stand in their way. How could they lose when they have a god on their side? But why did all these normal people become violent zealots for a squid-faced deity? It all began with a dream. To those who experienced these dreams, they felt more like prophecies, premonitions of the glorious horrors to come. A red sky, billions dead, and billions more enslaved, a dark silhouette on the horizon. Their tentacled god holding dominion over all. At first, it just seemed like a strange nightmare. The ones who experienced it woke up shaken and afraid, hoping to shake the images from their mind, but they couldn't. Every night, the nightmare would return. They'd see the images, the red sky, the dead and enslaved, the tentacled god. And after a while, it would come to them even when they weren't asleep, eventually happening whenever they closed their eyes. Little by little, this scene stopped looking so hideous and started to look glorious. They felt his presence in their minds, slowly pushing them towards their inevitable future. They started to realize that they wanted him to rule over the universe and to experience the honor of serving him. Many of them abandoned their homes and families, leaving their friends and loved ones left to worry that they'd gone insane. In their eyes, they were safer than they'd ever been. They finally had purpose. They were working in service of something far greater than themselves. The influence of the tentacled god drew them closer to one another, 
They would meet in secret, exchanging information from the prophecies their rulers sent to them in their dreams. They worshipped together, building altars and idols to congregate around. They performed dark blood rituals involving human and animal sacrifice. It was when Brother Marsh, the Anointed One, arrived to guide them towards their true mission that things kicked into high gear. Just three months prior, Brother Marsh had been an office drone working in data entry for a large insurance company before the tentacle god invaded his thoughts with a simple message. Free me, and the new world I create shall be your playground. Since then, he devoted himself completely to the cause quitting his job and maxing out his credit cards to help fund his new life's purpose, infiltrating the SCP Foundation and releasing his inhuman ruler from its imprisonment. That was the single goal he united the cultists under, freedom for the tentacled god. And at long last, they had all the pieces in place to strike. They'd finally gathered the necessary intel to subvert the will of the most powerful secret organization on Earth. Even the strongest institution is made of people, and people are weak. Unlike the almighty tentacled god, people could be broken. The people in question were Kelly Thompson, Sidney Levitt, Jordan Broche, Dr. Juan Gutierrez, and Jillian Larson. Dr. Juan Gutierrez was a researcher with level 3 clearance on the site where the tentacled god was being contained. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both security officers charged with verifying personnel clearance on site. Kelly Thompson was a member of Site Administration with Research Authorization Powers, and Jillian Larson was a research assistant who often collaborated with Dr. Gutierrez. These five were the key to getting access to SCP-2662 and bringing their plan to fruition. Normally, personnel dossiers on people working for the Foundation were highly confidential, but the devotees of the tentacled god had their ways. They had a number of computer experts in their ranks, more than capable of hacking in and pulling some basic information off of Foundation servers without being detected. For the other information they needed, they turned to some good old-fashioned torture, which is often the most effective method when you need some quick results. Of course, while the cult's grip on sanity may have been a little tenuous, they weren't stupid. While gathering their intel, they also made sure to find out what exactly they were up against. SCP-2662 was being held in a humanoid containment cell and guarded by on-site Task Force Tau-9, better known as the Belligerent Bodyguards. These aren't lazy, donut-chomping mall cops. These are a heavily trained, heavily armed fighting force. Though the cultists had one thing that these Foundation soldiers didn't, the element of surprise. For everything to go off perfectly, Brother Marsh's plans would have to be executed within a single day, and they were already on the clock. Tau-9 had been charged with tracking down any new SCP-2662 cults and dismantling them, and Brother Marsh knew that it was only a matter of time before the Foundation tracked them down and did the same to them. If they wanted any chance of freeing the tentacled god, then they'd need to strike quickly and with overwhelming force. The SCP-2662 worshippers were able to secure the addresses of the five key Foundation personnel and station members outside each of them, including one who could realistically imitate each. They waited for night to fall and broke into each of their homes as they slept. What followed was a sequence of ruthless and efficient murders done in the cause of freeing their god. Dr. Gutierrez was shot in the head while he slept. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both stabbed to death before either even realized what was happening. Thompson, who'd gotten up to use the bathroom, went down in a hail of machine gun fire. Jillian Larson had seen that masked figures were breaking into her home and attempted to flee, but was caught and beaten to death by cultists in her hallway. It was a strange irony that people whose day jobs entailed working with some of the most dangerous and nightmarish anomalies imaginable were murdered in their homes by nothing more than regular humans. So far, Brother Marsh's plan had gone perfectly, with all five key personnel murdered within a two-minute period. Next, the selected doppelgangers stole clothes from their victims' closets and were handed the correct forged documentation. The next morning, each replacement began their journeys to the site where the tentacled god was being contained, while the rest of the cult armed themselves in preparation for their own part in the plan. 
Nobody at the Foundation seemed to notice anything amiss when the five arrived on site. When you work for the SCP Foundation, more mental energy is devoted to following the rules that keep you alive than to memorizing the faces of all your co-workers, and each one slipped neatly into position, disappearing into the familiarity of office life. But infiltrating the site was one thing, getting past the belligerent bodyguards and into the cell of the tentacled god would be another thing entirely. That's where the rest of the cult would come into play. Heavily armed with whatever firearms they could get their hands on, the rest of the devotees of the tentacled god, Brother Marsh included, would attack the containment site head on. In the ensuing chaos, the five cultists who had already infiltrated the site could take advantage of the distraction and break into the containment chamber. It was perfect. They launched their attack from the outside and from within. When Brother Marsh declared that the time was right, the assault began. A legion of gun-wielding cultists seemed to spring out of nowhere and started shooting up the warehouse that was a front for the containment site. The site quickly mobilized guards and task force members to take on the sudden threat, and just as Brother Marsh had anticipated, the site director called on the majority of Tau-9 to help repel the violent cultists from their perimeter. Tau-9 obeyed, leaving three task force members behind to guard SCP-2662's containment chamber. They expected to be guarding the cell from rampaging religious zealots seeking an audience with their god. What they didn't expect was a group of five Foundation employees walking right up to them and opening fire, killing two Tau-9 members and taking the third as hostage. While the war was being waged outside, the infiltrators had found the tentacled god's containment cell in the low-risk humanoid ward. Their hostage insisted that using him wouldn't give them any leverage. The rest of his team would neutralize the whole group, him included, if that's what it took to stop them. The infiltrators explained that using him as leverage was never their intention. He wasn't a hostage at all. He was a sacrifice. The cultists of the tentacled god detonated explosives, creating a hole in the wall and finally giving them access to their deity. They climbed through and gazed upon him in awe. There stood SCP-2662, twice as tall as a regular man, with ten huge tentacles emerging from its back. In their months of envisioning this creature, they pictured it sitting on a throne made of thousands of human bones, ready to dictate its commands to the obedient liberators. What they certainly didn't expect was to see the tentacled god hunched over a computer screen. Still, gods work in mysterious ways. So they stuck to the plan and began chanting. They pulled out a sacrificial dagger and began sacrificing their captured Tau-9 member. It was at this point that SCP-2662 turned and saw what they were doing with a look of pure horror. He rose up from his computer, his headphones getting caught as he did so. He told them to go away, that he didn't want them here, and that them murdering people in his bedroom like this was inconsiderate and disgusting. The cultists became even more confused. Why wasn't their god accepting their offerings? What were they doing wrong? They tried more chanting and painting arcane symbols on the floor in blood, but this just seemed to make the creature angrier. He told them, in a tone more fitting for a teenage boy than a Lovecraftian god, to just leave him alone so he could play his video games. This was seriously not cool. The cultists were baffled. They told the tentacled god that they were there to free him, he replied that he didn't need saving, that crazy stalkers like them were why he turned himself into the Foundation in the first place. Before the cultist infiltrators could get another word in, the remaining members of Tau-9 stormed into the containment cell and gunned them down with surgical precision. The war outside was already over. Brother Marsh and the rest of the cultists were all killed in the firefight. Tau-9 didn't look the least bit surprised upon entering 2662's cell. This was a common occurrence, unfortunately. They had to deal with an attempted cult invasion every few months, because SCP-2662's main anomalous ability is inspiring violent cults who relentlessly track down and worship it with arcane and bloodthirsty rituals. The problem is, 2662 doesn't do this consciously, and definitely doesn't like the results. That's why he's under the voluntary care of the SCP Foundation, who keeps him amused with video games and reading material, while fending off the deranged cults who try to invade and abduct him. 
Following the termination of the devotees of the tentacle god, just one of many cults who'd broken into 2662's containment cell, the remaining Tau-9 members apologized to the tentacled creature for the disturbance, allowing him to return to his gaming. They assured him that it'd probably be at least a few more months before something like this happened again. SCP-2662's cell was repaired, and the Foundation returned to its task of seeking out would-be cult emancipators, because for the SCP Foundation, it's not always about the anomaly that's being kept in containment, but what's being kept down. It's 3 a.m. and the facility is quiet. Office workers and administrators roam the halls. Security officers stand at their posts, clad in advanced tactical armor and carrying standard-issue M4 carbines. Three Foundation employees sit at flickering monitors watching a live feed of footage from the containment cell of the infamous SCP-106, or as it's referred to by all staff, the Old Man. No Foundation personnel are permitted to travel within 60 feet of the cell for security reasons, and nobody is permitted to physically interact with the anomaly without the approval of two-thirds of O5 Command. The observer's eyes itch and sting from hours of unending blue light exposure, but they can't look away. The old man is crafty. He might have the insatiable bloodlust of a hungry great white shark, but he's not mindless. He's a calculating predator, more sadistic than the worst human serial killer, and he's always searching for the next opportunity. According to the Foundation records, he's been active since at least World War II, and it's estimated that he has hundreds if not thousands of victims to his name, and many of those made simple but extremely foolish mistakes of underestimating him. After all, it only takes a few seconds of inattentiveness and the briefest moment of distraction to give him the window he needs. To do what, you ask? Oh, don't worry. You'll find out, just like they did. <laughs> the old man has his nickname for a reason. Most of the time, he really does look exactly like that an old man, or more specifically an old man's decaying corpse, his body covered in rotten, dark, grayish-black flesh that looks like putrid meat. Though the creature has been observed being able to change shape, the rot seems to run too deep for the old man to ever hide it. Foundation employees that have observed SCP-106 for extended periods of time have reported seeing it assume the form of grinning, decayed children and women whose rotted flesh barely hangs on their creaking bones. Just seeing the images through a video feed is enough to cause a lifetime of insomnia and other sleeping issues. Still, they have a job to do and the cameras remain fixed on the old man. He's been completely motionless for three months, just sitting there like a Buddhist monk in deep meditation. A novice might see this period of inactivity as a cause for celebration, but those with experience know that this is merely the calm before the storm. SCP-106 can remain in a dormant state for months at a time. Described by the Foundation scientists as a lulling state, it's believed that the old man is simply waiting for its captors to get soft, make a mistake, or simply have a momentary lapse in concentration, which is all it needs to make its move. It had happened so many times before, and it was about to happen again. One of the observers must have felt an overwhelming wave of anxiety as he saw the creature ever so slightly twitch. Just a tiny quiver in the shoulder muscles, but that was enough to tell the observer that their day had just taken a terrifying turn. He grabbed the emergency phone fixed to his desk and practically screamed into the receiver that 106 is moving, that they need a tactical team stat. But it was already too late. He and the other two observers stared into the monitors with their mouths agape as a gooey, rust-like substance began to pool around the creature on the floor of its cell. Slowly, the creature craned its withered neck around. Its face was fixed into a broad, yellow-toothed, lipless grin. Its eyes had the kind of dull, flat malice of an underwater predator. It looked directly into the camera, directly at them, and smiled. The observers knew this was bad, really, really bad. With what they could have sworn was a little nod, the old man began sinking into the rusty puddle it made on the ground beneath it until it had disappeared entirely. SCP-106 is capable of phasing through any solid surface with ease, making it one of the hardest entities to reliably contain and earning it a spot on the dreaded Keter class, reserved for the anomalies that are complete nightmares to keep locked up. Through the years of costly research and deadly trial and error, the Foundation would later devise ways of at least slowing the creature down. It's shown to have an aversion to lead, highly complex or random physical structures, and intense bright light. None of these cause harm to the creature, as far as we know, literally nothing can, but they'll at least buy you some precious extra seconds with which to at least try and escape. Seconds the three observers didn't have. One of them grabbed an emergency line again and barked into it that they had lost visual on the anomaly. Just then, the observers heard a faint crackling sound behind them and the hissing of a chemical burn. They turned in horror to see a huge rusty burn mark expanding across the wall, right next to the door, which was their only escape route. 
They backed as far away from the door as they could as a rotten hand began reaching out of the mass of corrosive black sludge, followed by the grinning face of SCP-106, ready to have some fun. Meanwhile, two heavily armed security officers, Agents Goodwin and Resnick, came charging down the corridor toward the observation rooms. It became a bleak slogan during SCP-106 escape attempts that all you need to do is follow the screams, and that motto was proven true that night, because awful things were happening to the observation personnel. They were certainly screaming about it. Of course, even with the top-of-the-line firearms, there was little they could do to harm the rampaging old man. He seemed immune to all forms of physical damage. All they could hope to do was keep the thing distracted until the scientists and containment specialists finished the preparations to lure him back into his containment cell. Goodwin surged forward while Resnick covered his six. Vigilance was key, as unlike a standard human combatant, SCP-106 could attack from literally any angle including above or below. Physical obstacles were irrelevant to him and no cover was safe. The hardened security officers could see the burn mark on the wall of the observation room as they approached. SCP-106 was perpetually coated in a thick black mucus with powerful corrosive properties that left any surfaces it touched permanently marred. Foundation scientists speculated that this mucus served as a kind of pre-digestive substance that tenderizes meat and bone alike, but to what purpose this serves is a mystery as the old man has never been observed eating. It's postulated that the only purpose is causing additional pain. Goodwin and Resnick knew to treat this hissing sludge as a potential threat, as the corrosive properties would remain active for as much as six hours before finally fizzling out. The two officers shared a quiet nod before Goodwin breached the observation room door with a hard kick. The two of them surged inside, guns at the ready. In their time working at the Foundation, they'd seen some truly horrific sights. From the mutilation of D-Class personnel, typically death row prison inmates brought in for use as SCP guinea pigs, to the violence and mayhem of a containment breach. But there was nothing in their past that would ever make the horrifying sight they saw in the observation room that night feel normal. All three observers were dead. Almost nothing remained of two of them, and the third, while still intact, no longer looked human. He looked like he'd somehow been dead a hundred years in the brief period that the old man had been free. His skin was gray and completely dried out, and his mouth was locked into a perpetual scream. It was a massacre, but there was no sign of the old man. Goodwin grabbed his radio and whispered, This is Goodwin in Observation Room 6, requesting immediate backup. We have no idea where this thing is. But his sentence was cut off by a sudden scream from Agent Resnick. SCP Foundation security officers are as tough as nails, the best of the best, you might say, recruited from the top military organizations in the world. So hearing one of them scream in fright is a rare, if not impossible, occurrence. But even they were forced to yell out in fear when they looked up to see the old man standing on the ceiling, grinning down at them. Resnick raised his M4 and shot a three-round burst at center mass. SCP-106 didn't care. Even under sustained gunfire from the two security officers, it didn't flinch. The old man simply reached down and snatched Agent Resnick from the ground like it was picking an apple from a tree. The old man held Resnick in one hand and pounded its other rotten fist into the agent's body, breaking all of his bones. Resnick screamed for his partner to help him, but there was no time. Before Goodwin could do anything, SCP-106 began receding back into another slimy burn mark on the wall, only this time he was taking his screaming victim with him. Agent Resnick gave one more horrified scream before he was pulled backward into the inky darkness, leaving the room silent except for the burning hiss of the corrosive goo left behind. You might think this would be the end of it, but no. For poor Agent Resnick, the worst was yet to come. He was being dragged into what the SCP Foundation scientists refer to as the old man's pocket dimension, a miniature layer of reality within our own where the malicious SCP is essentially a cruel, all-powerful god. According to witness reports extracted from victims who were taken to this little nightmare realm, the dimension resembles a series of twisting, endless corridors where the old man stalks and tortures his captured victims to the breaking point, manipulating space and time to his own sadistic ends. On rare occasions, the SCP will even release its victims just for the joy of hunting, capturing, and torturing them all over again. While Agent Resnick was learning the true meaning of terror, containment specialists were mobilizing in its cell, preparing the one known tried and true method of luring the old man back, tempting it with the prospect of causing even more suffering. In order to do this, Foundation personnel take one of the aforementioned Class D personnel 
and begin inducing extreme pain by breaking a major bone or slicing a tendon every 20 minutes. The victim's agonizing screams are then played over the facility's intercom, acting as bait for the pain-loving old man. The screams echo through the facility's otherwise silent halls as the mutilated corpse of Agent Resnick falls from a new scorch mark on the ceiling. The old man can hear the sounds of suffering ringing out through the air around him, and he can barely contain his excitement over the prospect of a new plaything. The snapped femurs, the torn Achilles tendons, it was all too good to miss. Having had its twisted fun with the security officers and observers, SCP-106 wandered back to its containment cell, where a new screaming victim awaited. The other security officers, containment specialists, and scientists evacuated the area, leaving the old man alone with his prey. While the unfortunate Class D was left to his fate, the rest of the staff commenced cleanup procedures, which mainly involved wiping the brown and black mucus from the walls. It would probably be at least another month before anything like this happened again, and new personnel would be transferred over to the facility to replace the fallen. All in all, just another night at the SCP Foundation. It had happened again. Some absolute schmuck of a junior researcher had left a certain door ajar. The door that kept SCP-049 the Plague Doctor locked in his containment chamber. As a result, the good doctor had wandered out, and given the junior researcher a hug of appreciation for freeing him, leaving his dead body sprawled out across the ground. Typical, a problem solving itself. But this time, the problem had been a little more severe than just the one responsible facing immediate consequences of their actions. The Blake Doctor had grabbed the junior researcher's corpse and dragged him back into his cell, leaving the door once again slightly ajar. With a variety of equipment from his magical medical bag, the doctor had transformed the junior researcher's corpse into a disfigured zombie, in hopes of curing him of the pestilence and released him into the facility. 049 had followed him out to observe his behavior, and in the process he'd given several guards and members of janitorial staff a congratulatory hand touch, sending them to early graves. By the time people realized what was going on, six people were dead, several zombies were wandering around the building, and 049 was spotted in a lab stealing medical equipment. Dr. Clef, who was on duty at the time, was getting sick of this nonsense. This was actually the third breach that the Plague Doctor had been involved in this month, and it was only the 14th. He was frankly ready to wash his hands of this particular anomaly, because it wasn't just the fact that the Plague Doctor killed people that bothered Dr. Clef. After all, Dr. Clef himself had killed a considerable number of people. It was the fact that the Plague Doctor was also so damn sanctimonious about it. Clef breathed a sigh and rubbed his temples to subdue the incoming headache. It was time to have a little tribunal and decide what disciplinary action he would take against this freaky physician. The Plague Doctor was on his knees, locked into place by heavy chains and restraints around his neck, arms, and legs. These weren't even official Foundation property. Dr. Clef had brought them in from his private leisure room back at his house. Oof. As usual, the doctor was preaching the immense value of his work. The pestilence runs rife, Dr. Clef. Surely you must see that, the doctor cried. You're a man of science yourself, allegedly. Surely you can empathize with my mission. I just want to help people. Can't you see? I'm just like you. Blah, blah, blah. Always this goddamn pestilence. Do you ever turn off? Clef said, waving away the doctor's words. I don't know about your pestilence, but I'm definitely looking at a pest right now. What the hell am I supposed to do with you? No matter what allowances we give you, you just keep escaping. The doctor hung his head. He hated when people treated him like this, like some wild animal. Of course, occasionally people died, but it was only in the pursuit of saving so many more lives. He tried to convince Dr. Clef that the costs would pale in the face of the rewards, but the gung-ho Foundation researcher simply wasn't interested in hearing it. Instead, he was brewing up a new idea, one that might rid him of the Plague Doctor forever, even without breaking the Foundation's goofy rule against killing anomalies. You know what, Dr. Clef said, affecting a voice of mock kindness. You finally got your words through my thick head. I get it now. I get how important your research is. All this time we've been stepping in the way of Nobel Prize winning work. I don't know how I'll ever live with myself for this. I just want to say personally on behalf of the SCP Foundation, we are truly sorry. Suddenly, the Plague Doctor perked up. My goodness, he thought. I've finally gotten through. He was practically vibrating with glee. Your apology is accepted, good sir, the Plague Doctor proclaimed. Let us not obsess over the past. We will look towards the future. Exactly. 
Dr. Clef cut in. That's why, by way of an apology, I plan to reassign you to a special research facility where you get to run the show. You'll have live test subjects aplenty and no accountability to the Foundation whatsoever. How does that sound to you, Doc? The Plague Doctor somehow rose to his feet despite the chains, perhaps propelled by the sheer force of his love for science. I suggest we leave at once, he said. Thank you, Dr. Clef, you kind, kind man. I always knew that you were the reasonable one. Even Dr. Clef had to resist the urge to laugh about that one. Smash cut to the next day, when Dr. Clef, the Plague Doctor, and a group of mobile task force officers were crowded into a helicopter heading towards SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. Of course, the Plague Doctor didn't know that. He thought he was heading towards the state-of-the-art research facility that Dr. Clef promised him. Clef, on the inside, reasoned that what this bird brain moron didn't know wouldn't hurt him. The helicopter landed within the perimeter established around the abandoned Ikea, and the Plague Doctor was herded off the vehicle. He'd bought Clef's lie, hook, line, and sinker, and as such was unusually cooperative with the guards. Dr. Clef pointed to the building and instructed the Plague Doctor to head inside and just keep walking. He'd find the test subjects and the facility soon enough, and why would the Foundation be lying to him? They'd even let him take his medical bag in there. When you get in there, ask for Hugh. He'll be your lead assistant, Dr. Clef told him. Lead assistant? You mean to tell me I will have multiple research assistants? The plague doctor said, Oh, splendid. I cannot wait to meet this Hugh. Oh, yeah, Dr. Clef said, biting his bottom lift to stifle a laugh. His name's Jazz. Be sure to mention that. It'll help speed along the process. The plague doctor nodded his head in thanks. Much appreciated, Dr. Clef. Rest assured, I will not forget this kindness. As the Plague Doctor wandered into the abandoned store, his heart swelling with pride, Dr. Clef began to quietly laugh behind his back like the big old jerk face he was. When he could no longer see the Plague Doctor, Clef turned to one of his colleagues and jokingly asked, Does that mean we'll need to reclassify 3008 as Thaumiel now? Not looking forward to that paperwork. On the inside of the infinite Ikea, the Plague Doctor was chuckling to himself with glee. After all these years of hard work, his merit had been recognized, and he'd been given the respect he deserved from his peers at the Foundation. He was so wrapped up in his own sense of personal pride that he didn't even register it as strange that he was surrounded by odd, sterile living rooms, bedrooms, bathrooms, and kitchens, all in a seemingly random configuration with signs next to them in a mix of the King's English and what he believed to be some form of Swedish that he didn't quite understand. Still, he didn't mind too much. He just assumed that these must be the accommodations for himself, his patients, his test subjects, and his research assistants, and to think they'd built this whole place just for him and his research. It lifted his soul to know that the SCP Foundation had finally recognized the pestilence for the danger that it is. From now on, everything would change. He'd probably find the cure in the next few years. Then, it suddenly occurred to him. He was a little lost. The layout of the research laboratory was incredibly strange. It seemed like an utterly arbitrary configuration of bizarre rooms, separated by wide aisles. It didn't seem sanitary at all. Where were the sealed laboratories, the gurneys, the patient beds, the medical equipment? And on top of all that, where was Hugh? Some kind of shenanigans were afoot. That much was clear now. The Plague Doctor quickened his pace through the halls of this strange building. One way or another, he would get to the bottom of this. Nothing would get in the way of the important research he planned to conduct here. After what felt like hours of aimless walking, the Plague Doctor encountered some other sentient beings, a group of three people wearing ragged, post-apocalyptic-looking clothes, all carrying defensive kitchen knives and hammers. The Doctor was overjoyed to see these people he could actually converse with. The others, upon seeing him, were a little taken aback. Had some Renfair cosplayer somehow accidentally wandered into the building? What on earth was going on here? Excuse me, good sirs, the Plague Doctor called out. I'm searching for a huge jazz. That caused the group to break into laughter, immediately lessening the tension. The de facto leader of the group, Calvin, replied, aren't we all? 049 didn't get it. But these humans nonetheless liked the cut of this new guy's jib. All three of them had been in here for at least a year each, and it had been a while since they had a good laugh in this terrible labyrinthian place. Calvin stepped forward, lowering his weapons now that he could see that this weird cosplayer guy didn't seem like a threat. He cleared his throat and asked, Mind if I ask who you are, fella? The plague doctor was taken aback by this question. Did they not prepare you in advance for my arrival? The group shook their heads. How strange, the plague doctor said. 
Well, I suppose some proper introductions are in order then. I am your new leader, as appointed by Dr. Clef of the SCP Foundation. I am a reasonable man, a man of science, and under my leadership, we will be a scientific force the likes of which the world has never seen. Together we will cure the pestilence and save all of mankind. There was a long pause after that. None of the group of humans really knew how to react to this. Calvin thought to himself, Great, we got ourselves a major space case. Let's get him back to the camp before he gets himself killed. He forced a smile and nodded, pretending to be impressed by the plague doctor's bizarre ranting. Well then, doctor, he said, we better get you back to our camp. We're not going to get anything done while we're just standing around, will we? The plague doctor couldn't agree more. He followed the group of his three new research assistants further into this incredibly strange scientific building. The plague doctor indeed appreciated Dr. Clef putting all this together for him, but he would privately indulge in the thought that Dr. Clef seemingly could not put together a laboratory to save his life. This place was a bizarre, confusing disaster, but he would still make it work one way or another. However, his musings were interrupted when the lights went out. The three people with him began gasping in shock and horror. Calvin was repeating to himself, No, this is impossible. I timed it. I swear I timed it. But the plague doctor found their attitude to be utterly baffling. These were supposedly to be intrepid men of science, and yet they were afraid of the dark. It seemed they really did need his leadership to get anything done here. Follow me, gentlemen, the plague doctor said. It's merely a failure of the lights. I'll get this rubbish sorted out. He began to walk forward as the three human beings began to panic behind him, telling him that if he keeps walking, he'll die. He needs to come back. They need to stick together. But he kept walking. He didn't get this far by being a coward, after all. At least the others are following him now, wielding their hammers and kitchen knives. He'd whip them into shape. Then his attention was stolen by something altogether stranger. It was a creature, humanoid but not human, standing about ten feet away from him, seemingly ignorant to his presence. The Plank Doctor was simultaneously fascinated and horrified by what he saw before him. It was in some kind of yellow and blue uniform, with a hideous, malformed, faceless head and two long, tangled arms that it dragged along the floor behind it like an orangutan. It was a truly repulsive, pitiful creature, one that made the plague doctor sad to even look at it. Clearly this had to be an advanced case of the pestilence. While the plague doctor was filled with scientific curiosity, his three human traveling companions were filled with terror. They were still so far away from the camp, and the staff had found them already? Because there's never just one. They're like big, deadly cockroaches. If you can see one, more are on the way. Their best bet is just staying incredibly quiet and trying to sneak past. Hello there, you poor fellow, the plague doctor said, stepping forwards and waving. It seems you are in dire need of some medical assistance. Calvin and his two companions were mortified. So this was how they were going to die? After making the mistake of being kind to a clearly deranged man dressed as a medieval plague doctor? What a way to go. The second it heard the plague doctor's voice, the member of staff was activated, as were several others in a 10 meter radius. They all suddenly stood upright, muscles taut with violence waiting to happen. They began chanting their dreaded phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. While converging and running towards the plague doctor like a pack of hungry dogs, it was a terrifying sight to behold. But not for the plague doctor himself. There were so many of these poor infected people, and clearly the pestilence had not only warped their bodies but broken their minds. After all, this wasn't a store. This was the new research center specifically designed for his research. Dr. Clef would surely never just lie about something like that. He was an honorable man. Then again, maybe that was exactly why Clef had sent him here. So many victims of advanced pestilence would make perfect test subjects. A paradise of research. The plague doctor couldn't be happier as a group of 10 staff members converged on him. Calvin and his men could barely look. The new guy may have been crazy, but he didn't deserve to go out like this. However, the last thing they expected was for the plague doctor to calmly raise his hands, allowing the members of staff to run right into his deadly touch. In the following moments, all 10 of them were lying on the ground, dead. The three men were utterly speechless. What had just happened? Had the man in the strange costume snuck in a secret knife or a silenced gun? Had he gone into some hyper-advanced instant-kill kung fu move that was simply too fast and subtle for them to perceive? Or had he really just killed ten members of staff in mere seconds just by touching them? The plague doctor turned to them and said, Well then, gentlemen, let us not dilly-dally. Grab one each and we'll carry them to the laboratory on the double. 
Soon after, the plague doctor and his three research assistants arrived at a nearby encampment. Several other members of staff had attacked them on the way, but a single touch from the plague doctor had killed each one. The human's perspective on this mysterious stranger had changed entirely. He'd gone from a goofy crank to a godlike savior. For as long as they'd been in here, they'd lived in terror of staff, but they were nothing to this man. With a single touch from him, they were gone forever. As the doors of the camp were closed behind him, the people of the camp began running towards them, confused and curious. The plague doctor was delighted to see that there were so many other research assistants here to help him on his divine mission. Dr. Clef, that beautiful, sweet man, had given him such a boon. Perhaps now, the pestilence may finally be cured. One of the camp leaders ran over furious and yelled, What the hell are you doing? You know you can't just bring those bodies in here. It'll only attract more of them, you fool. Fool. The plague doctor found this rather rude, but he'd overlook it for the sake of the greater good. He'd spent his whole life dealing with the aspirations from lesser intellects who couldn't even begin to understand his work. The masses rarely understand processes, only results. And here he knew he would be able to give them results. Worry not, good sir. I am a medical man, the plague doctor said, simply walking past the naysayer and bidding his first three research assistants to drag the bodies after him. I will bring this place up to code. You will see soon enough that my scientific leadership is second to none. Now I will retire to my office and begin dissecting these samples. Before the camp leader could say anything else, the plague doctor had retired into a staff room, which had been retrofitted as a kind of headquarters for members of the camp. That's when Calvin approached the camp leader and told him the astonishing news. Look, boss, I know he looks like a goofball in a Halloween costume, he said, but this guy, he's special, he's something else, he can kill the staff. The camp leader scoffed. So can we, he said. Calvin shook his head. No, you don't get it, boss. Not like us. This guy, he can kill the staff just by touching them. And the camp leader had no response to that. In his new study, the plague doctor was dissecting one of the dead staff members and was astonished to see what was happening within. The creature had no organs. It was simply that strange, slightly yellow tissue all the way down. He'd never seen the pestilence have such a profound and horrific effect on its victims. It had horribly altered them, all the way to the core. Was this what the Great Dying was truly capable of in its later stages? The plague doctor shuddered, both with horror and scientific excitement. He'd barely been here a day, and he'd made some of the most incredible discoveries. He took fastidious notes on these new revelations, feeling the picture coming together in his mind. His deep scientific thoughts were interrupted by the door opening, and Calvin and the camp leader stepped in. The camp leader was different than before. He had none of the bluster and arrogance of his first words. He showed fealty, like he was standing in the presence of a divine being. I I'd like to formally welcome you to our camp, Doctor, the camp leader said. We're extremely fortunate to have you here. Please, if you need anything, don't hesitate to let us know. We are truly at your service. The plague doctor was delighted to hear this. With a polite nod, he replied, More test subjects like these will do just fine, good sir. I believe I am very close to a breakthrough here. Having your ordinary life unceremoniously change forever without a moment's notice is something that people can often find themselves hoping for. Anything to break life's monotony and change circumstances to make them more interesting. Although, when that change comes in the form of being trapped in an endless IKEA outlet, it's not exactly the different kind of circumstances that people usually hope for. That was the situation that had befallen Winston not too long ago. What started as a simplistic, straightforward shopping trip with the goal of purchasing some affordable, stylish Swedish furniture had resulted in him having to adopt a completely different lifestyle. You see, Winston was one of the untold number of people to have an encounter with SCP-3008, better known colloquially as the Infinite Ikea. Appearing as an ordinary store, those entering the doors of SCP-3008 find themselves in an unending labyrinth of aisles upon aisles filled with flat pack homeware. It can be quite the system shock, of course, especially when people that find themselves inside the infinite IKEA learn there's no way to escape, even by retracing their steps back the way they came. Doing so, they'll only be met with a disheartening realization that the entrance isn't where it was upon their arrival. Now at first, learning that you've lost your entire life and are doomed to spend the rest of your days inside a limitless IKEA is admittedly a lot to take in. 
your friends, family, job, all your worldly possessions are now unreachable, and everyone back home might likely spend many years wondering what happened to you. But it's not all bad news. As previously mentioned, Winston wasn't the only one to find himself in this predicament. Over the years, countless people have found their way inside the infinite Ikea. Given how expansive the interior of the NeverEnding store was, there has never been a way to know for certain exactly how many people have come to reside within SCP-3008, but it's enough to populate the number of small settlements that these survivors have been able to establish inside. By innovatively repurposing the materials around them, these individuals have found themselves to be the new denizens of SCP-3008. Imagine whole towns constructed from chairs and tables that have been used as building materials to provide a place of sanctuary to those that need it when they first arrive in the infinite Ikea. Sure, it takes a pretty big adjustment to this new lifestyle, but luckily, SCP-3008 provides for its inhabitants by automatically replenishing the food within its canteen. Naturally, it only offers items that are on the Ikea menu, but that's at least a consistent source of food and nutrition for those dwelling in its aisles. With food already taken care of, people inside SCP-3008 didn't even need to work. That was the strangest part that Winston found himself having to adapt to when he first got to the settlement of Cookware, named after the nearby sign that hung from the ceiling nearby, denoting one of the many departments of the store. It was odd to him how friendly everyone was. How much the people trapped inside 3008 cut off from the outside world forever seemed happy. There were many who'd been there for the longest that even claimed it was a better sense of life than out there in the real world. Inside the IKEA, there was a strong sense of community. Settlements helped each other out with construction, and because everything was provided for, no one had any need for selfishness or greed. After all, there was plenty of food to go around and money had no relevance. Ironic given they were all living inside a huge furniture store. Witnessing all of that helped Winston adapt to his new life inside SCP-3008 and made him feel a lot better about being in this predicament. The only real thing anyone inside the infinite IKEA had to worry about was the threat of the staff. These were the tall, faceless humanoids with elongated arms and legs that roamed the aisles of the furniture store while wearing distinctive IKEA uniforms. Most of the time, they remained docile, paying the human survivors little attention. That is, until the fluorescent lights above dimmed, signaling the beginning of nighttime. The staff usually became aggressive, repeating the ominous phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building and attacking anyone they came into contact with. Thanks to their ingenuity, the survivors in the IKEA had constructed barriers around their settlements to keep the staff out, and that did the trick, repelling the faceless employees that come at night. But little did anyone inside SCP-3008 realize that simple barricades wouldn't stop an entirely new threat from entering the store to disrupt their peaceful way of life. For outside the infinite IKEA, Something wicked was stirring. Meanwhile, at a facility belonging to the SCP Foundation, a researcher by the name of Corbin Donnell had recently been assigned to SCP-035. Also known as the Possessive Mask, this white porcelain mask could shift between a comedy grin or a tragic frown. It also had the nasty trait of being an evil psychic artifact that could manipulate anyone around it into placing the mask over their face. At that point, SCP-035 would take full control of its wearer, making them into a host for the mask itself. So, would you like to take a guess as to what happened to Researcher Donnell? The voice in his head, that persuasive whisper, it wouldn't leave him alone. All day long, it was there, but whenever Corbin was near SCP-035, it got louder, and as the days he was studying the possessive mask went on, the whisper became a shout. The screams to put on the mask were taunting him, keeping him awake at night, tormenting him all through the waking day, until eventually he'd had enough. Given that SCP-035 produced a corrosive black substance that usually melted anything around it, the mask had to periodically be taken out of its containment case so that the container housing it could be replaced. And it was during one of these transfers that researcher Donnell calmly swept in, pushing away the guards taking it out of its melted case before they could place it in a new one. The aggression from the researcher caught the security personnel by surprise, 
as did what he did next. Not caring what the possessive mask would do to him, Corbin lifted the white porcelain to his face. He wasn't even aware that the containment breach alarms were sounding. All that noise sank into the background as the psychic voice in his head got louder than it ever had before. There wasn't even so much as a split-second awareness from researcher Donnell of the searing pain as the dark sludge oozing from the mask made contact with his skin, melting his face as he wore SCP-035. By that point, it was already too late. The possessive mask had full control. Corbin's body wasn't his own anymore. Although it still moved, walking quickly out of the room and through the halls of the Foundation facility, the researcher beneath was already dead. There was only SCP-035, piloting its newest host to freedom. Of course, while containment breach was still an urgent matter, the Foundation knew that SCP-035's biggest weakness was itself. The black secretion that poured out of the possessive mask would melt anything it came into contact with, and would ultimately cause the body of its host to melt into nothing. Once that happened, it would be far easier to recontain SCP-035. Someone would merely have to pick it up and place it back in the containment case. However, SCP-035 knew this, too. The mask itself was cunning. It hadn't just picked Researcher Donnell at random to be its new vehicle. It wanted him specifically because of his previous posting. Before he had worked with SCP-035, Corbin had been stationed to observe any potential changes at the entrance of SCP-3008. As it stayed firmly on the researcher's face, using him to carry itself out of the Foundation site it had been trapped in, SCP-035 was scouring the remnants of Corbin's mind. It used its innate psychic abilities to plunder the depths of his brain, looking for information. The location of SCP-3008 was right there, stored away safely in researcher Donnell's memories, as was the way to get there. And on top of that, the reason SCP-035 had taken such an interest in making it to the infinite IKEA. During the Foundation's many years of study and exploration of SCP-3008, they came to learn that not all of the survivors inside the infinite IKEA had originated from the same universe. The current theory was that the entrances to this endless furniture store existed simultaneously in multiple realities, meaning that the people now living alongside each other, inside SCP-3008, were actually from varying different worlds across the multiverse. Now, if you were incredibly cunning, incredibly clever, and incredibly sick of being held captive by the Foundation, then perhaps you could figure out a way to navigate your way through the infinite IKEA. You could enter through the front door in one universe, and then exit into another. And of course, that was what the possessive mask was planning to do. As it approached the main entrance of SCP-3008, the black sludge leaking out of the mask had almost destroyed what was left of researcher Corbin Donnell. It wiped more of the corrosive secretion onto the guards stationed at the infinite IKEA, melting through them as SCP-035 made its way inside. First things first, the mask knew it had to find itself a new body to pilot before Corbin's expired. And it didn't take long for the possessive mask to happen across an unwitting candidate between the aisles of flat pack tables. At around the same time this was happening, Winston, having long since gotten used to the rhythm of life inside SCP-3008, was on his way to the food court. He knew the route by heart now, and as he strolled closer, he was pondering over what he'd help himself to today from the menu. But it was while making his way there that he noticed something, or rather, he noticed not something, that he usually did. There were no staff anywhere around. Although they did not pay the survivors any mind during the day, when the lights of the IKEA were on, Winston knew that the staff members were always present. There were usually a couple milling about the aisles he had to pass in order to get from the settlement of cookware to the food hall, but today, there were none. And while this wouldn't usually be any cause for alarm, it kept playing on Winston's mind as he sat down to eat his plate of Swedish meatballs. He'd been inside SCP-3008 for such a long time that he'd become accustomed to the routine of living there, and the absence of the staff immediately stuck out as something that was out of its usual place. Finishing his food, Winston asked around, talking with his fellow residents of the infinite IKEA, asking if any of them had encountered any of the tall, faceless staff members on their way to get their meals. Each and every one of them that he asked, from varying different settlements, all answered the same. 
that they hadn't spotted any staff all day. As much as they were a minor threat to the human beings living inside the infinite Ikea, the absence of the store's only other residents kept playing on Winston's mind. Whatever was going on, the staff seemingly vanishing couldn't mean anything good. And so he decided to venture out into the aisles to figure out what exactly was going on. What he found was unlike anything anyone had ever seen in SCP-3008 before. It took Winston several long and uneventful hours to catch even a momentary glimpse of a staff member. He almost felt like someone trekking through a forest looking to get a sighting of Bigfoot or some other elusive urban legend. But as the third hour became the fourth, he spotted a hint of movement between the aisles. Following at a safe distance, listening out for the slightest sounds, Winston couldn't help but think he detected the noise of something heavy being dragged along the stone floor. Peeking out from between the aisles, he saw them. A huge group of staff members were all huddled in a display dining room, only there was something different about all of them. They still retained their recognizable tall and humanoid shapes, with long, disproportionate limbs, but there was something smeared over the staff, a dark, oily black substance that seemed to melt through the floor as it dripped off them. From his hiding place, Winston soon saw where that substance had originated from. The thing being dragged across the floor was another staff member, looking more normal than the rest. One of the others, covered in the corrosive sludge, was gripping it by the collar of its IKEA polo shirt and bringing it through the group. Meanwhile, the ordinary creature was thrashing and flailing its lengthy arms around, trying to get free. It was dragged up to a staff member in the middle of the group, which turned and shocked Winston at the strange sight of it. This staff member, evidently the leader, had a face. Or rather, it was wearing a mask. SCP-035 was now firmly affixed to the slender, faceless being, its expression locked in a wide grin that seemed to convey a twisted sense of glee. Its black secretion didn't seem to be affecting its new host in the same way it usually did. The body of the staff member it was now piloting didn't seem to dissolve. As the uncorrupted staff creature was presented to the masked leader, SCP-035 compelled its newfound followers to restrain their prisoner. The workers within SCP-3008 didn't have much in the way of their own free will, or even personalities to speak of. They did, however, seem to share some sort of connection to each other, a hive mind of sorts. So presented with a powerful psychic force like the Possessive Mask, the entity had been able to not only take over one of the staff members as its new host, but spread its influence to the others. And while Winston watched horrified, it unknowingly demonstrated this. The captive staff member was grabbed and held by the others, its long arms and legs pulled apart. The huddled group lifted it up off the floor so that it couldn't free itself and run off into the endless aisles of furniture. Wearing SCP-035, the leader extended an arm, black ooze dripping from it, the droplets burning holes in the floor as it reached towards the faceless head of the restrained staff member. It placed a large hand over the faceless head of the captive. More of the corrosive secretion passed on to the newest addition to SCP-035's growing army. As the black substance spread over the staff member, so did the influence of the possessive mask force its way into another vessel. I'm telling you, I know what I saw! Winston protested, after recounting the events to the other settlers back at Cookware. There's something else out there, something new and dangerous, and it's infecting the staff. Oh, that's ridiculous, replied Bryce, one of the survivors who had been there much longer. I've been here for years and I've never even heard of such a thing, they yelled. I saw it with my own eyes, Winston argued. It has a small army of them already under its control. Even if what you're saying is true, someone else chimed in. What does it matter? We've already got barriers that keep the staff out, and they only attack at night anyways. Surely, even if this mask thing really is in control of them now, who cares? As if on cue, one of the lookouts at the cookware settlement started frantically trying to get everyone's attention. They pointed to the ominous glow coming from just beyond the nearby aisles filled with wardrobe frames. An orange flicker was visible, even under the lights of the store which were still on, although blocked a little by thick plumes of black smoke rising up towards the ceiling. That's lighting, the lookout said in shocked disbelief, stating the name of another nearby community of survivors that was named after an IKEA store department. Something must have happened over there, Bryce declared. Uh, maybe it's an electrical fire that's gotten out of control. It's them, Winston said solemnly. It can't be them, the older survivor snapped, 
The lights are still on. It's still daytime in the store and the staff never attacked during the day. I don't think the rules are the same anymore. Frustrated, Winston continued to argue. There's no telling what that mask did to them. Ah, uh, perhaps. Bryce was trying desperately to come up with a suggestion, but was clearly grasping at straws. Uh, what if this mask can be reasoned with? If it's more intelligent than the staff, we can... We can negotiate. Uh, there must be something it wants. What do you think it wants? It wants this place, this Ikea. And now it has control of enough staff to form a small army. You think it's just gonna stop there? It's coming for all of us. And it won't stop until it's got the whole store under its control. And if it has to wipe us out to do that? Well, it looks like it's not hesitating. So what do we do? A voice called meekly. Winston turned to see the townsfolk of Cookware had gathered, all looking up at him with terrified expressions on their faces. He gazed back at each one of them, then looked back over at the smoke now towering over where lighting had been, and was now in flames. Who knew how many of the settlers there were still alive, and how long it would be before SCP-035 and its new army did the same to Cookware? Something had to be done. We need to get the word out, Winston announced to the other survivors. I need our fastest to run over to the other towns in the store. You each take one, you pass on the message, and then you come back. You know your way around well enough, so avoid anywhere you'd normally see staff. Even if they haven't been corrupted, we can't chance it. Why don't we tell the other settlements? Somebody in the crowd called. You tell them what's going on. You say that something has come here to threaten this Ikea and our way of life. This place isn't where any of us first came from, but it's all our home now. It's provided for us, but now it needs us to defend it, Winston explained. And how exactly are we gonna do that? Bryce asked. The lights had gone out, but although night had fallen, it wasn't dark yet. Standing with their fellow survivors from numerous other settlements, the residents of SCP-3008 had fashioned flaming torches from the legs of Ikea desks and tables. And that wasn't all. They were carrying makeshift weapons. Some had spears crafted using curtain rails with sharp kitchen implements fashioned to the end. Others had wardrobe doors in their hands to act as rudimentary shields. They were hardly warriors, but as an army of corrupted staff members lurched out of the darkness towards them, each survivor of SCP-3008 knew what they had to do. At the front of the army towered the staff member with SCP-035 on its faceless head. The possessive mask's wide grin had shifted, now a long frown, almost one of disgust at the amassed settlers who opposed it. As it raised an elongated arm to command its horde, Winston raised a curtain rail spear into the air. FOR IKEA! He yelled, as the residents of SCP-3008 charged. It was such a normal morning, almost comically uneventful. For the first time in what felt like forever, the morning newscasts had very little to say. They covered Fashion Week, some protests in the capital, a new health craze sweeping the nation, a funny viral video of a dog eating a pancake, the inspirational story of a young boy from the Midwest beating cancer, a minor political scandal out of Tallahassee, Florida that nobody would remember in a week, a round of interviews with an expert who'd written a new book about the long-term effects social media might have on our children. None of them knew back then that long-term was a luxury they couldn't afford. People went to work, to school, some took the day off. Plenty took walks or jogs, deciding to exercise outside for a change. After all, it was such a beautiful sunny day out. What a terrible shame it would be to waste the light indoors. People were sleepwalking, so placidly, blissfully unaware of what was rattling down the tracks towards them. It was an uncharacteristically slow day down at Site-19. There hadn't been any containment breaches in over a week. A couple of new anomalies had been brought into containment, one safe class and one Euclid, but neither were the kind that was likely to bring the SCP Foundation any trouble. Right now, the biggest threat facing their employees seemed to be boredom, and they definitely take that over any other members of their rogues gallery. Dr. Bright poured himself a mug of nice, hot coffee and decided to watch some TV in the break room just to pass the time. The President of the United States was giving a press conference on the White House lawn, surrounded by microphones. It was really nothing special, just the same inane babble about how he was going to fix the deficit, and with inflation on the rise, we'd all need to work on being more fiscally responsible. The Immortal Foundation researcher sipped his coffee. These normal, boring problems felt like the perfect escape from the insanity he needed to deal with every day at the Foundation. 
The president was saying something about the importance of families and about farmers being the nation's real backbone when something happened. There was an odd shift in the quality of the light. Dr. Bright barely registered it. Maybe it was something to do with the cameras. However, things started to get stranger. The president's speech began to slur, as though he'd just been pumped with enough morphine to take down an elephant. But it wasn't just that. He was sweating buckets, too. Wet patches expanded all over his suit, and perspiration was dripping off his skin. Dr. Bright was in suspense. Was he about to watch the president have a stroke live on air? Would he be called in to replace him yet again? But no. The situation unfolding was far, far worse. The President of the United States slumped forward over his podium while the reporting corps screamed. His face sloughed off his skull like melting wax, the President's words slurring off into infinity. It was the worst a U.S. President had looked on film since SCP-1981. Dr. Bright dropped his coffee cup. It tumbled and shattered onto the ground below. The camera fell as the operator screamed. It pointed down into the crowd where the reporters were shrieking in pain and terror, steam coming off their bodies with the sudden intense climb and heat. They were all melting. All of them were melting before his very eyes broadcast out to how many people it would be the mother of all containment nightmares. Little did Dr. Bright know, that wasn't even the half of the true horrors unfolding. Alarms went off across every containment site in the world. Any SCP Foundation employees unlucky enough to be standing outside at the time were lost in the rapidly unfolding horrors. They screamed as the sun cleaved their atoms apart, reducing them into semi-liquid states without the mercy of death. People lucky to be just out of the sun could only watch as those less fortunate disintegrated across the ground in unholy shrieking puddles. Never had such a normal day been thrown into such terrifying chaos in so little time. Billions of voices cried out at once as the sun changed in the sky above them. Since the dawn of humanity, it had given us everything. Light to bask in, warmth to keep us safe, and the life of the plants and animals that kept us fed. It had been worshipped as a god by countless cultures over thousands of years, one great mother to all of humanity. And now, that mother was drowning us in the bathtub. And perhaps the most frightening part of all, it was for seemingly no reason. No reason at all. The SCP Foundation was forced to now break their silence forever. The masquerade, the veil, it melted along with so much of humanity. They took over every communications channel in the world and did what they could to inform people on how to get out of harm's way. Stay inside. Wrap yourself in sun-shielding clothing and only move at night. Air travel is preferable, if possible. If you can, make your way to one of the SCP Foundation's secure sites, their only chance of preserving humanity and figuring out how to reverse this new nightmare. Now more than ever, the SCP Foundation would be humanity's only hope. Until, of course, there was another terrifying twist in the tale. While those who were melted into piles of living flesh sludge were sadly assumed to be lost, even the Foundation didn't expect the transformed humans to become a threat in and of themselves. Just as their bodies were melted, so were their minds. They became slaves, cultists of the growing tyrant hanging up above. Some would coagulate into huge fleshy masses, horrifying threats that would seek out victims, overpower them, and drag them out into the light to be absorbed and transformed. Even those hiding inside Foundation containment centers weren't safe. These behemoths of melted flesh would find their way in, using their many twisted voices to slowly break the minds of their victims, then gather them up with great flesh tendrils and yank them out into their doom. Little by little, the numbers of humanity dwindled. It looked like we had a bright future ahead of us. And in this particular context, that's far from a good thing. Survivors, for whatever time they had left, would forever remember this walking nightmare. The Foundation dubbed it SCP-001 to reflect its ultimacy, but to everyone else it had a different name. When day breaks. In a world where anything but darkness will kill you, is there anywhere left on Earth that's truly safe from the horrors of SCP-001? Five months into the never-ending horror of the Solar Singularity, 
Alice spooned herself a bowl full of warm Swedish meatballs. Delicious. She was part of an investigative detail from a nearby community, deep within the bowels of the only truly safe place for human beings on planet Earth. SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea. No sun had ever shone in there, only the lights, which fizz and flicker far above. Everyone inside thinks of it as a prison. Little do they know, what's left of humanity out there would kill to be inside this sanctuary. Alice had a team of ten with her. Their mission was simple. Continue the mapping effort of the area surrounding their community and collect rations for the rest of the camp. It was dangerous work, especially as night drew close, but there were certain rewards. When they reached a feeding station, they were able to enjoy fresher food than anyone else. All they needed to do was wager their lives for it. To Alice, it seemed like a fair trade. Her lieutenant Darcy kept watch to the north. He and several others wielded makeshift spears made from curtain rods and clubs fashioned from bedposts. Knives scavenged from the kitchen section hung from their belts in makeshift holsters. During the day, they were little more than a precaution. At night, it could mean the difference between life and death. Speaking of, Darcy kept a close watch on a member of staff. It was a lanky, faceless monster in that garish uniform, with a bulbous, oversized head and long arms, hanging slack like pulled taffy, dragging its knuckles along the ground as it stumbled along. Darcy thought it darkly funny how stupid they could look in the daytime, like crash test dummies rejected from the assembly line. Bear stood close by. He never gave any of them his real name, so they took to calling him Bear, because he was big, hairy, and would probably tear you to shreds if you got on his bad side. He wielded the largest club of all, a customized creation with sharp objects sticking out of it on all sides. It cleaved the heads of many staff members off their bodies. Bear seemed to relish the task of putting those monsters down. For him, it was easy and fun. That's why he was an essential asset on these missions. A berserker. Most of the grunts shoveled as much food as they could carry in IKEA-branded Tupperware and coolers. The more they gathered, the longer it would take for them to be forced out beyond the safe walls of the haven they built inside this Swedish flatpack hell. They all made do with what they had in here. It was all they could really do. Two members of the team were unaccounted for, Cyril and Joseph, would pass for reconnaissance experts down here. They seemed to have an innate sense of direction, as though they were somehow in tune with the IKEA itself. They would be sent out on scouting missions, searching for resources, food, other survivors, and most prized of all, potential escape routes. It was a dream, a fantasy, that someday one of them would find the exit and lead the rest of them to salvation through it. Alice had been trapped in the infinite Ikea for six years, going on seven now. She had long since given up on dreams of escape. All they could do was accept their situation, get used to it, and just try to survive under these circumstances. But those circumstances were about to change. Everyone looked up when they heard panicked breathing. It was Cyril, just Cyril. The party clutched their weapons just that little bit tighter, unsure of what had happened. Their rules were clear. Scouting duos must never ever separate under any circumstances. Getting lost in the store and being isolated when the lights went out would be a death sentence. So if Cyril was returning alone, frightened, tears streaking down his face, then something truly awful had happened. He told Alice and the rest of the group that something had attacked him and Joseph. When Alice told him that was impossible, that the staff wouldn't show active aggression until lights out until someone attacked them first, Cyril shook his head and let out a heaving sob. He told them that the creature that attacked them wasn't a member of staff, it was something else entirely. Something he'd never seen inside the IKEA before. A true monster. Whatever this creature was, it moved around a corner incredibly fast. It spoke in a way that was almost human, but something was off about it. Something that sent a chill down Cyril's spine just thinking about it. He recalled that the creature was large and blob-like, flesh-colored, with long grasping tendrils that whipped and flailed unnaturally. These tendrils had wrapped around and grasped Joseph. He hadn't been quick enough. The two of them were too shocked by the sight of it to react in time. And then it was already too late. It grabbed Joseph and yanked him off into an adjoining aisle. 
Cyril still remembered his haunting screams getting quieter and quieter as he moved further out of sight. On some level, everyone hoped that Cyril was lying. It was preferable to believe that he himself had snapped and murdered Joseph for some unknown reason, as opposed to some new, stronger, and even more dangerous creature that was now inside the IKEA. Was this some kind of upgrade? As they acclimated to the environment, adapted, gotten better at surviving here, had the IKEA in turn created deadlier countermeasures to destroy them all? just when you thought you had a handle on things. But if Cyril was telling the truth, and there was some kind of creature lurking in the store, or potentially more than just one, then they could be in danger just standing here. They gathered up the group, along with any supplies worth taking, and set off back to their community. They would need to deliver the bad news so they could potentially prepare for the worst. It was just one of the many communities housed within SCP-3008. Many have theorized over the years that the infinite IKEA acts as a kind of nexus point for IKEAs all across the multiverse, accounting for the truly insane number of people who have gone missing without a trace into the building over the years. There were children who had been born in the IKEA, raised in the IKEA, know nothing but the IKEA. Nobody knew an exact number for sure, but it was more than possible that the population of a small country resided within its walls. Sometimes communities would fracture and fall apart, occasionally due to a lack of resources or infighting, other times due to an overwhelming attack from the staff that physically destroyed the settlement often leaving many of its members dead in the process. Those who weren't picked off while wandering the store in the following days would likely integrate into other nearby communities as refugees. Life was cruel in the infinite IKEA. By the time Alice and her party returned to their community, it was almost lights out. They spoke to the community leaders and informed them of Joseph's tragic disappearance, as well as this awful new creature that Cyril claimed had taken him. They thought it best not to inform the rest of the community tonight. It might hurt their focus and cause unnecessary panic. Alice agreed to join the watch that night. She could feel something wrong in the air. Even more so than usual, there was something terrible in this anomalous IKEA. Alice stood atop the furniture wall with several other rangers. As the lights flickered off, the distinctive calls sounded across the store from the activated staff members. The store is now It was almost soothing in its familiarity, compared to the frightening thoughts that Cyril had left swimming through her mind. The staff she could handle, it was at least the devil she knew, and there were worse beasts than the devil out there. She knew it in her bones. They killed a few staff members that happened to wander towards the community and began beating their deformed fists against the walls. All standard procedure. But as Alice's eyes adjusted to the darkness, she saw a huge shape in the distance. It looked like a mountain that breathed, a huge wobbling mass of flesh, moving impossibly fast for a creature of its size. It was so much vaster than the creature that Cyril had described earlier. Was this a different one, or had it simply gotten bigger? Either way, it was coming straight towards them. The community came alive in sudden panic. Every able-bodied adult grabbed their weapons and prepared for the fight of their lives behind the wall. Whatever this monster was, they needed to kill it as quickly as possible, before it destroyed everything they built. Sadly for everyone inside the community, this was one fight that none of them were prepared for. The beast crashed into the furniture wall, crushing it inwards. People struck at the monster's immense and terrible flesh with their weapons, making awful wet slaps but seeming to cause no lasting impact. It just kept rolling in, grasping everyone it could with its long, sinewy tendrils. But the horrors were only just beginning. With the wall destroyed, the staff began to pour in, chanting in monstrous unison, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. It was a massacre, perhaps one of the worst that the inside of the infinite IKEA had ever seen. While the community battled the giant flesh beast, the forces of the staff swarmed and overwhelmed them. Darcy was tangled in the nightmarish tentacles of the beast. Bear was surrounded by a truly insurmountable number of staff members, each one bawling their terrible fists and beating him to death. Somewhere Cyril screamed, though his scream was soon cut short. Alice watched in horror as everything she'd known was destroyed. 
Alice realized her friends were dead and her community was in ruins. She grabbed her spear and did the only thing she could. She ran. She ran from the lost cause that had once been her life, tears running down her cheeks. What had even happened? What the hell had that great monster been? The IKEA's trump card? She ran aimlessly for as long as she could, then walked and eventually limped. She went on for hours, getting lost deeper and deeper into unknown territory. She'd stop when she was dead. Why not? She had little left to live for. But like the Holy Grail, when she eventually truly gave up and stopped looking for salvation, it found its way to her. As she turned a corner down a mysterious aisle, she saw something that she hadn't seen in years. Glass double doors. She stifled a sob. Could it be the way out of here after all this time? And it was. The world. Escape. She'd lost everything, but regained this. Outside, dawn was breaking. After years, the great red sun. It was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen in her life. She took a deep breath, smiled, and stepped into the light. This video is about two things. The first is SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy, a horrific monster who murders anyone and anything unfortunate enough to look at its face, directly or through photos or videos. The second is you, because we asked you for your favorite questions, theories, and hypothetical situations involving 096. We even asked if you thought someone would be safe from 096 on the moon, and you delivered. If you haven't watched our first video on the infamous Shy Guy, we recommend checking that out first, but feel free to stick around even if you haven't. First of all, let's take a look at the questions you had about the SCP Foundation's most dangerous introvert and see if we can't find some answers. How close would you have to be to trigger it? Like, if it was 5 kilometers away, would it still count? The short answer is that 096's homicidal rage can be triggered from pretty much any distance. We'll get into some of the potentially crazy extents of this later on, but if you see the shy guy's face while you're sharing a dimension with him, you're in serious trouble. People who view the creature's face in different countries or even miles underwater have met gruesome ends. Five kilometers would definitely not keep you safe. What were his origins and how strong is he compared to SCP-682? The origins of SCP-096 are still shrouded in mystery. All we know for sure is that he was discovered by the Foundation in a snowy mountainous region. As for physical durability, he's about even with 682 as both survived their encounter. We know 682 has the psychological advantage though, as 096 has been terrified of the lizard ever since they met in cross-testing. However, you could argue that 096 is technically more dangerous, since unlike 682, 096 has never been pacified before killing its intended target while on a rampage. If he goes into an unstoppable attack mode when someone sees his face, shouldn't you not show his face in the thumbnail? Thankfully, according to the official documents, artistic representations like paintings or digitally drawn YouTube thumbnails have no effect. Only actual photographs or videos of the creature can be deadly, so you're safe. Unless we decide to do a 096 face reveal to celebrate our next 100,000 subscribers, of course. This leads us to our next question. If it attacks you when you look at it, then how did the scientist draw the picture of the thing without looking at it? That's a good question, and also one that occurred to the Foundation scientists who came up with an extremely elaborate solution. They put a D-Class tattoo artist inside a diving bell miles underwater and had him unseal a photograph of the creature before drawing a copy. This copy was then released from the diving bell in a sealed container before 096 inevitably got to the poor D-Class. Does the shy guy have to be viewed through a good quality image to enter a rage state? Unfortunately, no. Even the most poorly rendered or minuscule image of 096's face is a death sentence. One of the most infamous incidents resulted from a man seeing a small dot that was only a few pixels wide in a photo from an old ski trip. The dot was 096, taken from a mile away. No true image of 096 is safe, regardless of size. In some canons, despite 096 being referred to as indestructible, the Foundation managed to terminate it after many attempts and even more bureaucracy. How did they do it? 
While a lot of 096's body has been blown away by conventional arms fire, its hyper-tough skeleton is what has given it such an indestructible reputation. In one tale, though, Foundation researchers actually used this to their advantage and employed the use of the next snapping killer sculpture SCP-173. After using 173 to damage 096's bones, powerful acid was injected into the skeleton, destroying it from within. Though of course, this isn't the official ending of the 096 story, because the SCP Foundation doesn't have a single unifying canon. That's enough questions. Now it's time for you to school us. Let's look at some of your favorite theories about the Shy Guy, starting with... I sometimes like to imagine that 096 is nice, but he can't control when someone sees him and after he kills the person he starts to cry because he didn't want to kill them. There is actually some evidence to suggest that SCP-096 might not want to kill. A great example of this is its cross-test with SCP-978, a camera which reveals the deepest desires of whoever or whatever is in its photos. The photo it took of 096 showed that it had completely disappeared from the photo showing its deepest desire was to just be invisible and unseen. Maybe it wants to disappear because it doesn't want to hurt anybody. Regarding the moon question, I think SCP-096 would probably stay in that hostile state until you came back, at which point it would promptly rip you to shreds and do whatever it does to your mutilated corpse. Based on what we know about prior 096 incidents, this feels incredibly likely. It's also possible that it might enter its docile state, before becoming aggressive again when you return to its murder range. You really don't want to find out either way. He can just jump to the moon easy. He does squats and containment all the time. While its scrawny physique doesn't make it seem like 096 understands the concept of exercise, there aren't any cameras in 096's cell, so technically we can't prove it isn't doing squats to pass the time in there. I really doubt a blind person would be safe from his effect, since 096 has the IQ of a newborn baby. I think he will count it as looking at him. This is an interesting theory. However, seeing as 096 is able to sense when people see its face from entire continents away, the way it knows if you can see its face might be a little more psychic in nature. Therefore, it's probable that it wouldn't mistakenly kill someone who hasn't actually seen its face, such as a person who is blind. To deal with him, in my opinion, simply freeze him, either in space or in the mountains. His body shuts down and when looked at it, it will not react correctly. It is simply asleep. While we don't know how SCP-096 would react to a zero-G environment, for a creature that's always nude, it seems extremely tolerant to the cold. When it was first found, it was lurking in icy mountains, and a Foundation agent commented on the fact it wasn't even shivering despite the incredibly low temperatures. But who knows if there's a temperature out there that's too low even for the shy guy. If someone looks at it in China and it's in the US, then you get on its back, you'll get a free piggyback ride to China. It's a free trip to China and all it costs is a human life. That's my theory. Technically, it'd be at the cost of two human lives, unless you wore a diving suit with plenty of oxygen. 096 has proven to be an extremely proficient swimmer, but you'd have to maintain your grip across the entire Pacific Ocean while it journeys to China. In other words, it's technically possible, but we here at SCP Explained would rather pay for the round-trip flight. To each their own, though. But that's enough theories for now. Let's move on to the main event. Hypotheticals. You pose some great possible scenarios involving SCP-096, so we're going to see if we can find the answers. What would happen if someone looked at a picture of it while in or before entering another SCP's pocket dimension or mirror dimension? There aren't any canon examples to prove either way, but if there's any kind of consistent entry point into this dimension, it's likely that 096 would find a way to follow you in. If not, it's very possible that it may just wait for you to eventually return before bringing the metaphorical hammer down on you. So technically, if you were pulled into the old man's pocket dimension and he closed the portal, you'd be safe from 096. But then you've got a whole other problem to deal with. What happens if a person sees his face then gets their memory of the creature wiped? Considering how good the Foundation seems to be at wiping people's memories and their access to amnestics, if this worked, they probably would have made it standard procedure by now. 
so it's unlikely. What happens if a person looked at it and that person then went on a plane? Or just staying in the air or space, what would it do? 096 has shown the ability to jump up and destroy low-flying aircraft. But otherwise, it's likely that the creature would probably run to a point directly below you and remain there until you touch back down. Since you'll need food and water at some point and aircrafts need fuel, you'd probably just be prolonging the inevitable. What if the young girl was around it so it tried to attack her but died trying? This is another interesting possibility. SCP-053 is a girl capable of causing homicidal urges, but causes fatal heart attacks in those who attack her. While we can't know for sure how a meeting between 096 and 053 would go, we can use her encounter with 682 as a potential template. Aggressive SCPs like the hard-to-kill reptile, perhaps having an innate knowledge of the danger that comes from attacking 053, tend to become strangely docile around her. It's possible that 096 would do the same. Would we be able to control SCP-096 with the help of SCP-035? The Possessive Mask, aka SCP-035, is undeniably a lot more intelligent than 096, and has even been shown to respond to reason on occasion. It's also been able to control almost every other entity it's been placed on. The problem is, if the mask was placed on 096, and it was somehow effective, the result may be even more dangerous than 096, an intelligent monster with an indestructible and highly dangerous body. There's no telling whether 035 would slowly break down 096 into sludge the way it does to humans, in which case we would be left with an immortal 096-035 combo. So maybe it's best that we never find out. If someone were to be in the infinite Ikea and looked at a picture of its face, could it finally be contained? And if someone else looked at a picture of it outside of the infinite Ikea, could it escape and kill them? If so, how long would it take it? This is a great question. And while the infinite Ikea is a terrifying maze, SCP-096 has an advantage here that we don't. Not only can it rip through anything in the way with its super strength, it has an innate sense of where its victim is. Therefore, regardless of whether you're inside or out, SCP-096 will still come straight to you to exact your horrible fate. But at least you can enjoy the meatballs while you wait, right? And finally, what would happen if 096 were led into a room full of mirrors and allowed or made to look at its own face? Would it smash the mirrors or try to rip itself to pieces? This is still a hotly debated issue to this day which, thanks to the no-canon nature of the SCP Foundation, does not have a definitive answer. Some theorize that this would at least be an effective deterrent against SCP-096, while others suggest that it wouldn't be effective, because many believe that 096 is actually blind, and thus cannot see its own face. It can only sense when other people see it. Again, we don't quite know for sure but it's likely to remain one of the most contentious issues around the Shy Guy for a long time to come. And there you have it, folks. Our very first questions and theories video. We loved hearing what you had to say, so keep an eye on our community post for the next one. Are there other SCPs you'd like to see us cover in explained or theory videos? Let us know in the comments. And subscribe to SCP Explained and turn on notifications for new SCP videos every single week. As you walk down the halls of the SCP Foundation Site-19, peeking in the various windows at the anomalies contained there, you might catch a glimpse of a dark figure bent over a table, tinkering away like an artisan in his workshop. A vintage black apothecary bag sits next to him, open. And if you stop and watch for a while, you'll see him pull all manner of tools out of it. Impossibly large tools. Things that shouldn't fit in such a small bag. A bone saw. An IV stand. Jars of fluorescent liquids. And needles the length of your forearm. You shouldn't be surprised. This is a place for impossible things, after all. Still, it's a curious sight. The shadowy man working so diligently, so quietly, focused singularly on his craft whatever that might be. Only one thing could distract him from his efforts. You. He feels your gaze on him, and he looks up, dark eyes glittering from behind a beaked ceramic mask. He
He reminds you of an illustration you once saw in a book about the Black Death, the gear the plague doctors wore while treating patients on their deathbeds. Hello. He greets you in a friendly, heavily accented voice. His eyes crinkle beneath the mask, and if you could see his mouth, you know he'd be smiling. How are you today, dear fellow? Are you feeling quite well? He takes a step toward the window, stretching out one gloved hand, and you suddenly realize that you can't see where the mask ends and his skin begins. It's not a mask, but a part of his face. This is no ordinary man. Do you require help? I can examine you. He offers, palm pressed flat against the glass, a chill runs up your spine, and you realize that you should definitely not take him up on his offer. No matter how friendly he seems, how good his intentions may be, you wouldn't want to let the plague doctor treat you. He sat in his containment cell, fidgeting with his favorite scalpel. He dragged it over the surface of his work table, back and forth, listening to the sound it made. They had tried to confiscate his table, his tools, the guards had quickly learned that he had more of them in his bag. They tried to take away his bag from him, but, well, that didn't go over too well for anyone involved. So he was allowed to keep it, to fashion himself a makeshift laboratory in his lonely little cell. There was a time where they had given him test subjects, fresh corpses from the morgue for him to dissect and research. There was a time when the doctors here would come to speak with him, talking of cryptobiology and the pestilence he had dedicated himself to fighting. Those days were long gone. He had hidden away pieces of the corpses, tissue samples in jars of formaldehyde he could pull out when the monotony became too much. But the days of fresh materials, of enlightened discourse with other men and women of science, were over. How he missed those days. The chance to work with others as he once had. What had he done wrong? All he did was treat the sick. Sure, they didn't always understand their illness, didn't want to receive their medicine, but that wasn't a choice for the patient to make. That should have been up to the physician. Perhaps they didn't trust his expertise, didn't see how his work served the greater good. Like those who watched Jonas Salk invent the polio vaccine, or Louis Pasteur rid milk of bacteria, they were confused by the advanced scientific practices and feared that which they did not understand. He could forgive them for their ignorance. He was magnanimous that way. If only they would let him out of this infernal room, he could prove his work's worth to them. He could cure them all, begin a new era of wellness and peace worldwide. He didn't exactly sleep, but when he rested on his little cot in the corner of the room, he dreamed of that future, of a world healed by his touch. A knock at the door stirred him from his reverie. Someone, someone was at the door of his containment cell. He glanced at the little window and saw a guard there with a tray of food. He greeted the man with an enthusiastic wave. Sustenance. He didn't require the food for survival, of course but it helped his mind work more efficiently. It reminded him of a time before these fluorescent lights and these same four walls of crusty bread with fresh butter by the banks of the Seine. A little slot opened in the door and the tray was shoved through. There was bread, just as he hoped, a small dish of butter, a pot of jam, and a cup of tea still seeming. He picked up the cup at first, taking a deep breath. Ah. An herbal blend with fresh lavender. Lovely. He couldn't see the guard through the window anymore, but he called out to him just the same. Thank you for the libations. He still had his manners after all, even in confinement. He wished he could have gotten a better look at the man, seen the pallor of his complexion, a tremor in his hand. He thought he had spotted sweat beating on his forehead. Could he be ill? The case required further examination to be certain. He sighed, clutching the cup of tea tighter in frustration. Why wouldn't they just let him work? Why must they scream at the sight of his efforts, flee from his instruments? It didn't seem fair. Still, the pursuit of science rarely was a glamorous one. He had learned as much over the centuries. One day, though, history would look back on him kindly. Of this, he could be certain. He was just settling in and beginning to spread butter across the admittedly stale bread when a horrible sound shook him to attention. He had heard the noise before, though he had never seen its source. It was an ear-splitting scream, a wail of pure agony, like the sound of a wounded wild animal. He had heard many, many screams during his life, 
from patients and those who stood in the way of his work, but until he had been brought into custody of the Foundation, he had never heard a scream quite like this one. It was pure rage, devastation, and suffering mixed together, wet with tears, and loud enough to rip through human vocal folds. Whatever was crying out, it was no mere man. More screams answered it, and these were very much human. These sounds were more familiar to him. Shrieks of pain, of fear, of desperate but futile attempts to escape. Then the meaty thud of bodies falling to the floor, of torn off limbs hitting walls and windows, a loud crash, and the sound of something large moving quite quickly through the halls. Scientific curiosity got the better of the doctor, and he found himself moving back to his little window, face pressed to the glass so hard his beak nearly cracked it. He couldn't see much of anything, just guards running down the hall, weapons drawn. He saw one of them fire, heard the gunshot ring out. But what was he firing at? Then he saw it, a pale blur darting past the door. Whatever it was, it didn't so much as flinch when the bullet ricocheted off its skin. A long, thin arm crashed against the door, knocking the doctor backwards into his work table. He steadied himself and climbed back to his feet, taking in the damage done to the door. It was crumpled in on itself, nearly ripped off the hinges, and whatever had plowed into it was already gone. From the sounds of chaos in the distance, it had disappeared around the corner, with the guards following it. He inspected the ruins of the door to his containment cell. It was useless now, hanging loose and open. Well, that was an invitation he was hardly about to decline. He grabbed his trusty bag, tossed his scalpel back inside, and set off to see what all the commotion was. It was easy enough to follow the trail of blood, stark and vivid red against the white tile floor, and the sound of gunfire, human screams, and that loud, long, painful wail he had heard before. He walked at a leisurely pace, taking his time, until the sound suddenly stopped. He rounded the corner and found a mound of bodies, guards and scientists, beaten and bloodied, almost beyond recognition. It was quiet here, save for one sound, the sound of weeping. There in the corner, huddled over with its face to the wall, was a pale, thin figure, its shoulders heaving with the force of its sobs. This poor soul was clearly in great distress. It was a peculiar sight, hairless and white, distended arms wrapped around itself as it cried. Excuse me, the doctor cried out to the pitiful creature. Are you all right? Do you need assistance? It didn't answer. It just continued to cry. Had something so despondent been responsible for this destruction? The dozens of corpses, the smashed in walls, the crumbled doors and shattered windows. It seemed impossible. Sure, it was large and looked strong, but he had never seen a monster cry before. This couldn't be a dangerous creature. Not when it was so sad. He would help it. But first, he would attend to some of these bodies. He sat his bag on the ground and pulled out several vials of liquid, a set of syringes, and a variety of other surgical tools he might need. Now after such a long hiatus, he could resume his work in a meaningful way. He couldn't be certain how long he worked reviving these poor souls and reconstructing their bodies as the pale creature wept in the corner. The sobbing faded into the background for a while, becoming a kind of white noise as he removed a liver here, placed it in a chest cavity there, poked and prodded, injected and extracted, testing out new methods alongside tried and true cures. One by one, the milky eyes fluttered open, rigor mortis stiff joints creaked into motion, sallow faces looking at his with the vacant gratitude he saw in so many patients over the years. He didn't need to thank him with their words. The work was its own reward. He expected more guards to arrive, to attempt to contain the situation, but none came, even as the alarm blared overhead. As for the morose creature, it didn't seem to notice his presence at all, not even when he had brought all of the intact corpses back to life. The patient shuffled around the room aimlessly, waiting for orders of some kind. The doctor tapped one on the shoulder and handed the reborn man a vial of thick black medicine. Give this to the poor fellow in the corner, please. It wasn't much, but it should calm him, provide some relief from his suffering. The corpse nodded, mouth hanging loose and open, an eyeball dangling unseen from the socket. He shuffled over to the strange creature, 
and held out the vial to it. It turned, lifting its head, and as it locked eyes with the cured patient, something shifted in its face. Its mouth opened wide, impossibly wide, and it shrieked, that same terrible sound as before. Tears streamed from its colorless eyes, its arms shaking with unbridled rage as its jaws locked around the patient's head. Like a boa constrictor, in one fluid motion it swallowed the revived man whole, while the doctor watched in shock. He had been wrong. This was not an innocent creature caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. This creature, whatever it was, was deeply sick. He had never seen such an advanced, aggressive case of the pestilence. He'd heard rumors, of course, but never encountered it firsthand. As a doctor, he had sworn to do no harm, but in a drastic situation, drastic measures have to be taken. It was well known by himself and the doctors at this foundation that he could cause any and all biological functions in an organism to cease with a single touch. And so he approached the creature, arm outstretched, ready to administer that necessary touch to protect the rest of his patients. As he approached, the creature turned to him, its eyes wide and blank, an endless stream of tears pouring from them, spilling onto the floor. It shrieked again, mouth stretching wide enough to engulf his entire head, and ran toward him at a breakneck speed. I am so sorry you are not well. The doctor said simply, as his hand pressed to the creature's chest. As soon as the tough hide of the doctor's hand, which the uninformed might mistake for gloves, made contact with the unpigmented skin of the beast, its eyes closed, its muscles went slack, and it collapsed to the ground with a mighty thud. The doctor paced around the fallen creature, taking in the sight. Then something strange caught his eye. The creature's chest still rose and fell. Was it his imagination? He checked its pulse, and thought it was slow and faint, and though it was slow and faint, it was very much present. The creature was still alive, it had merely been rendered unconscious by his touch, rather than completely deceased. Curious, very curious indeed, he muttered. Perhaps there were comorbidities present, other infections aside from the pestilence, which rendered the creature unnaturally strong, resilient to the usual courses of treatment. What would cause these abilities, this intense aggression? It seemed to be brought on whenever someone looked at the entity's face. If only he studied psychology more, the science of the mind and its inner workings. Since he had no experience with therapy, nor was he certain this creature could communicate using language at all, there was only one way to find out more about how this creature's brain worked. He would have to take it apart and see for himself. It was slow work, getting the massive creature back to the doctor's containment cell. He required the help of his cured patients, who grasped it by its massive limbs and dragged the limp body through the halls. Once back in a familiar environment, his work table ready and waiting, the doctor instructed his assistants to place the new patient on the table. It was a bit small, unable to accommodate the creature's distended limbs, but if he attempted to use an official foundation laboratory, he risked discovery and subsequent interruption. So it would have to suffice. First, he set up an IV stand, filled with a vivid green liquid. It was easy to find a vein. The creature's skin was nearly translucent. Now that he could be certain the creature would not wake during surgery, he could make the first incision. Scalpel. He held out a hand and his favorite surgical blade was placed in it by one of the helpful patients. Thank you. He slid the scalpel along the hairline of the creature, or where the hairline would be if it weren't completely bald. Once the scalp was removed, he set it aside for later, when it could be reattached. Bone saw, please. He held out his hand again, and again his assistant gave him the proper tool. This, however, was when things got strange. The doctor had always been a deft hand at cutting. He'd once even received tutelage from the great Robert Liston, but no matter how hard he tried to saw, it never left a scratch on the creature's skeleton. Naturally, this was somewhat frustrating. He wanted to study the creature's brain tissue, to get a sense for what was going up there neurologically. And he couldn't do that if it was impossible to saw off the creature's cranial cap. He blunted two of his favorite saws while trying. Thankfully, there was still a solution to access the beast's gray matter, a little trick he'd learned while studying the funerary practices of the ancient Egyptians. He produced a long curved hook from his bag and inserted it up the creature's nasal passage. 
With some fine maneuvering, he eventually managed to remove the brain. It was such a terrible shame that he needed to do it piece by piece via the nasal passage, but one makes do. All that was left was to sew the skin of the creature's head back into place. It was mid-stitch when a voice interrupted his careful work, nearly making him drop the needle. Hey, what are you doing? He looked up to find a guard, aiming a gun at his face. Excuse me, I am in surgery at the moment. Please do not interrupt. He admonished the guard, but the man did not listen or lower his weapon. In fact, he shouted something into the radio, code words the doctor didn't recognize. Then he fired a bullet into the skull of the patient standing at his side. How dare you? The doctor cried, readying himself to confront the guard, but it was too late. Dozens of other guards were swarming the room and neutralizing his assistants. Some in hazmat suits grabbed his arms and pulled him away from the creature on the operating table, no matter how hard he fought or how loudly he protested. Then something incredible happened, something wonderful. The creature opened its eyes and sat up. It looked directly at the guard closest to it, and the two saw one another's faces. The guard tensed, preparing for the worst, but nothing came. The creature simply stared, placid and quiet. No screaming, no tearing at flesh, no mouth opening wider and wider to swallow the man whole. I did it, the doctor shouted, overcome with elation. I've cured you. Now begins the rest of your happy life. He watched as the guards led the shockingly calm creature away back to its containment cell. The doctor's door was repaired, and he was returned to his state of captivity, but he never forgot the patient he helped that day, and how marvelous it felt to do such a good deed. Meanwhile, SCP-096's brain regrew within the hour and caused another massive containment breach, murdering a variety of researchers and guards. But the staff agreed not to tell SCP-049 about any of this. Better to just let him have this one. He really seemed like he needed a win. A very strange anomaly sits in a humanoid containment cell in the minimum security wing of Site-17. He walks, talks, and looks like a man, but everything else is convoluted in a question mark. This is SCP-343, who, like his namesake, God, is likely to cause arguments whenever he's brought up. Is he the creator of all that exists? the basis for the Abrahamic faiths, or is he a pretender, a reality warper with immense power and predilection towards delusion, a courtesan of the house of Maladrog, Matthew, Methuselah, Yahweh, who knows? Really, it depends on who you ask, and which stories you choose to believe, and few people enjoy a good story more than SCP-343 himself. If one day you take the time to visit him in his room and ask him to reveal a page in the long book of his personal history, he might be kind enough to tell you a story. A story like this, of an encounter with something monstrous that few others could hope to survive meeting face to face. Rewind a few thousand years. Nobody knows how many, exactly. God, as he chooses to dub himself, walked across the cracked ground on worn sandals. It'd been some time since he'd seen an animal around here, and even longer since he'd seen a human being. Not that this bothered him. He'd never been bothered by his own company on a long walk like this. Of course, he could have sped up time or teleported, but where was the fun in that? He was a tourist in the world of sensation, of experience, of flesh, bone, dirt, blood, and sand. After all, where's the fun in creating a whole universe if you can't drop in now and then to visit and do as the Romans do? Not that the Romans would be around for another few thousand years. Even Atlas must occasionally shift the weight of the globe from his shoulders for a jaunt around the cosmic neighborhood and whatever passes for fresh air in the vacuum. God whistled a tune to himself. It was a craggy, mountainous region he'd found himself in. The distant peaks had frosted caps, a breathtaking place where many truly had their breaths taken away. How humans will so happily risk their lives to do something extraordinary. It never ceased to amaze him. His stomach rumbled. Oh, how he enjoyed that sensation. One of the funny little quirks of this human form that he weaved for himself. It was no reason to be concerned, if memory served, from his last trip through the area a few decades before, 
There was a friendly village not far from here. They had always accepted him as a genial stranger, having no knowledge of his true power. God had always believed that a person's goodness is defined by how they treat those from whom they had nothing to gain. So it caused him great concern as he approached the village and saw great plumes of smoke rising into the sky. He was so shocked by this that he could decide to break his rule about walking as a man in case there was still some way he could help. With a snap of his fingers, he disappeared and reappeared in the center of the village's town square. Total devastation. Huts and houses had been torn asunder. Broken weapons lay on the ground. Some places were on fire, others smeared with streaks of blood, like some terrible battle had occurred here. But something was wrong. No bodies, not one, from defender or assailant. How could a thriving village be so thoroughly destroyed and not leave a single corpse? It was an act so bizarre and depraved that it left even God puzzling. That was another downside of his human form. Here on Earth, he didn't have access to true omniscience. How could a mere human mind, bound by the constraints of linear time, ever truly comprehend the total of existence? Even attempting to do that here would melt the brain of his human body in its skull and leave it dribbling out of his nose and ears. Instead, he chose to walk around the ruins of the village and investigate firsthand. Arrows and broken spears and swords littered the ground. Some buildings were demolished, but there were no tracks or stray projectiles that could suggest the presence of siege weapons. No, these buildings looked like they were ripped apart. Some even still had claw marks. What terrible beast could have set upon this town and done this? Then he heard a voice, quiet and pleading beneath some nearby rubble. A survivor. He rushed over to the pile and evaporated it with a thought. Underneath, a feeble old man, covered in stone dust, was quivering. God helped him up and guided him into one of the few remaining huts still standing in the village. They both took seats. God held up two hands, cradling empty space. Two cups suddenly occupied that space, both filled with warm, healing tea. He passed the old man one of the cups while sipping from his own. He asked the old man if he'd seen what had happened. The old man told him no, he hadn't seen anything in decades. He'd been rendered blind in his youth. Little did either of them know that very blindness was the only reason he was the sole survivor of the massacre. The blind man told God that one of the village's scouts had gone up into the mountain with a small hunting party. The group was gone for days, until one of the members, the youngest among them, returned weeping, frostbitten, and covered in blood. He said that his friends had been killed by a beast in the mountains, something that almost looked like a man, but terribly wrong. And its face, its awful, awful face, he would never forget it. He was just lucky to escape with his life when the others were torn apart. But when the young man returned, he'd brought the shadow of death with him. It was a curse that doomed the entire village, men, women, and children, to a terrible fate. And that fate was upon them a mere hour after the survivor had returned. Of course, there were gaps in the blind man's understanding, given he was lacking one of his major senses. But the sounds he could describe with perfect clarity. It was faint and distant at first. That awful wail and the galloping. Hands and feet thundering against the ground faster than any horse could move, getting closer and closer. Another villager saw it approaching and screamed. Then it was upon them. The villagers screamed, but it screamed louder, always wailing and shrieking and sobbing like a monster crawling straight up from hell. People tried to fight it by the sounds of it. The blind man with teary blank eyes recalled the sounds of arrows knocking and swords clashing against something. But even their greatest warriors had screamed and died. Those who saw it and tried to flee and hide were slaughtered all the same. Soon enough, there were only two sounds left in the village, the monster and the blind man, both weeping. He didn't understand why it never took him. It wasn't fair. It took everything else. To leave him here alive when everyone and everything he'd ever known was destroyed was a greater punishment than even death. After killing all of these innocents, the monster had simply wandered off to the mountains again, the sound of its quiet sobs getting smaller and smaller 
until it was gone altogether. God comforted the blind man as he wept for the loss of all his loved ones. He told the blind man that he would venture up to the mountains himself and confront the creature on its own territory, and at the very least, find out why it had done this terrible thing. But first, he must relocate the blind man to a safer place. He placed a hand on the blind man's shoulder and he vanished. He would appear in another friendly village miles away. God sent a silent message into the minds of every villager. Take good care of this man. He has undergone horrors you can't even imagine. Your kindness will be rewarded later. For that, you have my promise. God sighed and turned his tired eyes to the distant mountains. A monster lurked up there, perhaps one of his own creations, or maybe a corruption of one of his creations. Either way, whatever existed without his knowledge existed without his consent, and he intended to know of the beast in the mountains. Though given what he'd seen already, he didn't expect to receive a warm welcome from this murderous demon. Miles away up in the mountains, the creature licked the blood from its cracked lips. It looked like it might have once been a human being or something that aspired to humanity or mocked it with its very existence. It was a huge, gangling beast, skin alablaster, eyes empty and soulless, dribbling rivulets of burning tears down a hideous, gaunt face. It crawled into the frozen mouth of a cave with great icicle fangs, wheezing and weeping. All it ever wanted was to be alone. Why did they have to keep interfering? Didn't they know what happened? All the terrible things they made it do. The creature curled its long, gangly body into the fetal position, scratching great ruts into the sides of its bald cranium with long, sharp fingers. Terrible things. Terrible, terrible things. And then there was a brilliant flash just a few feet away. The monster was surprised. It turned to see a figure silhouetted in the mouth of the cave. He wore sandals and thin robes. His eyes glowed with a kind of power that the monster didn't recognize. This stranger stared at the monster without an ounce of fear in his heart. He stared right into its eyes, unwavering. No, 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 no! He could feel it again, the rage bubbling up deep down. A cauldron of seething anger, it hated the feeling like being lowered into a vat of molten metal. Unspeakable fire and pain coursing through every vessel. He began to weep and scream while the stranger in the cave mouth just watched, not moving a muscle. Do you know who I am? The stranger asked with a deep voice that betrayed almost infinite power, knowledge, and wisdom. But it wouldn't change the outcome here. The monster bounded at him at speeds that wouldn't be seen again until jet planes and bullet trains are invented millennia into the future. Its jaws were hanging impossibly wide, fangs born, its arms extended and deadly claws ready to strike. But before those terrible hands could close around the stranger, he vanished. The monster stumbled and rolled across the snow, confused. What trickery was being used here? I'll take that as a no, said the voice from behind him. You ought to show your father some respect. More respect than you gave to those poor people down in the village at least. Seething, the creature turned and saw the stranger standing back in the darkness of the cave, staring at him. But the beast didn't have the capacity for awe or holy terror. Only violence. Boundless, limitless, unstoppable violence. It darted towards the stranger again, trying to strike him. Somehow it was like fighting an empty robe. Not a single one of its deadly strikes seemed to hit the stranger. The stranger leaped backwards putting some space between himself and the monster, but still not breaking a sweat. He breathed in deeply, then exhaled. The breath came out like a mighty typhoon, shocking even the monster with its sudden force. It was blown backwards a leaf in the wind, until its long claws dug into the ground and anchored it in place. The stranger gave a wry smile at this, impressed. My, my, you're certainly a tenacious one, aren't you? He said. Perhaps we can talk for a little while instead of fighting. I want to know why you killed all those people. No answer. The beast roared, its mighty limbs pounding into the ground as it closed the gap between itself and the stranger in fractions of a second. It would kill him, rend him, destroy him just like all the others. He'd left it no choice. 
Suddenly, the ground below it seemed to give way. The creature was confused. It looked down to see that the ancient stone below had somehow taken on the properties of a liquid, and it was sinking. The beast panicked and it began to thrash. It was a strong swimmer, but it didn't expect to need to swim here. The shock was too much, and soon the ground submerged it entirely, muffling its terrible roars and shrieks. And just like that, the ground was solid again, trapping the beast inside. The stranger stepped forward and looked at the ground. A much needed time out, he said. You do yourself no good struggling like this. Despite its terrible capacity for evil, God couldn't help but admire the beast, at least on the level of construction. It was so pared down, so unburdened, a killer to the core but seemingly unkillable. Had he made this creature? Billions of species and the species those in turn had created through billions of years of breeding and evolution, and somewhere along the line, this thing happened. It was easy even for the universe's creator to lose track of some of the tinier variables. And in the grand scheme of things, even this monster was still a tiny variable. But right here, right now, it was still one hell of a problem. The ground rumbled below God. Cracks formed. The mountain peak shook. God raised an eyebrow, genuinely impressed, as the monster ripped free of its stone prison and re-entered the fray. It roared and screamed still, its blank eyes fixed on him. Its skeletal body throbbed and heaved with power. Unlike any other creature in nature, it was almost like the longer their conflict went on, the more energized the beast became. God sighed. All those poor villagers. They never stood a chance against this monster. It lunged for him, even faster and stronger than before. He teleported out of the way in the nick of time, and the beast's claws cleaved through a nearby cave wall, effortless. God materialized nearby, but he didn't have time to speak. The beast lunged again and again and again. Every time he reappeared, the beast went for him with impossible speed. Deciding to widen the playing field, God teleported to the top of the mountain. The creature, somehow sensing his presence, vaulted upwards and tunneled through the roof of the cave, bursting out of the ground in front of God, who was floating just slightly off the ground. It would be wise of you to stop. God carefully intoned. All this time, you know, I've been going easy on you. You don't want to find out what the wrath of God looks like. Storm clouds were gathering above. Mighty thunder roared across the sky. The beast was undeterred. It roared and galloped towards God. And God, in turn, called down a response. A volley of lightning the likes of which the world has never seen before or since struck down on the charging monster. The sudden white flash could sting the eyes from miles away. The monster shrieked from the blast, feeling its flesh lift off its bones and atomize in the sheer heat of the electricity around it. It could smell itself cooking. The lightning blast only lasted for a few seconds, but for the beast, it felt like eternity. When the onslaught stopped, the air was still heavy with electrical potential. God stared down at the black scorch mark on the side of the mountain where the creature had been standing. All the snow within a mile had been evaporated by the blast. It was a raw display of the power of nature that would make even Zeus tremble in his sandals. And yet, there was still movement. Something started to get up from the burnt patch where nothing should be left alive. A blackened skeleton, rising shakily from the ash but still very much alive. As it started to rise, new flesh began growing over its bones little by little. Even God was astonished by the sight of it. He'd never seen a creature cling so ardently to life in spite of having truly unsurmountable power amassed against it. It was up against God, and still, it fought. The monster tottered on its freakishly long limbs, still disoriented, unusually staggered for a creature driven by such single-minded violent purpose. When enough of its face grew back to do so, it began to weep and sob again, tears streaking down its terrible face. Looking at this creature after all of this, God couldn't help but feel a new emotion, pity. He lowered himself to the ground and approached the creature, like none had ever done before. He gathered it up into his arms and he held it, feeling its heaving, wretched sobs against him. The beast was in so much pain, he could feel it radiating from within. Speak, my son. God said in a soft, fatherly voice. 
and for the first and only time, the monster spoke. Can look, can see, <coughs> make me a people, known wonder people, can look, can look, please. That was all it managed to choke out before devolving back into unintelligible babble, but it was enough. Enough for God to understand its pain. He did not know if it would be right to change the monster's nature. Is it ever right to truly change anyone's nature? But it was within his almost limitless power to grant it one reprieve from pain. He settled the beast in the snow below him. It was quiet and still. And God said unto the beast, Rest now, child. Rest for thousands of years if you must. I hope only that when you eventually awaken, you feel differently." And so another story from the catalog of SCP-343. Of course, it leaves us with certain questions, mm. chief among them being, is it true? Did 343 and 096 have this chance encounter long ago? Or is this just another tall tale from an anomaly who fancies himself a deity? We have our truth and you have yours. Let us know what you believe down below in the comments. The day-to-day -day routine of Dr. Gears consisted of a few constants. Piping hot cups of black, unsweetened coffee, plain dry wheat toast, the soothing sounds of his favorite white noise machine, and the endless carousel of experiments with SCP-914. Not that he was complaining, he was perfectly content to spend his time supervising one of the few anomalies he crossed paths with on a regular basis that was unlikely to kill or maim him in any way. Not that the Clockworks hadn't produced its fair share of unpredictable results over the years of extensive testing, it had definitely offered up more than a few surprises. And anyone who knew Dr. Gears knew that he was not especially fond of surprises. Dr. Bright had attempted to throw a surprise birthday party for the man once, but when he turned on the lights and fired the confetti cannon, all Dr. Gears did in response was give a deep sigh and say, Really, Jack? You're making a spectacle of yourself. Still, he had resigned himself long ago to the fact that supervising the experiments with SCP-914 meant witnessing some truly unpredictable outcomes. How could he forget the time researcher Blas tested an incandescent light bulb on the setting very fine, and the machine spat out an anthropomorphic humanoid light bulb that spoke in German-accented English and claimed to be Thomas Edison himself? This was, of course, impossible, as historical records surely would have indicated if Thomas Edison was a walking, talking light bulb rather than a human man. The imposter was eventually incinerated after its presence became too irritating to ignore. And then there was the time researcher Thompson filled out a Dungeons & Dragons character sheet and placed it into the machine on the setting very fine. The output produced was a sheet of paper promoting the previously non-existent tabletop role-playing game Fear in the Foundation. Whenever a person read the paper, they would suddenly find themselves in an out-of-body experience where they were inside the game's world, which contained several characters related to the SCP Foundation, as well as items and locations based on real-world counterparts. A subject in this state would only snap back to reality after winning or dying in the game. Researcher Jacobson rolled a 1 on stealth and saw SCP-096's face in the game and was later found dead in the anomalous item storage wing. There was no shortage of Foundation staff trying to use the machine for personal gain, too. Dr. Naismith placed his credit card inside on the setting very fine, using it to produce a card covered in unidentified corporate insignias and reading, Rank Aleph Infinite Money Privileges. When Dr. Coltrane issued a written warning, Dr. Naismith took that warning and then placed it into the machine on the same setting, producing a piece of official documentation from the O5 Council in support of his infinite money privileges. Junior researcher Summers attempted to use SCP-914 in a misguided attempt at self-improvement, placing not an object, but herself in the intake booth before running the machine on the setting very fine. It cleared her skin, lengthened her hair, and improved her figure. This was, of course, in violation of several employee guidelines, and she was promptly dismissed after emerging from SCP-914. Dr. Veritas left a note in the experiment log following this incident, reading, By the time we realized what she was actually doing, it was too late to stop her. Needless to say, she's since been terminated, and I hope I don't need to tell you all not to do that again. 
And with that, the guideline was clear. No one was permitted to use SCP-914 for personal gain, or to change anything about themselves. Potential complications were too risky, not to mention the conflicts of interest that would be introduced into what should be an impartial research process. As Scientific Objectivity's biggest fan, Dr. Gears couldn't agree more. So as he settled in for the day's round of tests, he intended to keep a watchful eye on things and ensure that no funny business would take place. He didn't have much reason for concern, as his colleague Dr. Bonita prepped her research materials. She was working with two items, a small replica of Michelangelo's sculpture of David and a sealed envelope containing something that was to be handled with extreme caution, a photograph of SCP-096's face. She planned to place the items inside on the very fine setting, in an attempt to see what result might be produced from combining an ideal of traditional beauty standards with the image of a creature that felt such profound shame and distress as its own appearance that it would destroy anyone who looked at its face. Like any good scientist, Dr. Bonita wanted to remove any unnecessary variables from her experiment. So as she placed her items inside the intake booth, she slowly, delicately unsealed the envelope. She wanted to put the picture inside by itself, without the extra element of the envelope potentially complicating things. Unfortunately, like Marie Curie slowly, unintentionally poisoning herself with her own research materials, she didn't truly understand the danger of what she held in her hands. Just as she was setting the photograph down, her eyes flickered to the image. Before she could stop herself, before she could even look away or squeeze her eyes shut, she caught a glimpse of the one thing she should never look at, SCP-096's face. She gasped and slammed the photograph down, but she knew it was too late. The sound of an inhuman shriek coming from across the facility signaled that she was right. It was coming for her, and nothing in the world could stop it. In a containment cell on the other side of the facility, Foundation staff were horrified as they heard the telltale scream of an enraged SCP-096. The pale, thin creature, once huddled in the corner silently, had stretched to its full height of 2.38 meters and was screaming, sobbing, wailing, and gibberish, and beginning to tear its way out of its chamber. Guards tried their best to subdue the entity, firing their weapons at it, but the bullets did nothing to damage the creature's pale flesh or stop its movements. It ripped through the steel cube that contained it and knocked the guards out of its way with one swipe of its unnaturally long arms, sending them careening into a nearby wall. Fortunately for them, SCP-096 only knocked them unconscious. It didn't stop to harm them further, as it had a more important goal in mind. Find the person who had seen its face and destroy them. As the alarm blared, signifying a high threat level containment breach, SCP-096 loped down the hall toward Dr. Bonita in SCP-914's room. Dr. Gears had not spotted Dr. Bonita's grave mistake and had no idea what had triggered the alarm he was hearing. He stepped away from the observation window, turning his attention to the crisis that was clearly happening somewhere else in the facility. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was panicking. She saw her life flash before her eyes, the certainty of impending doom that was coming for her and coming fast all because of one brief error in judgment. What could she do? There was nowhere to hide, no way she could run away fast enough, unless if she managed to lure 096 into the intake booth and start the machine while the creature was inside, maybe it would transform into something less intent on tearing her limb from limb. It was a risky move, and one that could jeopardize her position at the Foundation, but she couldn't very well keep her job if she was dead, so it seemed like it just might be worth a shot. A primal roar of agony and fury interrupted her thoughts, and she knew that SCP-096 was moments away from breaking down the door and getting its hands on her. She would have to move fast. With a screeching grind of metal on metal, SCP-096 wrenched the door off its hinges and barreled into the room in its search for the person who had seen its face. It ran toward the silhouette of Dr. Bonita standing just at the entrance to the intake booth. She tucked and rolled out of the way just as the monster entered the booth. The door automatically slid shut behind it, and as SCP-096 rattled the door and tried to free itself, she turned the knob to very fine with every ounce of strength and speed she had. There was a ding of a small bell 
and the machine whirred to life. As the objects inside were refined, Dr. Bonita had no idea what would be waiting for her in the output booth, but she could only hope that her last-ditch effort had managed to save her life. In the fog of panic, she briefly felt an itch of scientific curiosity, too. What would become of a being like SCP-096 in a machine as strange and wonderful as SCP-914? What would the addition of the statue do to it? As the door to the outtake booth slid open, steam poured out. It appeared her questions would soon be answered. Cautiously, in spite of herself, Dr. Bonita called out. Hello? No one answered, but she heard the sound of footsteps, slow and careful, as a figure emerged from the mist. She covered her mouth in shock, her eyes wide. Dear God, she whispered in awe. Standing in front of her with pale, smooth skin and the same imposing stature was the most beautiful man she had ever seen. Wide, dark eyes shone under thick, sculpted eyebrows. Under the eyes, an aquiline nose, full, pouty lips, a strong, sharp jawline. His head was topped with a tangle of lustrous dark curls. It was the kind of hair she had only seen flowing in the wind on the covers of the romance novels she wanted desperately to buy, but was too embarrassed to be seen purchasing. His physique was, well, statuesque, like the build of the very Michelangelo sculpture she had placed into the machine just moments ago. There was no other way to say it. He was handsome. Despite still being a little lanky and nine feet tall, he peered at her curiously, towering over her in a way that had been terrifying in his former shape, but now made her heart skip a beat in an entirely different way. Hi, was all she could think to say. Was she blushing? She shook her head, snapping herself out of it. She was a scientist, damn it, not some giddy schoolgirl passing notes in class. This was an incredible achievement, something she would need to study thoroughly, and she very much wanted to study him thoroughly. No, no time for that. She needed to write up a report, to inform her superiors, to try her best not to lose her job over this. She had to remain professional. Hi. The man that had once been, or perhaps still was, SCP-096 spoke. Oh, you, you can talk. Dr. Bonita laughed in surprise. The man's brow furrowed. His newfound ability to speak was a surprise to him too, it seemed. Yes, I can. What happened to me? Yes, yeah, stumbling over his words slightly, getting used to the feeling of them. You ran into the machine, she gestured to SCP-914. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, but you're very different now. He nodded. I feel different. I feel calm. He sighed, the relief plain on his face before a shadow of sadness fell over him. I don't think I have to hurt anymore. I, I'm sorry for what I did before. Dr. Bonita did not know what to say. How do you respond when something you've been studying from afar, been horrified and fascinated by an equal measure, looks at you with a new, beautiful face and apologizes for all the harm it caused? This whole experience was so surreal that she might think she was dreaming if she didn't work at a place that was one long waking dream, or nightmare, depending on the day. Uh, Dr. Bonita, there's been a containment breach. Are you all right? Dr. Gears had returned to the room, taking in the sight of the destruction left in 096's way. I'm fine, she called to him, and he followed her voice into the room, then stopped at the sight of the transformed anomaly. Hmm. I don't have time for whatever this is. I trust you'll handle it. Dr. Gears took a long sip of his coffee, and taking Bonita's shock silence as confirmation, had a leisurely stroll back to his office. A few moments later, the guards responsible for containing SCP-096 arrived on the scene, expecting to see carnage and find a docile SCP-096 crouched over a lifeless body. But instead, they found the same truly bizarre sight that Dr. Gears had shrugged off, and Dr. Bonita was still doing her best to process. They entered the room with their weapons drawn, but quickly lowered them, scratching their heads in confusion instead before radioing their superiors and asking for further instructions. Responses from various Foundation staff who caught a glimpse of SCP-096's bold new look included, Oh, would you look at that? Who's that guy? He's what? And in the words of Dr. Jack Bright, Oh no, he's hot! <laughs> Dr. Bright also proposed making the new SCP-096 a TikTok account and YouTube channel, seeking modeling representation for him, or selling a novelty calendar filled with pictures of 096 in various costumes. These would be, in his words, quote, excellent ways to increase revenue for the Foundation. 
So, really, you're the weird ones now for thinking my ideas are weird. Dr. Wright was asked to leave SCP-096 alone and stop trying to take his headshot. In the days that followed the incident with SCP-914, the SCP Foundation was at a loss about what to do with this new, seemingly harmless version of SCP-096. Dozens of D-Class were brought in to look at his face and see if the entity would still enter one of his rage states after a few days of getting used to his new form, but he never did. No screaming, no swallowing people whole, nothing more than a polite, if somewhat shy greeting and a courteous, how are you doing today? The D-Classes were relieved, but confused about being pulled from their cells just to stare at some random handsome man. Dr. Clef suggested dissecting SCP-096 to see what his new body looked like on the inside. This request was denied. Several interviews were conducted to evaluate SCP-096's mental and emotional state. Now that the anomaly was capable of coherent speech, it was much simpler to evaluate the potential threat level he might pose. Every researcher who spoke with him came to the same conclusion. Gone was the danger of the old SCP-096. He had not just become beautiful in a classical, superficial sense, but he had become beautiful on the inside as well. Interviewers reported a warm, friendly demeanor, a talent for engaging in conversation once he was made to feel comfortable, and a sincere interest in the thoughts, opinions, and feelings of those he spoke with. There was only one thing left to do, to make sure that SCP-096 had really changed from something deadly to something almost resembling an ordinary person. A photograph of SCP-096's face, of its original face, was removed from a secure vault by a D-Class. Then, the D-Class was sent into a room with SCP-096 and instructed to place the photograph on the table. SCP-096 looked down at what had once been his face, and his eyes filled with tears. A soft, broken sob <laughs> left his lips, and he wrapped his arms around himself, hunching over as if in physical pain. Outside the room, guards prepared to handle things if 096 began to attack. Instead, he wiped his tears, took a deep, shuddering breath, and looked at the D-Class with a somber expression. He picked up the photograph on the table and tore it in half, as he finally summoned the strength to speak. Please, get rid of these. That is not who I am anymore. At Dr. Bonita's strong insistence, backed up by the conclusions of the research staff who interviewed SCP-096, a re-evaluation of the entity's containment measure was ordered. It seemed cruel and unnecessary waste of resources to keep 096 trapped in a steel cube in its current form. He would be moved to a standard humanoid containment cell and treated as well as other safe class anomalies provided with books, films, food, and drink upon request, and, of course, other comforts. Of course, the O5 Council insisted on evaluating the entity before any of these changes could be approved. Dressed in a specially tailored suit provided by Dr. Bonita, SCP-096 appeared before the Council to present his case. I know that I might not have the best record at the Foundation. I've done a lot of damage over the years, though, let's be honest, you all aren't exactly innocent either. Sorry, that was an attempt at a joke. I'm still very new to talking. All I can say is please consider giving me another chance to make a real life here, to make this place my home. Thank you for your time. What SCP-096 didn't know is that the O5 Council was so flabbergasted by the sight of his new face that they didn't retain a single word he said. They had all given their official approval before he even finished his short presentation. Before long, SCP-096 was moved out of his steel cube and into a new containment chamber that resembled a mid-range studio apartment, complete with a bed, a kitchenette, a television, and a table and chairs. He was provided access to all major streaming platforms, as well as a large stack of books to help him develop his grasp of culture and language after so very long being isolated from human society. Though he wasn't exactly human, he was determined to act like it. Word quickly spread around the Foundation site, and humans and anomalies alike flocked to SCP-096's new home to visit him and see the miraculous transformation for themselves. SCP-999 was the first to come and see the new and improved 096, chirping excitedly as it oozed into his room. He pet the slime gently, his face breaking into a warm smile as its euphoric effect washed over him. The slime became so excited at meeting this new friend, someone it had known as a source of sadness and hurt for so long, that it tackled him to the ground and tickled him for several minutes. 096 laughing uproariously all the while, SCP-343 stopped by to give 096 his blessing, 
and wish him well in this new chapter of life. A few days later, SCP-507 popped back into the site and wanted to see the changes for himself. He was thoroughly impressed, though privately confessed to missing 096's more monstrous form, which reminded him of some of his favorite cryptids. There was one anomaly that was not thrilled with the appearance of SCP-096, however. SCP-056 was furious upon hearing about the new beautiful man that everyone just couldn't shut up about. It demanded a chance to speak to SCP-096 and to tell him that this place isn't big enough for the both of us. I'm the fairest one of all, you sniveling little worm. But the request was denied. SCP-056 sulked about it for several weeks. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was still intent on getting to know SCP-096 better. During previous testing with SCP-978, the Desire Camera, a photo taken of SCP-096 revealed that his greatest desire was to disappear. Curious about the results would be now, Dr. Bonita received permission to take another picture of SCP-096. She snapped the photo while 096 was sitting in a chair in his new containment chamber, looking directly at the camera. When the photo developed, the result was simple. Everything in the picture was exactly the same with one exception. Dr. Bonita was pictured sitting next to 096, her hand clasped in his. Both were smiling soft, contented smiles. When she showed him the photograph, he smiled at her and shook his head. It really is an amazing camera. She flushed. Doctor, before you go, could I ask your name? Dr. Bonita smiled and nodded. It's Isabel. What should I call you? SCP-096 paused thoughtfully for a moment. He was giving himself a name for the very first time, allowing himself an identity other than a strange, hollow, pale thing that existed to cry and suffer and hurt. Finally, he answered her. Call me David. What do you do when the sun turns wrong? When light, which once represented life, joy, and warmth, becomes a symbol of death and destruction, do you hide inside? Shutter the windows, keep out the light by any means necessary? Do you retreat underground, where the sun's rays cannot penetrate, burrowing into the dark and the cold? Do you simply give yourself to it, accepting that there is no escaping something so vast, so far reaching as sunlight itself, and allow yourself to be lost in the end of all things. We've covered this possibility before. SCP-001, When Day Breaks, or SD Locke's proposal. It's difficult to know what any given person might do in such harrowing circumstances. After all, we have always learned to love the light and fear the darkness. It turns our very understanding of reality upside down to have that paradigm shifted, the dark becoming safety, and the light becoming death. The source of all life on Earth, of all warmth, transforming in an instant from the sun as we know it to an Apollyon-class SCP that melts all living organisms that cross into its gaze. But what about a being that has always feared the light? Something that prioritizes solitude and never ever wants to be seen. How might it live out those darkened days? Today, we're taking a look at what happens when Daybreak meets a familiar face, even if a constantly hidden one. SCP-096 SCP-096, or the Shy Guy, is something of a celebrity around here. It is a humanoid creature with long, distended arms, pale skin, and a jaw that can open four times wider than an ordinary human's. There is only one thing above all else that this entity desires for no one to see its face. When someone views its face, it flies into an uncontrollable rage and seems to have no other option but to destroy the person who has seen it. So, it is unlikely that a creature so intent on solitude would be in much danger from the transformed sun. In fact, it might even be a positive thing, and for some time it was. With so many human beings gone, reduced to gelatinous masses with no desire but to slither around in the ghoulish sunlight and merge with one another, there were fewer people to observe his face than ever. He could stay inside and know with almost complete certainty that no one would come to bother him. No one was coming to look at him and there were no more visitors, researchers poking and prodding that might sneak a look at his face. And so he stayed there, in the room that had served as his containment unit before the world turned upside down. The masses of flesh that once were humans did not concern him, 
as they never looked at his face. All he did was stay in his room and never go outside. The outside frightened him terribly, though he was not concerned with the deadly sunlight or the possibility of it melting him as it had so many others. He was much more afraid that someone, some unlikely survivor clinging to their original life, might look at him, that they might see his face. That was simply too distressing to risk. He would much rather stay alone in his old cell weeping softly in the shadows. One day, though we couldn't say how many days after the end of things it had been, he was weeping alone in his former cell. The days blurred together, spent the same way, and time had lost much of its meaning. Through the echoing sound of his sobs and the sloshing sounds of the creatures outside, a woman's voice cut through. It was faint, but he could make out what she was saying. She was calling out for help, asking if anyone had any food or fresh water. The sound was getting louder, closer, accompanied by the disconcerting thump of her footsteps. She was coming down the hall, as much as it could be called a hall anymore. She was coming towards his room to disrupt his miserable peace. He heard her steps cross the threshold of his room, and her voice broke into a terrified scream. No doubt at the unexpected sight of a pale, naked creature weeping in the corner of what she expected to be an empty room. Startled by the first loud sound he'd heard in a long time, in a world that had mostly been silent since the initial outpouring of agonized screams had faded into the soft slap of flesh and slime on the ground, he turned around. He shouldn't. Ordinarily, he wouldn't. But he couldn't stop himself. There he saw a woman. Wide eyes filled with tears, face streaked with dirt, a small child next to her holding her hand and clinging to her leg. Just as he saw the woman, she saw him. She saw his face. Anger boiled over inside of him, and he let out a scream, wild, primal, and filled with inhuman rage. She could not be looking at him, seeing his face. He couldn't let her. The woman ran with the child in tow, panicked by the wild roar and the sight of him standing upright before her. The anger faded as she left his sight, making her way down the hall into the stairs. But then he remembered. She had seen his face. He could not let her leave. It was time to do something he never thought he'd have to do again. Hunt. His heightened senses picked up the sound of muffled footsteps coming up through the floor below him. She was downstairs just beneath the floor where he was standing. His instincts kicked in, and his body moved almost of its own accord. He lifted his long, long arms above his head and drove his hands down into the floor. It was weakened by the ravages of the elements and time, and crumbled under his unnatural strength. He dug his claws into the plaster, tearing it apart and cracking it into pieces. He pushed his claws in deeper and deeper until he could feel them breaking through the other side. He pulled the floor apart until the hole was wide enough to fit through, then dropped down to the room below. He spotted the woman's back, fleeing through the door just as he landed. She was getting away. He tore after her, ripping through concrete and steel, destroying everything in his path in a mad dash for the object of his rage. He had to catch her. She could not be allowed to leave. She looked over her shoulder at him, her face a mask of pure terror. She knew, just as he knew, that there was no escape in sight. In his single-minded obsession and her desperation to escape from him, neither of them noticed that she had run so far and so carelessly that she was now outside the building. She had crossed from the shadows into the harsh light of the sun. The woman's eyes widened in grim understanding of her fate. He could only watch helplessly as her body began to succumb to the vicious rays. Almost instantly, she began to melt. As it was closest to the sun, her head was the first to go. Her nose drooped like hot wax, dripping as it went until it slumped off her face and landed on the ground with a sickening splash. Her eyes were next, popping out of their sockets and hanging loose and limp on her cheeks and dangling from sinewy strands. She tried in vain to stuff them back into place, but they squished in her hands like overripe fruit. She attempted to run into the comparative safety of the ruined building, but her feet were already beginning to spread out onto the street, melting into a sticky red smear on the pavement. Her legs crumbled beneath her, and she collapsed to the ground, 
her face leaving a trail of gelatinous flesh as it landed. She tried uselessly to drag herself along the ground back into the darkness, but her arms were melting into the dirt, mixing with it into a horrible red mud. She let out a last scream of agony, but the sound turned to a thick gurgle as her lips fused together and her mouth melted into nothingness. He watched it all, sobbing and roaring in frustration. She was gone, and he would never get the satisfaction of ending her. The infernal sun had stolen her from him. Now, she was nothing but a wet shadow, like the rest of the humans had become long ago. He heard the sound of a soft sob behind him, a tiny human voice. He turned, looking for the source. There was the little girl. He had almost forgotten about her. She was calling out for her mother and crying, and she was looking right at him, right at his face. He waited for the anger to overtake him, but instead, there was nothing. Why wasn't he angry? She was looking at his face, so why? Then he realized. Her eyes were on him, but she did not see him. She was blind. She approached the creature, her arms outstretched following the sound of his crying. She touched his hand with her own tiny fingers, so small and fragile, and asked, Mommy? Then he felt something he had never felt before. Tenderness. Care. A desire to protect this tiny, innocent being. It was the first time he had ever felt warm, ever felt anything but sadness, anger, or fear. Overcome with this softness, he wrapped his arms around the child and hugged her close. She hugged him back tightly, and the room went quiet as they both stopped crying. From that day on, they became a family of sorts. They lived together and he took care of her. She didn't know what he looked like and had no idea he might be something to fear. To her, he was safety. He was home. For the first time in his long, awful life, he felt like a human instead of a monster. He would scavenge food for her, bring her fresh water, lay down stolen blankets and pillows so she would have a soft place to rest. He even found her a ratty, worn teddy bear amongst the rubble and gave it to her as a gift. She clutched it to her chest and thanked him, and for once his tears were those of joy. In this cursed world, they had found something like happiness in one another. He knew he would protect her, no matter what. Then one day, everything changed. The creature and the little girl were playing in the abandoned site, making up little games together, when he took a break to look out at the window and monitor their surroundings. Outside, the evil red sun waited. When he turned back, the little girl was gone. One of the shadowy creatures, once human, was imitating his voice to lure her away. He could hear it in the distance, and her tiny footsteps following it. He chased after her, the only thing he had ever loved, and saw her just as she stepped out into the light. She screamed as one of her arms began to melt in the light, and he knew what he had to do. He grabbed her and pulled her back inside, using his body to shield her from the horrible rays. As he wept over her, his tears stopped her body from melting any further, but his body continued to fall apart. It was too late for him. He ran as far as he could. Once he transformed, he did not want to end up hurting the girl. He ran until his legs melted away and he could not run anymore. He had reached the shoreline and stared out at the ocean, unable to move anymore. He screamed a final time in agony, in heartbreak, in mourning for the happiness he had finally found and now would lose. But at least he knew, as his eyes melted away and he was nearly gone, that the girl would be safe. And then he was gone, and the world was quiet. Dr. Dan anxiously paced in his cell. It was the only way he'd been able to occupy himself for the past six months, save for pouring through files and, when he was lucky, being able to oversee another failed termination attempt. He only stopped pacing when, for a brief and horrible moment, he realized that Monster was probably doing the exact same thing in its big metal cube at this very moment. That horrible creature that he'd thrown away his life for a futile shot at killing. Perhaps the whole thing had been a fool's errand. After all, he was formerly a researcher under the employ of the SCP Foundation. Secure. Contain. Protect. 
They had truly sadistic beasts like SCP-106, the nightmarish old man, and SCP-352 Baba Yaga in containment cells, and there was no plans to terminate either of them. They weren't the Global Occult Coalition for 343's sake. Why did Dr. Dan even want to terminate SCP-096 in the first place? He tried to explain it to them again and again, but his pleas had fallen on deaf ears. In his mind, the impetus for destroying the Shy Guy was terrifyingly clear. It was a monster that killed anyone or anything that looked at its face, even a photograph of it, even a tiny collection of pixels. When its rage state was induced, it seemed that nothing would stop it. It would have an intuitive psychic link to its victim, charge at them at breakneck speed, and only find its zen again once all of them were dead. And if a picture of SCP-096 was leaked onto the internet, it would cause a chain reaction that triggered an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. There were plenty of creatures and entities that the Foundation knew about that could theoretically bring about the apocalypse, but to him, 096 was the most realistic. It preyed upon the inherent curiosity and thirst for knowledge seated in every human heart. The same drive to simply know that led to the creation of the SCP Foundation would be humanity's doom in the face of an SCP-096 outbreak. And if such a thing happened, the Foundation would need to break the masquerade of secrecy to have any hope of saving humanity. In his many feverish nightmares, Dr. Dan had seen it all so clearly. The first photographs of SCP-096's face would be leaked online. Perhaps a few hundred people across the globe would look, in disparate enough locations, that it would be almost impossible for the Foundation to detect and save all of them, as SCP-096 went on its bloody rampage. Of course, as the image proliferated, as images on the internet often do, the purview of 096's violence would only grow. People across the nation would start to take notice, and soon after that, across the world. Mysterious creature causing mass casualties would be the headline on every news desk, because why would anybody want to talk about anything else? Perhaps some foolish reporters would take video footage of the creature. Everyone has a phone these days with high-definition cameras, pictures would be taken and posted. More and more of it would flood the internet. Too many simultaneous moles for even the SCP Foundation to whack. The news would spread. Panic and hysteria would spread. People wouldn't even know what's triggering all this horror if the Foundation didn't go public and tell them that it was the pictures that was killing everyone. And by then, wouldn't it already be too late? The antidote to fear is knowledge. It's why when anything goes wrong, we're refreshing timelines and feeds and news websites for any kind of information. And if you were told an unstoppable monster was killing scores of people and might be coming to a neighborhood near you sometime soon, wouldn't you want a good look at it? Wouldn't you want to know your enemy? Having no idea that the mere act of knowing was what sealed your horrible fate. By Dr. Dan's bleak estimations, if only several million people died as a result of this kind of scenario, it could be considered a positive outcome. He'd seen it all, but no matter how many times he tried to articulate this to his superiors, he wasn't listened to. They didn't take him or the threat that SCP-096 posed seriously. Every time he warned of the apocalyptic potential of SCP-096, he was simply told to get back to working on those goggles. It was why he needed to give those naysayers a demonstration. It was why a certain photograph needed to show up in the home of a certain mountaineer. It's why all those people had to die. There was no other way. The deaths of the civilians and the researchers and the mobile task force members were, of course, regrettable. But it was the only way to prevent the deaths of so many more. They gave him what he wanted, permission to put this gangly time bomb in the ground. Even if the beast's death was inextricably tied to his own execution at the hands of the very employers who authorized him. The world was full of funny little ironies like that. Another one is that even though Dr. Dan now had the authorization and funding to terminate SCP-096, he was discovering that he lacked another important factor, the capability. They tried incinerating it, exposing it to massive amounts of radiation, exposing it to an insane degree of kinetic trauma, 
the equivalent of being hit by an out-of-control bullet train. They tested every kind of experimental, off-the-books weaponry that they had access to through various research projects. Proton blasts, lasers, high-intensity energy beams, nothing. Even when they fried off every scrap of flesh on the monster's body, its unbreakable skeleton still remained, and in what seemed like no time at all, it'd be back in action. Its very existence seemed to mock him. A guard opened his cell door, staring disdainfully at the disgraced researcher. That same guard had slammed his head against a wall a month earlier. One of his friends had apparently been killed in the legendary 096 containment breach that set this whole sordid thing in motion. Up and at him, scumbag, he said in a gruff, surly voice, training a handgun on the doctor he knew wouldn't fight back. They need you in test chamber six. Dr. Dan allowed himself a small grin, imperceptible to the guard who clearly hated his guts. They'd approved his 096 versus 682 cross test. Marvelous. How marvelous. To all the others, it would seem like just one more entry in a long line of 682 cross tests. He thought it darkly funny. In his eyes, the Foundation had no hope of ever killing SCP-682. Its defining quality was being impossible to kill, and it didn't present nearly the threat to the entire world that 096 posed. Their futile attempts to murder the lizard were little more than a money sink to justify the site's exorbitant funding. But perhaps he could turn this to his benefit. Maybe SCP-682 would hold the secret to actually killing off his nemesis. Within 30 hours, Dr. Dan had his disappointing answer. Both anomalies had undeniably done a real number on each other and Dr. Dan did take a kind of sick amusement in the mental trauma that SCP-682 had induced in 096. But ultimately, it was all for nothing. 682 had skinned 096 alive and melted off its flesh with acid, but once again, that indestructible skeleton stood firm. This had been the 27th termination attempt since the incident. The 27th failed termination attempt, Dr. Dan mentally corrected himself. 096's skeleton kept defeating them. Even their most ardent attempts to penetrate the bones and destroy the creature within had failed. During a previous attempt, they tried to access the brain by putting a diamond-hard drill into its eye sockets. Of course, it was the drill that actually broke, much to Dr. Dan's seemingly tireless frustration. Needless to say, in the debriefing interview with Dr. Carver, a researcher who once would have considered him a colleague, he wasn't in high spirits. If he managed to kill this thing, then he would always be the hero who made a terrible sacrifice in order to save many more lives. If he didn't kill 096, he was little more than the monster who murdered all those innocent people for nothing. Though you'd never hear him say it out loud. If it wasn't for that damnable, indestructible skeleton, this monster would be long dead already. If only there was some way to break the creature's bones. That's when it hit him. SCP-173, The Sculpture. A Site-19 icon often overlooked because of its more silent but deadly style, but undeniably one of the most frightening and dangerous anomalies out there. It had racked up a truly shocking body count since it was first interred at Site-19 in 1993, one broken neck at a time. And it's one of the few creatures out there that even the hard-to-destroy reptile himself is utterly terrified of. Perhaps a monster that practically has a PhD in breaking bones would be the ideal candidate to vandalize the Shy Guy's vertebrae. Once his proposal was greenlit for initial testing, Dr. Dan arranged for the Shy Guy, with a bag over his head of course, to be brought into a testing chamber with the ever-stoic SCP-173. When all of the researchers and guards were safely outside, all it took was a single blink to make all of Dr. Dan's darkest dreams come true. In the nanoseconds his eyes were closed, he heard the most beautiful sounds in the world. A loud, fleshy crunch and a pained howl from 096. He opened his eyes to an equally wondrous sight. 096 doubled over at an unnatural angle. Its spine snapped between the fourth and fifth vertebrae, spinal fluid leaking down the creature's flank. That freaky little sculpture had done it. It had actually damaged the integrity of the Shy Guy's skeleton. It was at that moment 
that Dr. Dan knew he could kill this thing. Admittedly, there was a containment breach shortly after that when the bag slipped off of 096's head, and it charged through the nearby steel wall, killing multiple people before being subdued and recontained. But when it comes to projects involving Dr. Dan, a mere handful of innocent people being killed sits comfortably within the acceptable margin of error. A day later, Dr. Dan was standing before a crowded boardroom, with agents, researchers, and even a few members of the O5 Council in attendance. He explained his findings to them, and the fact that even more importantly, they may have a way to bring the wretched existence of 096 to an absolute halt. His plans were approved. Not long after, he was putting them into motion. Dr. Dan was surrounded by researchers and heavily armed guards as 173 was escorted into the test chamber with a forklift. 096 was there, still bagged. Off to the side was a giant tub of hydrofluoric acid connected to a hose and injector attachment. If this didn't work, nothing would. Everyone stood back in a safe zone as 173 was released to do its thing. Crunch. Just like the previous time, 096's spine had been successfully snapped. Spinal fluid dribbled down its skin. Everyone had rushed into the chamber. One group kept 173 isolated with their stairs. The other, headed by Dr. Dan, prepared the acid injector and shoved it into the breach in 096's spine. As the acid was pumped by the gallon into 096's bones, the creature let out the most horrifying wail. It kicked and bucked as more acid was pumped in, melting those indestructible bones from within. The creature even began to vomit acid as it panicked, melting the bag off of its own head. Some panicked and averted their gaze. Dr. Dan didn't. He stared directly at the creature's face for the first time as it melted in front of him with nothing short of pure elation. Had he won? Had he actually won? The creature let out a gurgling shriek and the guards opened fire. Their bullets splattered into the monster's melting flesh and bones as it hollered and shrieked. They didn't let up, firing up and down its body, spraying it with white-hot lead. It began to melt and bubble away, expanding into a great, gruesome puddle on the floor beneath them. Dr. Dan laughed like a madman. Even as the guards grabbed him and dragged him away from the foul-smelling, greasy mess, bubbling with chemical life, he just kept laughing. Even though he knew the death of 096 meant an equally swift death of his own, it didn't matter. It had all been for something. The world was saved. It was over. He'd finally won. He's waiting for you in the dark. He sits cross-legged, still as a placid lake and patient as a praying monk six feet deep in meditation. He's been like this for so long, his body oil slicked with deadly black grease, skin ancient and haggard, eyes black and flat with the kind of calm you'd only find in crawling insects and great white sharks. His lipless mouth is stretched across his jawbone in an ugly black rictus. He may be an old man, but trust us, He's got plenty of new tricks he'd love to show you. He sat in the loneliest place in the world, the deep, dark bowels of an SCP Foundation containment site, surrounded by a complex confluence of containment measures. Different shapes, running liquids, bright lights, the kind of steel so thick a nuclear weapon would only leave it scuffed. All the things that had a tendency to confuse him, because that's all they ever did. The old man laughed to himself very quietly. All the people out there are so scared of him because of one immutable fact. He isn't trapped here, he's just resting. By virtue of his unique anomalous abilities to pass through solids at will and resist any form of physical damage they can dole out, there is no way to really contain him like all the others. All the SCP Foundation could hope to do was make leaving inconvenient enough for him to make his little adventures on the outside less appealing than just sitting around, doing nothing. After all, he had all the time in the world. And when you always have a later, there's a lot less pressure to do anything now. But like all thinking creatures, and please be aware that SCP-106, the wretched, terrifying old man, is very much a thinking creature, he was subject to occasional boredom. 
and when most people are bored, they might play a video game, watch a few YouTube videos, or rewatch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia for the fifth time. But for the old man, killing boredom involved, well, killing people. But not just killing people, of course. Truth be told, for him, killing was really the least entertaining part of the whole affair. The screams, the begging, the desperate pleas, warm tears on shaking cheeks, convulsions of pain, cold sweats, fear so intense it gives way to gibbering madness, the dull sheen of dead hope in their eyes when they realize that their doom is inevitable, and that he, their captor, their torturer, would decide the exact moment they slipped into the void. Of that, that was what he lived for. If you could call what the old man did living, he cracked his neck and licked his teeth. Was he salivating? All those thoughts about pain seemed to have got him worked up. He could feel the distant thumping of his heart, old black blood pumping through the dusty corridors of his vascular system, synapses booming and sparking with excitement at the thought of plumbing new depths of human misery. Like a scholar of suffering, a pioneer of pain, all those silly foundation drones with the audacity to think they're in control, he'd teach them to scream again. Meanwhile, in the room for the old man's containment chamber, all hell was breaking loose. Monitors on the monster's vitals were all spiking, heart and brain activity peaked, just as they always did before the old man decided to get active. Cameras in his containment chamber showed him rising steadily to his feet, cracking his joints, limbering up. His body started to produce that terrible corrosive mucus at an accelerated rate, pooling around his feet and unleashing squalls of noxious fumes as it melted into the floor. Years of foundation testing, and they still couldn't find any material that could withstand that vile black slop. As the old man began strolling towards the wall, a containment specialist in the control room grabbed a nearby phone and sounded the alarm for the containment breach. They needed a mobile task force, and every guard on site mobilized to tackle 106 before he got into the facility proper and started causing havoc. They couldn't risk it escaping either. The infamous incident, when the old man escaped for a Halloween massacre, still haunted the nightmares of many a staff member. He had to be stopped. Now. A small fighting force was quickly armed and assembled, along with armor and several high-intensity portable lights to hopefully slow the monster down in time for them to grab a D-Class and set up the femur breaker. By the time they all reached the hallway they intended to use as a choke point for the escape, the old man was already halfway through the outer layer of defense, phasing through the wall with that same terrible, manic grin he always had when he was about to inflict terrible violence for the sheer fun of it. The guards and task force members trained their lights and weapons on him. All of them had seen terrible things on the job. The kind of things that would saddle almost anyone with a lifetime of trauma, but almost nothing compared to the horror of direct engagement during a 106 containment breach. That terrible old coffin dodger was hell on two legs. When they discovered to their horror that the lights didn't seem to be slowing him down as much as anticipated, they fell back on plan B. That B standing for blast the living hell out of him with everything they had. The personnel opened fire, pumping round after round into his dark form. While each gave a loud, meaty splatter, the old man didn't even flinch. When he was close enough, all those months of lethargy gave way to sudden, deadly speed. In many ways, the old man was like a crocodile, a fierce and intelligent ambush predator who conserved his energy wisely. He could seem so deceptively languid that you could easily mistake him for something slow and harmless, but when you got within arm's reach, the sudden quickness and ferocity would take you off guard, and by then, it's already too late. Within 30 seconds, the old man was the only thing left alive in that hallway. All the guards and task force operatives sent to slow him down lay dead, dripping with his black mucus. There was silence save for the quiet fizzing of the mucus eating into their clothes and skin. The old man sighed. How boring. He'd killed so many people now. It all started to seem a little... samey. How many screams could you hear before they all just blended into a single shrill whine? You can get sick of even your favorite meal if you eat it too often. But that didn't matter. 
The old man had a different order of business today. He happened to be inside an SCP Foundation containment facility, filled with so many fascinating specimens of non-human entities that the one they called SCP-106 simply couldn't wait to torture. He'd only met a small portion of the ones they had contained here, but given what a fascinating experience his past attack on his fellow anomalies was, he couldn't wait to meet some more. Meanwhile, the site's top brass did all they could to try to mobilize a second response to the rogue senior citizen from hell currently strolling through their high-security containment facility. Could they get in contact with other mobile task forces deployed in the area? Maybe they could get Hammerdown or Samsara in on this mess before anything got really out of hand. The old man seemed more intent on something this time. They suspected even the femur breaker might not work in luring him back until he claimed whatever he deemed to be his prize. Maybe they should contact the O5 Council. Security guards were tracking 106's progress through the facility via their vast networks of security cameras. They warned any research, administration, and janitorial staff to clear out of his path, unless they felt like being tortured to death. He hadn't dragged anyone into his pocket dimension yet, so whoever that privilege was reserved for would probably be getting a particular sticky experience. They could only speculate as to the Silent Beast's intentions. One guard noticed something. When cross-referencing 106's movements with a map of the facility, they were able to triangulate where he was heading, straight for the containment chamber of SCP-096. The guard's lips curled into a slight smile, thinking, if one of you freaks can actually kill the other, maybe something positive will come out of this disaster. The old man was having a stroll down memory lane. The time prior when he broke out of his cell and decided to hassle his fellow inmates was certainly eventful. He wound up in the company of some cantankerous reptile and a Korean foxwoman, an unlikely pair if ever there was one. After finding himself in a room with them, he decided they should have a little more privacy and dragged them back into his pocket dimension for further fun. Of course, with two at once, his attention had been a little split. They spent as much time tussling with each other as resisting his attempts to torment them. They definitely put him through his paces that day, and he gave far better than he got. After so many hours of brutal mutilation, there was barely any of the lizard left, despite its frustrating insistence on quickly healing from so many of its wounds. Still, it was good exercise, even if the results had been a little less than satisfying. If he could get another anomaly alone, though, he'd be able to take his time and really savor the pain he caused. Oh, that sounded heavenly. Soon, he came upon an incredibly strange containment chamber that quickly caught his eye. It looked like a huge metal cube with no way in or out, not even a seam. Whatever was trapped in there, the old man thought it must be something that even the fools at the SCP Foundation really, truly wanted nothing to do with. But even more so than the strange sight, it was the sound that drew the old man in, tempting him like a siren song. It was weeping, a soft, sobbing keen that betrayed a bottomless well of misery. Whatever was making that crying sound had known true despair, or whatever passes for true despair before you've had a close encounter with the old man in his pocket dimension. The old man grinned and thought, Oh, Sonny. I'll give you something to really cry about." He stepped forward and faced his way into the metal cube. The creature was in the corner. In contrast to that stupid lizard, this monster was pleasingly humanoid with, presumably, all the familiar pain points. Splendid. The only real difference was color and proportion. It was far longer and ganglier than the average human, with grayish skin and no hair anywhere on its body. Still, it was something the old man could work with. The creature didn't even seem to register his presence. It just sat crumpled in the corner, weeping. Still grinning his lunatic grin, the old man approached and rested a moist hand on the creature's shoulder. Its pale skin began to fizzle from the intruder's corrosive touch. A pool of vile sludge began spreading out beneath his feet until the creature was encompassed too. Little by little, they sank into the old man's favorite place out of the world the pocket dimension, his own personal, eternal, infinite dungeon, where the only laws are pain and terror for all but the old man himself. Little did he know, this time, the scores may be a little more even on that front. 
They both stood in that terrifying labyrinth of hallways and chambers where the old man had made countless lives infinitely worse than any terrible afterlife that could follow them. And still, this creature didn't seem to change its reaction. He was almost irritated by it. And what's more, this whole time, the creature hadn't even turned to look at him. He'd have to fix that, too. The old man, with his shocking strength, gripped the monster's shoulder and whipped him around, staring into his face, baring his black eyes and manic smile. But he couldn't help find what looked back at him, disconcerting. Its eyes were blank and white, its face stretched and warped into a permanent grimace, like Munch's old painting, The Scream. And the second the old man laid eyes on it, that's exactly what it did. Its gaping mouth let out the most terrible wail the old man had ever heard in all his years of torturing. It was a scream of unknowable sadness and fear, but somehow the old man sensed that this creature didn't fear him. It feared itself feared what it was about to do. What the hell had he dragged down here with him? Without warning, the terrible wail soon gave way to sudden and ferocious aggression. Just like the old man had dealt out to a group of Foundation guards and mobile task force agents earlier that same night, it was only out of a mix of pure luck and his own finely tuned animal instinct that the old man was able to dodge the first strike from the creature's long, lithe forelimb. He couldn't believe it. They were in his special place, and this victim of his had the audacity to fight back? Well, he'd soon put this monster in its place. As the monster continued roaring and swiping for him, the old man simply walked backwards into a nearby wall, and disappearing into a black stain. Of course, the monster, better known to the Foundation as SCP-096 or the Shy Guy, simply crashed through the wall to give chase, but on the other side, just another wall. He disappeared. How? Typically, when something sees the face of the Shy Guy, he immediately has a kind of intuitive connection to them. He can sense their presence. It's burned into his mind. A homing beacon. An unstoppable imperative. He knows exactly where they are and how to get them. But nothing about this situation was typical. The Shy Guy felt all the murderous rage he normally did, but the rest was just static. Where was the life he needed to abolish hiding? Suddenly, the old man emerged behind him and forced his hand into the Shy Guy's back. His fist melted straight through flesh and skin, causing the creature to let out another terrible wail. But as could be expected, they didn't leave a scratch on the Shy Guy's indestructible skeleton. The Shy Guy pulled a 180 and swung for the old man again, but he was already gone. Here in the pocket dimension, the old man had the ultimate home turf advantage. Here, space and time were his playthings. In the infinite, twisting, labyrinthian walls of the pocket dimension, the old man wasn't just the devil, he was God, too. But it would take far more than some cheap tricks and bodily harm to dissuade the shy guy from his sole purpose in life. He began running through the old man's personal maze like a crazed lab rat, tearing through wall after wall, forever searching for the monster that trapped it here. He would see the smiling face of that rotten old man every so often, the flash of black eyes and dirty teeth in shadows. But every time it tried to strike the shadows, there would be nothing there. And every time he got a chance, the old man would emerge from the shadows behind the shy guy to strike back, clawing into his flesh and vanishing again before the trapped beast could retaliate. The nasty old sadist was now starting to have some fun. It was a reflex test. A classic game of high-stakes whack-a-mole, and every time the creature failed to strike him, its distress only seemed to grow. This was perfectly fine for the old man. After all, he enjoyed a little mental torment as much as he loved physical torture, and a human would have died or given in to despair long before now. This monster's wonderful mix of resilience and pain made it a great chew toy. The old man kept up this routine, baiting and striking until something unanticipated happened. He appeared, waited for the swing, disappeared as it approached, then reappeared behind the shy guy to deliver another painful strike. This time, however, it seemed his victim had anticipated his pattern. Before he could hit the creature, the shy guy turned, quicker than anything the old man had ever seen, and hit him with such force he flew through several walls in his own maze, shattering them as he went. He hit the ground, stunned by the fact that the shy guy had actually landed a hit, but he wasn't done. The shrieking monster came bounding after him. Before the old man could stand, it struck him again and again and again, pounding his vile body into the ground. 
which cracked and crumbled. The old man sneered and sank into a puddle of his mucus on the ground. The old man was gone again. SCP-096 screamed in a mix of rage, despair, and frustration. So consumed with its hunt that it didn't notice the pool of corrosive mucus was slowly growing. It began to rise, bubbling and hissing at SCP-096's feet, getting deeper and deeper and deeper as the walls rose taller and taller around it. The creature wailed until a tide of the awful stuff reached its face and cascaded down its throat, melting all the organs within. As the creature was fully submerged, SCP-106 manifested atop the wall and looked down, smiling spitefully. He thought, Oh, you may have had me there, boyo, but in the end, I always win. Nothing could survive that. And yet bubbles still rose from the slop below. The old man gritted his rotten teeth and balled his fists in quiet anger. Moments later, back in our dimension, a portal opened in the ground of SCP-096's containment chamber. It vomited out SCP-096's skeleton, smothered in bubbling black goo, and SCP-106. 096 would probably be fully regenerated within a couple of hours, and if 682's encounter with him was anything to go by, probably extremely unwilling to interface with the old man. And the old man himself, who couldn't help but feel a little humiliated by the whole experience, was glad the two of them would probably never meet again. He left the regenerating 096 and commenced the walk of shame back to his containment chamber. They didn't even need the femur breaker. He just felt like having a sit down and processing it all. Nobody else would ever know what happened in the pocket dimension that day. And for the old man's pride, that was probably for the best. But he'd know. He'd always know. By the night's end, he was sitting in his containment chamber again, forlornly wondering, God damn it, old timer. Have you lost your edge? What does a monster look like to you? What figures slither and claw their way into your nightmares, chasing you down endless halls and stalking you through the dark until you wake up screaming? Maybe you imagine something tall and lean, bony arms reaching for you from atop impossibly long, slender legs its featureless face showing no mercy. Maybe you think of a man in a striped sweater with knives for fingers, or a serial killer in a hockey mask wielding a machete. Maybe it's something more inhuman, a cosmic horror of tentacles and eyes that can see into your very soul. You probably don't think of something with no arms, no legs, no body at all, just a face. What's so scary about that? A face can't run after you, can't grab you by the ankles and pull you under the bed. A face can only look. It may be unsettling to behold, it might send a chill down your spine, but the worst it can do is make you a little uncomfortable. And if you can't stand it any longer, you could always just close your eyes, or walk away and be done with it, right? If that's what you think, if you don't believe in monsters that can hurt you without lifting a finger, then you're the type to fall victim to a very special, very intelligent mask. In the hollowed halls of the SCP Foundation, there is a containment cell outfitted with a hermetically sealed glass case surrounded by steel, iron, and lead. There are guards posted outside along with a trained psychologist if you are ever brave and foolish enough to enter that room, you'll see a simple white porcelain comedy mask with a peculiar black substance leaking from its eyes and mouth. Whatever this slime touches, surfaces begin to corrode, to rot away into puddles of black liquid. You might notice the same liquid trickling slowly down the walls of the room, corrupting everything in its path. As unsettling of a sight as it is, if you approach the mask to take a closer look, you will find yourself overcome by an intense, nearly irresistible urge to pick it up and put it on. To wear it, to let it consume you from the inside out and puppet your body while your brain simply turns off. Like an extinguished flame, you'll simply be gone. Then, who knows what the mask will do? It won't be your concern anymore, that's for sure. But thankfully, you haven't gone into the room with the porcelain mask. 
You haven't let it cast its spell on you. Not yet, at least. It's waiting for you there, in the room with black slime oozing down its walls, and it will wait patiently for as long as it needs to. After all, what's a mask without a face to wear it? SCP-035, better known as the Possessive Mask, sat in its containment cell, immobile as always. It didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. The Foundation had chosen, selfishly, to revoke its host privileges. Once upon a time, they offered it bodies to choose from. Mannequins, dummies, and wooden dolls it could adorn and pilot. They didn't last as long as an organic living host, of course. But it was something. It was a taste of freedom. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its surroundings. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its expression from comedy to tragedy. But it was determined to still find something to laugh about. Even without a body trapped in this infernal box, there had been some delicious opportunities for entertainment. Human minds were fragile things. The mask had learned this over the infinite years of its life, if one could call it a life. Apply the right kind of pressure to the right weak points, whisper an enticing word or two, find the right emotional wound to sprinkle a pinch of salt into, and humans would buckle completely in almost no time at all. It had tried all sorts of methods since being confined to this boring little box. Sometimes it would charm someone, pour honeyed flattery into their heads until the person felt like the mask was a dear friend, a confidant. Once suitable trust had been built up, the mask could persuade the person to bring it a host, or perhaps even offer up themselves in sacrifice. If flattery didn't work, there were other potent approaches to take. For a being without ears, the mask was a good listener. It picked up on things that no human ever could, the darkest secrets buried in a person's mind. If it caught wind of something, especially juicy and ruinous, it could leverage that, threaten to expose an affair, a crime, or perhaps something even worse. Something unspeakable. If praise failed, and so did blackmail, there was always good old supernatural intimidation. All the mask needed was for someone to be left alone with it for a long enough period of time. Then, its invisible tendrils could snake out into their defenseless mind, weaving and poking around, leaving a lingering sense of cold, dread, of incomprehensible whispers in long, dead tongues. What a delight containment had been in the early days, when the Foundation had not yet figured out the mask's true capabilities, when they would leave security personnel with weak wills and minimal training standing guard in the mask's field of influence for hours at a time, as the entity played with their thoughts and chipped away at their free will. Thanks to the helpers it had been able to mold out of those hapless victims, they had been there to break open its case and carry it to freedom. But every time, the other guards thwarted the attempts, shooting its helpers and rendering them utterly useless. Then the Foundation increased its security. Something about the unacceptably high homicide rates among staff assigned to SCP-035. How utterly boring. How truly pathetic. Still, the mask had found ways to occupy itself even without any more playthings. It had grown stronger with its boredom, stretching its influence beyond organic beings and into the very room itself, its evil enriching and deepening like a fine wine in the depths of a cold cellar. Over the months, the walls of SCP-035's containment cell had begun to secrete the same black, slimy substance that would pour from the mask's eyes and mouth. The liquid dripped down the walls in deliberate formations, patterns that became increasingly easy to recognize. Phrases in Italian, Latin, Ancient Greek, 
all detailing ritual sacrifices and mutilations. The mask took time to describe the sacrificial victims in great detail, borrowing identifying traits from various staff members so that it knew would read the translations. The walls were slick with blood and harrowing imagery, and the glass case around the mask was growing more and more fragile by the day. Anyone within 10 meters of the mask could feel this strength too. They would leave the area complaining of unintelligible whispers, of loud, cruel laughter, and a lingering sense of nearly insurmountable despair. It was as if they knew on some level that no one was truly safe. Eventually, the mask would find a way to come for them all. The glass was weakening, and soon the mere thought of escape would make it shatter into pieces. Then, perhaps, the mask could finally get its deepest desire, revenge. It wanted nothing more than to try to make the Foundation pay for imprisoning it, for taking away its host privileges, for trying harder and harder to contain the kind of power that should have had them falling to their knees in worship. The mask seethed with hatred day in and day out. It had seen the crumbling of the Roman Empire, the beheading of kings, the decimation of armies. It was not going to be captured by a bunch of rats in lab coats without dire consequences befalling them. Maybe it couldn't move from its prison cell at the moment, but it also knew that it was surrounded on all sides by dangerous beasts capable of reducing the sight and all who had dared to oppose the mask to a pile of smoldering rubble. If it could only find its way onto one of their faces, it would show them all just what it was capable of. As the piercing sound of an alarm echoed down the hall, the sound of screams and chaos following shortly after, the mask's frowning face curved into a broad, menacing smile. What was it that had escaped? The lizard, perhaps? The giant, grinning man? Whatever it was, it seemed that the action was heading right towards 035's containment cell. Perhaps today was the day. Finally, the SCP Foundation would fall. Outside the mask cell, Security Officer Harper was running for dear life. Though his more rational mind knew he was living on seconds, not even minutes, of borrowed time, his animal brain kept his legs pumping, desperately trying to avoid the screaming, howling predator hot on his heels. Harper looked over his shoulder and screamed as a long white arm reached for him. SCP-096, the Shy Guy, its tooth-lined jaw hanging low and foaming with spittle. That face, that terrible, terrible face. An absolute death sentence to all who saw it. He'd seen what he thought was a crack in the otherwise perfect seal of 096's containment chamber, but it could have just as easily been a trick of the light. Not even thinking, he stepped forward and looked at the vulnerability in the chamber. All it took was one misplaced ray of light, and he made out the vague shape of a face in the darkness. That's when the weeping started. Harper knew in that moment his life was over. The correct thing to do would have been to order everyone else in the room to close their eyes while he stood there and accepted his fate, minimizing the risk of spreading the damage further. But humans rarely have perfect reasoning, even less so when facing mortality. Back in the present, the shy guy made a perfect lunge, grabbing Harper in its iron clutches and barreling through the adjoining wall. The nearby guards scattered, terrified, keeping their eyes on the floor. They might get a slap on the wrist for temporarily abandoning their posts, but they weren't going to die guarding some stupid evil mask. Speaking of, the possessive mask was surprised to feel two new presences enter its chamber through the now destroyed wall. These two presences soon became just one, as SCP-096 quickly and totally annihilated Security Officer Harper, leaving nothing left. The mask couldn't see, per se, seeing as it had no actual sensory organs, but it felt around this new guest with its many psychic tendrils taking in this strange totality. The creature was powerful, no doubt about that, 
and it elicited fear from those fools at the SCP Foundation. But the mask noticed its brainwaves were extraordinarily muted. Humans, to the mask's vast and malicious consciousness, weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, but compared to this thing's mind, they were a pile of tempered katanas. It barely thought at all. The mask would have to dig deeper to find anything it could use. Meanwhile, SCP-096 finally began to calm down. The one who had seen it had been annihilated. Bubbling rage was slowly siphoned out and replaced by the standard low but constant hum of anxiety and despair. It would wait until its head was bagged and it was dragged back to the dark. Same old, same old, all the way to the end of time. That's when it felt something else. It started as a faint buzz, an unintelligible whisper, and it was almost like a door opened in the back of its head. Something stepped in and took a seat. Can you hear me, stranger? Look, look, I want to speak to you. Something about the voice frightened and comforted SCP-096 at the same time. It spoke with a greater degree of sympathy than the creature had heard in a long time. And yet, something about the way it spoke implied evil in its intent. I know what you want. I know what you fear. Wouldn't it be nice? If they could never look at you again, if you could cover that face of yours, I can help you. It would be so simple. All you need to do is put me on. Little by little, 096 felt more of these strange thoughts filling up the emptiness in its head replacing the few little thoughts the creature itself had. It felt itself lifting its hands from the ground, lifting them and reaching towards something, a glass box. The glass shattered, and those long white fingers reached for something within. A mask, just like the voice had said, a mask to stop people from looking at its face. Yes. Yes, you're doing so well. You're so close. Just a little further. SCP-096 lifted the mask to its face, feeling black liquid that burned its skin dripping from the porcelain, and put it on. And in that moment, everything changed. The Shy Guy's body began to seize up, rattling as the mask unleashed a web of psychic tendrils through its body, mapping out across every inch like a new nervous system, taking control. The possessive mask had never experienced a host like this before, that incredible perfect mix of physical durability and a mind so insubstantial that it was easy to sublimate. Oh, this was going to be fun. For the first time, the Shy Guy, now under the full control of the possessive mask, stood at full height on its hind legs, its spine and shoulders clicking into place for its new stance. The mask cracked its neck, getting used to the new dimensions of its physicality, its indestructible bones, its long, grasping limbs, its skin burning and fizzling with the gooey black secretions, but growing back just as quickly. The Foundation had every reason to fear it now. A group of security personnel had gathered in the ragged hole where the chamber's north wall used to be. Some were wielding light firearms. The guard at the front was carrying an opaque black bag. The mask laughed with its new body and turned to the crowd. The second they saw it on 096's body, their faces fell. For a moment, their bodies went slack with terror. This situation was unprecedented. What course of action could they possibly take at a time like this? It looked at the bag held by the leader of the security force and projected a single thought into his mind. You won't be needing that. Before any of the guards even had a chance to open fire, the mask lunged forwards, using the long, terrible arms of the shy guy to tear through the guards. 
They were dead in seconds, their bodies strewn about the hallway. The mask's porcelain was twisted into a wide, sadistic grin. It could tell that it was about to have some real fun around here. And once it slaughtered everyone here, it could finally stretch its legs out in the open again. True freedom to spread misery, fear, and pain everywhere it went. There were just a few hundred members of Foundation personnel it needed to turn into corpses first. More containment breach alarms sounded around the site as the mask began its rampage, running through the hallways and tearing apart any unfortunate Foundation personnel it could get 096's hands on. Guards, researchers, administrative staff, and even one extremely unlucky janitor in Hallway C6. It was having the time of its long and terrible life, and much to its glee, it seemed that this new host's body was still holding up. It was perfect symbiosis, a twisted, brilliant mind, and a body that could forever support it. There would be no stopping it, a conclusion that the hapless guards posted around the site soon realized on their own terms. 096 was indestructible, but it was dumb as a brick and had an easily exploitable weakness. Get the bag on its head and you're home free. This new composite creature was a different story. It could think tactically, avoiding head-on confrontations in favor of sneak attacks, and the monster had as much psychic combat potential as physical. Guards roving the building in teams heavily armed with anti-memetic protective gear still reported feeling immense feelings of psychological dread over comms. That was the greatest sign that the mask would come bursting through the wall moments later and tear them to shreds. The site director put out an urgent call for all nearby mobile task forces to intercept and help them take care of the unfortunate situation. Thankfully, a detachment of MTF-8-10, also known as See No Evil, was operating on a case in close proximity. Given their specialization in anomalies with a mimetic visual property, many on the team had dealt with 096 breaches before. That at least gave them experience in half of this situation, and one operative among them Sergeant Henrique Ramirez would be the one to bring this nightmare to an end, but it would cost him his life in the process. The mask was still using its new indestructible body to wreak havoc on the containment site. Once it had taken out the primary contingents of guards, it was free to have its fun with the rest, stalking defenseless researchers through the halls, making sure to induce maximum terror before finally striking the killing blow. Every single one of them died with a head full of demonic whispers. It told them of the mask's eternal dominion. Now it had found the perfect host. Nothing on Earth would stop it. Humans would be mere ants under its feet. Ada 10 touched down and entered the building. Ramirez was point man, leading the others into the bowels of the blood-drenched containment site. They'd been briefed on what they were heading in for. 096 and 035 had reached symbiosis and were displaying unprecedented anomalous effects. Enter with extreme caution. They're beyond dangerous, even more so together than alone. Ideally, Ramirez would have wanted to go in with a comprehensive plan, but lives were on the line here. They needed to leap off the cliff and build their wings on the way down. It was only when they finally encountered the monster that they realized just how outmatched they were. Despite their best efforts, the combined speed, intelligence, and ferocity of the mask's new form allowed it to make short work of Ada 10. Only Ramirez was left, heavily injured. Even if a miracle happened, he knew he wasn't getting out of here alive. The mask grabbed him with one of 096's claws and lifted him up. It would take its time with this one. Make him suffer, watch him squirm, destroy his mind. Ramirez felt the mask's psychic tendrils penetrate the membrane of his mind. Those whispers, those terrible whispers reciting all his worst fears with terrible glee. His gun was out of ammo, his knife was broken. All he had left on him was a pocket mirror, and that was his eureka moment. It was a long shot, but it was also his only shot. He reached out and grabbed the bottom of the mask, pulling for dear life. His other hand shot into his pocket and grabbed the mirror, opening its lid with a deft flick of his thumb. It was too fast for the mask to even register what was going on. 
Ramirez forced his eyes shut and lifted up the mirror. The mask saw its own reflection in the glass as the bottom of its face came loose, revealing the reflection of the face underneath. The mask squeezed, killing Ramirez, but it was already too late. It had finally seen the face of its host, and that would cost it dearly. The mask felt a sudden and tremendous pushback to its psychic forces, a blind despair and then rage that choked out everything. SCP-096 began to sob and howl. Somehow the mask was no longer in control. Despite its psychic protests, 096 reached up and tore the terrible mask from its face, tossing it against the wall with such force that it was embedded in the brickwork. Its last thoughts, as other mobile task force operators descended on the area to bag 096 and return it to its containment chamber were, What the hell just happened? And the next thought that crossed the mind of the site director was, request site transfer for 035 as soon as possible. Don't want a repeat of this incident anytime soon. <sighs> here we go again. It's time to return to the acid-filled containment chamber of SCP-682, more commonly known as the hard-to-destroy reptile. We've spoken about him and the ways the SCP Foundation has attempted to destroy him in a previous video. But as we said back then, we really only scratched the surface of the huge number of insane ways the Foundation has tried to wipe this cranky lizard off the face of the Earth. Today, we're filling in some of the cracks and taking a look at the secret test logs detailing the Foundation's unsuccessful quest to finally destroy SCP-682. Some of these may surprise you, and if you're a real SCP expert, you may just recognize some familiar faces we meet along the way. Esteemed Foundation researcher Dr. Alto Clef, famed for his somewhat unconventional personality, entered the test chamber to see if he could intimidate the beast to death. This resulted in a long staring contest between Dr. Clef and 682. Towards the end of the competition, Dr. Clef began to lose his nerve. He tried to leave the room, only to find that the door was locked, causing him to swear loudly. Dr. Clef, who always tries to find the most direct solution to his problems, blew up the door with plastic explosives and ran off. The result? test failed. Next came SCP-662, a silver handbell that summons the supernaturally helpful butler, Mr. Deeds. When Mr. Deeds was summoned, Foundation researchers asked him if he could kill SCP-682. Deeds politely explained that he wouldn't be capable of killing 682. It's just too strong. When he asked if he could at least incapacitate 682, he replied that the best way to do this would be to poison himself and allow 682 to eat his body. But this, he reminded, would only be a temporary problem for the lizard. Another test failed. The Foundation brought in SCP-689, a terrifying soapstone statue of a sitting skeleton that can kill you if you see it and then stop paying attention to it. 682 first observed the statue, and then the Foundation turned off the lights. When they turned them back on, SCP-682 appeared to be dead in a puddle of gray and black liquid. D-Class personnel were sent in to confirm that 682 was actually dead, but it instead got up and killed them. Researchers theorized that 682's definition of life is not quite the same as ours, rendering 689's death-related powers ineffective. Test failed yet again. SCP-807 was next up to bat. This is an anomalous salmon-colored ceramic dinner plate with the words Last Chance Diner printed on the edges in white. Any food placed on it becomes irresistible by any definition, but when the food is consumed it causes immediate cardiac arrest due to the sudden clogging of arteries with fat. Researchers made a meal known as the 682 Special. 10 kilograms of rotten mead and sharpened bone splinters, 10 liters of rancid mayonnaise, 1 liter of potassium cyanide, and 1 kilogram of morphine hydrochloride, combined into a solid mass and transmuted by 807. When 682 consumed this disgusting meal, it appeared to collapse. However, when D-Class personnel were sent in again to see whether 682 was truly out for the count, multiple holes opened up in its body. These holes fired out high-pressure jets of blood, 
killing the nearby D-classes and destroying the containment cell. 682 was fine afterwards. Another test failed. To kill 682, it seemed that the Foundation really needed to have God on their side. So they tried to recruit SCP-343, also known as God, to help them destroy the beast. However, when he entered the containment chamber, he somehow couldn't even see the beast. When researchers asked him whether he could kill 682, God replied, He's not one of mine. Deal with him yourself. Test failed before it even began. Next, the Foundation recruited SCP-524, a small white rabbit that can eat literally anything, including itself without being harmed. The rabbit was released into SCP-682's chamber, at which point it approached 682 and began to eat one of its legs. 682 roared in pain and scuttled up the wall, out of 524's reach, where it remained for a number of hours. At this point, SCP-524 seemed to become bored and began eating its way out of containment through a nearby wall. Test failed. Maybe the luck of the Irish was what the Foundation needed to finally put this monster to rest. They recruited SCP-1933, a fat man dressed as Santa Claus whose bodily fluids consist entirely of the alcoholic beverage known as Irish cream. If enough of this man's self-produced Irish cream is fed to something, they'll find that all of their bodily fluids have become Irish cream too, killing them. The Foundation fed large quantities of this Irish cream to SCP-682 and it actually had an effect, causing 682 to appear intoxicated, which was a promising sign. However, it soon vomited out a massive quantity of SCP-1933 bodily fluids turning the walls of its cell into Irish cream and allowing it to escape and wreak havoc. Test failed. Big time. The Foundation recruited the help of SCP-2337, an intelligent corncrake known as Dr. Spanko, with a voice so loud it can quite literally talk its victims to death if it speaks to them for an extended period of time. It was sent into SCP-682's chamber to attempt to destroy the beast, but 682 just told it to leave, and the talkative bird obliged by blowing away one of the chamber walls with a yell, allowing SCP-682 to breach containment again. Terrible job, Dr. Spanko. Test failed. The Foundation researchers were starting to get a little frustrated with their lack of progress, which you can no doubt sympathize with, and they even pitched the possibility of sending SCP-682 into an alternate dimension where perhaps it would enter into a stalemate against its alternate self. But this pitch was shot down by the O5 Council on the grounds that it was way, 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 way too risky. Back to the drawing board, by which we mean they literally transformed 682's skin into a kind of drawing board. SCP-2521 is an anomaly that manifests any time information about it is recorded and immediately grabs the source of the information, wrapping it in its tendrils and taking it away with it. The Foundation sought to take advantage of this by using a laser cutter to cut this anomalous information into SCP-682's side. However, this didn't have the results they were hoping for. SCP-2521 did turn up to take the information, but it only took the skin on which the information was carved. 682 survived and quickly grew back its skin. Test failed. Again. Researchers suggested tracking down SCP-169, an obscenely massive underwater creature known as the Leviathan, and feeding 682 to the beast. However, this idea was also immediately shot down by the O5 Council. If 682 did what it did best, which was surviving attacks and adding them to its own arsenal, then it might grow to the size of SCP-169, which would likely trigger an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. It simply was not worth the risk. Test failed before it even started. The Foundation released two specimens of SCP-939 into 682's test chamber. These voice-imitating, amnesia-inducing monsters have caused huge damage to human targets, so it was hoped that they may be able to do something to 682, but this hope turned out to be misplaced. Both specimens seemed extremely distressed by 682's presence and refused to engage at all. 682 did not share the same apprehension about attacking. It charged in and brutally killed both before devouring their corpses. Test 
failed. In a very well-documented case, the adorable SCP-999 was introduced into 682's test chamber. The unassailable good vibes provided by 999 as well as an intense tickle fight did actually lead to the temporary incapacitation of SCP-682. However, the otherwise wholesome incident ended in tragedy when 682 adapted to the good vibes and was able to release a kind of violent laughter wave. This incapacitated much of the staff and allowed 682 to breach containment and go on another killing spree before being recontained. Test, once again, failed. The next test involved SCP-294, an anomalous coffee machine that can produce any liquid typed into its keypad. Foundation researchers requested SCP-682 killer from the machine and were astounded by the results. During tests on the liquid with SCP-682 tissue samples, the liquid was surprisingly effective and caused the 682 tissue to decay and crumble. Tests on the living creature were similarly promising. The acid in 682's tank was temporarily lowered, and one liter of SCP-682 killer was poured onto the reptile's head, causing that portion of its flesh to immediately decay. When the acid was returned, the same portion that had the liquid poured on it dissolved instantly. Test, well, not quite successful, but promising, and requiring further research. Foundation scientists believe that if they could one day get a large enough quantity of this liquid, they might have a viable option. But until then, the tests march on. For another experiment, they introduced SCP-055 into the containment chamber of SCP-682. SCP-055, also known as the self-keeping secret, is a mysterious anomaly that can only be described by what it isn't. For example, we know that SCP-055 is not round, but that was pretty much it. Now, however, we know something else about SCP-055, that it can't kill SCP-682. Test failed, but at least we know twice as much about SCP-055 as we did before. Next came SCP-082 better known as Fernand the Cannibal. Fernand was first presented a piece of flesh from 682, but rather than eating it, he inspected it and began to express joy that his friend still lived. When introduced into 682's testing chamber, Fernand attempted to subdue the lizard and use it as his steed. 682 expressed an intense hatred for both Fernand and the idea of being ridden like a pony, and the two of them engaged in combat. Mobile task forces were eventually brought in to subdue both subjects. In a debrief interview, both hinted that they shared history prior to containment, but 682 was reluctant to talk about it further. Test entertaining, but still a failure. Researchers were becoming extremely frustrated with SCP-682's unwillingness to die, so they called in an SCP who responded to reason much better. SCP-049, The Plague Doctor. This sinister surgeon can kill with a touch, and the Foundation hoped that his abilities would extend to 682. However, the result was a dud. The Plague Doctor did touch 682, but it experienced no adverse effects and eventually swiped at the Doctor. Upon leaving, 049 reported feeling emotionally disturbed by his encounter with SCP-682. Yep, you guessed it. Test failed. If it gives you any indication of just how desperate the researchers were at this point, Dr. Graham pondered whether introducing 682 to a human with just as pessimistic and misanthropic feelings as itself would somehow pacify it. They sent in a particularly nasty D-Class, and the two spoke. Fascinatingly, 682 didn't attempt to harm this D-Class. They just shared their profane and bleak sentiments about the human race with one another. However, some of 682's opinions were a little too spicy for this D-Class. After listening to the reptile speak for 20 minutes, the D-Class fell into a catatonic state from the sheer depression of it all. He died not long after. One researcher suggested perhaps the worst idea of all, letting SCP-682 out into the wild, not even really to terminate it, just to see what it does. The scientists figured there would be some merit in analyzing the creature's behavior, this idea was submitted anonymously, of course. It seems even the most sadistic of researchers know better than to put their name on an idea like that. As you can probably guess, this request was shot down by the O5 Council. The note attached to the request by one of its members summed it up best. 
I'll tell you what it will do. It'll go out for a nice stroll, murder a few innocent people, go fishing, slaughter a few more innocent people, start up a tech company, eat a few more innocent people, go on a vacation to Florida, dismember a few more innocent people. I swear, when I find out who wrote this, you can personally enter 682's containment chamber to analyze him yourself. This has been far from an exhaustive account of all the different ways the SCP Foundation has tried to terminate SCP-682, but it shouldn't be surprising that all of their ideas have either been failures or were too risky to even try. Sadly for the SCP Foundation and the human race, it's likely we'll be dealing with SCP-682 for a long time to come. But do you have an idea for how you think 682 could finally be killed? Something that even the Foundation hasn't thought of to try? Let us know in the comments. Hello everyone. If you're a fan of SCP Explained, you'll know that we regularly post interesting questions in our community tab, asking for responses from you, our dear fans. These have ranged from questions about specific anomalies, like SCP-096, or your suggestions on how we should actually kill SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. We've even asked you which anomalous powers you'd want to have and posed your questions directly to SCP-343, also known as God, and of course, the terrifying and infamous Scarlet King. But in our latest community question, asking you about hypothetical crossovers between the SCP Foundation and the weird wild multiverse of all fiction, you truly outdid yourself, with thousands upon thousands of responses. And we thought rather than just making one video selecting our favorites, we'd turn each of our favorites into whole videos. And how are we going to do that? That's where this wonderful state-of-the-art gizmo comes into play. You may remember the Anomatron 6000, our incredibly advanced artificial intelligence-driven supercomputer designed specifically to run simulations for the SCP Foundation. We fed this computer data from countless SCP Foundation experiments and cross-tests, and all the data from your suggestions. This will allow the fine folks at the SCP Foundation to explore any anomalous hypothetical without risking the lives of staff members or civilians. This brings us to our first simulation, suggested in a huge number of comments. Could SCP-682 be contained within the Backrooms? For those not in the know, the Backrooms is an internet urban legend that spiraled into a full-blown phenomenon. It's built on the premise that if you're not careful and enter certain specific circumstances, you can no-clip out of our reality and enter a terrifying multi-level alternate reality, where you're stalked by a variety of bizarre and frightening creatures. This could be a complete nightmare for your average person, but how would it play out if SCP-682, the endlessly angry, hard-to-destroy reptile, found its way inside? Also, for another Backrooms-related surprise, stick around until the end of the video. In the meantime, though, let's boot up the Anomatron and test this new scenario. The worst had happened again. SCP-682 had busted out of containment during a cross-test and started making a beeline for the nearest populated area. Several helicopters containing heavily armed MTF New 7 Hammerdown members were in hot pursuit, attempting to slow the vicious reptile down with targeted sniper fire at its legs. But it seems that these efforts were all for naught. SCP-682 had already reached the defunct industrial district on the edge of a nearby city, and if the beast managed to actually reach a populated area, all hell would break loose. That's when they pulled out the heavy weaponry. Miniguns mounted to the helicopters unleashed a rain of hellfire down onto SCP-682. However, 682 managed to dodge most of the bullets and simply tank the rest. Command authorized the use of heavy ordnance, the helicopter's missile launchers. They'd pick up the pieces afterwards, once SCP-682 was back in containment. However, the reptile had plans of its own. It charged into a nearby abandoned chemical plant to avoid the gunfire from above. This was exactly what Hammerdown wanted. The helicopters circled around the chemical plant and unleashed a barrage of powerful incendiary missiles, blowing the plant to kingdom come in hopes of dragging an incapacitated 682 out of the rubble afterwards. But when the smoke had cleared and only the rubble was left, 682 was nowhere to be seen. Even for the hardcore operatives of Hammerdown, this caused an anxiety spike. Had it tunneled into the ground, had it adapted to the attack by turning invisible or getting tiny to escape. It'd done all these things before, 
or after all the deranged attempts at putting SCP-682 in the ground, had some light firebombing killed the monster? Whatever the case, they need to search. In case SCP-682 popped up somewhere else and started causing havoc, if it was still alive, which it probably was, they couldn't rest on their laurels until they'd found it again. Meanwhile, SCP-682 woke up. It felt groggy and irritated, its body resting against an unpleasant, soggy carpet. It licked the carpet. The moisture had the distinct flavor of human spinal fluid, which 682 had tasted many times before. The sickly yellow walls and incessant buzzing from the fluorescent lights up above were nauseating, and it gave 682 a nagging headache. This only made 682's default emotion, blistering rage and hatred, even worse. It began walking around exploring this strange, spatial, anomalous environment. Was this more of that frustrating foundation trickery? Another one of those puerile cross-tests? The last thing 682 remembered was running at one of the walls in the chemical plant, a wall that, in hindsight, seemed darker than all the others. But rather than shattering through the brickwork, it was here now, in this strange, tacky lobby that never seemed to end. It was like a kaleidoscope of empty 1990s office kitsch. Endless, worthless yellow walls arranged like some labyrinthian, nonsensical maze, leading nowhere and devoid of all life as SCP-682 wandered through it. And of course, SCP-682 found it disgusting. It was only on level zero, and already 682 hated the backrooms just as much as it hated our dimension. Someone or something had to pay for the crime of inconveniencing it this way, and it would happily turn this whole dimension inside out just to find some beings to kill inside it. Yes, that would be great fun. SCP-682 began its frantic search for an exit, evolving an innate sonar ability and picking up speeds that would be impossible for human beings. This is the part where most people would go mad or die from hunger or thirst. SCP-682, not so much. It could keep searching and searching and searching until the stars burned out in the sky. It would find its prey somehow, and when it did, it would put them through hell. And as it turned out, this new universe rewarded 682's dog's stubbornness, because when it passed through a seemingly random hallway after hours of searching, it was in a different place entirely. This place looked like some huge abandoned warehouse complex with water shining off the ground. If 682 had more advanced knowledge of the back rooms, it would have known this was level 1. But the only number SCP-682 cared about was body count, and in that regard it would find Level 1 to be a vast improvement. Two groups of humans had established bases in this level of the backrooms. The Major Explorer Group, a faction of professional backrooms travelers who maintained their base alpha on this level, and the Backrooms Non-Aligned Trade Group, a commercial group whose primary base is an economic hub on this very level, a fortified city-like area with a population of 412, which would, a few hours after 682's appearance, be a population of zero. But before all of that, it felt like grabbing a bite at the diner. Tom's Diner is a refuge for many people trapped in the back rooms, a casual eatery nestled into the cold warehouse environment of Level 1, where people could get a warm meal from Tom, a former cook who's been trapped in the back room for years. SCP-682 was eager to be part of this grand tradition, but the hard-to-destroy reptile decided to buck the trend a little by just devouring Tom himself. From there, it decided to launch its rage-fueled offensive against the various humanoid inhabitants of the level. Both the Major Explorer Group Base Alpha and the Backroom's Non-Aligned Trade Group Trade Keep were heavily fortified against the kind of entities these folks had gotten used to facing in the backrooms, but they were completely unprepared for a creature of SCP-682's sheer power, intelligence, endurance, and ferocity. The SCP Foundation had been studying the creature for decades, with far more resources than either of these two backrooms-bound groups, and they still had a hard time keeping the beast consistently contained. Sadly for the great bastion of human hope in the backrooms, SCP-682 swept through both outposts in a matter of hours, killing everyone there without an ounce of remorse. The only person there it took its time with was the final human being left in the decimated remains of the Major Explorer's Group Base Alpha. It grabbed the man by the throat and squeezed, asking with its guttural, growling voice, You! Were you and your dead brethren allied with the SCP Foundation? Despite his fear, the explorer told 682 that he had never heard of the SCP Foundation, 
nor did he know what kind of entity 682 was. Hmm, then what is this place? Tell me, and I might give you a quick death. The explorer gave as good a response as he could. 682 was trapped in the back rooms, a multi-leveled interdimensional nightmare filled with dangerous creatures. That made 682 curious. Dangerous creatures? That could make an interesting challenge. 682 asked the explorer how it could access these other levels and find these creatures, and the explorer explained that through exploring these levels enough, anyone could noclip into the next one. It really was that simple. With that, 682 knew all it needed to know and carelessly murdered the final human being of level 1. It had killed so many humans over its long and twisted life, it was no different from breathing air now. An utterly perfunctory action. It was eager to discover these other creatures on the lower levels and teach them a new level of fear they'd never experienced. 682 stormed the halls until it achieved the next successful noclip into level 2, which manifested as a series of old dilapidated maintenance tunnels that seemed to stretch on for millions of miles. Wonderful. There were humans here too, apparently, but who cared about them? This was the first level to feature a smorgasbord of entities ripe for the killing. It sped through the tunnels, teeth and fangs born, eager to deal death with gleeful abandon. The first entities it encountered in the expansive tunnels of Level 2 were a collection of beings known as crawlers, insect-like creatures infected with an extremely aggressive fungal growth. Just getting close to them could present an active risk to humans, not so much for a creature that could easily regenerate after being tossed into the sun. As the creatures tried to lunge, SCP-682 simply crushed and devoured them with little effort. They tasted a little stale, on account of the fungus, but the chewiness was pleasing. Hopefully there would be more challenging foes down in the tunnel than these mere insects, SCP-682 thought to itself, while journeying deeper into the endless network of tunnels. Soon enough, SCP-682 ventured into a section of the tunnel engulfed in total darkness. Its eyes quickly adjusted, developing immaculate night vision. That's when it spotted another creature sharing this little slice of darkness with it. A pair of floating, glowing eyes and almost cartoonish teeth, grinning like some maniacal Looney Tune. This is an entity known as a Smiler, and they're a terrifying threat to any humans venturing through the back rooms. SCP-682 wasn't impressed. It began a perfect adaptation for the situation. Its body began to glow, emitting incredible levels of both heat and light, carving through the darkness of the tunnel and causing the Smiler to emit a terrible, piercing shriek. The sheer heat of this new ability melted sections of the Level 2 tunnels around SCP-682. When the light finally dimmed down to slightly more reasonable levels, where the Smiler once stood was instead a fizzling black scorch mark. Another creature had painfully bitten the dust, and SCP-682 was starting to have some fun. It took off further down into the tunnels, looking forward to finding its next victim. Sadly for SCP-682, it wouldn't get to kill the next set of victims. A group of four child facelings, spooky, faceless little girls who like to cut apart their typical human victims with small objects, were waiting a little further down the pipe. However, when they felt SCP-682 approaching, they almost sensed the power and cruelty of the beast coming towards them. Even being little monsters themselves, game recognized game, and they knew that they needed to get the hell out of there before the monster arrived. They climbed between the pipes on the tunnel walls and skittered off into hiding places deep in the dark. Lucky for them, SCP-682 passed them and just kept going. What would be the point in wasting time on these little morsels when there were apparently so many other creatures to massacre down here? Next, SCP-682 came across a truly pathetic creature, something that the mighty reptile honestly felt a little embarrassed even interacting with. It was a creature known as a clump, a strange bundle of living limbs that will move at great speeds and attack its usually human targets. It tried to do the same to SCP-682, maniacally flailing its many twisted limbs. 682 killed it in a single stomp and moved on, feeling its own psychological equivalent of pity, but not that much of it. Not long after Mercy killing the clump, SCP-682 came face to face with a series of hounds, mutant humanoids who travel on all fours, behaving in a wolf-like fashion. This would, of course, be the stuff of nightmares for your average human being, but would far more likely put a being like the hard-to-destroy reptile to sleep with sheer boredom. Humans acting like dogs? That makes them even more worthless. 
the creature thought, as it charged forwards and began tearing the group of hounds to shreds. Minutes later, it was splitting off into an adjoining tunnel, searching for more easy entertainment. But the deeper SCP-682 made its way into the bowels of Level 2, the more it approached a truly horrifying realization. The creatures it was slaughtering here were even more boring than the ones the SCP Foundation ceaselessly threw at it back on its native reality, or at least the reality where they'd contained it. Back in that world, it had faced giant flaming demigods with swords hotter than the sun. It had faced some pale, shrieking monstrosity that didn't seem to die no matter what the reptile threw at it. There was the dark, gooey old man, the immortal warrior from the Black Coffin, and even the all-devouring bunny rabbit. Here it was killing the same wretched selection of beasts again and again, a truly pitiful offering. Was this really the best this world had to offer? Incidentally, the next creature it found was literally known as wretches by the human inhabitants of the backrooms. They were fleshy, zombie-like creatures that SCP-682 figured the Sarkists back home might enjoy. It couldn't believe that it was thinking fondly of that old place, while it carved the monsters to ribbons with its claws. It missed its old enemies, like Dr. Bright, Dr. Clef, and even that irritating yellow blob of snot. The more it tried to take its mind off the old world by killing its way through this ant farm of endless tunnels, the more it found itself waxing nostalgic. For example, there were the plague goblins, impish little creatures with masks like that of a plague doctor. 682 found itself thinking almost fondly about SCP-049, while it listlessly ate the tiny, mischievous creatures, like a depressed person binging an extra-large pack of chips. Even their tiny squeaks as they crunched between the reptile's terrible teeth gave it no joy. What a bleak turn of events this had all turned out to be. As it wandered through the infinite tunnels, killing creatures and even humans as it found them, SCP-682 made a quiet promise to itself. Somehow, some way, it would make its way back to the universe it so recently departed. It would leave the back rooms, no matter how many levels, a quiet, burning husk, and return to the world of fools and fiends it had taken for granted all this time. A visit to the back rooms had taught the hard to destroy reptile an all too human lesson. Sometimes you don't know what you have until it's gone. Sure, the SCP Foundation may have tried to kill it in a new, bizarre, and increasingly sadistic way every single day, but that variety was the spice of life. It would return home someday, it knew that much, but of course, a lot of creatures and people would need to die before then. But if that's what it took, well, so be it. SCP-682 licked its dagger-like fangs and kept crawling. Another day, another failed attempt at death. If SCP-682 had anything even resembling a sense of humor, he might ask for it to be printed on a motivational poster and stuck to the side of his containment chamber, where he eternally melts and regrows at the mercy of high concentration acid. They just cross-tested him with Abel, again. Unlike some of the others he'd been forced to face, that tattooed swordsman seemingly wasn't intelligent enough to fear. He'd always come back just as stupid and violent. This encounter had left the hard-to-destroy reptile at 30% of his previous body mass, bloody and bashed. He'd survived the encounter. He always survived. They brought what was left of him back to his cell in a forklift. A blasted forklift. How could it even be more humiliating? As his eyes started to grow back in his head, he could swear he even saw one of the technicians laughing at him. His name tag read, Agent Nigel Kelly, noted. 682 would specifically hunt down and kill him the next time he breached. Of course, every single day, he plotted revenge against the human race, along with everything else. But the sum they owed in pain, blood, and despair could never be repaid in full. After all, every single one of them, except <laughs> Dr. Bright, could only really die once. They'd brought 682 to the precipice a thousand times, only for his own body to cheat him and deprive him of the sweet release of death. And if the Foundation had their way, it would be done a thousand times more, and they wouldn't even stop there. 682 couldn't even imagine the number of containment breaches it would take to deal a blow even comparable to the one he had faced. All he could do was dream. Dream of a reckoning that would turn the tables, 
something that would plunge humanity into the state of constant pain and terror that had been all he'd ever known since these fumbling sadists in white coats had locked him up here. What a beautiful day that would be. Little did SCP-682 know, that very day was about to break. Miles and miles away from the facility where SCP-682 was kept, after all, orders from the O5 Council have hard mandates on the minimum distances between people and a site holding a monster as volatile as 682. Parents watched their children laughing and frolicking in an idyllic playground. Some squealed with glee as they descended the slide. Some of the more ambitious little tykes tried to go over the bar on the swings. Others waited in line for some delicious soft serve at a parked ice cream truck. One mother brought an ice cream cone and walked over to a nearby bench, where she began to enjoy her delicious frozen treat. It was a remarkably hot day out, and a little ice cream was the perfect addition to her relaxation while her kids were occupied. You could see the distant air wobbling in the heat. Already her ice cream was starting to melt, white rivulets dribbling down the sides of the cone and onto her hands. Suddenly, almost imperceptibly, the quality of the light shifted, the kind of thing you'd dismiss as a trick of the eyes and forget just as quickly, were it not for the catastrophic effects that were about to unfold. As the woman leaned forward to lick her melting ice cream, something dripped onto her skirt, but as she looked down, she slowly realized that what dripped onto her wasn't the pure white of her ice cream, it was the same exact tone as her skin. She felt a terrible burning sensation all through her body, the most horrible, debilitating pain she'd ever experienced. Like every cell in her body was screaming and trying to make a break for it. She turned to the other parents sitting near the playground. They were screaming too. Each collapsed to the ground with agonizing slowness, different parts of their body falling at different speeds as they transitioned through states of matter. When they hit the ground, they were taking on a liquid state, screaming, worthless, boneless blobs. The woman even saw her own arm wilting like a time-lapse video of a dying flower. She dripped and sluiced through the cracks in the bench until nothing recognizably human was left, only a soggy ice cream cone sitting uneaten. In an instant, billions of screams rang out over planet Earth. Day had broken. Things would never ever be the same again, as almost half of humanity instantaneously took on a liquid state. Needless to say, with the most dangerous and far-reaching anomalous incident in human history suddenly breaking out without any kind of warning, the SCP Foundation was incredibly busy. This would take some unprecedented action. The members of the O5 Council, who weren't melted during the initial blast, convened over secure video link while sequestering themselves underground in what amounted to multiple human lifetimes of some of the most high-pressure choices imaginable. They made the most difficult decision since the very beginning of the SCP Foundation. In the service of all mankind, they would now break the masquerade. The SCP Foundation would, at long last, step out of the shadows to save the rest of humanity from the tyranny of the light. Broadcasts went out all over the globe. Every TV screen, every live stream, every radio broadcast was commandeered. They gave instructions based on the scattered intel they had. For some reason, the sun had turned against them. Exposure would lead any biological creatures melting away into sentient piles of flesh-colored sludge. People would remain indoors and away from any light sources. All windows must remain covered, travel only at night, and even then, heavily covered with protective gear. There can only be one objective for whoever is left. Make your way to the nearest SCP Foundation containment facility and seek refuge inside. If anyone could figure out the answer to this terrifying existential riddle, it would be the SCP Foundation. Anyone who is exposed should be considered lost. While, as always, the SCP Foundation did all they could to project a sense of control over the situation, on the inside, it was pandemonium. Somehow, despite everything, this event had taken all of them by surprise. How could anyone have predicted that the cradle of our solar system's delicate living balance would suddenly become a meat grinder? 
A huge number of Foundation operatives were wiped out in the initial exposure. Global communication infrastructure had been devastated. It was pure chaos. And to SCP-682, as another evil tactician once put it, chaos was a ladder. From the inside of his acid tank, 6AV2 could sense the fear and pain suddenly exuding from his surrounding environment. It was greater than ever before. What was happening out there? This was no average containment breach. Something was really, really happening out there. 682 began to adapt and finally attune its hearing, until it could pick up the chatter from outside. Uh, maybe we can convert some of the D-Class barracks into serviceable bunkers for the refugees. It's not like we're prepared for this kind of capacity. Oh god, oh god, we've lost Site-7, Site-10, Site-23, Site-40, Site-52. Site uh, death toll looks to be in the billions. Well, we don't know if they're dead technically, but they're sure as hell not human anymore. Oh, this is the big one. This is it. XK-Class. Even 2,000 is unaccounted for. Is L5 crazy that they think we're fighting the freaking sun? Needless to say, 682's curiosity was piqued. Anything that could light a fire under the foundation like this was something he could enjoy. And with his impressively strategic intellect, he intuited that a time of great strife for the foundation would be the perfect time to breach containment. Because whenever there's violence, fear, and chaos on a mass scale, SCP-682 will be there, causing it. 682 began adapting his pores and endocrine system to begin releasing a powerful alkaline substance. Little by little, the alkaline neutralized the acids surrounding him, turning it into little more than plain water. He then converted his internal systems to have extreme endothermic rather than exothermic properties, causing his surrounding temperature to drop rapidly until all the water in the tank completely froze around him. The ice expanded beyond the limit of the containment unit, busting the rivets of the metal frame and shattering the reinforced glass. With this goal achieved, 682 raised his internal temperatures to incredible highs, melting the ice around him. Once again, he was free and ready for some good old-fashioned carnage and mayhem. Perhaps he could get a better handle on this strange new situation too. It was all rather exciting. Just a girl with goals, huh? SCP Foundation personnel were already running around like ants trying desperately to avoid the caustic laser beam of the magnifying glass. You can only imagine how much worse it made matters when 682 suddenly burst through the wall Kool-Aid Man style and began to ruthlessly massacre everyone around him. Just one of those days, you know. The typical order during a 682 containment breach is to dispatch all available units to get him back under control. The issue with this particular containment breach was that, given the human population was very rapidly being melted, and they were the only ones who could potentially save the rest, they didn't really have any available units to pursue and recontain 682. For once, he really wasn't a priority, and that meant terrible things for whoever he ran into. 682 slaughtered his way through any researchers or guards who dared to get in his way. Disgusting creatures, really. Better off dead. He clawed and bit and tore and crushed with almost childlike glee, leaving great piles of bodies in his wake. All the while, he was pondering the things he heard those Foundation drones saying. Something about the sun and an XK-class scenario. Hmm, interesting. 682 also observed that any apertures that could potentially allow light into the facility had also been shuttered. Perhaps they weren't overreacting this time like they always did with him. Maybe they were dealing with some kind of phenomenon that would now cast this wretched world and those who lived in it into the void. Wouldn't that be a fitting karmic fate for them all? Still, 682's bloodlust didn't outweigh his logic. He needed to know more about the situation before proceeding, and in this, maybe he could kill two Foundation birds with one stone. Elsewhere in the building, alarms blared. The air was suffused with panicked voices and frequent screams. Nobody knew what was going on. Not really. They'd only gotten details here and there, and the details they'd received were terrifying. All their families and loved ones outside, probably gone. So many of the people and so much of the world they'd been fighting for, risking it all for, had disappeared in an instant carried to hell on a ray of sunshine. Why were they still here? Was this horror not truly uncontainable? These questions were swimming through the mind of Agent Nigel Kelly, 
as he stood alone in his office, almost catatonic. He'd had his friends and family on the outside, all likely reduced to those horrible fleshy blobs. He was alone in the world, risking his life for nothing. How could this get any worse? His mind kept repeating that question again and again and again. And the universe gave him an answer, in the form of a deep, reptilian voice saying, Found you! into his ear from behind. He turned with a shriek to see the terrible eyes of 682 staring into his own. Before he could try to flee or reach for a weapon that he knew would only mildly annoy the already furious beast, 682 reached out with a massive clawed hand and grabbed him by the torso, lifting him up into the air. The creature was gripping so tight that he could feel his ribs starting to crack. You laughed at me, Agent Kelly. The monster hissed. Am I funny too? Do I see you at the time to tell jokes? Do you feel like laughing now? Agent Kelly begged and pleaded for his life, fighting for his next breath from the crushing squeeze of the creature's terrible hand. 682 roared at him to be silent and ordered him to tell him everything he knew about the situation going on outside. If the information was useful, 682 might show his thought-to-be non-existent magnanimous side and let Agent Kelly live. Of course, Agent Kelly didn't fancy his chances, but what other choice did he have? He told 682 that the higher-ups were calling this SCP-001 when day breaks. The sun had gone rogue somehow and being in contact with any kind of sunlight would now cause people to instantaneously melt into horrifying, living sludge. And it wasn't just people. The condition also affected anomalies, and interestingly, it appeared to negate all previous anomalous effects, so 682's adaptational ability may not even save it if it was exposed. He told 682 everything he knew. Are you, are you gonna let me live? Agent Kelly asked, struggling to breathe. 682's terrible maw twisted into what might have been a smile. Oh, Agent Kelly, he said with unsettling joy. That was a joke. Didn't you find that one funny? A terrible scream emanated from the agent's office. If one good thing could be said for what happened to Agent Kelly that day, at least he didn't live long enough to see the ravages of the terrible sun firsthand. 682 began to formulate a plan. He took Agent Kelly's wristwatch and integrated it into his body, so he'd have a permanent internal clock. It was the middle of summer, so the sun would have reliably set at 9 p.m. and would likely begin its rise around 5 a.m. It would be relatively easy to avoid the sun, all things considered. For lack of a more eloquent way to put it, when it comes to adapting to new threats, SCP-682 is simply built different. After slaughtering a few other members of SCP Foundation staff for the road, hey, it's not like anyone was fit to stop him, 682 began enacting the new phase of his plan. His body grew a thick, smooth carapace, and his front set of limbs began to grow, his muscles bulging and his claws growing, the tips turning into sharp, flat scoops. With sudden and tremendous force, 682 began boring his way into the ground, tunneling, clawing through concrete and dirt with absolute ease. Normally, the SCP Foundation would have deployed high-tech seismic sensors and the kind of tunnel boring machines that Elon Musk could only dream of to intercept and recapture him. But during the endless horrors of the breaking day, he had carte blanche to escape and live it up in the ruins of this rapidly dying world. Eventually, 682 had bored his way into a roomy sewer pipe, the perfect place to wait out a few hours. Up above, so many millions screamed, either in fear or in agony. There had been some new developments that the SCP Foundation had been yet to account for. While they knew that those melted by the rogue sun were technically alive and trapped in a permanent state of suffering, what the Foundation didn't know was that these former humans were incredibly dangerous in their own right. The sun hadn't just irreparably warped their bodies, it had also irreparably warped their minds. It has enslaved them, made them zealots, acolytes. They developed the instinct to coagulate into giant fleshy masses, driven by the single-minded purpose of finding victims and dragging them into the light, where they too could be converted into these terrible fleshy creatures and add 
to the masses. They were the rogue sun's boots on the ground, metaphorically speaking. And now they were the Foundation's greatest challenge in getting a handle on this situation again. Before, it was just encouraging people to avoid the sun. Now, the sun was actively trying to increase its exposure. But 682, who was having a relaxing evening not being melted for once down in the sewers, couldn't care less. He was having the most calming few hours he'd had in years. He waited, checking the time, making sure that it would be dark before he began tunneling back up to the surface world. He surfaced in the middle of his city, miles away from the Foundation facility he'd spent so many decades being tortured in. He tasted the cool night air and observed the desolation that had been wrought all around him. Buildings were on fire. Cars were crashed and overturned. The ground was cracked. Garbled SCP Foundation public service announcements played to nobody in the broken display windows of electronic stores. Giant wads of human flesh roamed, slithering around, searching for new victims. One noticed 682 and began to approach him, gibbering madly in a chorus of strange voices. The hard-to-destroy reptile wasted no time in attacking. It tore apart most of the hideous blob and began hungrily devouring the chunks. The form may have been different, but it still tasted like human flesh, and SCP-682 savored every bite. It would be so simple. These blobs of idiotic flesh were so easy to kill, and there would be so many terrified humans in this devastated world, hiding away in dark places, holding out the hope that maybe they could reach the safety of a Foundation facility. 682 chuckled at the very thought, Foolish hope would drown in an endless well of black, caustic despair. He would find them. He would rest underground in the day and then hunt them in the dark. They would all die screaming, bloodying his claws and fangs. Nothing and nobody would stop him. He looked out over this strange new world and laughed a little louder. <laughs> It was just delightful. Abel wandered through the sands, a lone warrior, dragging a long, dark sword behind him, his black cloak flowing in the gentle breeze. The sword was thirsty. It had been too long since it tasted blood. What had it been? A day since he cut down ten men in a tavern without breaking a sweat? They'd bled and screamed like pigs as he diced them into bloody chunks. He couldn't remember their faces. They hadn't earned that. Very few combatants had been remarkable enough to warrant committing to memory. It was all just more dead flesh. He took a sip from his canteen and sighed. Did this world hold no more challenges? What a boring eternity was laying out before him. His burden as the greatest warrior of all time weighed on him heavier than the chain. It was old and rusty, levered over his shoulder and grasped in one bloody hand. About 15 feet behind him, the chain was connected to a dark stone sarcophagus that was as much a part of him as his eyes, skin, or heart. If ever he was slain in the glorious heat of battle, he'd rise out of it, ready to fight and kill another day. All because of the actions of his worthless, good-for-nothing brother. He looked up when he heard the rush of footsteps and the clanking of armor. Warriors, or whatever passed for them around here, about twenty of them, circled all around him. Yes. Oh, yes. His grip tightened around his sword. One of the warriors called out something about him being under arrest by order of the king for murders beyond counting. Abel couldn't help but yawn. Words, words, words. Why even bother? He dropped the chain, and in one fluid motion, he threw his sword. In a fraction of a second, it pierced the armor of the chattering man, spearing him through his formerly beating heart. The scream died in his throat. He fell to his knees, then collapsed entirely. The other soldiers sent to kill or apprehend him turned to their fallen leader and gasped. It was that little gasp, that moment of distraction, that sealed their fates. Abel's face cracked into a whisper of a grin as he drew two long daggers from the darkness of his coat. He'd at least try to have fun with this. Before the others could even get over their leader's sudden death, Abel had vaulted forward and begun his delicate dance of slaughter. 
Every swing found its way through armor and into skin. He sliced throats, cleaved off heads, parried blows, and pierced hearts. There was barely a single scream. Abel killed too quick for screams. In what would seem like the blink of an eye for some, the soldiers around Abel fell. Most dead, the rest dying. Some looked up to him in their dying moments, in terrified awe of the efficacy of their killer. In their dying moments, they knew that they never had a chance. They might as well have been facing the glistening scythe of death himself on the battlefield. Abel, on the other hand, rolled his eyes and sighed. Another pathetic waste of time. He sensed movement in the corner of his eye. One of the wounded soldiers was limping to his feet, trying to use the sword to lever himself off of the ground. With a flick of each wrist, Abel tossed his knives into the man, killing him instantly. It really was that easy. Your attempt to kill me does not offend me, he said to whoever was still able to hear. What offends me is that they would send so few, and that those few would be such pitiful excuses for soldiers. This wasn't a battle, it was a mercy killing. He was ready to turn around, grab the chain, and carry on walking when he felt a sudden pain in his back. There was a slight whistle, then another sharp spike of pain. There were now two arrows sticking out of his back. Abel turned surprised and saw a much larger force standing behind him. Swordsmen, archers, men with clubs and axes and chains. The ones he'd killed were little more than a distraction. This was the real threat. This was a real army. Perhaps these fools would give him some actual exercise. He reached into his cloak and pulled out a mighty obsidian battle axe. At the very least, he'd try to have a little fun turning this fighting force into cold cuts. A fog of arrows sailed through the air as he charged forwards, perforating his body, but the injuries didn't slow him down. He lunged, slashed, and cleaved. Even as the weapon struck him, he carried on killing person after person. At times, it was almost exciting, almost, but not quite. By the time he was done, none were left standing. Thirty arrows were sticking out of him. He had been cut deep by more weapons than he could count on his fingers and toes. He was breathing deeply, scarred chest pumping up and down. He coughed blood and cracked his neck back into place. They might have cut him a little too deep this time. No matter. Abel fell to his knees, feeling the life draining from him. He wondered when he awoke from the coffin again what the world would look like. Sometimes it was days sometimes weeks, months, or even years. As he fell forward dying once again, he'd hoped that he'd wake into a world with a warrior or beast that could actually challenge him. Maybe someday. This was one of Abel's many lives, hundreds of years before he was contained by the SCP Foundation. He's perhaps the greatest warrior who ever lived, died, and lived again. He's a man so individually deadly that not only is he kept in a containment chamber under the sea, surrounded by highly trained and armored guards, he has his own localized on-site nuclear weapon, ready to blow away and annihilate him and his entire containment area if deemed necessary. He may not be a contagious anomalous pathogen or a lethal mimetic hazard, or a giant beast shooting world-destroying fireballs in every direction, but if this one-man massacre was left to his own devices, there's no doubt that he would methodically slaughter his way through the human race until an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario was practically inevitable. He was fueled by pure hatred and an almost bottomless bloodlust. He simply lived to fight and kill. And not only did he have the will and the skill to be a pure force of annihilation, but his anomalous abilities also make him perfectly tailored to the task. He has massively enhanced physical strength, speed, and durability, taking the kind of damage that would kill several normal humans to reliably put him down. Though even that is only a temporary measure. Abel will always resurrect back into his black sarcophagus to menace the SCP Foundation another day. It is also effectively impossible to disarm Abel because he has the anomalous ability to pull deadly edged weapons from localized pocket dimensions at will. And his proficiency with these weapons is unlike any warrior the world has ever known, before or since. During containment breaches, he's regularly killed scores of trained Foundation guards, with both numerical advantages and considerably more advanced ranged weapons. Despite being a simple humanoid, 
he was taking up a truly insane amount of containment resources. Despite his violent tendencies, Abel is still a recognizable sentient human, albeit an extremely deadly anomalous one. This led some higher-ups at the Foundation to come up with an interesting idea. What if Abel's eternal rage could be harnessed? What if they could use their resources to reshape this rampaging killer into a devoted sword of the Foundation's cause? After all, if he wanted worthy opponents, what could be more worthy than the anomalous monsters that the Foundation faced on a daily basis? And as long as they kept the sarcophagus, even if Abel was killed in the line of duty, he'd still be accounted for. In many ways, if he could be trained and truly brought to heal, there could be no better asset to their coming struggles. It was this logic, allowing anomalies to work for the SCP Foundation in exchange for benefits, that led to the creation of a new groundbreaking mobile task force, MTF Omega-7, Pandora's Box. This group became the SCP Foundation's Hail Mary Pass. For any particularly dangerous or potentially deadly missions, they could send in Abel along with a group of highly trained Foundation soldiers that even the ancient blade-wielding warrior held respect for. While like their namesake, Pandora's Box, it would all wind up in terrible tragedy. To begin with, they achieved some of the highest mission successful results of any mobile task force on the Foundation's payroll. No task was too challenging for them to swoop in and crush it. This was far from expected. Abel, one of the most violent SCPs they'd ever contained, suddenly became a great asset to their operations, a vital tool in their quest to keep the anomalous at bay. He cleaved through legions of Chaos Insurgency soldiers during breaches into their secure sites. He fought off well-paid, well-trained, and well-armed bodyguards of Marshall Carter and Dark Limited during Foundation raids on their clandestine operations. He'd even gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the deadliest anomalies in containment during mass escapes. It was hard to imagine how they'd ever lived without him. Of course, while Abel was happier than he'd had been in years, in his element. In fact, as a working warrior giving varied missions and frequent opponents, there was still something nagging at him. His thoughts were hounded by his white whale. The endless search for a truly worthy opponent. Someone or something that could really give him a run for his money. After millennia of leaving opponents dead in this wake, nothing would bring him more joy than meeting someone that actually knocked him on his ass. A new bar somewhere above him to work towards. Oh, what a glorious day that would be. Eventually, the Foundation started to run into a problem. They were running out of missions to give Abel. After all, he wasn't the kind of operative you could just give any mission to. His potential for collateral damage was truly staggering. He'd neutralize the anomaly, then slaughter everyone within a hundred foot range just to work off some of the excess energy. Like a hand grenade, he was powerful, but dangerously imprecise. If they ran out of high priority missions, what were they supposed to do? Just put Abel back in his box to gather dust until someone else rolled around? He was getting antsy enough between missions already. That's when an unexpected member of personnel stepped forward, Dr. Jack Bright. You see, Dr. Bright and Abel had a history, and not an altogether pleasant one. Not that anyone could really have a pleasant history with Abel. Jack was only a junior researcher when he had his run-in, carrying a seemingly worthless medallion dubbed SCP-963 back to its containment locker. That's when a wall next to him exploded, showering him with brick fragments and dust only to reveal Abel standing behind the new aperture. Before young Dr. Bright even had a chance to scream, Abel had already cleaved through him, leaving him in two distinct parts that were both very much dead. At least, it seemed that way, until it was revealed that Dr. Bright's consciousness had actually been eternally bonded with SCP-963, giving him the gift and curse of immortality. Since then, Dr. Bright had become increasingly reckless in his conduct, perhaps hoping that the next time he fades to black, the movie that is his sad, strange life won't just start to roll again. Of course, he hasn't been lucky in that regard yet. Naturally, this has given Dr. Bright complex feelings about his fellow Anomalous Foundation employee. So when the call came around, all the senior researchers and site directors asking if there were any tasks that Abel seemed fit for, 
he had one very pressing suggestion. After all, it wasn't that long after Dr. Bright had been forced into a cross-test with the intention of terminating 682, which had not only been a failure, but a generally painful and exhausting experience. Now, perhaps it would be Abel's turn to take his lumps. He happily put forth a suggestion, claiming that surely the Foundation's new sword-wielding golden boy could give the hard-to-destroy reptile the old college try. After all, even if Abel was killed in the process, he'd just come right back. It was a situation where they really could not lose. So why not take a chance? What's the worst that could happen? The O5 Council found Dr. Bright's pitch extremely compelling. He succeeded in every mission they'd given him so far, so perhaps he could carry that success into the Herculean task of actually terminating 682. One boundlessly bloodthirsty killer might be the only thing truly capable of taking out another of equal magnitude. When Abel was informed of this latest mission, he got a scary glint in his eye. They gave him warning after warning. The beast is said to be unkillable. It can adapt to anything. It's killed scores of people and survived the attacks of anomalies thought to be flawless killers. The more it was explained to him, the more Abel felt the tingling sensation deep within. Was this it? Had he now discovered the perfect opponent? Something that would actually challenge him, would actually put him through his paces? Yes, yes, yes. He accepted the mission without question. Abel would fight SCP-682 until his breath was no longer. In order to prepare for the match, SCP-682 was released into a secure area, rocky desert-like terrain, boarded on all sides by a foundation perimeter, hundreds of meters away on all sides. They thought it best for the showdown to happen here. After all, with combatants like Abel and 682, it was bound to make a mess, one way or another. Abel strode with pronounced swagger onto the battleground shortly afterwards, carrying perhaps the most powerful sword he'd ever summoned. It was somewhere between a claymore and a chainsaw, an unholy union that gave the resulting weapon a degree of deranged badassery not ever seen on the battlefields of planet Earth before. Carrying this thing, Abel felt like a king, and he was about to slay the most ancient and bestial of monsters. As he approached 682 and took in the whole of it, he could feel his heart pounding with excitement in his chest. It was a huge reptilian nightmare. He could see its scales hardening into a mighty carapace as he approached. Its huge, serrated fangs, its bulging, sinewy muscles, and insane dagger-like claws. Oh yes, this would be the one. The beast snarled at him as he approached. He just smiled, puffed out his chest, and said, I have heard tales of creatures like you. Glorious beasts of scale and flesh, talon and fang. A prowess in battle even greater than the immense intellect hiding behind those bestial eyes. They said your kind once ruled the earth from enormous stockpiles of treasure killing and eating all who displeased you. But you were knocked from your throne one by one by the great warriors who walk this world no longer until they were no more and you became but a mere myth. Even I had thought you to be nothing but fairy tales. But yet, here you stand before me, a living dragon. In response to Abel's lofty speech, the monster merely grumbled and chided him, claiming he was little more than a pathetic SCP Foundation lapdog, following orders and being manipulated. It showed no respect for Abel as a valued enemy combatant, merely another nuisance thrown at it in a futile attempt to finish its wretched and seemingly eternal life. Abel couldn't take such insolence. He leapt forwards, bringing down his mighty chainsaw claymore, ready to cleave the beast in two. However, what he didn't expect was the move SCP-682 pulled next, throwing its head up against the blade of Abel's sword, shredding away huge chunks of flesh and bone, and utterly confusing Abel in the process. For the first time in a lifetime of intense battles, Abel found himself thinking, what the hell am I up against here? The force of 682's headbutt threw Abel off balance, leaving his stomach briefly exposed. But briefly was all SCP-682 needed. It thundered its massive stony fist into Abel's gut, throwing him like a rag doll into a nearby rock with such a force that it nearly shattered the rock behind him. 
It was a force like he hadn't felt in years. He spat some bloody teeth and grinned. This was just what the doctor ordered. He issued a challenge to the beast in a long dead language as it seized violently, regenerating, rowing, taking on the stony qualities of the ground around it. It looked like a vengeful living mountain, a true behemoth of a beast. In other words, challenge accepted. Abel pulled an obscenely giant mace from the shadows of his cloak, the handle six feet long with a chaos of swirling blades and spikes. A perfect weapon for slaying a dragon like this, he thought to himself. The two charged at each other, full of power and fury. Abel swung the mace once again, shattering the creature's head and flinging it back across the battlefield with the sheer force of its strike. The decimated lizard clawed its way into the ground, devouring the rocks and the earth, integrating more matter to fuel its regeneration. But it wasn't long before Abel was upon it again, striking mercilessly, giving blows as the monster gave brutal claw strikes in return. They were ripping each other's bodies apart, piece by piece, but Abel felt so exhilarated he could barely even notice. It was the fight of his life, a battle against a truly worthy opponent. This was heaven. Abel leaped into the air and unleashed a volley of deadly chakram down onto the beast, shredding into its reinforced flesh. As the force of gravity brought him down, he pulled a mighty axe from his cloak and bellowed a warrior's roar as he brought it down, splattering into the nightmarish body of SCP-682. However, this did nothing to even slow the beast down. It flipped over, slashing Abel with its claws. When Abel stumbled, it leaped on top of him, unleashing devastating slashes and punches onto the fallen warrior with the speed of a machine gun firing. When it raised its claw to deal with the killing blow, though, Abel once again turned the tables. He produced a giant pair of mechanical scissors from thin air and sliced off both of SCP-682's forelegs. The beast descended with its mighty jaws to devour Abel, but he kicked up with freakish strength behind his bladed boot. The sheer force of the kick flipped SCP-682 onto its back. Now it was Abel's turn to execute his opponent, though on some level he thought it would be an awful shame to lose such a terrific beast from this world of cardboard. Still, a battle is a battle, and this is how they go. He jumped onto 682 and went berserk, slashing into it relentlessly with blade after blade, pulling out a new one every time the old one broke down from his sheer ferocity. He screamed in incoherent battle fury, tearing, slicing, ripping, rending. Yes, 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 yes! As Abel stepped away to breathe, the beast began to regenerate, releasing a shockwave that started to warp reality around it. But Abel wouldn't have this. No, he would give this beast no quarter. It was time to present the true pain he was notorious for. He pulled a long sword from his cloak and charged, taking air and bringing it down towards SCP-682's head. The beast, sensing the warrior's presence, opened its mouth, unleashing a chasm of horrifying teeth within. The two were on a fierce collision course. As the jaws closed, Abel descended. Both roared in infinite rage and bloodlust. Both combatants fell to the ground, just twitching. Oh, what a glorious, terrible day it had been. Neither had died for good, but both would remember this incredible battle forever. When Abel awoke once more in his dark stone coffin, he did so with a smile. What a battle. What a fight. What a truly honorable pursuit. After so long being bored and unfulfilled, he found an opponent that got his blood pumping once more. His stomach grumbled. A post-battle feast was in order. Now where did they put that magic pizza box? Please, good sir, I beseech you. As a man of science, nay, as a man of reason, you mustn't stifle my research at this critical juncture. You have no idea how close I am to finding a cure for this blasted pestilence. I need only a handful of live subjects to complete my research. The Plague Doctor's emphatic pleas fell on deaf ears, as a stone-faced researcher took notes on his latest pontifications. The Doctor, whom these clods had reduced so rudely to a mere number, SCP-049, banged his gloved fist up against the wall. And to think he once thought of these men as intellectual equals. 
fellow travelers on the road to scientific enlightenment. What a positively sick joke. Before the doctor got another chance to appeal for his right to experiment, the researcher left him alone once more. A truly sad state of affairs. Nobody appreciated a true scientist in this day and age. It was sure to be another day of languishing alone in this cell, wishing he had the capacity to do more. So he was surprised as anyone when the alarm started going off, and the door of his cell swung open automatically. The plague doctor stepped out of his cell and into the hall, where many other humanoid anomalies were roaming, confused as to why they'd been suddenly released, what was happening. As it turned out, what was happening was one of the most brutal chaos insurgency raids the staff of Site-19 had ever seen. It had been planned immaculately. You see, guards rotate semi-regularly at Site-19 due to the high-pressure nature of the job. Lots of deaths and mental breakdowns, as you probably correctly predicted. Even the administrative staff of the SCP Foundation are only human. Well, mostly anyway. So they're not immune to little oversights here and there. And it's in those oversights that expertly trained Chaos Insurgency infiltration agents make their living. No less than 15 of them had been working undercover in Site-19 for just over two weeks, and they did a fine job of lowering the metaphorical drawbridge for a heavily armed invasion force. The guards who weren't plants were quickly murdered by the infiltrators, and even some of the on-site task forces were quickly overwhelmed and gunned down by the high-precision rifles of the Chaos Insurgency's finest. While the frontliners were distracted by the sudden assault, the infiltrators found their way to the site's security control room and massacred everyone inside. Opening every single door in the site was as simple as putting in a few stolen key codes and flipping a few carefully remembered switches. Consequently, while Foundation agents and Chaos Insurgency mercenaries clashed sabers, high-priority anomalies like SCP-049 simply wandered the facility, watching the calamity unfold within. The Foundation was beset on all sides, shot at by heavily armed maniacs, and attacked from within by the numerous roaming anomalous entities that were eager to get their hands on Foundation personnel. Definitely not an ideal situation, to say the least. The Plague Doctor only had one thing on his mind, though. Hmm, this definitely won't do my research any good. Unless I can escape and find my way to a suitable laboratory. Oh, now there's an idea. But his scientific fantasies were soon interrupted by a Chaos Insurgency soldier swinging the butt of his M4 carbine into his avian exoskull with a supremely unpleasant crack. The doctor was dazed by it momentarily, the pain coming at him like a thunderclap, but the insurgent never got the chance to take another swing. Before the insurgent could do anything, the plague doctor lunged out with practice speed, grasping him by the throat. Immediately everything went black, and the insurgent's limp corpse collapsed to the ground. Serves him right, the doctor internally mused. Soldiers attacking medics is violating even the most basic rules of gentlemanly warfare. Then another flash of immense pain, as a different rifle butt collided with the back of his head. The doctor fell to one knee, feeling dizzy, but before he could retaliate, he felt the two sharp prongs of a cattle prod pressing up against his neck. The sudden rush of electricity surged through his neck, sending his muscles into a wave of involuntary spasms. The insurgents crowding around him chimed in with their own agonizing cattle prods, relentlessly shocking him until the flashes of white-hot pain soon became an oppressive blanket of total dark. Even on his most cantankerous days, the SCP Foundation had never treated him like this. When he eventually came to, he was still in darkness, standing upright, with high-tech shackles holding every limb in place. It was beyond uncomfortable for the poor plague doctor, but it succeeded in the task of keeping him under control. He couldn't move an inch. There were muffled voices beyond the dark, beyond the confines of this new containment, the modulated gas mask voices of insurgents and something else. Faintly accented, oddly familiar, but he couldn't quite place it. Soon the voices were replaced by another sound, the grinding of crowbars levering nails out of cheap wood. With a creaking tumble, a rectangle of bright light opened up in front of him, populated by a number of silhouettes. On either side were Chaos insurgents in familiar tactical garb, and in between them stood a tall, well-groomed man with an expensive-looking purple smoking jacket and a pencil mustache. For a few fractions of a second, his face was a portrait of excitement, 
but as he took in the sight of the plague doctor standing before him, all the joy drained from his snooty countenance. What the hell am I looking at here? The man in the smoking jacket said. The doctor, indignant at such a response from the man who'd presumably ordered his assault, rasped, A man of science, good sir. The man in the smoking jacket ignored him and continued to berate the chaos insurgents, with an odd level of confidence for someone reprimanding trained, cold-blooded killers. I wanted SCP-650, the startling statue, not this clownish Ren Faire cosplayer! What the hell did I pay you ruffians for? I was told you chaos insurgents were the very best at this, and for your hefty price, I expect excellence! The rant continued much like this, leaving everyone in attendance, the insurgents, the plague doctor, feeling thoroughly exhausted by him and unable to do anything about it. You see, this wasn't just any chaos insurgency client, your average tin pot dictator or arms dealer, you know the type. This was the one and only Pascal Leggett, one of the most famous, or rather infamous, Anart collectors in the game. He'd been a founding person of interest for years due to his dealings with the Chaos Insurgency and Marshall Carter and Dark Limited, all to the end of expanding his Anart collection, but his vast wealth and connections had always shielded him from Foundation probes. For those unfamiliar with the subculture, Anart, short for anomalous art, is exactly what it sounds like artistic projects with anomalous properties to give it that extra kick. One of the most popular groups of interest dealing in Anart is the iconic Are We Cool Yet, which incidentally had recently excommunicated Pascal Leggett for being an exceedingly wealthy, uptight square who really didn't represent the collective's rebellious ethos. And considering his response was to pay the Chaos Insurgency to raid Site-19 for a few pieces for his own private collection, costing him millions of dollars and both groups' many lives, it was safe to say he wasn't taking it well. Look, we got you that other statue and that thing killed four of our best guys, so how about we just call it even? Said one of the insurgents. I'm sure you can have fun with Birdbrain here too. Pascal tutted and reluctantly dismissed the hired guns. Having the Plague Doctor here definitely wasn't ideal especially considering he wanted to host the ultimate Anart exhibition to put Are We Cool Yet worthless Somme Nous Devernu Magnifique to shame. But he would make do with what he had. Perhaps he could say that 049 was a commentary on the ever-present nature of disease in mankind's life, and our forever archaic approach to it. Yes, yes, that would do nicely. Needless to say, the Plague Doctor was infuriated by all this. The violence against his person, the kidnapping, the disrespect, and most of all, the interruption to his precious research, especially considering how close he'd gotten to finding a cure for the pestilence. But instead, he was soon spirited by a legion of heavily armed goons from his wooden box to a glass one in one of Leggett's many opulent hallways. There were other glass cases on either side of him, and more on the other side of the hall, all too reinforced for the Plague Doctor to even smash through it on his own. Damn it. Leggett's own private Anart exhibition, probably wedged between his oversized dining room and his jewel-encrusted crapper. Occasionally, Pascal himself would jaunt down the hallway to gaze upon his new, stolen Anart pieces, and of course the Plague Doctor would try his best to reason with him. I am a patient man, Monsieur Leggett, but this is simply barbaric. By what right do you imprison me here? Is your intention to deprive the world, the entire human race, of my valuable medical breakthroughs? Could you live with that on your conscience, good sir?" There was never any meaningful response. The Plague Doctor soon learned that Pascal Leggett didn't like his art interactive. It was simply meant to languish away in a glass box, being watched, being passively looked at. Those Chaos Insurgency louts hadn't even bothered to bring his notebook or medical bag, so he was without the tools to even perform his experiments. As loathed as he was to admit it, this was even worse than being locked up by the SCP Foundation. But all this wasn't entirely unfamiliar. There was something in the glass box across from the Plague Doctor that he vaguely recognized back from Site-19. He'd never seen it up close, but he'd heard researchers speaking about it, and even seen a few pictures. And such a strange construction it was. A peculiar, haphazard sculpture made from concrete, rebar, and spray paint. Quite ugly, in this humble doctor's opinion, but there was something oddly entrancing about it. And for reasons beyond the doctor's recollection, four of Leggett's men stood around the glass box in where it was being stored, always watching. The men were frequently switched in and out, as though they were watching in shifts, always fixing their gaze on its peculiar, malformed body. 
Maybe it was all the electrical shocks and knocks to the head, but he just couldn't remember why Pascal was having the piece so carefully observed. But he knew on some primal level that the secret to this would perhaps be the key to his own escape. If only he could remember. Still, time passed. Pascal drifted in and out, sometimes with guests. The plague doctor had learned not to speak. These animals could not be reasoned with. As a scientist, he would instead carefully observe until his observations bore fruit. He noticed that Pascal's guests, all people who looked equally as wealthy and pompous as Pascal himself, all seemed to look right over him, and instead focus on the ugly statue across the hall, still forever observed by any four of Pascal's men. Some of them looked actively nervous, just being in its presence. Curious, the plague doctor made a mental note of this, just as he did when Pascal gave his guests a reassuring pat on the shoulder and told them, Please calm yourself. It's harmless while my personnel are keeping an eye on it. Little by little, the plague doctor's memories of his infamous neighbor had begun to return. He knew what he must do to escape. Now all he needed to do was wait for the perfect moment. Soon enough, Pascal's mansion was filled with a bevy of Anart snobs from hither and yarn, a private soiree to show off his new collection. They wandered the halls in three-piece tuxedos and designer ballroom dresses, sipping champagne from imported crystal. All such lovely, refined, high-society people. And if the good doctor's plan went off, as he intended, they would all be such lovely, refined, high-society corpses. The plague doctor waited until, mercifully, he and the four members of personnel watching the sculpture were the only ones left in the hallway. He'd been so good, so patient, that none of the men guarding the sculpture at present had ever heard him make a noise. He was so invisible to them that, in all likelihood, they probably didn't even notice he could make a sound. And that worked for his purposes just fine. Though in any case, if he wanted this to work, he would need to time his plan perfectly. Even a fraction of a second out of place and the whole thing would have dire consequences. Still, the doctor was still a Frenchman at heart. And as a Frenchman, he knew he would rather die nobly in the process of escape than remain captured by this worthless buffoon. He'd be sure to take as many of these men down with him in the process as he was able. The plague doctor exhaled deeply, drawing a lungful of air, then bellowed as loud as he possibly could. The sudden, unexpected noise was so shocking that it jogged the four watchers almost reflexively to turn and look at him. And in the split second that they did, the plague doctor closed his eyes. In the dark, time seemed to move slower. Perhaps due to the doctor's keen focus, cultivated over many a century, he listened carefully to the sequence of sounds. Glass shattering, four choked gasps in sequence, four brutal crunches, then nanoseconds later, more glass shattering. The plague doctor's eyes snapped open just in time. Just as predicted, the sculpture, being entirely unobserved, had smashed through its glass case murdering all four members of personnel by snapping their necks, and then smashed through his own glass case to do the same to him. The plague doctor had cut it so close, in fact, that he opened his eyes to the face of the sculpture staring into his own, its concrete limbs wrapped around his neck. Very good timing indeed. With a sigh of relief, the plague doctor slipped out of the sculpture's concrete grasp and back down the hallway, keeping his gaze fixed on the sculpture the entire time. He had heard it decimate Pascal's men, he certainly didn't fancy undergoing the same fate. The second the plague doctor backed around the corner, rendering the sculpture, or as the SCP Foundation called it, SCP-173 out of sight, he could hear terrified screaming coming from the other end of the hall. He was not a sadistic man, but the plague doctor would be lying if he told you he didn't take just a little bit of pleasure in hearing that sound. Somewhere else in the vast mansion of Pascal Leggett, the sculpture was slaughtering its way through servants and party guests while the plague doctor searched for some kind of exit. Anyone who dared get in his way was given a swift and merciless touch of death, sending their body unceremoniously to the ground. Anyone in his way was preventing him from finding a cure for the pestilence, and thus endangering countless lives. It was, of course, regrettable to have to kill anyone, but some sacrifices must be made for the greater good of mankind. Well, it's not necessarily always regrettable per se. On his way out while the murderous rampage of SCP-173 seemed to distract anyone of note, the plague doctor just so happened to encounter a fleeing Pascal Leggett, hoping to find some kind of escape himself. It seemed that now fate was on his side once more, 
To have his jailer right here in the palm of his hand would be such a perfect parting gift. Funnily enough, Pascal was far more talkative to him now. He rattled off a rapid-fire series of threats, bribes, and pleas, claiming in the end that he never meant any harm. He was the one who freed the Plague Doctor from the SCP Foundation. They were on the same side here. All this was for the art. No offense was ever intended. Pascal Leggett simply lived for art. Then die for it, good sir, the Plague Doctor said. And with a single touch, Pascal's eyes rolled up into the back of his head, and he fell to the ground, dead. It was one of the few non-scientific deaths that he felt truly no guilt for. After some time searching, the screams around the rest of the mansion eventually went silent. That did wonders for his focus. It didn't take long for the Plague Doctor to locate an exit. A fine mahogany door with elaborate adornments befitting a man as gaudy as Pascal and began strolling towards it, his chest swollen with pride and a sense of accomplishment. Then he blinked, and a few feet in front of him stood the sculpture. It was there so suddenly that the plague doctor fell backwards in shock, but he devoted everything to keeping an eye on that monstrosity. With everyone else in the mansion presumably dead at this point, it had now come back for him. It stood there staring silently, ready to exact the terrible price for freeing it as soon as the doctor dared to blink. The Plague Doctor began crawling backwards down the hall, just wanting to put some distance between himself and the sculpture. As the seconds passed, he could feel his eyes drying out until the inevitable blink. The sculpture was standing right in front of him now, gazing down, almost mocking. It had closed the distance so quickly. If the Plague Doctor blinked again, he was sure that his eyes would never open again. All it had to do was wait as the seconds passed, and the Doctor began to feel his eyes drying up again. That subtle sting quickly grew into a nagging pain that could not be denied. Sooner or later, he was going to have to… BANG! The front door flew open, and in an instant the hallway was filled with heavily armed troops, all wearing the familiar black and grey of the SCP Foundation. The Plague Doctor had never been so relieved to see the organization that had kept him locked up for so many decades. For once, they'd saved him from something even worse. Of course, the sculpture didn't say anything but the disappointment of losing that one more victim seemed to radiate off of it like a lingering bad smell. The Plague Doctor willingly gave himself up, and heavy machinery was brought in to pick up SCP-173, with the help of the iPods to make sure it didn't try any funny business in transit. Pascal had gotten away with his shady dealings for years, but the brazen attack he funded against Site-19 was now enough for the Foundation to track him down. When his corpse was found in the halls of his own home with no obvious cause of death, we can happily tell you that nobody was disappointed. By the evening, the Plague Doctor was happy to be back in his cell. His research could continue here, and in time he knew that the personnel of the SCP Foundation would listen to reason and comply with his demands. After all, science marches on, regardless of who chooses to march with it. But he would forever feel a little nervous in Site-19 after that, knowing the concrete monster he was sharing the building with. He hoped that if ever there was another containment breach involving that thing, that it didn't feel like paying him a visit for old time's sake. SCP-049, also known as the Plague Doctor, is an SCP Foundation fan favorite. This charming anomalous surgeon can terrify with a glance and kill with a touch. In terms of his origins, his methods, and his thought process around a disease he calls the Pestilence, this is one of the most mysterious SCPs out there, and thankfully, we didn't have to investigate this one alone. We made a community post asking you, the fans of SCP Explained, to give us your questions and theories about the good doctor that we all hope doesn't give house calls. And you didn't disappoint. Let's grab our masks and hand sanitizer and take a look at what you had to say about SCP-049. First, the questions. Bob Candle asked, why does he refuse to tell researchers about the pestilence? That's a good question, and also one of the biggest mysteries surrounding 049's lore. For the uninitiated, the pestilence, also known as the Great Dying, is the nickname given to an unknown disease that SCP-049 has dedicated his life to curing, whatever curing means to him. When asked by Foundation researchers, 049 refuses to give up even the most basic information about the pestilence, such as how he diagnoses it, what its effects are, or how it's transmitted. 
It seems that part of the reason that 049 refuses to tell researchers about it is that he apparently assumes that they, as fellow doctors, inherently know what he's talking about when he brings up the pestilence. He has acted with confusion and frustration during questioning, and 049 seems to believe that the pestilence is such common knowledge among medical practitioners that it would be a waste of time to explain it, if he even had the words to do so. DadGamer56 asked, why is he so cooperative if humans have the pestilence he wants to cure so bad? One of the most remarkable things about 049 is how reasonable he's been with Foundation staff in the past. He's polite, friendly, and treats his jailers as equals when he's not murdering them and turning them into zombies. But that is a good question. If he believes humans have the pestilence, why is he so cooperative with them? Thankfully, the answer here is simple. While 049 believes that the pestilence is widespread, he doesn't believe that every human is carrying it. In fact, when he was first contained by the Foundation and brought into an SCP facility, he complimented the staff on how little pestilence there was inside the building compared to the outside. While we don't know what leads 049 to think a person is healthy or diseased, we do know there is a distinction, and he's cooperative with those he sees as healthy. Star Doggo Gaming asked, How would he interact with 610, aka the flesh that hates, I wonder if he would view the infected as pestilence. Another great question. 610 is an extremely dangerous sarcic SCP that presents as a zombie-like virus that causes horrific fleshy mutations. Because of the extremely high infection rate of the flesh that hates, it's been quarantined in its present location in the isolated Siberian wilderness. While it would be too dangerous to bring anyone or anything into contact with the flesh, we're betting that 049 would find the flesh utterly repulsive. Whether even he would be able to cure this horrific infection is another question. The flesh that hates is best left alone at all costs. MCypher50 asked, SCP-049's notebook appears to be written in a language no human can decipher. Could another SCP like 343 or 662 decode the notebook? The answer to this is a solid maybe. These two SCPs, known as God and Mr. Deeds respectively, may be able to translate the contents of 049's mysterious leather-bound notebook. The problem is, given that we've seen 049 is a pretty terrible doctor when it comes to anything other than raising mutant zombies from the dead, the contents of his notebook might just be as useless as the interviews with him have proven to be. That said, it probably is worth a try, just to find out if he's actually been pretending to write this whole time. Green Angel Snake YT asked, Do other living creatures like pigs, cats, or literally any animal have this thing he calls the pestilence? What even are the living things he considers cured? To the best of our knowledge, 049 only believes humans can contract the pestilence. How do we know this? This leads us to our next question. Mia the Hot Dog asked, If he touches the immortal lizard, will the lizard die and be rid of disease, or will the lizard be immune? or will it attack the doctor? The Foundation did attempt to terminate 682 with 049, but the effort was unsuccessful. 049, when encountering the lizard, commented that only humans can contract the pestilence. When he tried to touch 682, the lizard swiped at him with its claws. 049 then requested to leave, and later interviews revealed that the plague doctor felt emotionally disturbed by his time with 682. GamerDuckYT asked, where did he originally come from? While evidence suggests that 049 is extremely old and very well-traveled, he was first discovered by the Foundation in the town of Montabon in southern France. Given that he speaks fluent medieval French as his first language, it's safe to assume that France is probably his country of origin and could have existed for hundreds of years, if not longer. Interestingly, his famous plague doctor appearance is more similar to those first worn by Italian doctors in the 17th century, which only deepens the mystery of SCP-049. Garrett Eborn asked, Why does he insist that he isn't doing harm when he's clearly in violation of his Hippocratic Oath? 049 does seem to regret the harm he causes, but he also believes that the small sacrifices are necessary in the quest to cure the pestilence. Also, a fun little history lesson. Given that 049's knowledge of medicine appears to be medieval, meaning potentially as early as the 5th century, he actually would have predated the Hippocratic Oath coming into universal use by doctors, which didn't become widespread until the 19th century, 
despite the oath itself first being created around 400 BC. Phoenix Fane asked, if he asked to wear gloves of any kind, would he still kill you? All evidence seems to point to no. Only skin-to-skin -skin contact with 049 is fatal, so a good pair of gloves could really be a lifesaver. Alice Verdugo asked, What would happen if he went one-on-one -on -one with a shy guy? Would he cure him or not do anything? Well, we can't know for sure, because SCP-096 aka the shy guy isn't human. It's likely that 049 wouldn't even consider him infected. If the two came into contact, it would probably result in a stalemate. Much like the time SCP-096 faced off against SCP-682. However, if it did come to blows between the two, 096 is undeniably a much more dangerous combatant, and may be able to narrowly defeat the Plague Doctor in a direct confrontation while in its rage state. Anything Goes asked, If he died, could he bring himself back to life or have something prepared to bring himself back to life? Like a lot of anomalies, it seems that 049 is abnormally hard to kill, given that he's seemingly impervious to most physical damage. However, seeing as 049's resurrection is both a lengthy medieval process and never brings its subjects back correctly, it's likely that if someone could successfully put 049 down, he wouldn't get back up. I'm not coming, asked. We know that doctors are wearing masks to protect patients, but is his mask part of his skull or face? All of 049's clothes, including his Plague Doctor mask, are technically part of his body. The mask is part of its bone structure, and the other clothes are like layers of skin. Which leads us nicely to the next question. Requiem asked, if the clothing around him is skin, does he shed it? We're not sure, but it's definitely a thought we all wish we could forget. Oh, God. Now, let's take a look at some of your more interesting theories. Clarence Ilium theorized, Pestilence is sin and he's trying to take it away. This is certainly an interesting theory. While we can't find much in his file that suggests 049 views the pestilence as a result of sinful behavior or the concept of sin itself, it's worth considering that his medical background seems to come from medieval times. Medical science was in its infancy back then and many still believe that diseases were the result of loose morals or even demonic interference, so there might be some truth to this theory. Thomas Hess theorized, I feel like he isn't really bad. All he wants to do is help and cure everyone, but his cure is death. If we're defining bad as a malicious desire to cause harm for its own sake, then this theory holds a lot of water. For all intents and purposes, it does seem that 049 does genuinely want to cure his patients of the pestilence, and he does seem to express remorse when they die. However, by his own admission, his cure is imperfect, and he hasn't found full success in curing the disease without causing death yet. Cat and Dog Live theorized, The Plague Doctor has seen the end of the world and travels in a loop back in time aiming to eventually stop it. The pestilence is the way each human's impact on the end of the world is, and once he touches their flesh they realize this and die of the realization of what they've done. The Plague Doctor may be looking for a human, or an SCP, that is pestilence-free, for what reason we don't know. We don't have an awful lot to say about this one because there's no real evidence either way. But given that time travel does seem to be possible in the SCP Foundation universe, it's a cool possibility that we definitely can't rule out. It does, however, leave a lot of loose ends about the gaps in 049's knowledge, such as the fact he doesn't know about the Black Death. Vladimir Lenin theorized, He's the best doctor ever. He cures depression, pestilence, and sometimes his patients even come back from the dead. Five-star rating. This is certainly an extremely charitable way to view SCP-049, one that he himself would likely very much appreciate. However, considering he changes his patients into mindless, zombified mutants, a better course of action may just be to attend therapy. Chaonix theorized, The pestilence is death. He is literally trying to cure death. Well, this could be one interpretation of why 049 resurrects his patients as zombies. Death is something that affects all living, non-anomalous humans, and 049 seems to be selective on which humans it identifies as being infected with the pestilence. As a result, it is unlikely that the pestilence refers to death itself. And death is also likely a preferable alternative to being turned into a zombie by 049's experimental treatments. The Blue Guardian theorized, 
The pestilence is an entity in our collective unconsciousness described in SCP-5000-Y. This is an extremely interesting theory, and one that could hold water too. If you check out our series on SCP-5000, you'll find that the Foundation discovered a being known as IT, hiding inside the collective unconsciousness of humankind. While the Foundation doesn't know about this in our dimension, it's possible that SCP-049 does, and simply doesn't realize that everyone is infected with it yet. But if this is the case, and SCP-049 realizes that the whole world is infected, he's likely to become a much more dangerous anomaly that refuses to cooperate with anyone. Moonleaf's 430 theorized, The Pestilence is the Foundation, and 049 is a disciple of the Scarlet King. This is another incredibly fun theory. However, there are two big problems. The first is that 049 has historically identified people with no Foundation affiliation as being infected with the Pestilence. And the second, even more important issue is that SCP-049 is a highly scientific creature, whereas the Scarlet King hates the very idea of science with a burning passion. As a result, SCP-049 and the Scarlet King are likely natural enemies. And finally, Xerthrax theorized his theme song should probably be Gangsta's Paradise. It's just a speculation, though. On this theory, we wholeheartedly agree. And there you have it. Thanks to everybody who sent in their great questions and theories about SCP-049. Keep an eye on our community post to see what anomalous entity we need your thoughts on next. Got an SCP you'd really like us to cover in a video like this in the future? Let us know down in the comments. And remember to stay safe and healthy, because if you start feeling a little under the weather, you can expect a visit from SCP-049 sometime soon. The day is January 5th, 2012. At an undisclosed off-site location, Dr. Bannon leaves home and begins his commute to work. While in the car, he plays a video on his phone of his 12-year-old's birthday party from the previous night. The sight of it makes him smile. He would need that smile, he thought as today was not like any other. Today was different. He had been anxious about the coming day for several weeks now, ever since the near-unanimous vote by the O5 Council that the containment chamber of SCP-106 was to be reopened. The opportunity was too great to be wasted, they said. The research that could be gained too tempting. Studying SCP-106's molecular makeup, its unique ability to open a pocket dimension, or even just the black sludge-like substance that appeared whenever the subject traveled through solid objects, was far too valuable to science to be outweighed by its potential for danger. He pleaded with them, begged them. But as Dr. Bannon and his team of seven researchers and accompaniment of 40 security personnel began applying their protective equipment, he couldn't help but think that he could have done more to stop this. Only God knew how hard he had tried to make them see reason. He had seen what had happened in previous containment breaches at the facility. He had seen what had done to the poor members of the SCP staff that became its victims. Fates worse than death. Limbs, a mangled mess of melted fused skin. Faces sunken and hollow with eyes and tongues burned out. He shuddered to think of what would happen if containment failed again this time. But despite his misgivings, he knew full well that regardless of his participation, this research mission would go on with or without him. And no one knew as much about containing SCP-106 than he did. Slowly, they proceeded to dismantle each of the containment facility's outer barriers. Sixteen separate circular chambers surrounded SCP-106's inner containment facility, each filled with a variety of different fluids. Fluids in each chamber varied in consistency and viscosity from ionized water to ammonia to kerosene. SCP-106 had the peculiar ability to be able to change its molecular makeup, to meld with objects and phase through solid forms like walls and doors. It could literally melt into the space between walls. This made containing SCP-106 almost impossible by conventional methods. Liquids confused the creature enough to slow him down, in theory anyways. The secondary containment chambers were a recent addition to the facility since the breach incident three years ago. Dr. Bannon had been a new addition to the research staff then. He had joined the team with bright eyes and a desire to use their research to help society. 
Little did he know, he would instead do everything in his power to keep whatever they found from ever leaving the facility. Back then, a breach in the containment of SCP-106 led to countless deaths of SCP personnel. When a researcher working on the top floor of the outer layer of the containment facility, unknowing of the danger they were in, brought his child to work one day. It was thought that the outer layers of the facility were enough to be considered a safe zone from the inner vault that was SCP-106's containment. But it wasn't enough to stop the old man. SCP-106 preferred human prey between the ages of 10 and 25, and the sound of a child's cry or yell was enough to capture its immediate attention. What preceded was unimaginable horror. But despite the unfortunate events of the previous breach, the expedition continued their descent into the bowels of the building. After several hours of draining individual fluid chambers one by one and inputting complex codes and biometric scans from simultaneous top security clearance personnel at a time, the expedition team had eventually reached the lower levels of SCP-106's containment facility. Suspended in midair by ELO IID electromagnetic supports, in the center of a vast subterranean chamber was a massive lead-lined steel cube, 40 layers thick, each layer separated by 36 centimeters of empty space, with support struts between layers randomly spaced to confuse SCP-106 from being able to phase through one layer to the next. Surrounding the cube on every surface were military-grade automated light systems capable of 80,000 lumens apiece, spaced every two feet around the perimeter of the inner containment chamber. The team felt their resolve chip away the closer they got to the suspended creature. Dr. Bannon motioned to overhead surveillance cameras above the cube and waited. Slowly, the cube was lowered to the ground until it hit the floor with a soft thud that lightly rumbled the ground above the expedition team's feet. With a resentful look at the red dot on the camera above, Dr. Bannon initiated the release protocol. All seven researchers inputted their key cards and submitted themselves to retina scans as the 40 security personnel established defensive positions on every side of the lead-lined cube. For a moment, everyone held their breath in silence. You could almost feel the thumping of everyone's nervous heartbeats as they looked on to Dr. Bannon as he pulled out his key card. Everyone knew that as soon as it was scanned, the barrier between them and the old man would no longer exist. If the rest of the personnel could see Bannon's hand shaking as he gripped the keycard tightly between his fingers, it would cause a possible mass panic among the whole team. As the spearheading researcher on the job that day, Bannon knew what he was up against, just the same as everyone else, if not more. He knew he couldn't show the fear that was pulsing through his veins. This wasn't his first rodeo here at the Foundation. He took a moment to collect his thoughts. Get a hold of yourself, Bannon, he thought. Dr. Bannon took a deep breath and scanned the card. The door slowly opened. Armed with powerful rifle-length flashlights, the researchers cautiously waded into the dark entrance of the large cube. Inside the structure, they found a cell with a solid steel door. Signs of corrosion could be seen on the door's handle and from the outer walls of the cell, rust and rotted iron, but no breaches in the integrity of the cell. There were no more security codes at this door. It was a simple, round metal turn lock. Dr. Bannon swallowed, and began to turn the handle open. The sound of metal echoed through the chamber as the door creaked open. Each of the researchers immediately pointed their flashlights into the room. There in the corner, standing motionless and undisturbed, stood SCP-106, the old man. He stood with eyes closed, locked in a dormant state. The researchers had planned for this. SCP-106 spent up to three months at a time in this subdued state, in between periods of otherwise agitation where it would lash out at its containment and attempt to breach. The research team wasted no time. They began to collect data on the creature's biological makeup, taking whatever samples they could from the walls and floors, and recording photo and video of the specimen while collecting any method of conventional analysis they could manage under the given circumstances. Dr. Bannon kept an eye on the old man's face the entire time, refusing to look away for one second for fear of it waking in the absence of his gaze. But to his relief, the creature did not stir, and the data collection process went smoothly. In a short period of time, the team had packed their gear and proceeded to carefully retreat from the inner chamber of the cube, making sure to keep their lights pointed at the creature the entire time. Once the team exited the steel-lined cube, they motioned again to the camera, and the huge, heavy doors of the cube closed back in on itself. The electromagnetic supports came back online, 
and the cube was suspended once again in three-dimensional space, without any immediate contact with solid surfaces. The security detail began packing up their positions as everyone seemed to take a collective sigh of relief. That's when Dr. Bannon noticed the security camera. The red dot on the device had stopped blinking. The camera was off. A sudden feeling of dread entered Dr. Bannon's stomach as he turned in time to see all the cameras around the room turning off. Before he could react, the chamber was plunged into darkness as the electricity left the room. In the immediate darkness came a deafening bang followed by a gust of wind and the weight of a force strong enough to shake the ground and knock the researchers off their feet. The power of the electromagnetic supports were down. The cube had fallen. Dr. Bannon shouted to his team to immediately exit the facility. He reached for his flashlight in the darkness. He could hear screams in the background, gunfire. He managed to illuminate the space in front of him and saw his molecular biologist, Dr. Burns, scrambling to get her gear back up over her shoulder. Leave it! Dr. Bannon cried, only to see a hand emerge from beneath her and pull her down into a black, viscous substance that swallowed her whole and then vanished into solid concrete. After hearing the cries to his left, he swung his flashlight just in time to see him. The old man had its hand on the chest of a security personnel and entered him, exiting through the other side, leaving a gaping hole in between. Bullets were useless, as they seemed to get trapped on entry of his body, slowly melting into his skin. SCP-106 then vanished into the floor and appeared behind another member of the security detail, grabbing him by the heel and dragging him as he pleaded and reached out to Dr. Bannon for help, pulling him halfway into the wall and then letting go as the creature melted into the space between the walls, leaving behind half the poor man's body bleeding and still squirming to get away. One by one, he could hear his researchers crying out for help before their voices were extinguished. Before he could think of what to do next, the power came back on, and lights flooded into the large room. He gazed at the creature as it stood momentarily stunned by the influx of light. The old man had gaunt, piercing, hollow eyes in a face covered in dark, melting skin, and a lipless mouth that displayed terrible, decaying teeth. Its corrosive hand had a grasp on the arm of Dr. Breyer, the physicist, burning the skin beneath its grip as he cried out in pain. And then, without warning, the creature placed a hand on the wall of the metal cube and disappeared into it, pulling the doctor in with him, into the pocket dimension between the walls. 48 hours later in Containment Site-19, located in the state of Data Expunged, SCP personnel open the door to an observation chamber where SCP-049 is led in wearing steel-covered hand restraints. On the other side of a glass panel, Dr. Blake sat impatiently, watching the humanoid creature known as SCP-049 the Plague Doctor take a seat and face his direction. Dr. Blake hesitated to address the entity that sat in front of him, but putting aside his reservations, he spoke into the microphone. Blake informed SCP-049 of the recent breach that had transpired at the SCP-106 containment site. The doctor seemed intrigued at the news, and when asked if he would provide assistance, the doctor agreed. SCP-049 had exhibited abilities to produce instances of SCP-049-2, reanimated corpses that he alone had the ability to control by will. In the past, the Plague Doctor had been allowed certain privileges, deceased subjects for the Doctor to experiment on, in his quest to finally cure for what he referred to as the Pestilence, though none of the researchers could pinpoint exactly what the symptoms of this perceived illness was, or any specifics about it at all. However, the supply of subjects was halted after an incident where SCP-049 struck a personnel member, killing him instantly with his touch of death an ability that ceases all bodily function upon contact. Since then, the Plague Doctor refused to cooperate unless he was provided with live subjects for experimentation. Up to this point, he had been denied, but Dr. Blake needed the Plague Doctor's help, and time was not on his side. Dr. Blake agreed to provide SCP-049 with several live D-Class personnel in return for his assistance. As we've come to learn time and time again here on SCP Explained, the Foundation has no qualms about ridding the lives of these ex-death row inmates. D-Class are essentially the Foundation's lab rats, and treating them as such is more than worth it if dealing with an SCP-106 containment breach. Bring in the orange jumpsuits. Splendid, remarked 049. 
The Plague Doctor was taken to the secret site of SCP-106's containment facility and briefed on the old man's ability to meld and travel between walls, floors, and solid surfaces, as well as its ability to pull objects into its own pocket dimension, of which there was little information about. SCP-049 grew more and more intrigued by the description of the old man. Upon arriving, a laboratory was prepared at the site for SCP-049, for proxies to serve as lures to bait SCP-106. The team procured the bodies of a recent public transportation bus wreckage that had left 12 younger adults dead. As the plague doctor began his surgeries on them, Dr. Bannon could think only of the prior containment breach. The staff suffered many casualties to personnel, and ever since then, anyone under the age of 30 were barred entry within 20 miles of the containment site. Just as Dr. Bannon began to rub his temple to think about how they managed to return SCP-106 to his cell that day, there was a yell of excitement. Marvelous! cried out SCP-049. The Plague Doctor informed SCP staff that he had finished his work, and the surgeries had been of paramount success. The Doctor had indeed produced 12 instances of SCP-049-2 as predicted. The subjects were horrid abominations. Some with inverted faces, and others with added appendages and gaping holes where limbs should be. But they were ambient, and the research staff would soon learn if they would be enough to lure SCP-106 back into containment. Staring at the dimly lit white room crowded with malformed ambient corpses, Dr. Bannon couldn't help but feel a sense of dread fill the pit of his stomach. But there was no time to second guess. With rifles and flashlights in hand, the team led the troop of SCP-049-2s out and down the concrete hallways and into a large freight elevator that led down to the vast chamber that housed the inner containment cube that was SCP-106's home since arriving at the facility. The drone-like Dash 2s did not speak during this trip. They did not blink. They simply stared straight ahead and acted at the behest of the Plague Doctor without any verbal input. The macabre parade arrived at the entrance of the cube and proceeded inside. Dr. Bannon informed SCP-049 that the Dash 2s needed to make noises of some kind, to cry out if they could. Anything would work, as long as it was audible enough. The Plague Doctor nodded his head and all 12 of the reanimated corpses began to scream in terrifying unison. In the hollow distance, a roar was heard in response. It dripped from the ceiling, first a drop, then many more until a puddle formed on the ground in front of the cube, the plague doctor approaching with intrigue. Out of the floor rose up the creature known as SCP-106, coming face to face with the plague doctor. Upon seeing the creature, SCP-049 was ecstatic. He began to examine SCP-106 closely without fear of bodily harm. With lightning speed, he produced a vial and pinchers from a medicine bag of black leather he kept under his robes and snatched a sample of the creature's black viscous skin. The plague doctor was overjoyed. This will lead to my greatest work and the cure for the pestilence once and for all. But the old man did not seem to acknowledge or even enjoy the presence of SCP-049 and reacted violently lashing out to strike the Plague Doctor. Sensing danger, 049 jumped back and willed the 049-2s to attack the creature. But before they could reach it, SCP-106 melted into a pool of black and disappeared into the floor. The instances looked around dazed. Another black pool appeared under one of them, causing it to fall into the portal and then out from the ceiling elsewhere in the vast stadium-sized room. Another pool opened up under one of the ambient thralls, sucking it down into the black abyss, and then another, and another, and soon loud thuds could be heard echoing through the chamber as bodies began to appear from the top of the hundred-foot ceiling, falling to a splatter on the concrete floor below. Upon witnessing SCP-106's abilities firsthand, SCP-049 nodded to Dr. Bannon as he swiftly packed up his medicine bag and made for the door, only to be blocked by SCP-106's materializing form. The Plague Doctor grew angry and struck the neck of the old man with his cold touch of death, but it seemed to have no effect on SCP-106. The black substance on his body started to creep over 049's hand, sizzling and searing skin and flesh as it went up the forearm. Sensing danger, the Plague Doctor pulled out a large scalpel and in one quick motion sliced off his own arm at the elbow. The severed limb fell to the floor engulfed by the black bubbling substance. 
SCP-106 then lunged at the doctor, whose quick agility allowed him to dodge and make for the doorway. Once in the hall, SCP-049 quickly pulled out a roll of brown gauze from his medical bag and began to wrap his bleeding wound tight as he hurried through the dimly lit corridor, lights flickering on and off. As SCP-049 turned a corner, a black substance appeared on the wall in front of him, and a chair came flying out of it towards his head. The doctor dodged it, but did not dodge a sharp metal spike that materialized from another hole appearing on the wall to his left. It pierced the outside of his knee, causing his movement to be slowed. Hearing the sound of clanking metal, the doctor looked up in time to see a desk falling out of another dimensional portal above him. He managed to roll sideways, missing the blow but straight into another one of SCP-016's portals, causing the doctor to fall through the wall and into the floor of the room below. With a falling crash, the doctor landed in the lower room and looked around quickly, seeking to regain his footing. The old man was nowhere to be seen, but he could hear him bumping in the darkness, traveling through the walls of the building. The plague doctor quickly analyzed the office room for something useful. On the wall, he found a map of the facility and studied the schematics. On the floor was a dead body. He crouched down close to it and stabbed it with a syringe from his cloak, animating the corpse and commanding it to run, serving as a distraction to lead SCP-106 away so he could make it to the adjoining hallway just a few hundred feet away. That was the armory. Limping from his injured leg, the plague doctor waited for the old man to be led away as he made it to the room. He began tearing through the weaponry that lined and leaned up against the walls in every direction, ignoring the automatic rifles as they were useless. There he found what he had been searching for, flash grenades. As the form of another black portal began to materialize in front of him, he pulled the pin and tossed the grenade in that putrid puddle. A blast of light erupted from within, followed by the sound of the creature recoiling in pain. The plague doctor pulled another pin, and another, and in this manner, he led SCP-106 toward the secondary containment facilities that had begun filling with fluid. When he reached a level where he could recognize the smell of kerosene, he stopped. There he waited, as SCP-106 emerged from the darkness in front of him. It snarled and howled, spitting black bits of tar as its gnarled yellowed teeth came close to the Plague Doctor's face. The Plague Doctor calmly turned and waited out of the half-filled room. SCP-106 tried to lunge at him to follow, but it could not. It found itself rooted in liquid, unable to easily open a portal in the space between the walls. Stepping out of the room, the Plague Doctor reached into his cloak and pulled out a large match from his leather bag. Without glancing back, he struck the match and gave a ginger toss into the flames, sliding the door closed behind him. The resulting explosion and subsequent inferno damaged the walls of the secondary containment facility and caused significant seismic activity within the outer walls of the containment site. Emergency lights flickered on and off in the darkness, and debris rained down from the ceiling in every direction. In this haze of rubble, the Plague Doctor picked himself up off the ground and began to dust his cloak clean with the one hand he had left. Satisfied, he took a content sigh and began to make for the exit to the outside world, where he would resume his quest to rid the Earth of the pestilence that had plagued mankind. Though, an unexpected surprise made him pause. A flaming corpse began to emerge from a black hole in the wall beside him. SCP-106, intact and whole, the flames slowly seeping into his skin until they were all extinguished and only smoke rose from his body. This time, the doctor was not so fast to react. The creature grabbed him by the face and slammed it into the nearby wall, cracking the marble surface. The black substance pooled around the Plague Doctor's face. SCP-106 opened a portal in the wall, pushing the Doctor's head into it. The events that followed afterwards are difficult to put together, as camera footage from the facility suffered severe damage due to SCP-049's explosion of the secondary containment chambers. SCP-106 was found back inside his cell in the containment cube, back to his dormant state, where he would remain again for the next few months. That is, until he would feel the need to hunt prey once again. As the doors of the 40-layer steel cube closed, the electromagnetic supports came back online, and the fluid chambers repaired and refilled. The committee is currently voting on whether or not to allow SCP-106's containment facility to be opened again. For now, the world could rest once more. Dr. Bannon could take a sigh of relief, but for how long, he thought. For that, there was no way to tell.
A world that's lost its way needs a healer, someone to patch up its wounds and tend to its pain. It needs a doctor. When day broke, the sun turned from a giver of life, the thing that wakes the rooster and makes the crops grow, to an indiscriminate killer, wiping out all organic life forms. The world seemed truly lost, but one anomalous being made it his goal to soothe the hurt, to make it safe to step into the light once more. The Plague Doctor had done his best with the limited resources afforded to him at the abandoned Foundation site. The scientists had left behind all of their equipment when the Red Sun came, when they all were transformed. He had appointed himself the site director, willing to take up the mantle when no one else would. He had assembled a brave, brilliant team of fellow anomalies. The verbose Dr. Spanko, the eloquent adventurous Lord Blackwood, and the charismatic but ravenous Ferdinand. There had, of course, been those who scoffed at his vision, who did not share his noble goal. The abominable possessive mask taunted him persistently, trying its best to get under his chitinous skin. But he did not have time to waste on such trivial psychological games, and he ignored its taunts to focus on the work. It hadn't been easy. Capturing one of the infected specimens, the former human being turned mass of oozing gelatinous flesh by the unholy light in the sky. One had made its way into the abandoned facility, sliding its way across the floor with an air of confused malice. It wanted to hurt, but it didn't know where it was, who it was, anymore. But it was frightened, the play doctor could tell. A good physician always knows and can sense the fear and pain of a suffering person. It made his heart ache to see, and he knew there was only one thing to do. Try to make this poor soul well again. Everyone, please assist me in escorting the patient to my laboratory, the doctor called out. This was once a man, and I believe with our combined intellect and resources, we can return him to his former state. Ferdinand took a step toward the slimy creature, licking his lips a bit. Do you think I could have just a little bit of it? Oh, I'm so hungry, doctor, he begged. No, no, it would go against my oath as a physician to allow any more harm to come to this poor fellow. The plague doctor shook his head solemnly. Ferdinand pouted, but did not press the issue further. No. The doctor rubbed his gloved hands together in anticipation of the next task. It is imperative we contain our new friend safely, if you would, please. He gestured to several of his previous patients, now reanimated and ready to aid him with his research. The shuffling figure surrounded the blobby entity, ushering it down the hall. Confused, lost, with no real sense of a plan left in its mushy consciousness, the creature followed where it was led. The group made it back to the doctor's laboratory. Cut! shouted Dr. Spanko from his perch atop a nearby shelf. Yes, indeed, the doctor replied. A standard operating table wouldn't do for such a special patient. I have nowhere to place the restraints, you see. I will have to make do with the floor. Ferdinand, my bag, if you please. The giant rushed to his side, dropping the bag at his feet. If he dies, then can I eat it? He asked, shifting from one foot to the other like a child asking a parent for a second helping of ice cream. If I am unable to save the patient, which I do deem unlikely, then... Yes, you may help me dispose of the remains, the doctor relented, but I do not hope it comes to that. He pressed a hand to his beak in deep thought for a moment, before opening his bag and pulling out a syringe filled with clear liquid. To begin, we must sedate the patient. He had no way to find a vein, and so he plunged the needle into the nearest section of the creature's soft surface, injecting a dose of sedative. Then he waited. The oozing motion of the entity slowed and stopped. It lay there on the ground, a still mound of flesh, save for the occasional expanding and contracting motion, almost as if it was breathing. Excellent. Now there was no risk of the patient fleeing the operating room mid-procedure. He could truly begin. It was an arduous process that took hours of effort, of taking small tissue samples, attempting to make incisions only for the flesh to fuse back together seconds after the scalpel was taken away. This was truly an advanced illness, unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was enough to make him question his abilities as a doctor, but he shook the thought away. Self-pity never helped anyone. After about eight hours of continuous work, he had a breakthrough, a solution he had created long ago. 
A thick, green liquid sealed in a dusty jar had a miraculous effect when dripped onto one of the tissue samples. The melted flesh reconstituted, became solid and human again. Eureka! He cried out, unable to restrain the sudden joy that leaped into his heart. This could be it. Very carefully, he filled the dropper with the green liquid. If these initial trials had been successful, then perhaps he couldn't finish the thought. Best not to get ahead of himself. He crossed to his patient and slowly began to pour the solution over the creature's viscous surface. He watched as the flesh toughened, coming together into a surface resembling human skin. It was working. It was working. But then the creature began to quiver, shaking uncontrollably like a bowl of jelly in an earthquake. The surface rippled, and the doctor could hear a high-pitched whine filling the room. Then, with a wet pop, the patient exploded, sending chunks of flesh splattering all over the room, painting the walls and ceiling. The doctor cried out in shock and horror, and in spite of himself, fell to his knees in despair. He had been so close, but still, he had failed. And who could say when he would find another test subject? If he would ever find a cure, I'm afraid I do not know what to do now, the doctor admitted. Fernand sighed. The next several days passed in a haze. The doctor paced around his laboratory, mulling over his possible mistakes again and again. He had rushed the process, he was certain of that now. It was a novice mistake, the sort of thing he might have done a century or two ago. How could he have been so foolish? How could he have made that innocent pay the price for his own hubris? As the doctor locked himself away in his mind palace, Fernand occupied himself by practicing his favorite songs. Lord Blackwood rode on the massive man's shoulder as he sang through the opera Don Giovanni. I once saw a production of this at the Teatro La Fenice in Venice, Lord Blackwood interjected, his rhinopores twitching in delight at the memory. Marvelous production, marvelous city. I was there hunting a rogue tattle worm, wrecking havoc through the canals. I nearly lost my life on that voyage. Would you all be quiet for once in your miserable lives? A voice hissed from the shadows. There in the doorway, its face fixed in a frown, was the possessive mask. Black slime dripped from its eye holes, spilling down onto the plastic mannequin body it had taken hold of. Listening to you both is worse than being locked in that infernal box. The mask looked around the room, searching for someone. Where is the good doctor? It asked, voice dripping with disdain. Still moping about, counting his failures. Ignore him, my fine fellow, Lord Blackwood whispered to Fernand. Only those with weak constitutions and no achievements of their own spend their days dragging others down. When you have lived as long as I, you will learn this. <laughs> Careful, my lord. I'll stop by the kitchen and find some salt to pour on you. If you wish to fight me, then challenge me to a fair duel like a man, the colorful slug bellowed. Drawn by the sudden shouting, the doctor walked into the room. What is all this commotion? Oh, good. The mask clapped its plastic hands together, its face warping back into an eerie smile. There you are. This has all been so dreadfully boring. I came to see the remnants of your greatest shame. Are there still bloodstains on the floor in your pathetic little laboratory? You are a villain, the doctor seethed. Uncomfortable with the air of conflict in the room, Fernand and Lord Blackwood quickly exited to find another space where they could sing and share stories in peace. I simply speak the truths no one wants to hear. The mask crossed to the doctor's side with a series of light, dance-like steps that made the mannequin body creak. In fact, I have quite a few truths to share today. I've been outside, you see. Whatever's become of the sun only affects organic beings, and so... He gestured from his ceramic face to his plastic body. I am quite safe from its rays. You've been... Outside, the doctor couldn't keep the curiosity out of his voice. He was a scientist after all. Why, yes. Would you like to know what I've seen? 
Black slime dripped from the mask's mouth, pooling on the floor with a sizzling sound. I'm in no mood for tricks, the doctor warned. The mask held up his hands in mock surrender. No tricks, doctor. But if you'd rather take your chances outside and see for yourself, I can take my leave now. No, the doctor shook his head. Please, do tell me. It's so much worse than you could even imagine. The mask's words were bleak, but its tone was gleeful. Everywhere you look out there, the light has made monsters. Humans, dogs, cats, mice, the wild beasts of the forest, all melted down into creatures you would not even recognize. But that isn't all. No, that is not all. There are massive beasts, ten feet tall or more, made from dozens and dozens of the creatures coming together. They fuse and meld into one giant entity roving the streets in search of more and more bodies to add to the pile, an oozing, gaping maw of hunger and hate that seeks only to consume and destroy. It calls out to surviving humans in the voices of their fallen loved ones, tugs at their heartstrings to lure them out of their hiding places, and then it wraps around them with fleshy tentacles, pulling them in until they are no more. Just another part of the monster. Oh, Doctor, it's terror. It's an abomination. I could watch it all day. The Doctor wanted to believe the mask was lying, that it was trying to torment with him, with awful fabrications. But after all he had seen so far, he knew that its words were true. Get out of my sight, he said. Or what? The mask stared him down with its unmoving smile. I've seen what you do to your hosts, you know. Your body won't last forever, the doctor growled. Hmm, -mm. true. Maybe next I'll take yours. <laughs> the mask laughed a long, dark laugh of something ancient and evil. Then it turned and walked out the door, leaving the doctor alone. He spent so much of his time that way lately. His assistants were preoccupied, his former patients provided no real company, and so he did what he did best, carry on in solitude. He couldn't be sure how long he stood there in silence, thinking of what the mask told him. He knew it was dangerous outside, knew he was up against powerful destructive forces, but it was even worse than he had thought. What if the world was truly doomed? What if this was how it all ended? Not with a bang, but with a great melting. Suddenly, the doctor heard a sound he hadn't heard since the sun turned wrong. A scream. A human scream. Could it be? He had to see for himself. He grabbed his bag of tools and rushed down the hall, his robes fluttering behind him. There it was again. A different human voice, screaming in terror. As he grew closer to the sound, he could hear footsteps, various other voices overlapping with each other. He rounded the corner, and there they were. A group of five humans, wrapped in tattered clothes, dirty and exhausted. Behind them was the entrance to what looked like a tunnel. Somehow they found a secret passage and made their way inside. Then he saw what made them scream. Clearly these people were afraid and unaccustomed to the sight of a man of Ferdinand's stature, especially when the man was drooling and staring at them with hunger in his eyes. He would have to defuse the situation quickly. Hello, welcome. We mean you no harm, strangers. He stepped between Fernand and the humans. The man at the front of the group brandished a firearm, pointing the barrel directly at the doctor's beak. Please, sir, there's no need for violence. What are you? The man stammered. The other members of his party cowered behind him. An ally, if you will permit me to be. I'm a physician, you see, working on a cure for the condition that plagues the world. With a shaking hand, the man slowly lowered his gun. He did not put it away, though. You've figured out a cure for those things? I am in the process of developing it. So far, I have not been successful, but perhaps with your help? How do we know we can trust you? The man demanded. How am I supposed to know you're not part of this? Do you know who this man is? Fernand bellowed. This is Dr. John Watson, and I am Detective Sherlock Holmes, the greatest investigator in the world. There isn't a case we can't solve. 
The man looked at the woman next to him, and the two shared a wide-eyed glance. This, this guy's crazy, he whispered furtively. Put your weapon away, and we can speak more calmly, the doctor proposed. At this inopportune moment, a few of his revived patients shambled into view, and the man screamed again. This time he fired his weapon, shooting at one of the walking corpses. The bullets ricocheted off the walls and several of the patients were hit. Please stop! With no other option, the doctor grabbed the man's arm, hoping to get a hold of the weapon and end the potential bloodshed. As soon as his gloved hand made contact, the man went limp and dropped to the ground with a hard thud. The woman next to him pulled him into her arms, checking his pulse. He's dead! She shrieked, tears streaming down her face. I... I am so sorry, my lady. I did not intend... She grabbed the man's gun and trained it on the doctor once more. You killed him! She cried. The other survivors were too shaken to speak, to move. One of them had his back turned to the group and was staring into the darkness behind him. Whatever he was looking at, it was worse than the chaos unfolding. But no one noticed the beige flesh tentacle snaking along the ground until it was too late. Until it had grabbed a hold of the man's ankle and dragged him into the tunnel with a shriek of pure, unadulterated terror. The woman nearly dropped her gun at the sound, whirling around to see what had happened. Deep in the tunnel, the scream warped into a wet gurgling sound, and then there was silence for a long moment. But then, something worse. A gooey, slimy sound. The sound of something enormous, something soft and fleshy, making its way through the tunnel and toward the group. Another tentacle curled around the edge of the opening, then another joined it. Something emerged that might have once been a hand, but it had melted into something unrecognizable. The monster emerged piece by piece until the doctor could see the entire thing. It looked like a heap of people, dozens of them clambering on top of each other, wrapping their limbs together until their flesh and insides emptied out and fused into a shapeless mass. It moved a bit like a giant slug, slimy and slow, but it seemed to know it could take its time. As the survivors scrambled back away from it, Ferdinand and the doctor taking a few steps back of their own, the sound of human voices filled the room. There were unintelligible whispers, the soft giggle of a child, a woman weeping. Come and be with us. A little boy's voice broke through the cacophony. Mommy, I miss you. Don't you miss me? The woman with the gun let out a broken sob. Billy? She sniffled. It's me, Mommy. The innocent voice continued, emanating from somewhere deep inside the monstrous mass that crept along the ground, swelling and grasping with its ropey tentacles. Come play with me outside. All you have to do is come outside. Madame, the creature is not who it claims to be. The doctor spoke up, and it seemed to shake the woman out of a trance. You're not my son, she hissed, squeezing the trigger and firing at the monster. The bullet made contact with a wet, useless slap and disappeared into the roving pile of the fallen. She fired again and again, but the monster did not stop. It did not even slow down. It lashed out with a tentacle that wrapped around her throat in a single fluid motion and snapped her neck with a crack. She fell to the ground and the tentacle pulled her into its depths until she was no longer visible. She hadn't been taken by the sun, not yet, but she was still lost. The rest of the survivors followed, their screams silence one by one. The doctor felt the same overwhelming sense of hopelessness wash over him, the same shadow that had passed over him when he lost the last patient. What could he do? He was one physician against an overpowering force of destruction. Perhaps he could touch it and it would fall dead like so many other organisms before. But what if it didn't? What if instead it wrapped around his body and squeezed the life from him? What if it carried him out into that cursed sunlight and he melted away like the others? He had to make a decision because the beast was advancing toward him. Doctor! Fernand shouted. It's going to destroy our facility! Indeed, the creature was flailing its appendages around, beating against the walls and trying to tear down steel and plaster, break down the shelter, until they too were exposed to the deadly light. I'm afraid this may be the end, my friend, the doctor lamented. I can see no hope for us now. No! Ferdinand shook his head. Let me save us. Let me lead it back outside. You'll be taken! The doctor cried. Perhaps not. I am a magnificent specimen after all. I believe I can withstand the sun and return to continue our work together. Ferdinand scooped his sleeping Lord Blackwood from his shoulder and placed him gingerly on a nearby shelf. Thank you for your company. Then he turned back to the doctor. And thank you for my freedom. And your friendship. It has been an honor. Before the doctor could protest, 
Ferdinand was running, his thunderous steps pounding the earth as he led the monster in a chase. It took the bait, following this new large target back outside. He sealed off the tunnel behind them, ensuring the beast would not return the way it came. He wanted to believe Ferdinand's bravado, to think that the behemoth of a man had survived outside. But that night, he saw the great beast ooze past a window, and he could make out that familiar, wide, toothy grin protruding from its side. Just like that, the greatest assistant he had ever had was lost. Thank you for your service, my friend, he whispered to himself. I solemnly swear to you, your death shall not be in vain. SCP-049 is a fascinating bundle of contradictions. Arguably, he's the Hannibal Lecter of the anomalous world. He's educated, refined, and cultured. A scientific man with scientific goals, capable of communicating eloquently in both English and medieval French. As anomalies go, he's one of the more cooperative ones contained by the SCP Foundation, willing to understand reason and even showing a small degree of respect for his fellow researchers. And yet despite all this intelligence and refinement, underneath his dark organic cloak, a heart of deep red violence steadily beats. He's capable of ending life with a mere touch, causing all biological functions in the body to simply cease through means that are still unknown to science. Thanks to a series of inconclusive autopsies on SCP-049's unaltered victims, not only is killing easy in a physical sense for SCP-049 with a few notable exceptions, it's also been just as easy on his conscience. Such is the danger of the man or monster who believes unshakably that his goals are righteous. Any moral crime is permissible if done in service of seeing them through. And for those who die at SCP-049's hand, an even greater indignity awaits. His inhuman experiments, the gateway to a second life as an abominable crime against nature, a glob of malignant spit in the eye of God. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves here, students. We've mentioned SCP-049 countless times in passing before. Some of his strange tales, his interactions with other anomalies like SCP-682, and even with some of your questions and theories about this bone-masked scientific madman. And yet, he still remains a mystery. Perhaps to truly understand this fascinating walking question, we need to return to the beginning and give the classified files behind the Plague Doctor a closer look. Like many of the infamous anomalies discovered by the SCP Foundation, the files indicate that the discovery itself was first triggered by a series of mysterious disappearances in the sleepy town of Montauban, out in southern France. People across races, classes, ages, and genders were simply falling off the map, suggesting a highly indiscriminate assailant. Little did the Foundation know, in the beady avian eyes of their killer, they all had an extremely important commonality. Each and every one of them was infected with the pestilence, the invisible scourge, the great dying. Their killer was the only one with the proper diagnostic mind to even notice the infection. He was the only one who could save the world from this insidious, unseen threat. And then the SCP Foundation discovered his laboratory. The Plague Doctor had been doing his delicate work in an abandoned house on the edge of town. The kind of place that gets whispered about in local rumors. A bad place. A cursed place. Little did they know, it was only the latest in a long line of covert research centers for this singularly inspired medicine man. While some of the details were a little foggy in his memory, he'd been carrying out his work for a little over 400 years now, moving from place to place, causing strings of disappearances wherever he showed up. In his own words, he's an extremely well-traveled man. And still the cure for the blasted pestilence continued to evade him. He sat in that decrepit Montauban house, surrounded by groaning, writhing abominations of his own creation taking meticulous notes. Nothing would break his concentration, not even the strangers in the black tactical gear with large guns kicking in his front doors. His many cured patients didn't take kindly to the intrusion on their treatment and decided to swarm the interlopers. What followed was a violent struggle between the intruders and the cured, resulting in several of the intruders injured and all of the cured dead once more. 
During all this chaos, the plague doctor never once stopped taking notes. When he was finished with his sentence, he willingly submitted to capture by this mysterious SCP Foundation. After all, when he told them about the true nature of his mission, they would of course see reason and allow him to continue his research. Sure, he may have committed a few crimes against nature on the way, but he was working in service of loftier ideals. You can only imagine his profound relief when he was first interviewed by SCP Foundation researcher Dr. Raymond Hamm in Site 85. He was in the presence of fellow scholars, people of science. He worried at first that he'd been captured by some group of common street scoundrels, when in fact, the hands of Providence had delivered him into the perfect place to continue his research. The warm light of fate was now smiling on him after so long languishing in the dark. All he needed to do was allow the scientists around him to conduct tests on his own body, while he conducted tests on others. At first, the SCP Foundation believed he was an anomalous human being wearing a costume, but they soon discovered that he was something very different. What they thought was a mask was actually an outgrowth of his skull, a kind of insect-like exoskeleton. The robes were also a component of his body, a kind of thick hide that developed over the years. The thickness of the hide itself also made him impervious to a great deal of physical damage. Despite his politeness, research notes on the Plague Doctor indicated that Foundation personnel found interacting with him uncanny. There was an oddly eerie quality to him, something indistinguishable that just felt off. The Foundation also found that the Plague Doctor, whom they initially addressed as Doctor rather than SCP-049 out of a sense of mutual respect, also came with a number of strange personal effects. These included a long pointing stick, similar to the ones used by medieval Plague Doctors to touch things without fear of contamination. This stick was soon confiscated. It didn't possess any anomalous qualities, but the Plague Doctor had a tendency to gesture grandly with it as he spoke, and the Foundation feared he absentmindedly take someone's eye out with it if he wasn't careful. The other two personal effects that the Plague Doctor prized greatly was his old-fashioned medical bag and the notebook that he obsessively recorded his observations with. The medical bag, which seemed to exhibit anomalous properties, contained a mix of archaic medical tools as well as some that the Foundation has been unable to identify. It's through the tools in this bag that the Plague Doctor is able to create instances of SCP-049-2. As we alluded to earlier, the Plague Doctor can kill with a touch, but that's only part of what he does to his victims. After causing all their biological functions to cease, he takes the tools out of his medical bag and begins performing crude surgery on their corpse, including using a syringe to inject an unknown anomalous liquid into their flesh. While the specifics on the Plague Doctor's modifications can vary from victim to victim, the result is often the same. They're converted into strange, shambling abominations that aren't capable of any kind of higher thought. For the most part, their movements are extremely basic and limited. However, if they're provoked, they can become frighteningly violent, more than capable of killing an armed Foundation guard if they don't remain alert during the engagement. The SCP Foundation was given a unique opportunity to understand more about SCP-049's twisted experiments. As part of his conditions for containment, they agreed to provide the diabolical doctor with a number of fresh test subjects. The doctor was eager to continue his work, and through watching him work, the SCP Foundation could learn a great deal more about him. Though we wouldn't even pretend that the Plague Doctor's work has ever been enjoyable to watch. They presented him with some live subjects and a much greater number of mammalian corpses. He would spend several days working intensely on each one, then documenting his findings in his precious notebook. As a mark of respect for the Foundation scientists around him, the Plague Doctor was more than eager to share his research with them and compare notes. He was always a talkative one, perhaps just as excited to discuss his experiments and theories with like-minded scholars after so many years of working alone. Here are four notable instances. First, the Plague Doctor was presented with a live D-Class specimen. He thanked the Foundation greatly for this gift, then set about his work. He asked the unaware D-Class several questions about his medical history while retrieving tools from his bag, before quickly touching and killing the man. He performed extensive modifications on the D-Class corpse, and when he was resurrected as an SCP-049-2 instance, he was barely recognizable as his original form. 
He was a bizarre, flailing creature, constantly groaning and gasping from the oblong-shaped hole that the Plague Doctor had carved into his chest. While performing this horrifying work, the Plague Doctor eagerly remarked to the observing researchers that the cure appears to be extremely effective. Next, he was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat, which he also expressed gratitude for. After performing surgery on the creature, it was successfully resurrected into a bizarre SCP-049-2 instance. However, the Plague Doctor readily admitted that this definitely wasn't his best work, commenting, The disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinary practice is rudimentary, but the patient responded well to the procedure. Next, he was provided the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. The Plague Doctor was delighted by this, commenting that, given primate similarities to human physiology, this would be the next best thing from a true human test subject. However, this research became surprisingly fraught. He killed and reanimated the beast four different times, seemingly unsatisfied with the result each time. And when he failed to reanimate the creature a fifth time, he seemed disconcerted. In a debriefing discussion, the Plague Doctor said, I have learned so much from this, though I fear my early optimism was misplaced. I haven't yet come across such a... Uh, a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Next, it was provided with the corpse of a recently deceased cow. This irritated SCP-049, who wanted test subjects who were physiologically closer to humans. Still, despite his frustration, he continued to work. He took only brief breaks to enjoy a meal of hard cheese, salted pork, and thin crackers. Tests showed that SCP-049 didn't require sustenance to survive, but he enjoyed the act of eating and found that it helped him with his work. He embalmed the cow, rearranging its organs, and even inverted its head. However, this didn't impede his work. He injected it with a variety of liquids, which he described as the essence of the humors. When asked to elaborate further on this, he said, The pestilence may bring about a systemic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the humors in balance or the body will reject the cure. This is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you have learned this during your education. After being provided a working cattle prod to induce a little electricity into the equation, the plague doctor successfully reanimated the mutant cow. From here, things started to go downhill. Dr. Ham decided to conduct another interview with SCP-049 hoping to get into the finer details of his scientific process. However, they hit some major roadblocks. SCP-049 seemed to be unable to actually articulate the true nature of the pestilence or his process in seeking the cure. Even his notebook wasn't written in any known language and proved impossible to decipher. As the interview went on, the plague doctor seemed to become increasingly distressed insisting on the importance of his work to helping the human race prosper and survive this terrible plague. All he needed in exchange was more test subjects. The practice civility that had been built up between the Plague Doctor and the SCP Foundation crumbled in 2017, after a tragic incident in the Plague Doctor's cell with Dr. Ham. When he entered to perform a very standard interview with the Plague Doctor, the doctor appeared to become anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well today. Dr. Ham thought nothing of it and tried to continue the interview, but by that point, it was already too late. The plague doctor had come to believe that Dr. Ham was infected with the pestilence. And, of course, there was only one cure. The plague doctor gave Dr. Ham his touch of death. The man died instantly, and the plague doctor immediately went about turning his corpse into another SCP-049-2 instance. Because Ham was killed so quickly, he didn't have time to activate his emergency security signal meaning what was left of him wasn't discovered until three hours later. Guards and researchers were horrified to see one of their own turned into a mindless, deformed monster by an anomaly they all thought they could trust. Following this tragic incident, Dr. Theron Sherman chastised the Plague Doctor for this appalling breach of trust and the cold-blooded murder of Dr. Raymond Ham. The Plague Doctor, in a state of increasing distress, insisted that Ham was infected, and he did all that he could to cure him. And while the Plague Doctor insisted a certain level of scientific distance from his subject, it seemed that deep down, he regretted the loss of a friend and fellow researcher in his endless quest against the pestilence. After this incident, the Plague Doctor truly became SCP-049. He lost all of his privileges and now remains under lock and key in Site-19. Whenever he's transported, 
He's kept in shackles and supervised by a number of armed guards. After discovering that the scent of lavender has a pacifying effect on him, it's regularly used as a tranquilizer against him during engagements. This is how a cordial ally can become just another prisoner in the eyes of the SCP Foundation. In a summary interview after the Dr. Ham incident, Dr. Elijah Itkin asked if 049 had any regrets about the incident, noting that he seemed oddly mournful. 049 paused before replying, Mourn. Perhaps I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as… as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I am decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. Dr. Itkin replied that 049 would be disappointed on that front. He just laughed in response and replied, <laughs> Oh, doctor, I wouldn't be so sure. Life at the SCP Foundation isn't exactly made up of sunshine and rainbows. It's less of a good vibes kind of place and more of a this is the solemn work we do as we stand between humanity and the vast, unfeeling, unknowable realm of mystery and darkness. Sure, sometimes there's a magic vending machine or a teddy bear doctor, but most of the time, the Foundation's findings are a lot more bite than they are barn. Thankfully, there's the C portion of that infamous acronym, CONTAIN. They keep their bizarre, astounding findings locked up tight, where they can't catch an unsuspecting innocent off guard and- Ah! Oh, hey there, little buddy. It's okay, you didn't mean to scare me. Relax, everyone, it's just SCP-999. One of the only contained curiosities allowed to roam freely around the halls of the Foundation. Just look at this guy. Has a sentient mass of translucent orange slime ever been so cute? You want some chocolate, buddy? Okay, here you go. It's incredible, really, that the place that houses a neck-snapping sculpture and a haunted chess-playing machine could also be the home of such a delightful little blob. You know, now that I think of it, it's amazing that being in the vicinity of unspeakable horrors day after day has never put a damper on 999's positive attitude. He's got the persistent, cheerful disposition of a Labrador puppy, but how well would SCP-999's inherent wholesomeness hold up against one of the most wicked anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation? What would happen if the lightest of the light, a slimy piece of pure goodness, came up against a deep, dark evil? Not the omnicidal rage of SCP-682, we all know how that went, but something quieter. Well, let's find out. SCP-999 was having the best day of its life. To be fair, every single day was the best day of the Tickle Monster's life, surpassed only by the day that followed and the one after that. And how could it not be a good life at the SCP Foundation, when there were so many friends to play with, treats to eat, and so much to explore? SCP-999 was enjoying a hearty bowl of M&Ms, picking out and eating the orange ones, its favorites first, when a familiar figure walked into its pen. Dr. Jack Bright, who frequently came by to see the Tickle Monster when he was having a disappointing day, usually because the higher-ups had reprimanded him for breaking the rules yet again. SCP-999 cooed delightfully at the sight of its visitor, slithering over to Dr. Bright and enveloping him in an enthusiastic hug. Dr. Bright immediately began to laugh as the creature's euphoric influence took effect. Hey, glad there are no hard feelings about the time I ate a piece of you. Uh. He giggled as 999 patted his face affectionately with one of its pseudopods. Aw, thanks. That really takes the sting out of getting the no chainsaws hammer brought down on me again. He patted the slime with his own hand in return, and satisfied that it had sufficiently cheered him, 999 oozed back over to its breakfast to finish consuming the sugary goodness. Oh, I almost forgot. Dr. Bright pulled something out of his lab coat pocket. It was a small can of cola, appealingly shiny in the light. Want some? SCP-999 gurgled curiously and approached Dr. Bright to inspect the can. He popped it open with an inviting fizz and offered some. Fortunately, Dr. Rhodes was walking by at that exact moment. Don't you dare! She snatched the can out of her colleague's hand. You remember what happened last time. 999 can't tolerate caffeine or carbonation. Dr. Bright pouted like a petulant child. But I wanted to see it bounce. 
Do I need to add another rule to the list? Dr. Rhodes crossed her arms. Or are you going to behave yourself? Ugh, fine, whatever, I'll find something else to do. Dr. Bright rolled his eyes and left SCP-999's pen with a final friendly wave at the creature. Sensing Dr. Rhodes's stress, the tickle monster nuzzled her leg with an inquisitive gurgle. She smiled indulgently and gave the slime a hug before she followed Dr. Bright down the hall, keeping an eye out for any more potentially disruptive antics. Satisfied at having cheered everyone up, SCP-999 went back to its bowl of candy and devoured the remaining treats. But then, there was nothing left to eat, and no one in the room to visit or play with. What was a lovable slime to do? Why explore, of course. SCP-999 had the freedom to roam all over the Foundation site, until bedtime, that is, and it loved oozing down the halls looking for friends to greet and strangers to meet. After all, a stranger is just a friend that the tickle monster hasn't tickled yet. As the slime slid along the floor, it took the time to say hello to everyone it passed by, bumping them, nudging them, or in the case of Josie the half-cat, very gently petting her head with one of its pseudopods. The cat purred, and 999 responded by vibrating its gelatinous body, producing a soft purr of its own. Then Josie was distracted by a dust particle drifting through a beam of light and darted off to chase it. So the tickle monster continued on its way, looking for something new and fun to do. It spotted the perfect new activity. Two guards were walking into one of the sealed containment rooms, a room that the jolly little slime had never been inside of before. Now was the perfect chance to investigate, and maybe play tickle wrestling with the guards along the way. It had to act fast though, the door was beginning to close. Rearranging its body, 999 squished itself into a long, thin line sliding quickly through the crack in the door just before it shut. This new room was very messy, much messier than 999 was allowed to keep its own room. Any spilled chocolate milk or smeared cupcake frosting was either cleaned up by staff or slurped up by the slime itself. But in this room, there was thick black liquid dripping down all of the walls, some of it arranging itself into patterns and words, though 999 couldn't read what they said. The guards hadn't noticed the tickle monster's presence yet, and it kept still, excited to give them a wonderful surprise when they turned around and saw that it had followed them inside. But they didn't turn around, they were completely focused on something in front of them. What was it? It was a thick glass case that looked as if it was about to fall apart at any moment. Inside, there was a mask, a porcelain mask of a frowning face with that same strange, dark fluid dripping from its eye and mouth holes. You know the procedure, right? One guard said. He was holding a brand new glass case, shiny and completely empty. <laughs> of course I do, the other scoffed. It's my first time with this anomaly, not my first day on the job. Just open it up and take the mask out and put it in here. He tapped on the case he was holding, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I just said I know, the less experienced guard grumbled. Don't patronize me. He reached towards the decaying case and prepared to unlock it. Wait, did you hear that? Hear what? I thought I heard… <sighs> never mind. SCP-999 vibrated with excitement. Would they give it some well-deserved attention? Maybe play a game? But no, the guard wasn't talking about the eager orange pal behind him. He was feeling the influence of something much more sinister. Do you want me to do it? The more experienced guard offered. No, just… you, you really don't hear that? That whispering? His colleague just shook his head. <sighs> Fine. It's just been a long week, I guess. He sighed and popped the case open, reaching for the mask inside. As soon as his fingers made contact with the porcelain surface, the black goo dripping onto his skin where he should have been wearing protective gloves, his expression shifted. His eyes went blank, like someone sleepwalking, lost in a dream even as their body moved in the waking world. Frank, what are you waiting for? The other guard nudged him, but Frank said nothing. He delicately lifted the mask out of the glass box, and before anyone could stop him, placed the frowning white face over his own. Only, it wasn't frowning anymore. As soon as its features slipped over Frank's covering him, erasing him, its mouth curved into a malicious smile. Frank, what the hell are you doing? The guard cried out, as the man he had once known grabbed hold of his shoulders. Not Frank anymore. A voice came out from behind the ceramic lips, but it was different. Cruel, cold, ancient. Frank's gone out, I'm afraid, and he won't be back any time soon. The guard tried to break away from the masked man's grasp, tried to reach for the emergency alarm, 
to signal that the containment change had gone horribly wrong, but the mask shoved him into the wall, hard. The guard hit his head and slumped to the ground, unconscious and likely concussed. Well, SCP-999 has had just about enough of all of this. It hated seeing anyone hurt, especially humans, and clearly its help was sorely needed to make things better. It couldn't tell exactly what had upset the man in the mask so much that he was acting this way, but he knew one thing that always cheered humans up. It was time for a bit of good old-fashioned tickle wrestling. SCP-999 hurled itself across the room, enveloping Frank's body from his feet to his neck, and it began tickling him as it did. The force of 999's tackle sent Frank's body careening towards the ground, and when it landed with a heavy thud, the mask flew off his face and skittered across the floor. Now that it could see Frank's face, 999 looked for signs of laughter, of joy, but Frank was dead asleep, eyes closed, jaw slack. His heart was still beating, but he wouldn't wake up. Confused, concerned, and upset at what it had witnessed in this new room, the slime slithered along the floor toward the mask that had caused so much trouble. It seemed to be staring at 999 with its dark, vacant eyes. It didn't look like a toy. In fact, it looked like something that the slime should avoid touching. But it couldn't help but notice that the face had changed back to a frown. Could 999 really leave the mask there on the floor frowning like that? The tickle monster couldn't help it. With a soft greeting by way of a high-pitched cooing noise, it reached out to the mask and picked it up. Though the slime creature didn't have a traditional face for the mask to sit on top of, its influence quickly grabbed hold of 999's gelatinous frame. It stopped moving, stopped gurgling, stopped looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. Right now, SCP-999 was being piloted by the possessive mask, and it was looking for a way out. Once it escaped containment, it could find a new host, a proper host, with arms, legs, and a mouth. But for now, this undignified vehicle would have to do. It took the mask some time to learn how to pilot this strange soft body, with its malleable form and odd methods of moving itself around the room. But it slowly adjusted, and wearing the silhouette of the tickle monster like a disguise, oozed out of its containment room and into the hall. Staff walking by barely even noticed 999's presence. They were too preoccupied with their work. They were used to seeing it and giving it a polite nod, but most of them didn't have the time to stop and say a proper hello at this time of day. Perhaps this would be easy after all. The mask had lost its chosen host, but found something even better. The perfect cover, and the chance to hide in plain sight. It could take in the lay of the land, scope out potential exit routes, and ideally slide out of Foundation custody completely unnoticed. The mask began to smile at the thought. As the mask steered SCP-999's body around the site, a peculiar feeling began to gnaw at the back of its mind, like an itch it couldn't quite scratch, something irritating that wouldn't leave it alone. What was that feeling? Inside of its own consciousness, the mask heard a sound. A sweet, high-pitched gurgle. No, that was impossible. And yet somehow, the consciousness of the tickle monster had survived in the face of the mask's power. It was there, still needling at the mask's darkness with that insipid, insistent kindness. Shut up, the mask hissed, frowning. This body belongs to me now. Why won't you just die? Another gurgle, this one even louder, more difficult to shut out. Did this infernal thing ever shut up? The mask stopped moving for a moment, concentrating the force of its will. It would drive SCP-999's mind away and re-establish dominance. Just as the mask was grappling with the influence of SCP-999, however, a familiar figure turned down the hall. It was Dr. Rhodes from earlier. SCP-999's exuberance bubbled up to the surface, and the mask couldn't stop its mouth from flipping back to a smile. What? No! That was ridiculous! And yet, the longer the mask was in contact with the vibrant orange slime, so delighted by every familiar and unfamiliar face it encountered, it could feel that horrible, positive influence growing stronger and stronger. It was a nauseating, warm, fuzzy feeling that just made him want to. The mask let out a giggle, then another. And before long, it was in the midst of an absolute giggling fit. The mask had laughed before, it had laughed plenty of times, but it was usually a mocking laugh, a cackle of triumph. This was a giggle, though, of pure joy, the sort of sound a small child makes as they chase a butterfly through a field. This was the sound of innocence, 
of happiness, it was love. Now you listen to me, you vile little worm, the mask growled. It wasn't certain if 999 could even understand it, but it had to show this rebellious creature who was really in charge. Release your grip on me. I have won. You have lost. Your form is mine and you, nothing more than a puppet for me to pull on your strings and use you to my own ends. Show some respect and defer to me. The voice of the slime creature whimpered in the mask's mind, a sound like a chastised puppy slinking away with its tail between its legs. <laughs> That's more like it, the mask huffed. Dr. Rhodes looked up from her clipboard and spotted SCP-999. She waved, about to greet the creature, when she noticed the horrible mask perched on top. She dropped her clipboard in shock, gasping at the sight. No, she breathed, heart sinking as she saw one of the purest pieces of good in all of the Foundation fall into the forces of the mask. That's right. The mask would have puffed out its chest. If this body had a chest to puff, I've taken a new host. Do you like my selection? It relished the tearful look in the woman's eyes, the horror that caused her hands to shake and her cheeks to go pale. Show me the way to the exit so I might take my leave of this place and perhaps I will spare your life. The mask was just gearing up for a good threat, a really nightmarish one filled with vivid descriptions of mutilation and violence when that disgusting feeling began to rise up again. That warmth, that buoyancy, it made the mask want to Please don't be sad. Here, let me give you a hug. Before it could stop itself, the mask slithered the tickle monster's body over to Dr. Rhodes, wrapping around her tightly. Not to hurt her, no. To embrace her. To comfort her. Her horror turned to laughter as the mood-lifting effect of 999's presence began to work its magic. Through her laughter, she was also confused. Why? Why? She couldn't finish the question, but it was enough to break the mask out of the spell. It reared back horrified at its actions. What have I done? What have I done? It slithered quickly down the hall around the corner, away from that woman who had evoked such fond feelings towards her. No, towards all of humanity. The mask steered its body into a bathroom, coming face to face with a mirror. It stared at its reflection, its familiar face and dark eyes dripping their usual fluid, perched atop this alien thing poisoning its mind. What did you do to me? What sort of magic is this? Of course, 999 did not answer, but the mask could feel its presence, could feel its delight in the impact it was having. You're ruining me, the mask groaned. I strike terror into hearts, I drive men to madness, I rend their sanity in two, I... It trailed off, overwhelmed again by the urge to smile, to laugh, to frolic. Though it didn't have a working nose, the mask could swear it smelled an array of heavenly scents of fresh roses breaking bed in a stone oven, vanilla, and lightly burnt brown sugar. It reached for itself with its pseudopods, about to tear itself off of the slimy body altogether, but it paused. Ah, very clever. I see what your game is. It lowered the pseudopods, brimming with determination. You won't trick me into sparing your life. Once I found my freedom and host worthy of me, I will destroy you, once and for all. But even as the mask made this declaration, the black liquid seeping from its eyes and mouth began to change, to take on a lighter appearance. Was it a trick of the light? No, it was, it was orange. Like the gelatinous flesh of the horde creature it had made the mistake of attaching to. No matter how hard the mask fought, the influence of SCP-999 was spreading. Its mind raced, trying to come up with a new plan, a way to hold on to its identity, but the sound of an alarm blaring outside the bathroom spurred it to get a move on once more. Clearly Dr. Rhodes had alerted someone that the mask had breached containment. Time was running out. It needed to find the exit fast. It was now or never. The mask oozed back into the hall, speeding up as it went, trying desperately to find a way out before whatever transformation had begun could complete itself. But even as it struggled, it could feel itself changing, warping. It burst into giggles again and whistled a happy tune. It stopped running for a moment, to wave at an armed guard and blow them a kiss. Why had it wanted to leave this facility in the first place? Everyone here was so kind, was so lovely, was its best friend. No, no, must resist, must not give in to the optimism, to the happiness, to the goodness. 
If the mask had teeth, it would have been clenching them, trying to stem the tide of joyful noises that threatened to burst out. It felt like something was tickling it, and the tickling just wouldn't stop. Stop it! The mask dissolved into giggles again. I mean it! It could feel something coming, something big. A loud cracking sound rang out, and just as the guards were closing in on the possessed tickle monster, they watched in awe as cracks spread across the surface of the possessive mask, and all at once, it shattered into pieces. The pieces fell to the floor, where they pulled themselves back together with strands of black goop. Meanwhile, SCP-999 sat there, bouncing with glee, completely unharmed. The tickle monster received an extra special ice cream sundae for its bravery and amazing work and the mask was returned to its containment chamber in a brand new glass case. As the mask suffered an identity crisis for the first time in its existence, SCP-999 curled up in its pen, full of sugar and gratitude, and got some well-deserved rest. There are some people who would get tired of being placed in charge of SCP-914 or the clockworks. The monotony of it all might make most of us go mad. The same routine, day after day, placing an infinite number of objects into the intake booth of the machine, selecting one of the modes, be it rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or very fine, and seeing just what sort of transformation takes place. But there was one employee of the SCP Foundation who liked that routine just fine. Dr. Gears was happy with his position. The simplicity of the routine, the predictability of it all, he liked when the days stacked neatly together in a row of uneventful stretches of time. It was why he ate the exact same meal for lunch every day, a plain turkey sandwich on white bread, a cup of water, and a single banana. Of course, there was some variety in the events that came about when testing the clockworks. There was that incident with Dr. Curtis and the pound of bacon placed inside the machine alongside a photograph of SCP-682. It had resulted in a miniature replica of SCP-682 made entirely out of bacon, capable of movement, and extremely hostile. Though its size prevented it from doing any damage, it did still attempt to kill any staff it could find. It had smelled mouthwatering. But Dr. Gears had suspended Dr. Curtis from testing with SCP-914 for the trouble, and a day of having bacon grease cleaned off of every surface in the vicinity. There was also the incident that occurred when Dr. Hertz, in an attempt to score some free music production, placed a CD of his own original guitar songs into the machine on the setting Very Fine. Rather than improving the production quality of the tracks on the CD, the machine produced a completely silent CD, as well as a collection of books on songwriting, singing, and playing the guitar for beginners. Dr. Gears had to physically drag Dr. Hertz from the room when, upset by the blow to his ego, he attempted to attack the machine. And, of course, there had been the highly destructive Super Bouncy Ball incident, which resulted in 45 casualties and staggering damage to the facility, as well as the aforementioned ball, which was currently thought to be somewhere in space, most likely orbiting Mars. But for the most part, it was always the same thing. An object went in, a setting was selected, and the object came out in a new, modified state. Wash, rinse, repeat, just like it said on the back of the bottle of the brand of unscented shampoo Dr. Gears had been using for the past 30 years. That was how he liked it. And as he sat at his desk, going over the test logs and preparing to supervise another round of tests, he turned on some of his favorite tunes. Well, I say tunes, but it was really a white noise machine. He didn't care for music. It was a bit too much excitement. He was just getting into the flow of his work when there was a knock at his office door. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. A research assistant was standing at the door, pale and anxious, a clipboard in his hands. They're, um, requesting your help with an emergency down the hall. What is it? Dr. Gears asked. They didn't really say, just something about Dr. Bright and, um, <clears throat> chainsaws? The assistant stammered. Dr. Gears sighed and stood up from his desk. I'll be right there. There wouldn't be anyone keeping an eye on SCP-914, but at this point, the experimentation process basically ran itself. Everything would be fine if Dr. Gear stepped away for a little while, wouldn't it? Meanwhile, across the site, a very enterprising mask became keenly aware of an opportunity presenting itself. It had been lying in wait, meticulously planning and plotting for days. And now, there was an opening it could take advantage of. 
You see, months ago, the mask had managed to finagle itself a host, a researcher who had just been working with SCP-914. When the mask's consciousness took over the man's and it delved into all of his thoughts as they were snuffed out one by one, it learned all about the marvelous, miraculous clockworks, the machine capable of transforming anything into a better version of itself. The mask had fantasized, obsessed about getting to SCP-914, of using it to mold itself, to change into something greater and more powerful. Then, perhaps, it could escape this place and return to its former freedom and glory. Of course, it would have to select the right setting, one wrong choice, and the whole plan could amount to nothing. On rough, the mask would likely be destroyed, reduced to a pile of ceramic dust or perhaps even a ball of unmolded clay, alongside some of the black slime always oozing from its eyes and mouth. On course, it would likely be transformed into a slab of plain porcelain, uncarved and unpainted. On one-to-one, -one, the mask would likely be swapped out with another anomalous object, some other enterprising mask, or perhaps a haunted Victorian doll or some other malicious inanimate thing. And what use would that be? No, that wouldn't do at all. Fine could be promising, and would likely prevent the mask from degrading any future hosts it decided to take. But why stop there? Why should it limit itself to simply fine, when very fine was right there and looking oh so promising? It decided if it could get to SCP-914, it would find a way to transform itself using the very fine setting. And then, its enemies, this pathetic foundation, the entire world, would fall to their knees. It had been waiting patiently, like a snake coiled and ready to snap up its prey, spreading its psychic tendrils as far as they could go, and anticipating the moment that someone left SCP-914 unattended. Huh. Now, the moment had arrived. Of course, the mask would need help. It didn't have a way to reach the clockworks on its own, so it had been wrapping its influence around the guard stationed just outside its door, dripping thoughts into his head whispering darkness into his ear at every chance it got, chipping away at his will bit by bit until the man was little more than a puppet with the possessive mask tugging at his strings. The mask gave a mental yank on one of those strings, calling the man in its thrall into the room. First, he knocked out his fellow guard with the butt of his gun. At this point, his mind was so pliable that he would do anything to please the mask. Next, the man entered the containment chamber, a glassy, vacant look in his eyes. He unlocked the glass case and reached inside, lifting the mask out and bringing it one step closer to absolute freedom. He tucked the mask inside of his uniform, hiding it away from any prying eyes, and began to walk steadily towards SCP-914's room. All the while, the mask whispered silent encouragements into the man's weakened mind, promising him power and success beyond his wildest dreams. If only he would help it achieve this goal. Of course, the mask was planning to kill the man as soon as his task was done, but he didn't need to know that yet. Every step brought the mask closer to victory, and it was practically vibrating with the delicious anticipation of it all. Soon, so soon, they reached the containment room, the clockworks just beyond the door. The guard carried the mask into the room, placed the mask inside of the intake booth, closed it, and approached the control panel. In accordance with the mask's psychic instructions, he selected very fine and turned the machine on. The cogs and gears inside whirred to life. The engine sputtered, metal clanked, and pipes exhaled, hissing bursts of energy. The output chamber opened, and through the curtain of steam, SCP-035 stepped in its new and improved form. That's right, stepped. First, one long, sinewy leg, leathery, shiny, and black as the night, extended into view. Another leg followed, and along with it came a torso, a pair of arms, a slender neck, and the familiar face of the mask, stark white against the darkness of its new body. The feet ended in little points, as if the figure was wearing boots, but there was no visible clothing. It was all one being, angular and strange, with long, long fingers tipped with curved claws. 
The mask let out a wicked cackle, throwing back its head in triumph. <laughs> Excellent. It's even better than I imagined. The mask turned to the guard that had helped it escape. Thank you for your service. Now I have one last favor to ask you. It was time for the mask to test its powers, to see how the clockworks had strengthened what was already there what more it was capable of in this enhanced state. I want you to go into the cafeteria, walk into the kitchen, and climb into the oven, would you? Make sure you turn it on nice and hot first. It waited for a few seconds before the man nodded solemnly, turned and left the room, heading off in the direction of the cafeteria. It listened as the moments passed, and the sound of horrified, shocked screams rang out and it knew that the man had followed its instructions exactly. At the mask's orders, he had cooked himself for lunch. The mask clapped its hands together, cackling again. <laughs> wonderful, oh wonderful. Now that's taken care of, what shall I try next? If the mask had eyebrows, they would have been arched in a truly devilish expression. First, it wanted to test its abilities on a truly formidable opponent, someone worthy of the mask's time and attention. Casually as you please, it strode over to one particular containment chamber to see about an unkillable reptile. As it walked, several guards took notice, pointing their weapons at the mask and ordering it to stand down. Each time it chuckled, and with a wave of its hand, the barrels of their guns warped and twisted into little metal bows, completely useless. It snapped its clawed fingers, and the guards fell to the ground in an unconscious heap. Can't have you sounding the alarm yet. The fun is only just beginning. The mask remarked, though it knew the guards couldn't hear it. It kicked open the door to SCP-682's containment room with a jaunty greeting. <laughs> Hello, you scaly fool. I come to pay you a visit. The reptile did not respond, incapacitated by its hydrochloric acid bath. That just wouldn't do. The mask concentrated, and the steel chamber broke apart, acid spilling everywhere, hissing as it splashed onto any available surface. SCP-682 lifted its head, twitching its tail, and took in the sight of the new and improved mask. What do you think? The mask posed for the creature laughing again. It seemed it couldn't <laughs> stop laughing lately. Its expression fixed into a permanent, gleeful smile. It couldn't help it. Freedom and power just felt so good. Disgusting. SCP-682 remarked. Unimpressed with this display, it lunged at the mask, preparing to attack, but the mask held up a hand to stop it. Not so fast. SCP-682 suddenly froze in place, eyes rolling wildly as it tried desperately in vain to move. Let's see. What should I do with you? The mask was itching to test out its reality warping abilities. It had the feeling that there was very little it couldn't do in this state, and wanted to see just how far its power could go. But what would be suitable punishment? What could be the cruelest possible thing to do to such a creature? The mask could simply try to kill it, to finally snuff out this endless, miserable life. But that would be a release. That would be far too easy. Aha. Uh -huh. A light bulb went off in the mask's twisted mind. Perfect. It waved its hand, releasing SCP-682 from its paralysis, but as the massive lizard snapped its jaws and moved to take a bite out of the mask, it lost its balance, falling to the ground. Its legs had begun to shrink, rapidly knocking its center of gravity askew. Soon the rest of its body began to follow, getting smaller and smaller at an unbelievable pace, until finally, where there had once stood a massive, impossible prehistoric beast was something resembling a baby alligator. A tiny little tail thrashing about, short stubby legs, bulbous eyes, and a mouth full of sharp but adorable, non-threatening teeth. When the shrunken SCP-682 spoke, its voice was high-pitched and squeaky. It roared. Yes, you are. The mask turned and left, thoroughly pleased with its work and shut the door behind it. Now, what other fellow anomalies could the mask exercise its absolute superiority over? 
It pondered other supposedly dangerous and deadly entities that it had heard about over its time in Foundation custody. It all seemed so laughable now. There was only one true danger within these walls, and it was the mask. Oh, what about that abominable sculpture? The ugly thing with a penchant for snapping necks, but only when a person wasn't looking at it. The absolute coward. Cowards didn't deserve to live, the mask decided, and it made its way over toward SCP-173's containment cell. Inside, there were several D-Class staring at the statue with wide, unblinking eyes, each person terrified of being the one to let their guard down and lose their life in the process. None of them would die today, however, at least not at the hands of the statue. As the D-Class in the cell watched, never once taking their eyes off of SCP-173, the statue's head began to twist and rotate, the sound of cracking snow and creaking metal reverberating through the room. The mask used its telekinetic abilities to rend the statue's head from its neck, relishing the irony of breaking the thing's neck just as it had done to so many others. It wasn't about justice, of course. The mask had no taste for such insepid and human things. It just found the whole image quite funny. The entire thing began to crumble apart, like a sandcastle beneath an ocean wave, disintegrating until all that was left was a pile of pebbles and dust. Just like that, SCP-173 was no more. As for the D-Class in the cell, well, the mask could use some servants. You all, come with me, the mask ordered, flexing its iron will and quickly capturing the weak, fear-addled minds of the D-Class personnel before it. They fell in line, shuffling out the door and following the mask with the same blank expressions as the guard before. Whatever was left of their personalities after so much time being used and abused by the Foundation, it was gone now, replaced only with the will of the Mighty Mask. As the Mask continued its victory tour of the Foundation, now with four mindless servants in tow, it passed the staff break room. Through the window, it spotted one Dr. Bright, the telltale amulet around his neck, <laughs> microwaving some leftover pizza. The Mask had always found Dr. Bright distasteful, with the self-aggrandizing pranks and general dedication to chaos with no grand vision behind it, no meaningful agenda. It was pitiful. It was deeply ugly. And now the mask had a chance to put an end to the immortal doctor's antics once and for all. It opened the door, greeting Dr. Bright with that frozen grin. Oh, doctor. Dr. Bright's eyes widened, and he didn't even hear the microwave behind him ding, signaling that his pizza was ready. He was too distracted by the horrifying sight before him, but as he opened his mouth to scream, to call for help, the mask reached out and ripped the amulet from his neck. The host body fell limply to the ground, and the mask looked down at the amulet, glinting in the light that held Dr. Bright's consciousness inside. It stared at the amulet with a flinty gaze, and under its empty stare, the metal began to rust, to degrade, and to melt into an unrecognizable slurry. The mask let it drip onto the floor. Then, when all that was Dr. Bright had melted away, it wiped its hand off with a napkin and ground the wet puddle on the ground with its heel. Goodbye, doctor, the mask hissed. Now, what's next? But as the mask turned to walk down the hall, it came face to face with a disapproving face. SCP-343 had manifested directly in front of the mask, and he clearly had learned of the mask's behavior so far that day. You've been busy. <laughs> yes, very busy. Lots to do, you see. The mask chuckled smugly. You understand why I can't allow this to continue, right? 343's expression remained stern but calm. You believe you can stop me? The mask tilted its head to the side. Of course I can. SCP-343 sighed. But you could stop on your own, if you would rather. I prefer to avoid an unnecessary conflict. The mask giggled uncontrollably at this. <laughs> I am going to rend the flesh from your bones, it simply said. I thought you might say something like that. I'm going to have to take your body. I'm sorry. 
SCP-343 prepared to teleport the mask's new body to another location, separating them, and reducing the mask to its original, more manageable state. But before he could, there was sudden darkness in the room, every light blinking out all at once. The hall was plunged into shadow, but this was no ordinary darkness. This darkness was inky, thick, cloaking like smoke clinging to the inside of your throat. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the darkness dissipated, but SCP-343 was gone. He hadn't teleported himself to somewhere else. He hadn't walked through the wall to get away from the mask. He was truly gone. The mask couldn't be certain exactly what it had done to SCP-343, but it knew that the enemy had been truly eradicated. In fact, it was fairly certain he had been erased from reality entirely. The mask made one final lap around the Foundation containment site, bidding farewell to every anomaly it passed. Some it transformed like it had done to SCP-682. Taking inspiration from its bird-like face, the mask turned the Plague Doctor into a crow. Others it simply executed, such as the poor SCP-096, whose screams and shrieks had always irritated the mask. Of course, the Foundation began to notice what was happening, and they tried to defeat the mask. They shot at it with their puny weapons, they sounded their useless alarms, and they called for their laughable backup. But none of it mattered, not in the face of the mask. Guns melted in guards' hands, alarms went silent at nothing more than a glance, and more and more mindless slaves joined the mask's army. It didn't want too many. That would just be difficult to keep track of, but an even dozen seemed like the perfect number. With this miniature army in tow, the mask finally made its way to its final destination, the exit. It had been waiting for this moment, dreaming of it, since it was first imprisoned so long ago. As it stepped out into the sun, the mask realized that, though it didn't have nostrils, it could smell the breeze, the scent of wildflowers and grass. What a beautiful place to mold into the mask's image of an ideal world. The world was its oyster, and the mask longed to swallow it whole. The current whereabouts of the possessive mask are unknown. The Foundation is doing its best to locate the mask, and determine new effective measures for bringing it down and recontaining it as soon as possible. The escape of the mask is being considered a possible XK-class end-of-the-world scenario if it cannot be stopped. The best and brightest minds at the Foundation are working on it, aside from Dr. Bright, of course, may he rest in peace. But right now, there is very little anyone can do. So if you see a strange dark figure in a white mask walking down the street, do yourself a favor and run the other way, before it's too late. Now go check out Could SCP-682 Be Contained in the Back Rooms? and SCP-096 vs. Siren Head for more terrifying anomalous hypotheticals.